Grave Walkers. Book 11. Marigold Cemetery. By Richard T. Schrader. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved. Chapter 1. Girl Detective. Alice appreciated having Bobby Bean to snuggle up against to keep warm. It was at that perfect hour, right that morning when she needed to get up for work, but she still had time to stay in bed and enjoy being comfortably lazy. The air conditioning really blasted out an arctic blizzard in her parents' apartment. Even with her pajamas and thick quilts, it was cold in her bedroom. Leaching the extra body heat from Bobby made her bed just right. Having Bobby spend the night wasn't any degree of problem, not while Critias and Carmen were still away in Nevada. They had gone there as part of a daring commando mission to capture the Boulder Dam. Even though Alice was a deputy marshal herself, it was the kind of thing that was too much for her to handle. The operation had to depose its former owners, a bona fide army of unsavory evil survivor soldier types. Aunt Jam had not come home at all that night because she had stayed at Tony Banjo's apartment again. Pipkin shared Mandy's room as was their usual arrangement. The Admiral's son Hardik had stayed over late while they watched movies and just had fun. When he did finally leave, Hardik hadn't bothered to lock the front door. He had grown up on an aircraft carrier where doorknobs and house keys weren't a common concern. If Alice had gotten out of bed a little earlier, she would have been up and getting ready for work when Marshal Duke quietly entered the apartment. Commodore Tinney was a man of his word. His promise as a governor of the council was that he would provide the equipment and expertise necessary to open the heavy rail track from Jim City out to the presidential bunker in Denver. He would also secure the deep water port in Texas that Fleet Admiral Rudel needed for the unloading of his ships. Those trains and workers had arrived in the night and then made themselves at home out at Foranger's Castle. After he cleared decontamination, Duke followed his instructions from the Commodore. He was to seek out Colonel Flash at Critias's apartment in King's Tower, and then personally convey the Freeman Governor's orders to her. When Duke asked some of the GNP personnel for directions, they informed him that Critias and Carmen were not in the city. If he wanted to find Jam, they suggested that he try Tony Banjo's apartment since she was probably staying there. The guards also told Duke that Tony partied hard, and didn't appreciate having strangers pounding on his door first thing in the morning. Their helpful advice was that if Duke went to Bobby Bean's studio apartment first, he could have Tony's newest crew member deliver a message that Jam needed to come down for Freeman business. That would be less awkward than him beating on Tony's door. Duke thought that it was bad enough that Colonel Flash had not been at Forager's castle waiting to supervise the arrival of their trains. He considered calling her cell phone, but decided against it. Cell phones were a King Louis invention, and not the modus operandi of the Freeman community. In any event, Duke wanted his irritation to be fully blossomed and undiluted when he finally tracked her down. She was off enjoying herself with a notorious gigolo as though Jim City was some kind of permanent vacation for her, and he didn't like it. Jam was supposed to be representing her people, not living the good life on Fantasy Island. Duke eventually discovered that Bobby Bean was not in his apartment. A roving GNP woman noticed him rapping on the door. She suggested that he try Critias's place instead. Everyone knew that Bean was in the habit of hanging out there with his girlfriend Alice. The confounding maze of his adventure was really getting on Duke's nerves. When he finally arrived at Critias's door, still no closer to finding Jam, he just walked inside. Duke already knew that Critias and Carmen were away at the Boulder Dam. He understood that Alice had a reputation to upkeep as a deputy marshal, an underage one at that. Already irritated with Jam's malfeasance, Duke fumed even more in the umbrage that Bean had no business being there at that time of the morning while Alice's parents were away. Hardock had left the outer hallway door unlocked. No one noticed when Duke walked right in and he still didn't disturb anyone even as he started checking the bedroom doors. He saw Mandy and Pipkin charming asleep in their beds. Mandy even had her teddy bear Virgil to keep her company. Duke moved on to Alice's room where he saw her snuggled up against Bobby Bean. He finally lost his temper and as much as he was able, in that he stepped up, grabbed Bean by his ankle, and then yanked him off the bed, pulling the quilts right along with him. Alice's suitably modest pajamas saved Bean from a savage beating on the spot. Duke indulged the possibility that Bean had not committed a capital offense with a girl. Rather than kill Bean with his bare hands, Duke none too gently dragged him out toward the living room instead. Bean had been deeply asleep when Duke seized him. He had only recently been on the run for his life out on the streets, and had a near miss when one of Jingle Bell's elite ghouls had caught him by the leg. Duke awakening him in much the same way was a horrifying flashback experience. Bean's first conscious thought was that ghouls had overrun the building and they were all about to die. Alice screamed in frightful surprise after Bean howled out in alarm first. The sound of them both in distress caused Mandy to cry out in terror. Pipkin instinctively rolled right out of her blankets to hit the floor. 
her arm already reached beneath her bed to take a hold of the automatic combat shotgun that she kept there for just such an emergency. If the apartment was not chaotic enough already, when Juke arrived back in the living room, dragging Bean by his ankle, wearing nothing but his boxer shorts, Yeti arrived at the front door along with Riverboat Darla and Oleg. Yeti had been about to take Darla to see Kevin's control room where Jim and Fleet Admiral Ruto were going to have a morning teleconference with a new outpost at Boulder Dam. The available rumor was that the mission out west had been a total success. Colonel Davis's team had taken the dam undamaged, liberated the prisoners, killed the bad guys, and not lost any of his people in the process. What remained was that the home base of their new enemy was the Area 51 of Legend where the old government had stored crashed alien spaceships. In total, the control room would be an interesting thing to see and since Starla was an ambassador, they would not deny her the opportunity. G&P Radio Chatter had informed Yeti that Juke was on his way up into the tower to look for Jam, Bean, and Critias's apartment. Yeti had promised Carmen that he would keep an eye on her business while she was away. He postponed the control room pilgrimage to stop on the floor with Critias's apartment first. Yeti would make sure everything was all right with Alice and Mandy. Oleg lived in the customs house where he took over Keith's old apartment that was a perk for the director of civilian armory. He headed up the tower that morning with his GNP girlfriend Robin. They were on their way to see his friend Bors and Bors' wife Rachel at their captain's apartment. The four of them would go to breakfast together in Funland. The patrol woman Robin was a member of Yeti's East Airport squad, and he had defended her honor when one of the Admiral's mechanics spoke to her most inappropriately. During their brief conversation in the elevator, Oleg learned that Yeti wanted to check up on the home of Critias. Since Critias and Yeti had shown him respect over the affront at the airport, Oleg volunteered to go along and in a small way perhaps repay the favor. Bean finally realized who had him by the leg, but there wasn't much he could do about it. Juke was a large and dangerous man well beyond what Bean would be able to handle short of shooting him. That was the moment that Yeti came up behind Juke and then grabbed him by the shoulder to make him stop manhandling Bean in Carmen's apartment. Not hesitating a moment, Juke elbowed Yeti in the face to shake him off. The blow wasn't enough to knock Yeti down, but it certainly didn't feel good. Yeti was not of a mind to hit anyone since he only wanted to break up the conflict and let everyone come to their senses. The elbow to Yeti's face did infuriate Oleg, who would never back down from anyone, and frankly, would never have to show caution since he was quite possibly the most dangerous man alive. In a brutal instant, Oleg dashed in, grabbed Juke by his arm, and when the marshal resisted, Oleg spun him about flipped him right off his feet, and then slammed him down through the coffee table, which partly broke his fall as it exploded into collapsed wreckage. Alice came out of her room at that point, screaming for them to stop, only no one did. Juke wasn't hurt or intimidated, and nearly steamed with rage over what Oleg did to him. He must have thought that Oleg would wait for him to get back up, or want to make some kind of fair fight about the whole affair. Oleg was more of a mind to leap right in immediately, take the mounted dominant position on the ground, and then beat Juke unconscious with blows from his fists. Everyone did freeze when Pipkin appeared and then audibly racked the slide on her Benelli semi-auto shotgun, which chambered its first shell. Pipkin was a freeman herself, so she had the sense not to store the weapon loaded to the pipe and she could fight when the situation called for it. Juke was family to Pipkin, and as such, she was not about to let Oleg finish what he had started. That's enough. Pipkin verbally warned everyone, meaning it. Oleg's GNP girlfriend Robin went for her cell phone so fast to Kostig and tell him about the whole mess, that Pipkin shifted the shotgun in her direction out of fear that the woman was going for her sidearm. Enough already, Yeti sounded hurt as he waved at Pipkin to lower her unneeded weapon. He had to lean his head back so that the blood coming from his bleeding nose didn't end up in Carmen's new carpet. That was Bean's opportunity to jump up to his feet and act like he was entirely innocent. All it actually accomplished was to make him seem like he was some kind of idiot standing there as he was in red and white boxer shorts. Juke got up out of the wreckage of the coffee table and the scattered knickknacks that had been on it. In the process of brushing himself off, he checked to see that he hadn't suffered any injuries. He gave Pipkin an aggravated scowl as he demanded, Where is your mother? The Commodore said she was supposed to be living here and keeping an eye on the kids. Juke's gaze shifted to Bean when he said kids to highlight the fact that the apartment was supposed to be closer to a romper room playground than a brothel where foragers ran around in their underwear. Pipkin scoffed with undisguised disgust as she lowered the shotgun, where do you think she is? She is with that banjo character, up in his sex pad apartment. If those three samurai women are there too, I would not be at all surprised. The mention of sex pad made Oleg realize what he had seen since he had entered the apartment and then his stern gaze landed on Bean. It now appeared that Oleg and Juke were on the same side and that they both wanted to give Bean a proper beating.
quick thinking was a talent that Alice had in addition to being a keen observer. She said, nothing happened here last night, nothing at all. I just didn't want to be home alone without adult supervision. Her excuse did in a way make it seem like Bean had been doing everyone a favor by babysitting. She also inadvertently made it appear that Jam was negligent in her duties and thereby caused the necessity in the first place. Alice didn't want to get Jam into any trouble. To change the topic, she said, I need to get ready for work. Jam will be back any moment to get ready too. I don't want her to find all of you here. She made a fine display of generous annoyance by adding, You have done enough damage already, thank you very much. After that, she turned to march back into her room, hoping that no one was going to call her bluff. Before she closed her door to get dressed, her final comment was, Carmen is not going to be pleased that you have broken her stuff with your horsing around. She needed only moments to throw off her pajamas and then pull on the bodysuit that went with her mech suit boots, gauntlets, and helmet. She buckled on her pistol belt, grabbed her Tesla Flux carbine, and then headed out. Mandy was in the kitchenette helping Darla put an ice pack on Yeti's nose. Pipkin was in her room getting dressed for joining the Freeman in Forager's castle. Everyone else had thankfully departed. Without looking, Mandy told her sister, Bobby said he would call you later. I'm sorry about this, Alice told Yeti on her way past them as she headed toward the front door. Are you going to be okay? It's not broken, Darla said pleasantly as she held the ice on Yeti's nose while he sat in a kitchen chair with his head leaned way back. If anything, Yeti taking a hit while trying to responsibly break up the immature squabbling of everyone else only made him more appealing. Darla liked a strong man but not one who did stupid things to show his machismo. It was men with more regression than brains that had brought her riverboat hotel community to ruin. Once Alice was out of the apartment, she went straight to the elevator and then took it up to Tony Banjo's floor. Before long, she pounded her gauntleted fist on Tony's door. Right away, the door opened. Jam stood there on one foot trying to put on her other shoe. She had on her walk of shame dress that she had left the apartment in the night before. Behind her and the room, Alice saw two of the Japanese foragers who worked for Fleet Admiral Rudel. They wore short silk robes in primary colors and floral patterns. A moment later, the third ambassador walked through the view only she was stark naked. A forest of empty liquor bottles were all about the place. Tony had a very nice apartment, but it was currently a disheveled mess from some wild party they had thrown. He did have good reason to celebrate, having survived his truck fire and accompanying ghoul riot. Bad as it all appeared. Alice didn't feel it was her place to make it any of her business. I'm running late, Jam said as she came out and then closed the door behind her. I know, Alice agreed somberly. The tone was enough to get Jam's attention. That was when Alice spilled the beans, Duke came by looking for you. He found Bobby in my room and he didn't like it. Yeti came by to check on us and Duke hit him in the nose. That Russian friend of Bors was with Yeti and he threw Duke through the coffee table. It is a total loss. Any moment now. I will be getting the call. I'm probably in a lot of trouble. Duke is here? Jam didn't disguise her sudden dreadful realization. I wasn't expecting them so soon. The Commodore didn't call me. She took a moment to consider that because it was significant, no one did. Jam put her hand on Alice's shoulder to urge her along in the direction of the elevator. We both might be in trouble, I better get back downstairs and dressed for work. The call did come just as Alice had expected. About the time that Jam came out of Critias's apartment dressed for duty, Alice got a text message on her helmet HUD that the officers wanted her at Kevin's control room. Jam glanced down at her cell phone because she had received a similar message. Kevin's control room had a conference table where the officers sat for their breakfast while they also held a morning business meeting. Fleet Admiral Rudolph was there with Commander Carries. Jim and Jessica were there as was Kevin, Fat Jack, and Headshot Sally. Sea Captain Esteban Marino was at the meeting too but he was currently across the room at one of the stations having a mildly flirtatious conversation with the female technician seated there. Not seeing Juke or Bobby Bin was a relief to Alice. She feared that everyone was only waiting to roast her over what had happened in the apartment that morning. As they came in, Jim pressed the button on a teleconference module that was on the breakfast table. He said, She is here now, Commodore, if you would like to begin. Commodore Tinney's voice came over the speakers from where he was at his Camelot base. Good morning. Samantha, he said to welcome Jam. Colonel Flash instantly realized that the Commodore would not be calling her by her full first name unless he was disappointed in her performance. It didn't help that Jam wasn't even sure what he was displeased about. She hadn't been properly on top of things to know that the new Freeman crews were going to arrive that morning. Jam's people must have known to expect them. If Jam had been at Forager's castle just making herself useful, 
she would have gotten all the information required. Jem responded simply by saying, Good morning to you, Commodore. The Commodore spoke from the speakers again, We are on the eve of the great adventure. Thanks to Jim, we have our new home at Camelot. It is the Admiral's people that need a home now and we have the skills required to make the Denver base available to them. I must confess, even if we have the talent and machinery to accomplish so epic a task, we do not have all the manpower necessary for so grand and dangerous an undertaking. In light of how important this all is to my fellow governors, I am certain they won't deny your requests for able personnel. Time being of the essence such as it is, hurricane season weather could postpone completion until well into next year. Jam asked the Commodore, did you have anyone in mind in particular? Just use your discretion, the Commodore advised pleasantly. We freemen know everything about trains and their related matters. I am putting you in command of the Southern Track Expedition. The connection between Jim City and the Admiral's fleet will be useful even before we open the track to Denver and make it available. Start by finding yourself a capable security commander to lead any boots you have to put on the ground. I have Ray on loan to Colonel Davis right now, but even when he is free, he will be helping open the western route. Lacking him, you are going to need someone with first-rate engineering talents. You have been at Jim's community for long enough now to know everyone available for you to choose from. After a pause the Commodore repeated for the benefit of the other governors, this operation is critically important and must be completed before the winter weather makes the iron too cold to handle. I am sure that Jim and the Admiral will be open to most any sacrifice to guarantee you safe and expedient success. Texas? Jam nearly gulped the name so that it got all the magnitude it deserved as an enormous, dangerous, and important undertaking. It took her a moment longer to decode everything that the Commodore had said and then fully realize the profitable opportunity that Tinney had artfully crafted for their Freeman community, if she did her part in capitalizing on it. In light of the unscrupulous profiteering she took part in, Jam didn't let her eyes fall directly on the officers at the table. She didn't want to witness any of their hostile reactions to her usurpative appropriations as she made her crew requisitions. I would need Critias to serve as my ground operations commander, Jam said in a tone that bespoke hesitant but simple honesty and I think Carmen would be ideal in the role of my team's field engineer. Ray is already on good terms with Aram, giant. If Cutter is not going out west with Ray, I could use his assistance too. He would be a huge help, if only with all the heavy lifting. A platoon of their GNP would provide some much needed extra firepower, if that would be possible and this mission really is as time critical as you say. Well, the Commodore sounded pleased. That should give you what you need for safely undertaking the operation. I am sending Juke to lead the other team heading west. If possible, Special Agent Shield and her assistant Mr. Romeo would join them. Everyone has heard about their extraordinary talent for moving outdoors safely, some have said that none are better. Because Fleet Admiral Rudol was the primary beneficiary of the train operations and none of the people or equipment involved was his own, the whole matter sounded most excellent to his sensibilities. Rudol even added, Commander Critias did tell me that Special Agent Shield and Romeo were second to none in what they call grave walking. We all have to work close to the infected, but no one can safely get as close as they do without triggering a riot. Jack disguised his alarm that Jam had finally put herself in a position to steal away Critias and Carmen from his community. It was not too hard to believe that by the time the railway missions were over, they would feel more at home with the Freeman than they did in Jim's city. Critias and Carmen are away in Nevada. Jack said in a tone that suggested it was unfortunately impossible for them to leave on Jam's train. We are committed to helping open Denver, but that doesn't mean we don't still have problems of our own that require expert attention. After a pause he added, besides, they have children to care for. They won't just abandon Alice and Mandy while they go off for weeks on end. I wasn't suggesting leaving them behind, the Commodore said about the girls as though he had prepared his thoughts on the matter long before this meeting. They would be safe enough working aboard the train and learn some valuable trade skills as well. They could continue their schooling by video conference with no more inconvenience than we have here. We can all agree that Jim's community is not the best place for impressionable children anyway. If last night is any indication, Alice, Mandy, and Pipkin would benefit from some time away from the morally ambiguous atmosphere that Jim's community enjoys so liberally. As though on cue, the door opened. Duke came into the control room along with Oleg, Yeti and Darla. Bean came in last behind Pipkin, Wolf, and Tony Banjo. Yet he had tape on his nose that didn't do much other than help hide the bruise on his face. I'm here, Duke said aloud for the benefit of Commodore Tinney. You did the right thing calling me immediately, the Commodore answered. I am deeply troubled by what happened. Only moments ago, I was telling the other governors about my plan for you to leave the westward rail mission. 
Now, it seems that you may not be up to so challenging a responsibility. What reason could you possibly have for starting a brawl with Jim's people? I am at fault for hitting their patrolmen, Juke confessed sounding genuinely regretful. When he grabbed me from behind it more or less just happened on instinct. I didn't injure their forager, even though I was well within my rights to do so. I only dragged him out into the main room after I discovered him in bed with one of Pipkin's friends. I had gone into the apartment trying to find Jam. I knew the parents were away in Nevada. I assumed she would be there keeping an eye on the kids. She wasn't there and neither was anyone else suitable for chaperoning them. I believe that I am correct to assume, King Louis's foragers are not supposed to be spending their nights in children's bedrooms. Nothing happened, Alice pleaded sincerely. I know that it looks bad to someone who doesn't know us, but Bobby and I are just friends. It was all perfectly innocent. Duke turned to glance back at Bean and then growled. He considered appearances to be a worthwhile boundary in of itself. Jack thought it might help to take some of the heat off of Bean and undermine Jem's position at the same time. He asked her, You were not home last night, Colonel Flash? She was at my place, Tony answered for her. I had a party last night and she stayed over. Fleet Admiral Rudel asked, Akako, Yumi, and Rai are not still rooming with you? Them too, Tony confirmed it unperturbed. Sounds cozy, Duke grumbled with distaste. Sounds sleazy, Pipkin snapped off about it, clearly displeased with her mother's scandalous conduct. Commodore Tinney asked, Samantha, you left the girls in the care of that man? Was it your recommendation that he also spend the night in her bed? Carmen and Critias allow Alice extraordinary latitude, Jam offered as her explanation. She is a member of the Council's own martial service. Honoring promises to her own friends and family are the least of the commitments and trust that you ask of her. We trust her to keep her word. I have to assume that all of you do as well, since you trust her with riskier responsibilities than a platonic friendship with a young man she is tentatively engaged to marry. Queen Jessica spoke up, we expect our marshals to conduct themselves as examples to everyone else. It is unacceptable that anyone could come along later, and then cite the example that they only did what marshals do. She turned her gaze to being to command, the next time the two of you will share the same bed, will be your wedding night. Is that perfectly clear? Perfectly, Bean repeated the word gratefully, since it appeared that his one punishment for his crime was chastisement and that would be the end of it. The Commodore spoke again, the guardsman that Duke inadvertently injured during what was in large part a family squabble among freemen, has our sincerest apology. Since it is our way to make amends with more than words, I would like Jim to give you thirty gold tokens from the Freeman bank account as recompense for your inconvenience. Thank you, Commodore, sir, Yeti replied. I will deposit it in the GNP widowing fund. I do not hold a grudge and I wouldn't like any of the other patrolmen to take it the wrong way either. Thirty shifts of hot zone combat pay is a generous sum for a bloody nose. With that out of the way, the Commodore said, I presume that the Admiral and Jim are in agreement then? How soon do you expect to have the situation in Nevada resolved and your officers back in your city for other duties? Entirely sensible, said the Admiral in approval. I will make plans to get our supply barges underway back to the fleet. Everything will be in readiness when her train arrives in Texas. Jim said nothing and concealed his thoughts, aside from a subtle glance over at Alice. It was not incriminating, rather more a knowing look where Jim shared an understanding with her. Of the other people in the room, it was Alice who quite naturally came to the realization that Commodore Tinney was not merely some adorable codger like a sweet Saint Nicholas. Tinney was very much a shrewd leader and a worthy adversary for the other governors. The Freeman wanted Critias and Carmen, and they were going to take Alice and Mandy too. Commodore Tinney had already maneuvered the Admiral's urgency for progress to his favor and even if Jim was against the idea, it was possible that the situation was such that Jim simply had no other choice but to comply. His potential reasons for refusal would be too thin, the benefits of his compliance too obvious, and the urgent insistence of the other two governors were not something he could casually disregard. None of that took into account that Critias had already requested permission to take Carmen to Texas with Jam and Jim had promised to help him accomplish it with whatever assistance they desired. Kevin spoke up, by transferring fuel from the Hercules transport plane that Colonel Hiram captured, they could return home in the Greyhound. We are confident that their Groom Lake base will have extensive fuel storage reserves. Once the Colonel has taken that over, refueling will not be an issue of concern. The male android added, Carmen's information about them having nuclear weaponry attached to long-range cruise drones has turned out to be true. I have already fully infiltrated their computer network, along with all the drones interacting with that system. Even if I hadn't already changed all the arming codes on their bombs, missiles, and the drones, it appears that their leaders kept those codes secure in their sole possession, 
and they all died when a Predator drone we commandeered fired its Hellfire missile into their Striker Command vehicle. In conjunction with the exploding ammunition and burning fuel, the vehicle and all its contents are totally obliterated. Their drones of nuclear mass destruction are exotic prototypes. Essentially they are pilotless scaled-down flying wings that carry tactical fission warheads. At this point, it is no longer possible for them to launch any of those aerial vehicles or to detonate the warheads. According to previous understandings, they are now the property of King Louis until such time as he chooses to transfer them into the possession of anyone else. Fleet Admiral Rudel Harumft at that last part. Do you really think it is prudent to make yourself a nuclear power, Jim? I have professionals who are capable of handling such things. That is business for another day, Jim answered non-committally. Neither of us has forgotten about the Maltese pirates who are still out there. If the situation warrants it, we may just nuke their main bases and be done with them. For now, Nevada is a mission orchestrated by my community and the rewards are also mine to dispense with as I see fit. Carmen also said that the man they captured mentioned that they were aware of where your fleet is waiting in the Gulf and that it would have been one of their targets. So while admittedly you are eager to get this railway work underway, I expect you to be doubly ambitious to have Critias and Carmen complete their operation of capturing Groom Lake. If we have overlooked some detail in all of this, we would not want those people lashing out against your ships in a last-ditch expression of extreme revenge. The Admiral nodded resolutely with that wisdom from young Jim. Your people have done an excellent job so far and I don't want to distract them with my problems. Until your people have that Groom Lake situation officially locked down, I would prefer they stay where they are. Colonel Davis has my total confidence and I defer to his on-site expertise. Dr. Clara came into the control room just then with her assistant Mandy in tow, which got everyone's attention. Clara was her usual self, impeccable in her manicured dress without being overly showy, but neither was she ever cheap. Her expression was her customary passive cunning, not unlike Sally Headshot in that they had the same zero tolerance for the tedious formalities of other people that always seemed to somehow be holding them back from more practical efficiency. Even Clara's first words conveyed the same sad old attitude, You summoned me, my king? Jim told his table, Excuse me for just a moment. He turned his full attention to Dr. Clara, I received a report this morning from housekeeping. When Grace had her people sanitize the medical center, they did a regular inventory. The numbers do not match up. Several cases of medical supplies appear to have gone missing. Clara was a brilliant woman by every standard. She leaped to an educated guess, the only thing we have worth stealing by the case would be oxycodone. Being no fool either, Jim skipped right past confirming her guess by asking, you wouldn't happen to know where it has gone? The doctor's expression was such stone that actual rock would have given more away. To complete her point, she replied, your sense of humor is lost on me. If your next ludicrous suggestion is that Mandy was behind the theft, I don't believe that to be the case either. Like myself, she would never get involved in such petty nefariousness. We both have quite privileged positions in this wonderful community. As for myself, I have grown quite attached to my head, and would never risk it over something as pedestrian as drug dealing. My thoughts exactly, Jim agreed with her behind a totally real pleasant smile. Claren understood him perfectly. He believed she would never lower herself to such petty villainy especially because the severity of her punishment would be on the side of extreme. Jim had never forgotten her collaboration with the president during his reign of madness in Denver. Clara would live a life of angelic honesty and goodwill toward men, or Jim would have her burned alive. It seems that we have a bit of a mystery then, Jim commented to all present. While Critias and Carmen are away along with Verloc, the only marshal available would be Juke. I'm not sure his skills would be ideal for solving a crime such as this, especially since he is not that familiar with the people of our city. Jim looked to Alice, are you capable of taking this on? The theft of essential medical supplies is a serious matter. Such treason to our community could carry rather severe punishments, doubly so if the guilty hold positions of considerable responsibility. As proof that she was up to the challenge, Alice said to Jim, I was the one who found those pills in the quarantine field hospital inside the hotel beside Radio City. I know which pills you are talking about. At the time, I learned that they are powerful painkillers. I was to keep them locked up because people would feel tempted to abuse them for the purposes of getting high. That being true, I do not believe they qualify as essential medical supplies. Whoever took them, almost certainly thought that when they did it. I also know that not everyone was thrilled about your decisions to approve all the drinking, drug use, and red door trade that is going on in the city. You are partly responsible. I don't think it is at all fair to call this crime an act of treason. She has a point, Jack agreed with her logic. Jim saw no reason to haggle over those trivialities immediately. He told Alice, 
I am not asking you to line people up and give them a firing squad. Find out who took the pills and if possible, recover all that are left. They took a lot of them, far too many to have used them all up. Once you have solved this, we can talk about what to do with them. When Alice just stood there with nothing to say, Jim added, you can start right now if you like. Duke told Alice, if you plan to confront anyone, let me know so I can back you up. I don't want you getting hurt if they get rough about it. Or you can call me, Oleg offered in his thick accent. It might be someone tough that he couldn't handle. It was his deliberate jab at Duke reckoning their brief brawl in Carmen's apartment. Thank you, both, Alice replied. I will keep you in mind for help if the need comes up. Actually solving the crime was something that Alice had not worked out yet. She knew that Grace's decontamination staff had scrubbed down the medical center already, so there wouldn't be much in the way of physical evidence. There were the security cameras around the city, but if those could solve the crime, Kevin would have done that himself. Besides, whoever took the pills would know about the cameras and gone about it in an inconspicuous way. Alice felt certain that the way to solve the mystery was with smart thinking rather than with legwork. She headed for Funland as she thought about the problem. Since it was morning and she was hungry, Alice figured that she may as well have a good breakfast. As she walked, Alice used her helmet hood to tell her about oxycodone, it gave her a bunch of chemical diagrams that she couldn't comprehend, but imagined Carmen would tell her that she should learn. Even if Alice was not educated enough to understand something, Carmen had taught her that smart person things existed at all because they were useful if you took the time to understand them. Her database did have a warning section that explained that the drug was addictive and that at least in the place where the helmet came from, it was a controlled contraband. From there she found something interesting. Among the clusters of red eyes on her helmet, two of them were spectroscopic lasers. According to what she read, people who took oxycodone would exude traces of it from their sweat and urine along with something called metabolites, sort of a byproduct from having it in their body. Her helmet came right out and offered her the option of making a spectroscopic analysis of anything she could see. In the same way that her helmet had detected those pressure-sensitive explosive residues that day in the building at the power cable yard, Alice could just scan for oxycodone instead. Anyone who had been eating it, sniffing it, or injecting it, would be sweating it. And it would be as plain as writing on their face, if you had the spectroscopic lasers to see it, which she did. Funland was busy when Alice arrived. The tray line and the tables were full of people, everyone getting their breakfast. She didn't even make it so far as the nearest tables when her helmet locked onto one target, then three more, and finally another. From the viewpoint of her helmet's technology, the investigation wasn't even a challenge. Far from a rush of victorious pleasure, Alice experienced a sensation of nausea born of great sadness. The people involved in the pill theft were not fundamentally different from anyone else. They had the same sort of smiles, the same jobs as other people, and shared the same friends. Two of the people she tracked were members of Stig's GNP. Alice still had a clear recollection of when Commander Stig killed Herman Clark, just beat him to death with an aluminum baseball bat. She wasn't entirely sure what Stig was going to do with the GNP pill thieves when he found out, but killing them was not impossible, and maybe not even unlikely considering his more serious temperament of late. Three of the other people involved worked in Commander Derek's construction crews. Those men sat together, which was what made Alice feel certain that it wasn't some honest mistake like perhaps Clara had genuinely prescribed the medication for one of them. The men being together was reason enough for her to assume that one of them was supplying the others. When she considered that, Alice decided that what she really wanted to know was who had stolen the cases of pills in the first place. That original thief would be the ringleader. After she got her breakfast tray, Alice took a seat off by herself in a place where she had a view of all the diners as they came and went. There was no need to keep her helmet on while it continued scanning. Alice propped it up on a napkin dispenser so that it faced in the proper direction and then she silently ate her meal. Two more people came up as positive in her scan by the time breakfast was over and everyone had gone off to their morning work shifts. Both of them were women in the laundry service. Like the people she had already found, they were just typical members of the community. Alice could only wonder how they found themselves in a gang of criminals. She considered taking what she knew to someone, maybe to Jim or to Jack, but Alice finally decided against it. The cases of pills were still around somewhere and she also wanted to know who had stolen them in the first place. From the information she had already, Alice thought it was unlikely that men from the construction services could come and go from the medical center inconspicuously. On the other hand, a woman from the laundry service could pass through the medical center as part of their job, and even have a laundry bin that was large enough to hide the crates in and then take them anywhere without anyone being the wiser. The laundry service was mostly inside the customs house. They did have clean linen and clothing storage in various places around the city. 
the older and now smaller laundry service was still at Forager's Castle. All of the equipment was still in use as the service found it convenient. Alice decided to start her search in the customs house since she was already there. As she walked, she studied her HUD interface for a way to use her spectroscopic scanner to find pills. The pills would still be in bottles and those bottles would likely still be inside boxes. The thieves would probably have hidden those boxes inside some cabinet or other out-of-the-way place. As it turned out, her helmet did have another means for detecting hazardous materials and contraband substances. Her mask came equipped with an artificial nose. The nanoscale synthetic nostrils were capable of detecting the faintest particle of illicit substance unhampered by any other odors that would mask detection from how a human sense of smell functioned. Alice could even use both detection methods simultaneously. It wasn't much of a revelation when Alice found the two suspect women from breakfast working together in the laundry plant. They both still glowed with oxycodone contamination as traces of it leaked from their every pore. The Delta Helmet's chemical sniffer proved insightful as it led her attention to the employee lockers. Laundry was a decontamination service, which required the workers to practice safety protocols. Their casual clothes and personal items went into their lockers during their shifts. Alice's mechanical nose told her that each of the women had pills in their locker, likely a bottle of them each. Alice's possible motives for being in that work area were anything but inherently inconspicuous. The women noticed that Alice had come in and the way she made a beeline for the lockers where they were hiding stolen medical supplies. Fortunately, Alice observed them watching her intently. Being cautious and using duplicitous cunning was something that life in Denver had drilled into Alice to masterful levels. She headed right over their way and then Alice asked them directly, Have you seen any rat droppings? The women glanced at each other in confusion. One of them asked, Rat droppings? Yeah, Alice groaned. I'm supposed to complete a vermin inspection. Rat droppings would mean that rats are getting in. Have you seen any? The women fell for the ruse and both quickly agreed that there were no rat droppings in their work area. Another worker who had nothing to do with the pills said, We check the traps at the end of every shift when we take out the trash. There has not been a rat down here in ages. On her way out, Alice took another direction that would be faster for getting to Smuggler's Passage. She wanted to pass through Radio City and then take the new land bridge into Forager's Castle. That hallway took her past the nearby detergent storage room. The strong lingering traces of oxycodone wafted through the humidity vent at the base of the door. Alice went in, followed the scent trail, and then found the cases of unopened pill bottles concealed behind boxes of laundry detergent. Decontamination services used in industrial bulk detergent they took from the hotel. The small homeowner size boxes had come from foraging. They were just in storage for some day when the laundry service might need them. A two-wheeled cargo dolly was in the room. The workers used it for easily moving about the five-gallon plastic buckets they filled with the powdered detergent. Alice loaded up the pill boxes onto the dolly and then wheeled them away. As Alice reached to switch off the light, she saw a clipboard hanging on the wall beside the door. It had a sheaf of papers where the workers signed out each of the buckets of detergent that they removed from the room. Grace was a stickler for exacting procedures and stringent record keeping, which if nothing else, helped her weed out people with sloppy habits who were unsuitable for working with contaminated materials. For Alice, the advantage was that only the same three workers had ever signed out any of the detergent and only one of them was also one of her suspects. It was the clue she needed for knowing just who it was who had originally stolen the pills from the medical center. Typical of human nature, the thief had hidden the pills in a familiar place, one they could visit freely and was secure enough to be suitable for hiding them. Alice ended up back home because she couldn't decide on anywhere else to go. None of the people who saw her along the way were privy to her investigation. They thought nothing of the boxes she had with her. At the door to her parents' apartment was one of Derek's carpenters. He used his cordless drill to tighten the last screw on the new coffee table he had assembled from the box. So much stuff came into the city on the Commodore's trains, that most anything that traveled in boxes could be available in quantity, new furniture included. When Alice saw that the man was not radiating oxycodone contamination, she walked up and gave him a strong hug even before he had a chance to explain what he was doing. You're so wonderful for this, Alice told him genuinely. She opened the door and then pushed it wide so that he could slide the new table inside. It's nothing, he said surprised by her enthusiasm. Oleg said you needed a new one and here it is. While he labored with the table, Alice remembered that Carmen had purchased some of Emperor Nick's bottled beer from the commissary and put it in the refrigerator for Critias. She got one and then offered it to the carpenter. Take this as thanks. He gratefully accepted the bottle, but then set it aside for a moment. The carpenter still needed to muscle the new table into final position. It appeared that Mandy and Darla had already cleaned up the mess of the old table. 
the wreckage had gone down the uncontaminated trash chute on its way to the incinerator. By some stroke of luck, none of the knickknacks Carmen had acquired during her stay in quarantine were actually broken. In a moment, he had the new table set in place and the living room was back to normal. Once Alice was alone, she slumped into the couch and then put her mech suit boots up on the new coffee table. Just looking at the boots made her think of Carmen. She had loved the boots. They were the only thing that Carmen had liked about the armored suit that Alice got from Critias instead. She gave Alice the boots to complete the set, because Carmen did love Alice. If there was anyone that Alice could talk to about what was going on, it would be Carmen. She had tried to save Herman Clark from his self-destructive choices. It wasn't in Carmen's nature to want to see all those people executed for their treason of stealing essential medical supplies as Jim had described it. When Alice sent Carmen a communication request, she promptly got back an invitation to enter a virtual environment. All of the apartment dissolved until only the couch and coffee table remained as they were with Alice still in her seat. The new room was an unfathomable black space. Off to her left where the door to her parents' bedroom used to be, was a rotating pillar comprised of semi-transparent digital document pages, sort of like an orderly tornado of data. Seemingly at random, some of the pages would fly away from the digital cyclone to take their place in hanging collages of other documents. A whole legion of Carmen clones moved around Alice. Sometimes they admired the collages of documents and other times they were doing strange things like one that scooped up handfuls of snow before she sprinkled it back down to disappear into the dark floor. One distant Carmen battled with a translucent verloc. The fight seemed to be some kind of loop where Verloc always grabbed Carmen's hair. Sometimes Verloc would manage to break Carmen's neck, actually turning her head around backwards. Other times, Carmen would acrobatically twirl Verloc bodily about over her head and then throw her to vanish into the black nothingness. Alice asked, what is this all about? I'm sleeping in this morning, said another Carmen copy, this one just appeared beside Alice on the couch. I like the new coffee table. A flock of data pages flew from the digital cyclone to form another collage. Another Carmen copy appeared to start studying it. The friendly couch Carmen commented, it seems that having Bobby stay over has caused quite a mess. A moment later she added, I see you found out about the oxycodone ring. It was only a matter of time. You knew? Alice asked in surprise. She didn't mean about Bobby, but about the drugs. When Alice let Bobby stay over in her room, she had positioned her Delta helmet to be overlooking her bed. Alice knew that Carmen would always be able to watch over them. Another Carmen appeared to catch a document from the air. She paused to say, I know lots of things. You only just found out about this one thing, and look how unsettling it is for you. Couch Carmen continued, If I allowed myself to know everything that I know, it would just drive me crazy. I have thought about it, about keeping myself ignorant, thought about it thoroughly in fact. Let she who is without sin cast the first stone, and all that. I don't want to run around all day every day punishing people for every rule they break, all the lies they tell, their illicit romantic affairs. It is better that I don't tell myself and instead focus on my own life and bettering myself. She confessed, most of the time anyway. Alice got up off the couch and then walked around a bit to examine some of the other things. At the end of the room where the kitchen would have been, there was a sort of mirage where Carmen was asleep in a bed next to Critias. It wasn't any room that Alice had ever seen before, so she guessed that was their new place in Nevada. As she watched, some bird-like flying data pages headed that way, only to bounce off some kind of invisible barrier. On the other side of the force field, that Carmen was aware of nothing but Critias and their marriage. He was like the shadow that blocked out the sun that was all the chaos and information on the side with Alice. Having seen it, it suddenly made a lot more sense. One of the Carmens had just said that knowing too much was driving her crazy. When Carmen was folding under the pressure of it, she ran to Critias to block it all out. When she was with him, she didn't have to think about oxycodone thefts and 10,000 other things that were flying about, literally. When Alice reached out with her gauntlet, she discovered that she could grab one of the digital documents and hold it in her hand. It was Carmen's memory of a newspaper she had found while clearing out the ruined hotel. The headline read, Notorious Mob Boss. Fat Jack Lawrence and his underboss headshot Sally Russo enter the federal court building today to face charges of murder, racket airing, and bribery. There was a good picture too. It was obviously Jack only at least a hundred pounds heavier. Sally was there also. She was right beside him. Alice gestured the document toward a Carmen, is this for real, Jack and Sally were gangsters? A new Carmen answered, lots of people in the city were something else before this. A lot of them did much worse things. I don't see any need to know about it. It would only give me anxiety. The Jack that I know about is a good man, a father to me. That is all that matters. 
Another Carmen reasoned, if people who used to be bad can become good, then people who are bad now can still become good someday. Yet another Carmen who stood at a collage asked herself, what about the people I killed in the striker armored vehicle? One of her counterparts replied, I don't know who was inside it. I don't know how many were inside it. I don't even know if they were men or women. They don't even know they are dead, another Carmen observed. The missile killed them faster than the nerve conduction of their realization. They never even knew I was their enemy to hate me for it or want revenge. Another Carmen said, I showed Cutter how to disable the main weapon so that Critias would not need to use the Hellfire missile. Yet another Carmen complained, they were already in retreat. I killed them anyway while they were running away. Alice boldly walked over to that collage and then began pulling down all the data pages about the striker vehicle Carmen had destroyed. You don't want to know about any of this, Alice demanded with real confidence that Carmen should accept her decision. Bad things happen to bad people while they are doing bad things. It is an occupational hazard. You belong to your family and your friends, not to these wicked ghosts who brought their troubles onto themselves. Rather than agree as such, the Carmen copies associated with that issue, simply vanished. A different Carmen asked, what do you want to do about the Oxycodone conspiracy? It seemed obvious enough that this Carmen, the mechanical Carmen, knew everything Carmen knew while the organic person who was also a Carmen remained asleep. Alice asked, how many more people are involved that I don't know about yet? Two data pages flew out of the digital cyclone so that Alice could catch them. One of the pages identified another employee in decontamination services as a conspirator, a man this time. Alice didn't know him as such, but he was definitely a hard-working person who made a significant contribution to the community. The other page was the kitchen sauce chef who worked under Gabriella, who was Emperor Nick Sue's chef apprentice. Another Carmen clone appeared and she said, those pills don't have any real value. Everyone involved in the conspiracy is a functional addict. They are users more than abusers. How is it any worse than Jam binging on alcohol or Tony Banjo being a chronic abuser of any drugs that he gets his hands on? Alice had to ask, has Tony or Jam been taking any of those pills? A new Carmen appeared to shrug non-committally, not from any of the pills Jim considers stolen. It is not officially a crime to own them or to take them. That people stole pills from the medical supplies was the crime in this situation. The frustration of it all was getting to Alice. It made her appreciate the pressure that Carmen was under when she lived with awareness of far more troubling information than Alice could even imagine. Alice pleaded with Carmen, we have to do something. We can't just let them destroy themselves. Should I let you use drinking and pills to blot out your problems? Another Carmen warned, you cannot change fate, only how you feel about it. If you interfere with people's lives, expose their problems, take away their crutches, it could end up being your fault when they kill themselves. Wouldn't you rather be their friend and make the most of the time that they have? Alice realized that the advice was not baseless. She demanded, who is planning on killing themselves? Mechanical intelligence Carmen who was never asleep and always fully aware of all information, apparently didn't have any reservations about exposing Alice to unfiltered reality. She caused another digital page to fly down from the whirlwind so that Alice could catch it. The page represented knowledge about an oil painting. It was an old painting where Carmen came from but did not even exist yet in Alice's time. What it showed was mostly familiar, enough for Alice to recognize it. She saw the Omiyot grinder and the city bridge. There was a vast ocean of ghouls all in a frenzy, just packed shoulder to shoulder, reaching up with hands clenched like claws. The railway crane boom was there and it supported a kind of flying platform where musicians in a band had set up to perform their music right over that ferocious horde. The band was the three Japanese ambassadors and their personas as the outrageous death metal band they called the Crazy Samurai Bitches. The important part was that Tony Banjo was with them too, only he was diving off the platform into the ghouls, doing it on purpose. Tony stage dived into the waiting arms of many thousands of ghouls. They would tear him up so completely that their murderous hunger would leave nothing left at all, it was perfectly horrible. It will be totally metal, said another Carmen appreciatively. Tony becomes a legend worshipped by socially disturbed young people for centuries to come. It will be his greatest show ever and in the end he gives himself to his fans, to join them in Amiot. Alice didn't need to think about it at all. She already knew what to think and yelled at the nearest Carmen, we are in this for the good fight. I don't have to win, but I have to try. Jam is drinking too much and Tony is encouraging it. If being a marshal means anything, it has to mean that we try. We are the ones who push back. If I end up being the one who pushes them off the cliff, at least they will know that I cared enough to try. The same goes for you. Was it Critias who told you to blow up those people? Well, good. They were using that big monster tank thing to crush people and shoot at them. 
they got exactly what they deserved. I am proud of what you do and I want you to be proud of me too. If someone needs to knock some heads together to keep everyone else from going crazy, then we are just the people to do it. I actually let you convince me that you have some kind of bad temper. You don't. You just see things that no one else can and lots of people need a good kick in the pants to straighten them out. This oxycodone thing is totally unacceptable and I am not going to let it slide. One way or another, I am going to confront the problem, because that is what you should do too. A new Carmen appeared to give some advice, Kevin believes that perception is the only reality. Perhaps that painting has another story behind it besides the one that my history tells. For me, Tony killed himself on that night, the night that King Louis declared total war on the ghouls. If you can figure out a way to cheat fate, I will gladly help you. I would like to change things for me too. Alice had found herself, not only as a marshal, but as a member of her family. She couldn't hug Carmen in the virtual world, but with her gauntlets, she could feel her hands when she took them. You take care of Critias and get your mission done, Alice said with heartfelt compassion for her mother's heavy burdens. I will take care of things here. Like so many startled birds, all of Carmen's digital pages burst into flight, plunging into the data cyclone as though escaping some predator and then the whole of it sank into a single point in the floor like a Ginny's smoker returning to its lamp. Alice understood that it meant that Carmen was waking up completely and she didn't want to stress her mother into dark thoughts that were of no benefit to her waking life. I'll talk to you again soon, Alice promised. Tell Critias that I send my love. With that said, Alice returned to her real life. She brought the pills with her and she left the apartment and then headed for Kevin's control room. The officer's meeting was long over by that time. The room was just its regular business with all of Kevin's ladies doing record keeping and messaging for all the various departments and their personnel. Not only did Kevin know she had found the pills, but he was waiting for Alice to walk in the door. He was an android too, no less than Carmen was, and being older and more emotionally stable, he stayed abreast of Carmen's mind and Alice's Delta Gear helmet too. Well done, Kevin congratulated her. I am curious as to why you brought them here. We don't store medical supplies. This was the first stop on my way out of King's Tower, Alice explained the simple convenience of it. I need you to send out a general alert message for me. Everyone in the city needs to be aware that possession of oxycodone and in whatever names you know of, is now a banned contraband. They have 24 hours to turn in what they have to Dr. Clara. After that, I will collect it myself and give the offender jailhouse confinement for all their free time for 30 days. Once they have a moment for that to sink in. Send another message that everyone involved with the stolen pills will turn themselves into Jack as soon as their work shift ends. If I have to collect them tomorrow, I am going to shoot them. I don't want it to come to that, so you could mention that I already know all nine of their names. It would be a shame if I have to kill anyone just because they thought they had slipped through the cracks. Kevin asked, have you cleared this with Jack or Jim? I have not, Alice answered with complete confidence in her authority. I will trust in you to word the messages properly. Since the penalty for not turning themselves in is death, I want them to understand that their willing confessions will earn them punishments of a lesser severity. Okay, Kevin agreed. Alice went down to the lobby. By the time that she arrived with the dolly and the cases of pills, a large number of people had gathered there and were gazing at their cell phones, reading the messages that Alice had requested Kevin to send. Even Jim had gotten the decrees and he was there in the lobby with Hatchet. When Jim faced Alice, he commented, Nine of them. He shook his head sadly at the weight of that, Jim worried that having to deal with so many was probably going to undermine the harmony of the community. Jack needs to make their punishments mercifully reasonable, Alice declared so that the people around the lobby would overhear her. As the marshal assigned with this case, I serve your laws, and your laws serve this community. It seems you have made a new law, Jim observed neutrally. Alice reasoned, now that those pills have already become a real threat to the lives in this community, nine in particular. They have become contraband to protect the common good. Jim questioned her reasoning again, and the nine? They did do something incredibly stupid, Alice admitted. The common good remains the most important consideration that I am trying to protect. I would only hurt everyone else if I allowed their punishments to get blown out of proportion. All of the people involved in the theft are good at their jobs and popular with their co-workers. Harming them excessively for their poor judgment is not going to make a single person happy, and would offend more than a few. Jim looked at his phone again to reread Alice's message and then he asked her, would a month in the jailhouse cells, only getting out for work shifts, be enough of a spanking to show the general displeasure over their sticky fingers? It is if they turn themselves in, Alice replied. You will be spared the nuisance of a trial if they all confess to their misdeeds, apologize for them, and then accept their deserved punishment. 
After a moment, she reaffirmed her threat, unless they don't turn themselves in, in which case I am going to hunt them down like ghouls and then shoot them just as I warned. I see a world of difference between good family friends who have made a stupid mistake, and unrepentant criminals preying on us like the pirates do. Just as she mentioned pirates, one of the decontamination workers came along and tried to get past them with a large load of clean towels. With the way everyone surreptitiously had closed into eavesdrop on the conversation, she had to wait for some open space. It was potentially more awkward because the woman was Ziva, the former pirate with a young son miraculously rescued by the good Dr. Kine. Instead of showing any bias towards Ziva because of her former pirate affiliations, Alice promptly paused her conversation with Jim and then stepped aside to make plenty of room. Ziva begged pardon, don't mind me. You are doing something important. Not at all, Alice insisted. You are part of this community and doing your job in your assigned workspace. That makes you good as a king in my eyes. We are the ones in your way. Ziva glanced over at Jim to witness his reaction since she worried he would take it as an insult that his own position was no better than a former pirate carrying towels. Jim promptly took a step back and then raised his hands to show that he had nothing to say to contradict what Alice said. It made the woman smile as she passed and then went on about her business. With that out of the way, Jim congratulated Alice, well done. I had not expected you to resolve all this so quickly or so insightfully. When something comes up again, I will know I can count on you to take care of it. I will take these back to the medical center, Alice said about the boxes of pills. She took hold of the handles on her dolly and then wheeled it off on her way. Chapter 2. Prayers by Night Colonel Hiram Davis had his people remove the heavy weapons from the captured Special Forces dune buggy before they loaded in some canned water and food. With an audible hint of doubt, Hiram asked Talbot, we are going to hear from you again? It wasn't a matter of trust so much as one of sanity. Talbot had driven the Bradley fighting vehicle into combat for them as Ray operated the Bushmaster chain gun. That was definite proof Talbot wasn't an agent of Groom Lake. The sentiently infected man's repeated demands that he not be around after dark was reason enough for Hiram to be skeptical. In a few days, Talbot pledged his return. I will contact my friends, tell them about your council of governors. Cutter, Verloc, and Romeo were present too. Talbot told the giant, I will tell them about you and your friends. I'm sure that they will want to meet you. There are not that many people around anymore that we can cooperate with. It will be a good thing for everyone involved. Verloc offered a suggestion, Romeo and I could go with you now, and meet these friends of yours. You are not the only people in the world with special circumstances. We would be fine. No, Talbot barked too quickly, but then calmed himself as though it was not a sign of a problem with him. No, he said again only at ease. I need some time to see to my own business. I promise to return with the others in a few days. Hiram submitted by saying, if you hadn't helped Ray and Cutter, we might not be alive right now. What's yours is yours, and your business is your own. Good luck to you. We hope to see you again. You will, Talbot pledged with a handsome easy smile. Don't worry. Cutter went on ahead into the road tunnel, I will get the doors for him. The titanic armored railway gate at the end of the tunnel stood open by the time Talbot arrived in the dune buggy. Forever is a long time to live, Cutter commented to the watcher before the man drove away into the desert. If you decide to run off and just forget about us, we will bump into each other again eventually. Talbot affixed his goggles and then wrapped his head and face with a desert dweller's kefi scarf. Once he finished, he promised Cutter, we make a good team. I will be back. The others will be interested too. I am thinking that your scientist can help us the same way he helped you. Dr. Kine can help all of you, Cutter assured him. All of my friends can help you make a better life for yourselves. After a leisurely drive up the lower portal road, Talbot pushed a music disc into the high-end stereo. As he went down the highway, he sang along with Bing Crosby who would rather swing on a star. When Talbot reached the airport, it was a ghoul-infested mess worse than ever. The loud explosions, gunshots, and smoking fires from the battle had lured in the infected from over a wide area. All the dead bodies of the Groom Lake gunmen were the meat for the ghouls to eat and encouraged them to stay. It would be a good while before the humans could finally return for any reason, like transferring fuel from the Hercules transport plane. The infected had that area overrun to the degree that Talbot had to slow down to a crawl. He patiently allowed the ghouls to swarm around his vehicle where they sniffed it over in their never-ending search for a potential prey. Infected had no real interest in watchers or in dune buggies. Talbot eventually made it past them and then returned to where he had left his motorcycle. He secured the buggy inside the large maintenance shed there. When Talbot could not get his motorcycle started, 
It took him a while to finally discover that Cutter had uncapped the spark plug when they first met. That made him think about the Bradley fighting vehicle he had driven for them. At the time, their speculations had been right that the track light tank had not come all the way from Groom Lake. Talbot was familiar with the enemy armory depot where the Groom Lake soldiers stored local equipment. He could assume that they were all dead now and that the place stood abandoned. It had other vehicles there with fuel reserves. There would be weapons with ammunition and food supplies that could be all his for the taking. Anyway, he needed a place to put all his stuff while he passed the night. That depot was not far away and it would be perfect for his needs. The Groom Lake Supply Depot had once been the garage portion of a wealthy man's villa. The rocky hills at the back of the property were not really mountains, but only because of their size, which was on the scale of hills. The rock face was large enough that the builder had tunneled back into it so that the line of huge garages were as spacious underground as they already were on the outside, all in heavy stucco-covered concrete. The original owner had space enough for storing two private airplanes, numerous exotic cars, assorted watercraft, sport terrain vehicles, and a fully outfitted tool shop. The man-sized door into the garages was a keyless affair where a pad had metal push buttons that would accept a code, the numbers to solve the lock were on the door itself, scratched there into the paint. Ghouls couldn't read or operate complex devices, and the Groom Lake soldiers didn't know that the watchers were aware of their little outpost that was in the middle of nowhere out in the desert. Talbot opened the door to find a gun barrel pointed into his face. The Groom Lake caravan of soldiers had left behind three guards to secure their bunker while the rest of them took combat vehicles from the storage and then went off to make war. Strict radio silence kept their enemies unaware and succeeded in keeping the three surviving guards a secret from Carmen, but it had also left them entirely ignorant of what had happened to their friends. It was a small miracle that none of the guards recognized Talbot as they pulled off his scarf to expose his face. If they had known who he was, they would have killed him immediately. Instead, they leaped to the simplest explanation. After they ushered him inside away from the prying eyes of wandering ghouls, the leader of their group sneered as he asked, Where do you think you are going? His weaselly companion snickered, Maybe he is looking for King Louis in a can? Not so smart now that we have taken back the dam. Talbot delicately replied, I believe it was Prince Albert that came in a can. As far as the dam is concerned, it is still in their possession. The army that your leaders sent to retake it never managed to get out of the airport. The sniveling man whimpered with dread, you killed them all? Me? Talbot innocently shook his head no. I only heard about it second hand. I'm obviously not a soldier. They took a large number of your people alive, with the intention of recruiting them into their own army. It might be the three of you that needs to consider where you are going. If you don't join them, you may find it difficult to stay here indefinitely. The third guard said, we need to drive back ourselves. If we get there before they do, we could. We could what? The leader asked his man contemptuously. There isn't enough of us left to stop them now. He considered that a moment, unless he is lying and they didn't lose at all. The fighting is over, Talbot explained with simple logic. Get on the radio and call the dam. You only need to listen to who answers and then when you see that I am telling the truth, you tell them you want to change sides. That plan was reasonable enough, but the leader remained suspicious. What are you doing out here? How did you even know we were here at all? Talbot didn't have a good lie, so he tried the truth, I had no idea anyone was here. This is an obviously secure building in an out-of-the-way place, and someone scratched the lock code right on the door. It seemed like something that looters would have done. There was a good chance that I might find food and water in here. The leader pressed him for more information, yeah, but that doesn't explain why you left the dam and came all the way out here, if your people were still in control of it and all of mine were dead at the airport. Thinking fast. Talbot tried to use more truth because that was always the most convincing. They shot down an antique propeller fighter plane near the airport. It came out this way when it was on fire. Someone said that they had seen a parachute. They argued that a pilot is worth 20 regular people. I drew the short straw, so they made me come out here to look for him. When I saw it would be dark soon, I came across this place. I figured that I would take shelter for the night, try again in the morning. Farrell, the Weasley guard blurted out. They shot him down and he is out there. Maybe we should go look for him. The leader didn't give a shit about that man Farrell. Fuck him, he said dismissively. What are the odds that he would even still be alive, coming down from the sky, in the daytime? The munchers would have been chowing down on his ass within minutes. The man did believe the story though, which made him stop thinking about why Talbot was out and about. None of the three men was all that sharp in the brains department. Their rampant stupidity explained why the others had left them behind. No one was thinking they were useful men to have around in an emergency. 
even if he was no genius, the leader of the men came to a quick decision, we are taking the sky back to the dam. If our people have captured it, we will be fine. If their people still have control of it, he can talk to them, tell them we didn't rough him up, and then we can join them. We can't stay here, and going back home is just postponing the inevitable. They will be taking that too and would cut off the power anyway. The jittery guard paced a bit before he said, all of the armored vehicles are gone. He didn't like the idea of going for a drive in any of the vehicles they had available. At that end of the connected garages was the tool shop, which still had all of its equipment intact. The only vehicle at that end was a four-door Range Rover that was extraordinarily nice aside from not having any armor, every other vehicle was progressively less suitable from there, being too sporty and fragile for survival use. Talbot moved slowly to avoid startling them when he checked his wristwatch. Not liking what he saw, he cautioned them, it is getting dark. It might be best to wait until morning. He showed a little nervous anxiety as he realized that plan was not going to help him either. So long as they trapped him in the same room they occupied, there was going to be serious trouble. The leader was not even listening to Talbot as he told the other two, grab your stuff. The rover is plenty good for getting us to the dam. It is safer in the dark because they can't see us driving from miles away. We can use the CB along the way to get a hold of them. This guy can let them know we are coming. The two guards rushed off to collect their personal baggage they wanted to take with them. While they were away, the leader headed for the Range Rover. He told Talbot, come on so I can keep an eye on you. Talbot did follow him, only in a slow and awkward gait. He checked his watch again as he shuffled his feet in a broken walk. The garages had skylights for illumination. Such was the great flatness of the desert country that the sun setting and darkness taking over was precipitous. Talbot glanced up at the skylight to see that night had come and then his eyes went back down nervously to his watch. That was when Talbot turned over his wrist where he saw the horrific thing he dreaded most, a luminous pentacle of supernatural evil that pulsed with hellish light on the palm of his hand. Solar-charged electric lights clicked on when the Fenrir of night fully consumed the sun. Something was out of sorts with the electrical system because the fluorescent tubes hummed and blinked with uncertain ballasts. They all didn't flutter to the same rhythm such that it was an epileptic confusion to the eye. The guard leader never turned around to look back as though he believed that Talbot was too docile and too committed to common interests to betray him. From the guard's point of view, they would soon become members of the same community, perhaps even friends someday. For his part, Talbot had no thoughts of betrayal. His watcher madness had escaped from its subconscious gauge and ran rampant through his senses. Even as he slowly paced behind the guard, Talbot watched his fingers lengthen and sprout curved black claws sharp and glossy as obsidian. Dark hair erupted from his skin as he grew into an abomination that was equal parts wolf and man. His lycanthropy eroded the humanity from his mind, making him predatory, merciless, and totally homicidal. Something about the breathing of Talbot made the guard leader pause, think for a thin moment, and then slowly turn around. Since Talbot was in fact entirely funny farm insane to the worst degree, the guard did not see any claws, fur, or glowing monster eyes, that was all in Talbot's deranged imagination. However, the guard was familiar with ghouls, humans gone ferociously crazed with murder lust. That perfectly described what he saw when he looked into Talbot's narrowed eyes that locked onto him with undivided malice. The other two guards heard the most terrified screaming of their leader as Talbot leaped on the man, forced him to the ground, and then bit a deep wound into the man's face. Lacking actual werewolf jaws and fangs, Talbot was not able to bite with any special effectiveness. In the strictest sense, Talbot was not a ghoul and as such he wasn't completely mindless. His insanity left him with a far greater measure of cunning and powers of reason such as any true wolf could possess. Even if Talbot was not especially lethal with his teeth, his adrenaline supercharged strength was a weapon in of itself. After the first bite, Talbot delivered another savage chomp into the man's throat that had him gushing out his life's blood. In his crazed state, Talbot easily jerked the guard up off the floor, pressed him up over his head, and then threw him right over the top of the Range Rover to land badly on the cement pavement some distance away. The mortally wounded guard clutched at the gash in his throat and made terrible gurgling sounds as his life passed away in fearful agony. The other two men had heard the screams and readily knew that it was their leader who had made them. They had no doubt that Talbot had to be the aggressor since there wasn't anyone else in the building. One of the guards rushed that way to help. He held his assault rifle at hip level as one would charge while holding a spear. The Weasley guard just stayed where he was, frantically turning his head this way and that in a panic, totally at a loss for what he should do. When the braver soldier reached his fallen leader, he found that the man had lapsed into shock and then bled out on the floor. He had seen enough ghoul bites to recognize them for what they were. 
What he never considered was that Talbot was a ghoul. The man had been totally human and rational only moments before. No one turned in the snap of a moment. Come help me. The braver guard called to his absent companion, there is a muncher in here somewhere. The cowardly guard spun in the direction of his companion's call only to find Talbot standing right behind him. The maniac's face had a glistening cover of fresh human blood. The guard's fear became so intense that he made a piercing feminine scream while he dropped his assault rifle to clatter on the floor. Talbot yanked the man's head over when he tried to bite his throat. It was so forceful an attack that he broke the man's neck and then laid it sideways across his shoulder. Even though he was already dead, Talbot bit him anyway. The last remaining soldier saw the car keys on the floor where their dead leader had dropped them. He snatched up the keys, dashed to get into the Range Rover, and then started up the engine. All the garage lights finally stayed on and clearly illuminated the place. The man put the Rover into drive and then ran the truck into the main garage door to just smash it right off its guide tracks. His truck did bust it open by breaking it loose from the bottom up until the Rover forced its way underneath to end up outside. The driver was in such a panic that he had his foot to the floor with the gas pedal. Once the rover got out on the sandy gravel, the wheels spun out and the vehicle began to fishtail. Believing he had successfully escaped, the last guard throttled back as he switched on the headlights so that he could see. What he saw in front of him was so awful and unexpected that the man's first assumption was that the enemy from inside the garage had somehow teleported to end up in front of him, as befitted a masked campground psycho slayer. Some strange person who was definitely not a wild goo stood out near where the lifeless frontage met with the desert highway. The figure wore military tactical gear in the form of boots, knee and elbow pads, and unhued desert camouflage. The costume had web gear straps, pouches, and such accoutrements typical of special operations commandos. The part where the figure's nature abandoned all sanity was that the man, the driver presumed it was a man, had the head of a dinosaur or some kind of iguana reptile. The guard's last swift thought as he tried to run the man down, was that West African warlords had used outrageous costumes to intimidate their enemies in war. Dinosaur Commando raised up his weapon, which was a break-action single-shot 40mm grenade launcher with a pistol grip. He discharged it like a handgun, which put the shell through the windshield of the Range Rover. It was an impressive truck in that the body of the vehicle withstood the explosion with stalwart resilience. All of the window glass, the leather interior, and the driver fared rather poorly in the fiery blast. As the momentum of the flaming rover continued in on its way to end up dead in the desert beyond the highway, Dinosaur Commando snapped down the barrel of his weapon and then loaded another shell from his bandolier of them. Talbot came rushing out of the broken garage door, still believing he was a werewolf. When he saw the Dinosaur Commando, Talbot closed on him at speed to kill him next, because killing people is what werewolves do. Dinosaur Commando did not seem impressed or concerned perhaps because he used a grenade launcher as a pistol. Within moments, Talbot leaped to tackle the dinosaur man, only the lizard-headed warrior struck first by shooting Talbot. A great rubbery mass of jelly smashed into Talbot's chest and knocked him right out of the air. It hit him with enough energy to leave him delirious. Talbot remained helpless for long enough that the dinosaur man walked over, pinned him down with a boot on his chest, and then forced a squeeze bottle of deadly liquid poison into Talbot's mouth. For any normal human who drank a gullet full of Arizona monk's hood tincture, they would have suffered delirium and then death. In Talbot's case, not only was he immune to such poisons because of his infected biology, he had also developed a strong personal resistance to it because of his many prior exposures. Whether or not wolf Spain had any practical effect on real werewolves, on pretend ones it quite efficaciously reversed their transformation into a monster and returned them to their natural civilized form. As he came back to his senses, Talbot honestly had no memory of anything he had done while rampaging as a werewolf. Once he blinked the confusion out of his eyes, Talbot complained, ow, and put his hand to his chest where the spongy projectile had hit him so hard. He glanced up at the dinosaur man, which was a costume mask of course. Talbot knew his friend Dosh very well since he was one of the other watchers in his close-knit club of them. It was not within the powers of Talbot's watcher madness to be aware of his own insanity, but he had no trouble seeing into the madness of his friend Dosh. The rubber reptile mask was what Dosh believed to be his real face, or at least that was what his real face appeared to be in his own mind. Dosh believed that he was an extraterrestrial bounty hunter, apparently from a planet of reptilian humanoids. Talbot made a point not to get too personal with the backstories of his friends since they were always so touchy about them, and really, what did it matter to Talbot anyway? When you didn't come back on time, Dosh hissed, the professor sent me to find you. He knew that you would be needing your medicine. To show what he meant. Dosh offered Talbot the squeeze bottle. That information let Talbot piece together what had happened to him. 
he had been planning to spend the night alone in the desert and then return to his friends in the morning when his lycanthropy episode had abated. Some men from the Groom Lake community had captured him, and then he had blacked out. Tao but wiped his mouth that was ghastly with a taste of his werewolf cure potion. When his hand came back covered in blood, he understood that the Groom Lake soldiers had paid the price for being too close when the transformation came upon him. Because of the blood that proved that Tauba had killed, Dosh gestured toward the distant fire that was the burning rover. They were Mar Lake men, he said meaning the enemies of the Watchers none of them cared about anyway. They must have captured you on your way back. There are new people, Tauba told him as he got up unsteadily. Good people have taken over the dam. They defeated the army that came to take it back. Some of them are King Louis people from the radio, and other groups that joined him. A few of them are also immune like we are. They want to be friends and make a deal. I spent some time with them. That is why I was late getting back. Dosh couldn't show his expressions through the costume dinosaur mask, but he was having diminished interest in what went on at the dam. The professor paid me to bring you back, Dosh said trying to sound reptilian, which didn't mean much when reptiles did not speak anyway. His point actually was that once he took pay to complete a mission, he followed through. Talbot was coming back with him whether he liked it or not. After Talbot glanced around to see that his motorcycle was still where he left it and undamaged, he asked, How did you find me out here anyway? All Dosh had to do was gesture to the ground nearby. There was a totally obvious set of tracked vehicle prints that ran between the garage and the airport. The heavy machine had just recently made the trip and no one else ever used the sand-blown roads. Tank treads had left a trail that anyone could effortlessly follow. It didn't take an alien bounty hunter to track him down, even if one had. Before long, they were both on their motorcycles and riding off at a safe speed to return to the base of their clan. A few hours after sunset, Josh delivered Talbot to an isolated ranch deep in the northern desert. It was on the outskirts of the Groom Lake territory that their clan had once cooperated with. The property had belonged to a wealthy sheep herdsman. It had a main house that was large and comfortable. Wind turbines and solar panels provided electrical service. Pumps brought up clean well water and a thermosiphon system heated it. The watcher they knew as Professor Carnegie sat on the front porch of the house where he occupied a rocking chair, puffed on a smoking pipe, and admired the lush density of the unfettered stars. Here he is, Dosh told the professor. I had to give him his medicine. A few of the lake men captured him. When the moon rose, none of them survived. It was difficult for Dosh to know if Professor Carnegie just rocked in his chair, nodded his head, or both. There is something else, Dosh informed Carnegie. The warriors of King Louis have made their move and taken control of the dam. The lake men assembled an army to take it back, only King Louis had been ready for them. From what I saw at the dam's airfield, most of the lake men are dead, and the rest captured. I would have been home on time, Talbot said apologetically, but I met one of King Louis's soldiers and they invited me to join them. I aided them at the airfield battle and then returned with them to the dam. They have resistant carriers among them, only they also have a doctor, a man named Kine who is resistant too, and he has a treatment, a cure of sorts, so that they are no longer carriers. They live openly with the other survivors without posing a risk to them. A cure for asymptomatic carriers, Carnegie paraphrased the news to show that he paid attention and was genuinely interested. Anything else? The one I spoke to first, Talbot revealed, was huge like a giant. He was friendly enough, but I also got the impression that it wouldn't be good if we refused to join them. I told them I would be back in a few days. Professor Carnegie asked, is this giant the one in charge there? No, Talbot answered quickly. There is an army man in charge, a Colonel Hiram Davis. They had a Chinese pilot and some soldiers. I heard some of them mentioning a fleet Admiral Rudel and some man they called the Commodore. From the way they talked, I don't think all of them came from the same place. More of a joint task force, Carnegie speculated correctly. It seems that King Louis has some powerful partners. That indicates that he makes alliances with friendly communities and only destroys hostile rivals. Perhaps his attack on Denver was more than the blatant aggression we heard it to be. If their success against the Lake Men is any indication, and I'm sure that it is, they are quite capable of accomplishing their goals. If as you say, they have extended us an invitation that we dare not refuse, I think it would be wise of us to hear them out. If nothing else comes of this meeting, we could gain access to this cure their Dr. Kine can provide. Talbot asked, where are the others? Are they here? The Lady de la Cure is away on her own business, Carnegie answered. Gustav and Blacksburg went off at sunset to forage for food. You know how Blacksburg eats, so it could be quite some time. Ophelia is in the house tidying up or reading verses from the man's library. 
at the name of Ophelia, Tauba frowned and then asked, so you have made no progress with her then? No progress, the professor parroted the comment as though it was an ignorant observation. The desert climate has had considerable sanative effect on her hysteria. I would imagine so, Dosh said darkly amused. With no available lake to drown herself in, she has contented herself to reading. Professor Carnacki puffed on his tobacco pipe as he rocked thoughtfully in his chair. Guilt is not easily assuaged, he finally said about Ophelia's madness. The ghosts of her children still whisper to her, ever confounding her progress. She could never have imagined that driving her car into that reservoir would only entomb her alive with her children's drowned and decaying corpses. If we had not found her and brought her ashore, Ophelia would still be there now, floating dreamily in the terrible prison, locked away from air or sun, doomed to reflect on her mistake for all eternity. At the moment, she made us supper and distracts her troubled mind with elegant literature. That is very much what I call progress. It is not an easy thing to reconcile the torments of a tragic ghost and then bring her back into the world of the living. Fortunately for her, I am a professional. Tao but realized something that he told the professor, the men at the dam were going to attack the lake men and put an end to the conflict. Were the Lockerer and Gustav still talking about having their revenge against them? When they left, which way did they go? They refused to tell me their destinations, Karnaki confessed, but before they departed, they did express some lingering resentments over past insults. Even if they were preoccupied with vengeful aspirations, it seemed unlikely that they would try anything as bold as an attack. Dosh kicked some sand into a nearby hole that was in fact an animal's cloven hoof print left behind by Gustav's giant pet. The reptilian alien bounty hunter said gravely, I would not be so quick to dismiss Gustav's boldness. When treated unjustly, he can have a mind for retribution and some means of accomplishing it. It was their assault upon the lady that forced our separation from their community. I think it is quite possible that they are thinking to strike back. Their ambition will grow accordingly when they discover that their enemies are at an opportune moment of extreme vulnerability. If so, the professor reasoned, there isn't much that we can do about it. It is a long journey from here to Groom Lake, Dosh reasoned. Blacksburg would have to walk. I could follow his tracks easily enough, even if he wasn't eating everything in his path from cactus to prawn horns. It would not take long before I would know what direction Gustav is heading. To what end? The professor challenged him. Do you plan to talk him out of such a reckless course of action or to help him accomplish it? If he is going to attack the Lake Man community, how far would you be willing to go to stop him? I go where I am paid to go, Dosh stated as a fact of certainty. Up until now, I was content to have you pay me to keep you safe and tend to your business. Now that I know that this King Louis is but one of many nobles with powerful kingdoms, I have other patrons with the wealth to employ my services. The Lake Men are of no special importance to me but that community is apparently of some value to King Louis. According to the rumors, he likes to take all their women and the lake men have many women. If that fool Gustav makes an enemy of King Louis, his soldiers may decide that all of us were part of it too. If you are interested in Talbot's offer to meet with them at the dam, you may want to intervene before Gustav does something stupid that they're not going to appreciate or be quick to forgive. You can go after him then, Professor Carnacki relented, after you get something to eat and refuel your motorcycles. If Gustav is intent on involving himself with the lake men, you can do what you can to dissuade him. Just as your future may be with these new kings from the east, so too may be the fate for us all. Chapter 3. Dreaming Butterfly After Carmen's strange dreams about Alice, she awoke to a lazy wonderful morning. She remembered the good news that her daughter had solved some martial work mystery for the city back home. Alice had learned some important wisdom from the riots of Thessalonica. The king's law merely served the good of the people. She would act with compassion ever mindful of the mission that was the people not their laws. By allowing the living law to bend in the wind of necessity, problems would be solved, the common good protected, and no one would take up arms to protest brutality because their beloved friends lost their lives to petty vices that were just an inescapable part of life. Carmen was certainly not beyond having petty vices. Greed and lust could be fun in their proper proportions. She repeatedly scooted her butt across the huge bed to push against Critias as he slept. When he shifted over to get some space, Carmen just did it again. Before long, she had pushed him to the very edge where his arm had to hang off to the floor. Her sustained attack awoke him at that point, such that when she dug in to shove him right off the side, he sprang to the fight, flung her back into the middle of the bed, and then gave her a right smart smack on the bottom. After that, she got the pretend punishment lovemaking that she had wanted in the first place. When Critias did finally get out of bed, Carmen was gone, but she had set out clean clothes for him. His mech suit and weapons were decontaminated and ready for use. 
he discovered that she left his helmet as a security scanner so that she could keep watch through it and make sure nothing snuck up on him. The bedroom was in the visitor's center at the top of the cliffs overlooking the lower boulder dam. It wasn't really safe territory. Groom Lake Commandos had broken in before, and perhaps could again. In general, Carmen was mindful of the realistic and actionable possibilities. Critias took his boots and gun belt, but left his arm rather than his helmet, which he would carry. The rest of the team that Colonel Davis brought to the dam really were amazing heroes. It wasn't easy for Critias to live at their risky level where he didn't have his full armor on. In his old life, he would never even be on earth out of his mech suit. Lydis never trained him to play fair with ghouls or dangerous criminals. When Critias walked around to the great walls of windows that overlook the dam and its canyon, he saw an astounding phenomena of meteorology. The vast reservoir lake behind the dam was always brimming full since no human civilization existed anymore to pump it all off for irrigation and water works. Perhaps it was the sweeping temperature changes common to deserts, the deep cold waters, or the mountains, but some combination of forces had generated a thick rolling fog that covered the lake, overwhelmed the crest of the dam, and then made its way down the lower canyon. He saw down to his right was the outdoor overlook patio space where Verluck had landed the Eurocopter they stole from the Groom Lake Commandos. There was a circus of overhead power lines that left only an arrow lane of entry. Typical of Verloc, she felt no fear and harbored no doubts. For her, Hazard was just part of her secret agent idiom. Also down on the outdoor deck was Carmen, along with Verloc, Major Li Feng, and Romeo. Critias arrived to find Li Feng demonstrating her masterful understanding of Chinese martial arts. The Virgil Libus had raised Critias in a monastery life of training and he had excelled at combat skills. He had more than a passing knowledge about the topic. Li Feng had rare knowledge worthy of admiration. All marshals learned unarmed combat skills. Feng demonstrated advanced exercises even by Lydus standards. In his time, only the Praetorian Temple on Earth trained marshals in the internal strength styles. It was a counterintuitive fighting philosophy that non-practitioners would rarely understand the value. Its same was obvious enough when considered in terms of what it was not. Common marshals learned that hand speed, muscle strength, and body mass were the source of punishing blows. Deriving one's strength from breathing exercises and stillness was not part of their common curriculum. Even so, Li Feng was being anything but still. She leaped about with demonstration punches and kicks that didn't readily appear different to an external style, without knowing the difference. Carmen sat in the lotus position apparently trying to meditate. It actually would do her good if she could control the amount of sensory information that intruded on her mind during waking hours. Like Li Feng's Wu Dang Gong. Meditation was not part of Carmen's core programming. She was born with the collective mastery of the somewhat rival Xiaolin techniques. Critias was not confident to say that one way was fundamentally better than the other, but they were different. With that in mind, Critias felt that Carmen had the external styles more befitting to her aggressive personality and draw athletic prowess. For the moment, Critias was content to stay back and observe. Carmen was pretty awesome, and his wife, so it was a pleasure to just admire her from afar. After Li Feng demonstrated her routine, Verloc did her best to duplicate it, which she did impressively. Verloc had spent years learning every kung fu movie that she could get her hands on, resulting in her current skills, which were already phenomenal. More than that, Verloc had photographic reflexes that allowed her to copy new techniques even during combat. Li Feng had greater knowledge and experience in her family style, but she was not the superhuman athlete that Verloc was by virtue of her watch or biology. In Mandarin, Li Feng praised Verluck's demonstration of the forms, you have studied before, I can see. After a contemplative pause to weigh her forthcoming criticism, Feng recommended, you do have a tendency to hold your breath and then go between the segments. You leap from your limbs rather than your center. It was a truthful observation. When training herself by watching great masters on film, Verluck had never really had the opportunity to study breathing techniques. No one ever filmed passive subtleties as such. Carmen opened her eyes to tell Li Feng that she had come to a realization, I stop breathing every time I do something stupid. When I get angry or lose my serenity, I even breathe in a huffy way. That made her think out loud, maybe that is where the word huffy comes from. Yes, Li Feng agreed with Carmen. You breathe the way you live and one is a reflection of the other. You could say that they are one and the same. Take a calm breath and start again, Carmen advised herself. If I breathe wisely, I can behave wisely. She did just that. Carmen forgot about her goal to meditate and just gave some faith to the idea that so long as she continued to breathe at a balanced regular pace, she would not fly off the handle and do something stupid. Within moments, she felt something new yet familiar. She found a sixth sense she had never been aware of before. 
Carmen felt true harmony with herself and the universe as she touched the spiritual presence of some supreme being. She felt loved and she could feel a physical presence that was the corporeal manifestation of that unconditional acceptance. It is something wonderful, Carmen said aloud, having no words to describe it any better. She wasn't sure how she knew it. But the loving entity was so close that she really did have to turn around and see because it was definitely behind her. Carmen discovered that the feeling came from Critias as he stood and watched her from across the patio near the doors into the building. That enlightening moment she experienced was actually just her discovering that she always had the ghoulish ability to feel the presence of natural humans when their thoughts betrayed them. She gasped, which thereby abandoned her meditative breathing. Since life was breath and feeling Critias's love for her caused a panting respiration of joy, her life became her breath. Carmen hopped off her seat and then ran over to hug him. Upon seeing what had happened, Li Feng called to Carmen, when you freed yourself from your passions, you discovered the real joy of your being is always within you. When you gave yourself into them, you only grasp a passing manifestation. I wanted him to know it too, Carmen reasoned why she had to surrender to her passions and embrace him with such enthusiasm. He already knew, Li Feng said non-judgmentally, but with a hint of sadness. She understood that Carmen had to follow her life's path at her own pace. After he held Carmen a moment to calm her fluster, Critias escorted her back to the lessons. The natural power of the place with its crashing waters permeated the very ground. It was a wonder to behold. When Critias noticed that the ridge of the dam was clearly visible, he said, The fog is parting. Li Feng saw the epic wall of concrete for herself and then added in English, And the mountain appears. I didn't mean to interrupt. Critias said to Li Feng about that morning exercise class. Perhaps you can show Carmen how to perform your Tao Lu? I have committed it to memory, Carmen boasted in truth, or at least so she believed. Critias went over to sit on one of the benches. Once he was comfortable, he commanded her, show me. Carmen stepped over to an open space near the handrail overlooking the canyon, took a breath to compose her breathing, and then began. The display was unmistakably a product of the ancient Chinese and their legendary schools of martial excellence. For anyone to perform the moves, it would require extraordinary flexibility and physical fitness. The incredible leaps and flying kicks were beyond mere athleticism, especially when they demanded a graceful landing on one foot. By any mortal standard, Carmen performed magnificently. In many ways her skill was superhuman in that no mere natural person could match her strength or balance. That aside, Li Feng gave her uniquely expert opinion on her family style that was centuries old. You are ferocious as a tiger. A splendid interpretation to behold, your way jaw is lightning and thunder. It is I that should be a student of you. Carmen was proud well beyond what was good for her, such was the true nature of deeply rooted self-doubt. She did not hear any flattery for what she believed was a perfect demonstration of the forms. Li Feng had used the term for external strength, which was praised in a Xiaolin tradition. In the Taoist school of Li Feng, it explained why she called it an interpretation, meaning that Carmen had taken the lesson and then made it into something else entirely. All Carmen could do was look to Critias for him to disagree with Li Feng. Critias understood what Carmen wanted, but he was not going to lie to give it to her. He asked, did you breathe even once? When you finished, I half expected you to chop a bench in half with your hand just because you could. Major Feng is right. You are sharp as the cold, and hard as vengeance, but you missed the point entirely. She planted her hands on her hips and snorted air through her nose, breathing in the way she did when slipping out of balance. The point of all this is breaking things, she argued. Whether it is Grendel, ghouls, or gunmen from Groom Lake, my purpose is to defeat my enemies. The purpose is to defeat the enemy in yourself, Li Feng instructed. Carmen scoffed at that philosophical mumbo-jumbo, I have had many enemies, and none of them were myself. It was Critias's turn to scoff. He need say nothing else. Carmen was well aware of all the times she went off her rocker and caused all her own problems. Li Feng was less ridiculing and more patient as she asked Carmen, if it starts to rain right now and you get wet, will you be mad at the sky? Carmen honored her teacher by considering her answer before she replied, I would not be angry at the sky for raining on me and getting me wet. The sky is not a villain and neither is the water. It is just the way of the world and nothing personal. Li Feng walked over and then picked up a water bottle. She brought it back to offer it to Carmen. When Carmen shook her head no to indicate that she wasn't thirsty, Li Feng opened the spout and then sprayed the water onto Carmen, getting her wet. Even though she didn't like it, Carmen believed it was a test to see if she could control her temper, so she did. Carmen only stopped breathing as she scowled, and then just stood there dripping. Li Feng asked, if being wet from the sky would not make you upset, does me doing it make you upset? When Carmen hesitated, 
Li Fen acted as though she would spray her again if the answer was no. Yes, it bothers me, Carmen said in haste. It makes me angry. She pouted again, what should I do? You? Li Feng acted as though she thought about that and then drank some water from the bottle. I was thinking about me. I was thinking, I should be more like the sky and less like Li Feng with a water bottle. You can fight like a tiger and you get angry at people, but you never get angry at the sky. I will be like the sky and my life will be so much better for it. When you do the Tao Lu, you do it as a tiger, as a person with a water bottle, as a weapon. Your power creates fear and jealousy. It makes enemies where there were none. When you do it as the sky, you will frighten no one, anger no one, but an opponent who forces you to defend yourself will become just as wet. Carmen did not understand. She walked to the hand railing and then gazed into the canyon with its twin torrents of water continuously crushing into the river below. I am good by my personal actions, she reasoned, and so by choice and intent I am violent. My choice is at whom I turn my violence against. Li Feng took a place beside her at the railing and then told Carmen, My grandfather practiced at a waterfall. He said it was like the breathing of the world. Was it the cliff, the water falling, both? When you look at this place, what do you see, the river, the concrete, the generators? No one piece is the whole of it. Its breathing motion is what makes it alive. The whole of it here does not include the electricity it generates. In some place far away, it has some light burning bright or they are shocking one of their prisoners. Is this damn good or evil? Choices are good or evil, Carmen said as her philosophy. What if, Li Feng asked, you go to Groom Lake right now? What if you kill a man there, and you do it because you are feeling mean and angry? What if unbeknownst to you, that man was about to kill innocents, and because you arrived and killed him out of wickedness, you saved their lives? Would you have done evil or good? My own wickedness would be enough for me, Carmen replied. Whatever came of it, I would have done wrong. So then, Li Feng reasoned, when you try to do some good and then some unforeseen misfortune comes of it, what is that to you then? Is your own path to seek goodness enough for you, whatever the world beyond your control makes of it? Carmen wanted to answer no, because she did blame herself for every shortcoming no matter how good her intentions. In the end, she could only say, I don't know, but I cannot say yes. My wrongs are still wrong no matter how good my intentions were at the time. When you were acting righteous and good, Li Feng reasoned, you believe your actions can still be bad. When you are being selfish and angry, you believe your good results can still be failure. It is your attachment to the thinking that you can know and control the good and bad outcomes of your every action that is poisoning you. You cannot be content with what good you do accomplish, so more successes will never give you peace. The good of the whole world is far beyond your winning. When you finally let go and just be your humble self, you will learn to rejoice in what good you naturally accomplish just by being who you are. Only after you accept yourself and the consequences of being that self, will you then attain your true power and become most capable of attaining all that good you seek. You have mastered the way of external force that is the tiger. Now you must master the way of inner peace through wisdom and become the dragon. Once you have passed through both houses and merged them, only then will you become the one. Carmen asked, the one what? You will tell me, Li Feng answered. I am not your equal. I will be content to do my small part in helping show you the path. Reprogramming her outlook on life was a frightening prospect for Carmen. She couldn't rejoice in the good of her past works or relinquish her guilt for her small failings. Carmen did comprehend that good and bad were entirely subjective principles. Her logic engine made that perfectly clear. It was her own publicly declared reasoning that she came to Boulder Dam at all as a consequence of her guilt for past shortcomings. Cochise and the dam workers being free at that moment was a direct consequence of her past self-reproaches. As she thought about it, Carmen knew that what she feared most was that if she did change and took on a different outlook on life, that Critias would not want her anymore. He would get bored with her tremulous clinging and then make himself a harem from great women like the conspicuously available Li Fei, the professionally adrift Jam who would be his for the taking, and the spicy Master Chief Emily from the GNP. Critias knew Carmen's facial expressions better than anyone. Li Feng was right in that Carmen did need to defeat the great enemy that was her fears within herself. When she had external enemies to defeat, they had better watch out, because she was their worst nightmare. When she didn't have anyone to fight, her thoughts turned inward and she battled herself. He called to her, it has always been coming to this. Your bad temper and paranoia have invariably gotten you into trouble. We only came here at all because you were leading the way. Colonel Davis has the responsibility, but we all know this is your mission. It's time for you to make me look more important by unleashing your full Carmen. His cunning use of his power over her worked perfectly. While she had heard everything, 
the only part that stuck in her conscious mind was that she had to make Critias look more important. He would need her more than ever, and reward her generously. The communities of her world would respect her husband even more, which appealed greatly to Carmen's vanity. All she had to do to have all that was to stop selfishly nitpicking herself and put her mind to actual business. That was really like nothing at all. It was simply making the choice. As that new tier of enlightenment coursed through Carmen's complex mind, her new sensory perception of humans and their earnest thoughts returned. Those musings wanted to enfold around Carmen like loving protective arms. Carmen calmly turned about then gave Li Fang a gentle kiss on her lips. The effect on Li Fang was to leave her in stunned bemusement. Far from being offended, in the rules of her personal religious superstitions, an immortal Gui Shen spirit had just blessed her life with celestial magic. It was a very auspicious thing. The intimate gesture took Critias entirely by surprise. He had to ask, what was that for? Carmen was at peace with herself when she turned his way to answer, when will come another? He shrugged at that since he couldn't deny that Li Feng was an amazing woman, surely the only one of her kind in the world, and when she passed away, there would never be another. Carmen walked over to look upon him sweetly as she said, Master, you should go and get all of your armor. We need to bring out the prisoners. I can check the bandages on the wounded. That man Leah told Colonel Davis that they imprisoned their old leader at Groom Lake, and that he would help in a regime change there under the right conditions. We need to explore that option thoroughly. I plan to enter their compound just after sunset. It may even be to our advantage if you take Leon with you. I will talk to Colonel Davis to see what he would like to happen from all this. It was all good ideas to Critias. He did ask her, so you need me? We need you even if you don't do anything, Carmen told him. The others trust you and would not be at their best without you to back them up. It is time to hand out weapons to the damn engineers so that they can provide their own security. If they were significantly unstable, I believe we would have encountered evidence of that by now. Critias asked her, are we turning off the power to their base? She wiggled her nose in a small and decisive no, I will recommend to Colonel Davis that we do not do that. It would alert them to our intention to attack, make them especially determined to fight since armed resistance would appear to be their only possible hope, and perhaps we would also endanger any hostages that they are keeping. Our conflict with them is not really about the electricity. He gestured dismissively that she had his permission to depart. Go have your confab with Colonel Davis and then inform him of my plans. Carmen smiled with adoration for his thoughtful maintenance of their marital romance that she so craved. She just dreaded the thought that her guise of mission leader would deprive their lovemaking of any of his magnificent caveman masculinity. Critias got his full armor on and then summoned help from the grave walkers Frank and Manny so that he had some backup. They opened the gates to the canyon tunnel to let out the Groom Lake prisoners. The first men who appeared carried several dead bodies that they had wrapped in old sheets. When their captors were clearly skeptical about the explanation they were about to get, Leon came forward to speak for all his people. We voted to help your King Louis in whatever his plans might be, he said. Leon gestured to the bodies, these men voted to break out of our confinement, steal some weapons, and then kill all of you. Critias asked, you didn't think it would work? Leon turned his head a bit so that Critias could get a good look at the bruise on his face. He had been wearing a combat helmet when Carmen bounced his brain off of a marble countertop. The bruising was not that bad, even if he did get a concussion out of it. I've seen the kind of people who work for King Louis, Leon confessed his entirely wise caution against treasury. Your colonel seemed interested in making a deal and we accept. If you didn't have something in mind, you would not have tended their wounds and fed them decent meals. Using his helmet transmitter, Critias called Carmen, what kind of future are the knuckleheads down here looking at? She answered, tell them that they are going to be contractors in service to the governors. They are about to start opening the freight rail lines between all their holdings. With Ray's technical experience to assist me, I will get them a trained community operational. They will start helping from this side of the project. Since it will be what amounts to a one-way trip to meet up in the east, we have no immediate need for a railway base at this end. If everything goes as I plan, they will gradually adjust to joining the existing communities. Critias told Leon, we are going to set you up with everything you need to live on your own aboard a railroad train. You guys will work your way east clearing the boxcars off the rails we want to use. Our people already have trains and they will start clearing track from the other end. The boxcars blocking up the railways are full of everything you could ever want. If you can manage not to screw this up, you assholes will all be rich, will have learned useful skills, and then you can join whoever you want from among our governors. On our own? One of the other prisoners asked in a way that sounded like approval. Critias answered so that they could all hear him. It will be hard and dangerous work. By the time that you are finished, you will have earned your places and our trust. For now, 
just cooperate and behave yourselves. He gestured over to one side as he commanded, the wounded need to wait over there. Our medic wants to check your bandages. You men who brought out those bodies, take them down to the end there and toss them in the river. If they are faking it because you guys came up with some jackass plan, the rest of you are free to jump right behind them. Swim away and go wherever. Now is the time for choosing if you want to join us or go back to being pirate dickheads. Oh, they're dead all right, Leon assured Critias as he gestured for the other men to get rid of the bodies. I did what I could to reason with them, but they would have none of it. We figured it wasn't worth the risk of you killing us all when they broke out on their own and then hurt some of your people. Critias stepped closer to intimidate Leon with the imposing figure he was in his mech suit. You are smarter than you look, Critias praised him in a threatening manner. If you had let that happen, I would have blamed you too. Your people would have left with them if they had been successful. I would make sure you still left with them after they were dead. Leon did not show any sign of cowering even if Critias was clearly dangerous and obviously serious. After all, Leon had shot Critias's wife in the face while trying to kill her, some lingering resentment was entirely understandable, even welcome since it was the alternative to actual payback. He replied, I suspected as much, so we saved all of us a bad night. You have my word, if you keep your side of this bargain, we will keep ours. Not yet, Critias warned him away from haste. We are going to Groom Lake tonight to straighten out what is left of your friends. My commander seems to think that you might be useful. Your old leader was apparently not as big an asshole as your usual style, and we might be able to work with him. If you help us make this transition as painless as possible, it would go a long way to bettering your lives. On the other hand, if you don't want to help us take down your former pals, I can respect that. If you would turn on them, the day would come when you might do the same to us. Of course I want to go along, Leon answered without reservation. Any of them who refuse to see reason are going to end up dead. If they kill any of your people while holding out, some of your friends might decide to take their grief out on us. They are far more likely to listen to me than they are to you. Carmen met with Colonel Davis and Ray in the dam's cafeteria where they could have a meeting about the day's business. During her time in the main engineering control room on the day of the airport battle, Carmen had reconnected the satellite communications uplink dish, and then restored the local wireless internet routers. Hiram had used his laptop computer for the morning teleconference with Kevin's control room back home and the Council of Governors. Granny had made breakfast for everyone, partly from the supplies that came aboard the Greyhound plane. While Carmen ate, she also prepared a sealed container that she would take to Critias when she went down to check the bandages on the wounded prisoners. Colonel Davis had already heard Carmen give a quick description of her plans. He told her, I can't get on board with your scheme to insert yourself and Special Agent Shield by riding under the weapon hard points of the Predator drone. She reasoned, our combined weight would not be significantly greater than its normal payload of Hellfire missiles. Its airspeed is rather modest and we can rig up a pair of transfer gurneys to ride in. It won't even be uncomfortable. I believe you could do it, Hiram humored her. I just can't take the risk of something going wrong. Jim made it very clear that I was not to risk either of you when any other option was available to me. He specifically mentioned what he called harebrain heroics that no one else would ever even consider. Should anything go wrong, however unlikely I am sure, not only would we lose you both in the same accident, but then Romeo would go berserk and Critias will be beyond livid. With that as his final answer, he continued, Jim confirmed that our reinforcements will be on schedule and in position. If we didn't have that captured drone, you would have other ideas on how to get our people there safely. Let's try one of those. Carmen replied, due to our battle at the airport, the infected will keep it off limits to us for days. Siphoning fuel from the Hercules transport will remain impractical until the ghouls get hungry and thirsty enough to disperse back to their old haunts. The Greyhound and the helicopter would need refueling for such a long trip under heavy load. With the drone out of the picture too, we will just have to drive there. It is a long trip in the heat of the day so we will have to get underway in plenty of time. We just have to hope we don't have any breakdowns out in the desert. Hiram was not overly concerned about vehicle problems, we can always find some shelter and postpone the operation if something like that comes up. Our reinforcements from Jim could just come rescue us instead. That rally truck you took from their men is in perfect condition and so is our car. We will stick to the good roads and take our time. I am concerned about leaving the dam undefended, Carmen cautioned him. With all of their prisoners here, we will have to trust in the armed dam engineers to keep them under control. I want you to stay here, Hiram told Ray. You and Cutter can keep the dam secure while we are away. If you think it will help, you could contact Kevin and have him start a satellite search, see what you can find in the way of trains you think are suitable for our needs. 
his technicians are already mapping the whole lot, Ray said about the railways. By the time we start, we will have routes and an exact count of how many cars we need to relocate. As far as an engine for us to use, I think I have already found one. There is a large library of books up in the apartments. I read a tourist guide about the local area. They have a fully equipped railway garage off the main highway near the airport. The engine they keep there is a bit of a classic, but enthusiasts kept it safely indoors and had restored it to mint condition. I think we will be able to get that engine operational without too much trouble. Once we have it rolling, we can find better engines along the way. No reason to own only one. Until Cutter carries me out there to check on its condition, we can't be sure. Carmen and Verloc will be there too, Hiram informed Ray. You would invariably climb down to explore and that is how you get bit by a sand jerky desert mummy. You are not expendable, especially not now when the governors have all this train business going on. After you do give these Groom Lake men a train, I can't believe they have anyone who knows how to command it. Well, you know, Ray said at ease. I may have to stay aboard for a few days to teach them how to hook up the iron, air the brakes, and unfreeze the lock trucks. Once they have seen the process performed a couple of times, it won't be too much for them to handle. Carmen commented, I think their problem will be clearing derailed cars or repairing some buckled rail. We will probably have to find them a wrecker somewhere along the way. We adapt, Hiram said about that. This is an uphill climb every step of the way. We will focus on the progress we can reach and then see where it takes us. Just getting them a train and turning them loose to something useful is an unexpected gain for our side. They will enjoy it more than our firing squad, which is their backup plan. He thought of something else and asked Carmen, if the airport is off limits, where is your drone now? I landed it out in the desert, Carmen told him. It's at the same private airstrip that Major Fang used for the Greyhound. Hiram considered that before saying, since it has cameras and one more Hellfire missile, it could come in handy if Groom Lake is a tougher nut to crack than we hope to find. Would you be able to get it on station for when we arrive? Absolutely. Carmen confirmed that she could. Plan on that then, Hiram ordered her. If they have any more tanks or perhaps a fortified bunker, I may need the option to put it out of action with that missile. Carmen mused, let's hope that they don't have a bunker then. I won't like having to sacrifice some of the hostages because we don't have any other option. Hiram agreed with her balanced interpretation on that matter, it will be a last resort of course. We do the best that we can with what we have. That is what command is all about. When neither Carmen nor Ray had anything else to add, Hiram said, I guess that's it then. Critias needs his breakfast, Carmen said as she got up to go. I will check the bandages on those wounded prisoners. She looked to Hiram for his opinion when she asked, If any of them are showing signs of infection, do you want to be informed before I take care of it? Hiram shook his head no, I would like to hear about it eventually just to know what is going on, but that is just a necessity beyond our control. It has been long enough now that I suspect they will be fine, but you never know. One of those fools could be picking at his bandages and got himself contaminated with his filthy fingers. An idea came to him then, so he told Carmen, I would like you to put some of the healthy ones to work. Give them the hoses and brooms. Have them scrub down all the boots and clean the pier. We will be tracking contamination around with our feet and vehicles. It will be best for everyone if we stay on top of that. It will be done, Carmen confirmed her instructions and then went on her way. Chapter 4. Exercises in Blasphemy After their conversation with Professor Karnicki, Dosh and Talbot had gone off to find the missing watchers. Of them all, it was Dosh and Talbot who shared the greatest common interest in having a friendly relationship with the new survivors that had taken control of the dam. Neither of them had any other prospects to pursue. Continuing to exist was not really living. While Dosh and Talbot had entirely different ambitions, they both still needed other people to share in the social experience of living. Tracking Blacksburg and Gustav in the dark desert was not all that easy, but neither was it impossible. The hoof prints were generally conspicuous owing to the bulk of their maker. Uprooted cacti he had devoured were even easier to recognize from a distance. Despite riding mounted on motorcycles, the pursuit was irksome. They required frequent stops to reacquire the elusive trail. Their progress went no faster than Gustav had himself traveled and perhaps they went even slower, despite the meandering delays that were his titanic pet always browsing for forage. From the beginning, Dosh was certain that the common direction that Gustav took was toward the community of the lake men. Frustrated with their slow progress, Talbot argued, we already know where he is going. If we abandon the trail, we can be there all that much sooner. Stopping him from doing anything stupid requires catching him before he has already done it. Once we lose this track, Dosh warned Talbot, 
it will be difficult if not impossible for me to ever pick it back up again. This is our one sure chance to actually find him at all. We already know where he's going, Talbot repeated in the name of making haste. At this rate, he will be done before we ever even arrive. Dosh submitted to Talbot's call for urgency and then remounted his motorcycle. They abandoned the sure track as they rode off at haste in the direction of Groom Lake. For most of their journey, they felt that they had made the right decision. The pillaged cacti patches seemed clear proof that Blacksburg had passed that same way. Signs of the brute feasting had vanished by the time Dosh and Talbot came upon the roadway that connected Groom Lake with the Indian Springs airbase further south. It was late in the night by then, a mere hour before sunrise. Dosh got off his motorcycle to inspect the roadway for tracks. The only thing he found was one fresh set of military tires. A widely spaced wheelbase made it clear that the vehicle had been one of the typical military gun wagons that the lake men favored. He wasn't able to tell if the vehicle had come or went, only that they were recent. Talbot used his binoculars to scan about in every direction. The starlight was strong and he hoped to spot some clue about where Gustav and Blacksburg had gone. There is no sign of them, Dosh said at last. If he had planned on going to Indian Springs, he would not have come through this way. The lake men are just over there, he gestured north. It is not far now. He would probably be there already. Talbot had hoped to find Gustav before he got to the airbase. All the people there would be shooting at them on sight. Sunrise fast approached, so whatever they did, it would have to happen soon. He may be after water, Dosh speculated while he gazed west through his dinosaur mask. Even if Dosh wasn't a real alien reptile bounty hunter, he was a genuinely skilled tracker. Talbot expressed his doubts, all this way for water? And this close to their community? I think we need to keep going toward their base and see if we come across his tracks. Dosh agreed to go and check the base, but only after he voiced his reasons, if he did come this way after water, that would mean their community is safe anyway. Gustav would come back on his own soon enough. Gustav the Watcher actually had gone off in the direction of Groom Lake just as his pursuers had suspected, but that wasn't his immediate destination. It was a long journey from their farmhouse to reach that top secret air base in the deep desert, and he had a stop to make along the way. Gustav had his friend for company during the journey. While he rode on his baggage-laden motorcycle, his companion Blacksburg trotted along by his side. His friend's enormous nose could locate the slightest sense of food on the wind, and that came in handy because Blacksburg was always gluttonously hungry. When he couldn't get fresh meat, Blacksburg contented himself by feasting on prickly pears or any other beaver-tailed cactus that they came upon. His name, Blacksburg originated from a tattoo that remained legible despite being somewhat faded and enormously stretched along his spacious left ham. Blacksburg was a swine, an actual four-legged pig, but not any sort of common one. In the days before the fall of man, Blacksburg had been a wonder of human science and genetic manipulation. His modified blood and organs were compatible with the biology of humans. Had things gone differently, his heart might have ended up inside a human chest and then successfully grafted there. After mankind fell in their world turned into a screaming hellscape, Blacksburg the pig found himself free to wander in the wild. It hadn't been long before contact with ghouls had exposed him to their contagion. While all other pigs in the world and animals in general were immune to such a species-specific infection, Blacksburg was not resistant. His genetically modified biology was quite human enough to serve as host for the mitochondrial scale life. It made itself at home in his genetically modified chimera cells. To better protect itself from harm. The infection aggressively transformed Blacksburg's body, taking him to the extreme of its interspecies genomic potential. It made him grow much larger and stronger, and so too did his genetically modified brain grow in proportion to the rest of him. Blacksburg was the size of a rhinoceros and unbelievably fast for his bulk. He even chased pronghorns if they got close enough, though catching them was beyond his ability, such was the legendary speed of those graceful antelope. Gustav carried a rifle that he used for taking down large game animals. Blacksburg had no problem munching down an entire antelope, without concern about any tasty bones. He only spat out a chewy hide, hooves, and antlers because they weren't worth his time or aggravation. By sunrise, Gustav and his razorback lord of swine had reached the range of mountains that was at the back of the Groom Lake airbase. While it was a risky and generally valueless endeavor for those human inhabitants to explore the desert in which they lived, for Gustav it was a harmless diversion. As a watcher who would never sleep again, Keeping himself amused was a difficult thing to accomplish. On that opposite side of the mountain range was an old silver mine from the days of horses and telegraph. It was up in the rocky hills above another salt flat lake that stretched out from the base of the mountains. At the edge of the flat and foot of the hills was a derelict water tank on tall legs. It was not as old as the mine itself, 
but still aged to the last world war and had large corroded holes all through it. From beneath the water tank, Gustav could hear the mechanical wheezing of the windmill that was higher up. He had made the repairs himself years before when his clan was still on good terms with the Groom Lake community. Antique hand pumps were common enough in that region for water wells as were the windmills that labored over them. In the years since human civilization stopped pumping the aquifers dry, the water table had surged up to levels not available for two centuries. The silver mine ran deep enough to take on groundwater. Gustav's restored pump lifted that water to the arid surface. Instead of the pipes draining the water into the ruined tank, where it would spill into the sandy ground, there was only a short pipe section that was just long enough to pour the fresh water into a basin at the mouth of the timber-framed mine. The pool at the mouth of the mine was not deep, but it was rather broad such that one could not enter the mine without stepping through it. A bat-friendly modern metal fence had blocked off the mine entrance when Gustav first discovered it. He had pulled that down to leave the entry unrestricted. Some green mosses and colorful lichens grew in and around the water. As the only open water source in the desert, it had become popular with the local wildlife. Every sort of bird and animal would frequent the pool to drink from it. The noise of the windmill had a human quality to it that attracted ghouls. The infected had learned that they could drink from the pool. They had also discovered that many edible animals frequented the place. By entering the mine and hiding quietly in the darkness there, ghouls would ambush animals when they came to drink. Gustav had only wanted the fresh water source on the surface when he got the pump operational. It was later that he discovered that the ghouls would get into protracted battles with the larger animals they wanted to eat. Scratching and biting an antelope was hardly effective in any case. As the water overflowed the pool at the front entrance, it ran back into the mouth of the mine and then down a steeply sloped shaft that began only a short distance inside. The stone floor of the entrance as well as the dangerously inclined shaft were perilously slippery and altogether slimy from wet algae that grew by the weak reflected light near the entrance. Ghouls and animals alike would slip and then tumble down the shaft which then trapped them inside the mine. If Gustav had purposefully designed the trap, it would have been truly genius, as it was, it had happened by fortuity. When Gustav had been on friendly terms with the Groom Lake community, it was well and good to capture the local infected and thus keep them away from the survivors. Now that they were enemies and the community's safety was no longer desirable, Gustav felt it was time that old friends finally had their chance to become acquainted. Getting the ghouls out of the mine did task his thinking. The slippery shaft slide inside the entrance had come about because the original miners had pursued the ore vein where it led them. When desert dry as it naturally had been, the floor was not the death trap it had become when wet and slippery. That ramp did not go especially deep, only far enough that the ghouls had no chance of climbing out without traction. At that lower level, the tunnel stretched off in various dark directions, rank with bad droppings and swarming with the small vermin that fed on a guano ecosystem. The chain link fence that had once blocked off access to the mine had been loose fitting enough that it didn't hamper the traffic of all those bats that lived inside. Gustav found that the roll of fence was long enough that he could drape it down the shaft to form a convenient ladder. One of the steel poles securely anchored the upper end of the fence. All that remained was for Gustav to call for the stupid ghouls and then let their hunger for fresh food and sunlight draw them up to the surface. Some yelling and banging summoned up the sound of the many infected. The number of them that he had managed to trap surprised him. As the first of them started climbing up the fencing, it brought a smile to Gustav. The community at Groom Lake were going to get exactly what they deserved. Josh and Talbot went up as far as the base's security fence vehicle gate without finding any sign of Gustav or Blacksburg having been there. They knew from past experience when they had traded with the survivors that the soldiers had long since given up the burdensome habit of patrolling their outer fence. Rather than being of any kind of security benefit, people near the fence only antagonized the few infected that did come along. When they spotted an uninfected human, it could trigger the ghoul to start its frenzied screaming that could continue for a day or more. They were just about to leave when a familiar female voice spoke up from inside the fence. The woman asked, Did Professor Carnegie send you? It was the lady the lockerer as she walked barefoot out of the darkness to approach them. Talbot answered her in a hushed but scolding tone, What are you doing in there? Are you mad? If they find you, they'll kill you. I think they would find that difficult, she replied sounding at ease especially now. The general has gone to the dam and taken his army with him. Since there has been no word, it seems that they're all dead, destroyed by newcomers. My guess is that it must be King Louis who sacked Denver. It appears that our little corner of heaven is the next item on his grocery list. As Talbot walked to the gate to open it for her, he said, I was at the battle. Some of them are prisoners, but the general is dead along with most of his officers. The professor sent us here after Gustav. He said that the two of you had been plotting revenge. 
She smiled with considerable satisfaction and then used a pinky finger to check the corner of her mouth, as though she had recently dined on something. Perhaps we were, she admitted. I don't know where Gustav is. We didn't come together, assuming he is here. When she saw Talbot fiddling with the lock, she showed him her silver key and then said, a gift from an admirer. He must not have admired you very much, Talbot replied unimpressed. This is a combination lock. We saw tracks from one of their trucks. It must have been heading to Indian Springs. When they left, they changed the lock. Sunrise was not far off and that made the locker anxious. Her wispy black dress billowed in a cool desert breeze as did her long black hair. She was an attractive woman if only in a malign sort of way. Dosh man handled the gate to discover that whoever had locked it last had done a rushed mediocre job of it. The long chain that threaded through multiple times had enough collective slack that he forced a gap large enough that she could slip out. Talbot asked her, where is your vehicle? Were you planning on walking home across the desert in the sunshine? She didn't appreciate his snide humor, you're one to talk, running off without your medicine again. The professor had to send Dosh to your rescue. Did you bite anyone? No one who didn't deserve it. Dosh answered for him to speed them along. Lady de Locker smiled with devilish beauty and it showed the porcelain vampire fangs an old world dentist had added to her teeth. The reptile's comment made her chuckle, only ones who deserve it. When the men didn't know where to go, she gestured toward the mountain hovering over them. I parked up at the watchtower. My plan was to spend the day there then come back again tonight. The motorcycles got them up the coarse mountain road to where a concrete bunker was in the hillside. At one time, when military security was more paranoid than usual, the tower was one of several watch outposts for overlooking the desert. The lowest level had a garage where the locker had parked her black motor van. Its lack of rear windows made the van a serviceable shelter from the sun, if she ran out of other options. The mid-level of that outpost was a dusty but comfortable apartment that the watchers had used as a hideout in the past. Talbot felt inspired by the place. He told his companions, we can keep watch from here. If we don't find Gustav. We might find the people from the dam instead. Dosh intended to stay and keep Lady the Locker safe even if it was highly unlikely that the survivors would have reason to come up and explore the watchtower. After their recent loss of manpower, the lake men could hardly afford to take useless risks, and they never valued the old buildings outside their fence before. Chapter 5 Extraterrestrial Highway Colonel Davis pointed out through the window of the luxury sedan as Palat drove them through the city near the airport. That's the place, Hiram said with enthusiasm for Ray's idea because the huge sturdy building appeared to be in good condition. That's the railway garage we will need to check out. It would be hard to find anything closer or more convenient than that. Critias leaned over to see for himself. Railway had delivered all the heavy materials when the engineers had first built the Boulder Dam. Since those bygone days, the track to the dam terminated in town near their ghoul-infested airport. The heavy rail went conveniently into a vast locomotive maintenance building. According to Ray, they would find a like new locomotive in there, vintage but powerful. For Critias, everything in the old world was a primitive antique. Carmen had taught him that one appreciated classic machines based on their inherent engineering excellence, not their relative age, much akin to the admiration of fine swords. That shed would also have all the tools they needed for repairing other locomotives and armoring up various railcars for other purposes. Ahead of their 12-cylinder sedan was the Dakar rally truck with Andy at the wheel. That much larger vehicle carried Ruby and Sully, the two sand tigers, and both grave walkers. They kept that captured Commando Leon handcuffed in the back. Fang was in the front passenger seat of the sedan next to Palette. Critias shared the sedan's back seat with Colonel Davis. Out in front of the rally truck were Carmen and Verloc. They had taken a pair of high-powered off-road motorcycles from the vehicle storage in the dam's canyon tunnels. With those two capable women well out in the lead. They could simultaneously check the roadway for obstacles that might damage the tires of their larger vehicles and they could also lure any ghouls off to the curb so that Andy and Palat could pass through without having to hit them. The summer midday heat in the desert was extreme enough that ghouls in general preferred to skulk in some shadowy hole out of the sun. Aside from the vast reservoir lake and the river, the land overall was a dry dusty place with little to offer to sunbaked thirsty infected as they slowly dehydrated into leathery mummies. Malnourishment and thirst highlighted the inhumanity of infected since any mortal human would have long since died from such privations. As their caravan entered the nearby ruins that had been the city of Las Vegas, the vehicle passengers took interest in the scenery. The canyon winds had helped the desert rapidly reclaim the land. Owing to the quirks of wind and pavement, in some places the dunes already buried the frontage of burned-out buildings. In the first days of outbreak, 
the Canadian Air Force had bombed the city's airports in the belief that the continued operation of passenger planes only hastened the spread of the contagion. Whether or not that had actually done any good, their bombs did succeed in turning the center of the city into an aviation fuel-fed firestorm. Epic explosions had hurled flaming debris over great distances. Strong winds, the gas tanks of cars, and broken natural gas pipes spread the fires even further. City emergency services had already been near collapse because the world was at an end from the ghouls. The surprise military bombing of the city from the air put an end to any organized efforts other than the looting and the frantic rush to escape. The fire had totally wiped out the dense suburbia between the airport and the highway. They had a perfect view of that blackened wasteland as they drove past. Even in the heat of the day, they caught glimpses of ghouls prowling through the ruins as they searched for small animals to consume. Carmen and Verluck chose the course their caravan would take across the city. That path was roughly straight through the thick of it. They had a clear preference for broad highways that offered room to maneuver. They needed an hour to make it across traveling as they did at a safe speed that was still swift enough to make foot pursuit by ghouls impossible. Some infected did scream and dash about after it was already too late for them to attack the trespassers. The northern part of the city had a second smaller civilian airport that military bombs also destroyed. As before, accompanying fires had ravaged all the dense suburban areas adjacent to it. Upon the completion of their crossing, the city ended with astonishing brevity. Like a giant puzzle that had pieces missing, the urban development simply ended and then the great desert stretched away to the horizon ahead into mountainous ranges far off to either side. The pace remained the same as their vehicles followed the bland highway across open country. It was partly because Carmen was in no special hurry and that the risk of sharp stones puncturing a tire was much worse at higher speeds. Verloc stayed at point while Carmen drifted back to the rear. She came up alongside Colonel Davis's window. Carmen didn't invite him to roll the window down since they would converse by radio. Her voice came from Critias's helmet which he had in his lap. She warned, we will reach Indian Springs in about 15 minutes. It meant nothing to Critias, but Hiram knew a great deal about the place. The colonel said, it is an airbase that would have lots of drones, desert warfare equipment, and possibly anything else you might guess at. Critias understood the obvious implications when he commented, they will have gathered up enough stuff to equip a dozen of their armies. Do you think they have a checkpoint there, or maybe some traps? I would, Carmen said as the voice of tactical reason. Landmines would be problematic with all the ghouls and wildlife trampling over them. Anti-tank mines would work though. One of those wouldn't go off unless something as heavy as one of our vehicles gave it a good thumping, or the triggers could possibly even be magnetic. We're not in mine-resistant vehicles, Hiram thought aloud. If we hit one of those, there won't be any survivors. He told Carmen. You two need to go up ahead and scout us a clear path around the airbase. We are not going to forage for anything. Just bypass it as best we can. Stay on course for Groom Lake. Critias advised her, before you go, check with that Leon guy. If he knows anything about an ambush, now is the time to ask. Right away, the vehicle slowed down and then stopped. Leon got out of the back of the rally truck, climbed onto the back of Carmen's motorcycle, and then they raced away beside Verloc. The truck and the sedan then returned to their previous travel. Colonel Davis asked Critias, what do you think of that? She knows what she is doing, was Critias's only explanation. If you are concerned that he will capture Carmen, that is never going to happen and he knows it. It wouldn't be the first time that she beat him senseless. Carmen in fact did not know what she was doing and that she didn't have the situation under her control. She piloted the Predator drone as a subroutine self in her parallel computer mind. As the drone. She made a high-altitude overflight of the Indian Springs airbase to take in as much information as she could. The drone's uncooled thermal camera had poor sensitivity, especially while looking at daytime desert heat. Carmen had the ability to enhance the data with secondary software of her own, but it didn't help her locate much other than some ghouls who were out in the open. The normal wavelength cameras did not detect any signs of human enemies either. In actual fact, two men from Groom Lake already watched Verloc and Carmen. They had their up-armored military gun truck concealed in the nearby hills from where they could observe the highway coming in from Las Vegas. Their body heat and their vehicle with the engine off was not appreciably different in temperature from the hot ground around them. A desert camouflage paint scheme and netting made them suitably hidden from afar in the drab landscape. Being unaware of their imminent danger, Carmen had her attention on her scouting mission. Barbed wire fencing secured all the Indian Springs airbase property and blocked access across to the lonely road that would take them deeper into the desert. A shabby town had grown up around the base, with liquor stores and trailer homes. Since there were no ghouls coming their way, Carmen and Verluck stopped together to talk. Leon pointed in the direction of an old checkpoint in the fence line, 
we need to go in there and take the perimeter road around. Verloc asked him, is that how you go? I always flew, Leon admitted. I have seen it from the air though. The road is on the other side. I guess it doesn't really matter how we get there. We can go through the middle of the airbase if you want. The gun truck started down from the rocky hills at speed on an intercept course for Carmen, Verloc, and Leon. The Humvee's Chavis turret sported a 50 caliber machine gun that could handily destroy anything it hit. Even the Bradley light tank that Rand Cutter captured would be a rolling coffin when suffering incoming fire of that magnitude. Carmen's titanium skeleton would be of little consequence if one of the bullets struck her. Neither of the vehicles her friends approached in would fare any better. It was Verloc who first saw them coming because she happened to be facing in the right direction. She understood their danger and reacted without hesitation. Even as she throttled her motorcycle hard to dash away, Verloc warned, Scatter. Carmen didn't even check to see why before she raced her motorcycle forward, which was in the opposite direction of Verloc. Leon was lucky not to fall off the back and only saved himself when he frantically caught Carmen by handfuls of her breasts and then hugged her tight. There was no mistaking the loud barking from the huge gun as it fired on them. The gun truck was a long way off and on the move across rough ground. The talented gunner still managed to have one of the bullets gouge the roadway where their motorcycles had been only an instant before. Verloc had made the right call in having them split up, in that it would not be possible for the truck to fire on them both simultaneously, being who they were, neither of them would have willingly made the other the target. Fate decreed that the gunner chose Verloc to die first. It may have been fortunate in that Carmen had a passenger on the back of her motorcycle, which greatly reduced her effective agility when trying to evade. Ever sharp even when under the harshest extremes, Verloc power slid in the gravel while she made a racer's swerve and then she raised the front wheel in a wheelie by being so bold with the throttle. It proved the right move because she now had the concrete guard walls of the highway between her and the gun wagon. An automatic strafe of bullets chased her from right to left. The unstoppable rounds made K-rails explode one by one like hammered graham crackers. Some of the hits were so on target that the pulverized cement sprayed Verloc with gravel. The Predator drone faced the wrong direction because it had already flown past. Carmen had to pilot it around to engage the gun truck with its missile. As for her motorcycle, she thought it wise to get off the roadway and into the confused cover of the mobile home park that was opposite the airbase. Ghouls charged at Carmen's motorcycle from multiple directions. The roaring engines and shots of heavy machine gun had every local infected in a furor. A quick turn let Carmen hose down one ghoul with the flying gravel from her rear wheel. Like a jousting lance, she stuck out her leg to kick another in the chest and knock it away as they zoomed past. Before Leon even got the chance to cry out for it, Carmen's hand reached back to thrust her Tesla Flux pistol at him. If Leon was stupid enough to try and turn her own weapon against her and then take off on the motorcycle, he would regret it. He would discover much to his sorrow that Carmen could remotely disable the pistol's function at will. That was even if its friendly fire avoidance software did somehow deactivate, which it wouldn't. The Humvee turret gunner's next shots missed Verloc completely owing to a hasty course change by the driver. Verloc got that turn of luck because the gun truck had to abruptly swerve and take a new direction. The enemy had started on the far side of the airbase's security fence. They had to go around to the roadway gate if they wanted to pursue the motorcycles. Their gun truck and its turret had armor that was fully capable of fending off any small arms fire that Carmen and Verloc could send back. The men would be able to chase down the motorcycles and kill their riders at their leisure, even if they just ran over them with the off-road capable four-wheel drive military truck. As Verloc raced her motorcycle through the scrubby desert and circled to join Carmen in the cover of the mobile home park, the Predator drone attained firing position. Leon had never seen Tesla Flux pistol before, but it had a trigger and the ghouls that came at him were at close range. He popped off shots at the infected with his considerable skill and as such made himself useful. If luck had saved Verloc from dying by the machine gun, fortune balanced itself on Carmen when the laser designator on the old drone would not function for want of proper maintenance service. If she was unable to paint the gun truck with the laser to confirm her target, the missile would have no chance of hitting it. By the time that the gun truck passed through the gate and made its way to the main road, the Dakar truck and Palat sedan were visibly coming up the highway. Apparently the driver saw the new prey as more appealing targets because he turned that way to have the gunner engage them. The gunner had never taken his eyes away from the mobile home park. He fired some bursts from his weapon at where he believed Verloc to be as he saw flashes of her appear between trailers. The sedan and the rally truck approached at speed because they knew something was wrong and wanted to help. Carmen had radioed enough information that they understood the situation. She hadn't offered any possible solutions for want of one. It was Hiram's knowledge of the Predator drone that gave him such confidence. 
he of course had no idea that the drone's laser designator was no longer functional. The Humvee driver screamed at his gunner to come about and engage the vehicles. As the turret rotated away from Carmen and Verloc to destroy the incoming transports instead, the Predator drone pulled out of its power dive to skim just above the pavement of the highway. Carmen blind fired the Hellfire missile unguided as though her Predator drone was actually a Sopwith Cuckoo biplane that released an aerial torpedo against a First World War battleship. The drone jerked away in a hard turn as soon as the missile came free. Carmen's land torpedo rocketed blindly into the side of the gun truck. The missile blasted the enemy vehicle into a twisted flaming wreck that fully flipped over in midair before it ended up a black smoking heap. Hiram's group were in a perfect position to witness as the Predator drone stooped like a hawk and then took out the enemy gun truck with glorious finesse. The colonel felt vindicated in his faith about the Predator drone, still not realizing just how close he came to being the victim of that machine gun. Carmen with her passenger and Verluck soon appeared back on the road with their motorcycles. They promptly took the lead of the caravan and then showed the way through the gate in the fence line. Everyone followed the patrol road that went around the airbase. On the far side, they came upon the final highway. It ran straight out into the deep desert where they would find the high-security sister airfield known as Groom Lake. Along an uneventful drive later, the caravan stopped where the road threaded a valley between rocky ridges. Everyone got out of their vehicles to stretch their legs, relieve themselves, and have a late lunch from the supplies they brought with them. Carmen and Verluck refueled their motorcycles with jerry cans that hung off the Dakar racer. Timing was important because Carmen's plan required that they approach the enemy airbase after nightfall. There was only about 20 minutes of travel remaining and then they would reach the outer circle of security fence. Sunset would not be for another hour. Manny Giles noticed something strange enough that he called the others to attention. An almost skeletal mossy green ghoul clumsily shambled up the roadway from the direction they had come. Dehydration had robbed the creature of any audible voice and famine had starved it too long for it to have much in the way of vigor. If privation in the desert could kill infected, the creature that pitifully pursued them should have already fallen victim to it. That desert ghoul dragged one spindly leg as it crept closer with almost comical deliberation. So much of its tissue mass had shriveled away that it had probably been a lurker for years. Aside from its leafy chlorophyll color, the ghoul's appearance made it clear how someone might confuse it with an animated corpse such as a zombie. The thing was undoubtedly undead, but equally so, it was not really alive either, not in the sense of any biology that a human could recognize as being akin to their own. Resimer the Sand Tiger chuckled about the pathetic abomination, would you look at that? What a nasty bugger that one is. He headed off that way to get a closer inspection of the weathered ghoul. It was unlike anything he had ever seen as a seaborne survivor that lived as far from deserts as the world offered the opportunity. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Frank Peterson cautioned the man. What is he going to do? Resimer chortled. That worn out old git probably doesn't even have any teeth left and couldn't chase down a turtle if he did. Tortoise, said Carmen. What? Resimer asked her for clarification. Turtles live around water, Carmen explained to him. Tortoises live in deserts, and anyway, you need to keep your distance. Like all lurkers, shambling leather bones are deceptively dangerous. Resimer gave the lot of them a downward swipe of his dismissive hand to show that he didn't believe it. That whole dog has chewed his last bone, the sand tiger joked. As it turned out, the same dryness and dust that ravaged the ghoul in general also caked over its sunken unblinking eyes. Once the pinholes of its pupils took focus on Resimer, the ghoul quite literally sprang to animated life. Wiry arms swung in great sweeps so that their momentum allowed it to take wild bounding strides on its stiff unbending legs, like a stick man might run. In a sorry way, the ghoul demonstrated the perfect opposite of Li Feng's martial arts teachings. Rather than moving from a graceful center, the ghoul was all flailing limbs that dragged its wooden torso along for the ride. Resimer got a real fright, not only because he was the target after unwisely moving too close, but also because he had convinced himself that such an attack could never happen in the first place. A loud snap sounded from the supersonic bullet that Critias quick shot through the ghoul's bobbing head. The back of its skull blew out a slimy green gooey mass of tissue that splatted onto the roadway hole without anything like a splash. Thusly dispatched, the body crashed face down onto the sandy pavement where thick oily green blood slowly oozed out like so much lime pudding. He told you, Manny said because surely it proved that grave walkers knew more about ghouls than sand tigers did. Rosner walked up to get a closer look at the destroyed ghoul. The way that it had green oily slime instead of blood was worthy of curiosity. He finally commented, that is nasty. Is there something around here that is mutating them? That just happens sometimes, Gridius said to explain it. Colonel Flash told me that the deserts are full of them. 
They continue to adapt to conditions until they become like carnivorous plants, surviving off bugs and sunlight. In the Arctic, there are hunters that pack on thick blubber so they don't freeze. Carmen took up one of the plastic shopping bags that had held their food containers. She used it as a glove for when she dragged the body out of the roadway by an ankle. When Carmen left the desert adapted ghoul to lay beside the road, it was no more or less dead than it was before Critias had shot its slime-colored brain out. The only real difference was that the creature would never hunt for food again. Its green undead tissue would be there imperishable for many years to come. As Colonel Davis walked up to her, Carmen contemplated her bag glove as though she didn't want to be a litter bug, but then she just tossed it away, leaving her hand clean from the filthy ghoul. Keeping his voice low, Hiram asked her, Are you still using one of those gadgets of yours to signal the drone? Yes sir, Carmen confirmed it. She understood that the colonel's concern was that since the drone was out of missiles, that she might have thought it was no longer valuable to them. Carmen didn't believe that Hiram knew that she was an android or a cyborg, but he was aware that she and Critias possessed a wide range of exotic technology that was well beyond his understanding. He did fully comprehend that the contemporary technology that normally piloted those military drones was a bulky array of equipment that would not in any way be concealable. It was more on the order of a tractor trailer, or even two of them for additional support equipment like transmitters and a generator. Carmen suspected that Hiram assumed that she was a watcher like Verloc, but it was possible that Jim and or Jack had told him everything because of his high-ranking importance. Colonel Davis might have to take over as either their king or as Grand Marshal if those posts became vacant. If they did keep him up to speed on her secrets, Carmen would not begrudge it. Regardless, she had Hiram's respect and they had an excellent working relationship. Hiram delved into her plan, can we get a look at their base yet or do you want to wait until dark? We don't want to tip them off that we are coming, but that patrol back there might have radioed a warning to them already. They didn't use a radio, Carmen said with certainty. It is possible that they didn't have a long-range transmitter, but I think it just as likely that they thought our motorcycles were no match for them, so they had no need. Once the fighting started, they no longer had the option. Either way, Groom Lake is still unaware we are on our way. The drone is at too high an altitude for them to detect it without an active radar. Carmen informed him on what she could see through the drone, their base does have an impressive number of aircraft and vehicles. Nearly all of it has just been sitting around for years unused. In the area of what appears to be their occupied buildings, there is a tracked armored vehicle with a 20mm Gatling cannon. While operational, it would easily destroy us or our reinforcements. Other than that, I don't see anything of particular concern. None of their personnel are moving in the open. That seems reasonable considering the heat of daylight hours. He inquired, what about infected? Their security fence is in good repair, Carmen reported. Body piles at regular intervals along the outside of the perimeter indicate that they have had calling operations in the past where they removed the ghouls that had built up along their wire. At the moment, I don't see any active infected. They have a good thing going on then, Hiram said conversationally. With electricity from the dam, they have all the amenities and pumps for well water. I asked Leon about the food, Carmen told him. They use one of the islands in the reservoir for their fishing boats. About 40 kilometers further north, they have a farming village populated by slaves. As I understand it, they are mostly autonomous so long as they hand over all of their surplus produce and livestock. Colonel Davis considered everything she said before he asked, Do you think we can get to the fence line undetected and then move in on foot? That shouldn't be any problem, Carmen advised. They managed to fence in a lot of area enough that we would be well out of sight from their occupied spaces when we do reach it. Turning back to the vehicles, Hiram called out to Critias, can you make us a map, like that time down in the subway? Critias's helmet had multi-purpose laser emitters that could do targeting, scanning, and project video or graphics. Carmen sent him a HUD application that contained all her data and included continuous updates from the Predator drone as it stealthily observed the Groom Lake base. The ridges that enclosed their valley already blocked the afternoon sunshine such that Critias could beam a colored wireframe map on the roadway that was suitably visible. What is that? Leon gasped when he saw that technology. It really got him thinking. He had to ask, what kind of pistols are those? Leon had seen Critias shoot the mummified ghoul and recognized how it was the same model as the one Carmen had let him use. He had fired hers and knew that whatever it was, it didn't operate on gunpowder. He had seen the HUD helmets that some pilots used. Those had cost millions of dollars and were nothing compared to what Critias had. Still coming to his senses, he asked, who is flying the drone? There are no control trailers at the dam and you had never been to Indian Springs before, so you didn't steal one from there. Carmen walked up close to Leon and then said peaceably, 
We brought you here so that you could help save your friends. Now is that time. Unless you provide us with other options, we will have to suppress them aggressively and many of them will die. Okay, Leon agreed as he went closer to see the map. After looking it over, he explained what he saw, this green line must be the fence. We pulled up the security fence in other places to enclose the core area of the base. These are the fuel storage tanks. This is the pumping house for our water. These big hangers here are the ones for the aircraft we still use. These smaller hangers along this side and all these trailers are for living areas. Hiram pointed out the anti-aircraft autocan, is this operational? It is now, Leon confirmed it. That was a priority when they thought you might bomb us or something. It works even better against ground targets. Critias asked him, how many people do you think they have left, and are any of them the assholes who knew how to operate that contraption? It is just about all women at this point, Leon admitted with a shrug. There will be about a hundred of them and most of them know how to fight. I am hoping I will get a chance to talk to them and calm things down. I don't even know who all died when you ambushed us at the airport. I don't know who was shooting at me back there at Indian Springs, but that was two of them at least. My guess is that there will be eight to twelve men left not counting the farmers up north. We never let them have any weapons other than spears to keep the creatures off their fences. Critias had to ask, why did the women stay behind during your attack? That was the general's idea, Leon answered. Platt asked, your general didn't believe in taking women into combat? No way, Leon declared. He figured that anyone who had his woman with him might decide to change sides and go join King Louis. Leon chuckled at the truth of it, you know the show he broadcasts, a dance club with real booze and his Le Cordon Bleu chef. He was right, plenty of people were ready to get out of this goddamn desert. Even if they didn't turn right away, he worried that after he took back the dam from you guys, they would turn on him then, just set up their own community, and then turn off the electric until the base caved in. So long as he had all the women as hostages back at the base, he figured he could trust all the men to follow his orders. I suppose he was right. Platt questioned him, where is your general now? Leon gestured to Critias, the percolator hit him with that missile wiped him out and his whole command staff. He dark roasted their asses and then ground them all up into fine espresso. Carmen politely cleared her throat to not come across as being overly critical as she informed Leon, his nom de guerre is percala, not percolator. Though I do appreciate your excellent idioms within the genre. When she turned back to face Critias, she unleashed her silent but fully guffawing expression over his potential new nickname of the percolator. Since Critias couldn't give Carmen the revenge sex that she deserved, and certainly wanted, he kept his mind on the mission. He pressed Leon, what is the story about this old general of yours? Don't you have another one confined somewhere? Copper wasn't a general, Leon told them. He was a doctor, not the medical kind, a physicist or computer guy kind of thing. I think he used to study radar or jamming it, something like that. He was the one who set up the community and kept it all working. His computers were downloading all kinds of satellite stuff. When he learned about the Navy ships and the King Louis show, he wanted to answer the invitation to talk. The general didn't want to do it because he said your show was just fishing for new victims to attack so that you could kidnap the women and steal food. Most everyone were with Copper and thought it was the way to go. Carmen felt moved by his story. She urged him for more, then why didn't you call us? Leon had a good reason as he said, the general got access to the information that Copper had been skimming from the satellite traffic. He showed everyone proof that after a community at the Denver airport contacted King Louis, he flew in there, killed everyone, and then flew home with all the women and food. He showed us communication logs. It was even the official continuity of government bunker for the president and Congress. Once everyone saw that the general was right, Copper ended up under arrest. The general wouldn't kill him because only Copper knew how to make a lot of things work. He is a smart guy, there is no doubt about that. That explanation could not have been further away from what Carmen had expected, or perhaps hoped. She immediately turned to see Lee Fang and when their eyes met, Carmen respectfully lowered her gaze. When Carmen had gone along to liberate the Denver community from the insane precedent, it was absolutely one of the best things she had ever done. Carmen had even gotten two wonderful daughters out of it. That great success had eventually come back in an unexpected way as a harm somewhere else. Good and bad had just happened in the unpredictable way that Lee Fang had taught Carmen that it would. It simply wasn't possible for anyone to know the good or the bad that their actions might result in. It wasn't the belief that right and wrong no longer mattered, just to the contrary, because it mattered so much, Carmen had to evaluate her actions by other methods. By doing the right thing and saving people in Denver, 
Her actions had also reverberated in an impossibly unpredictable way to cause misfortune for the community at Groom Lake. Carmen in no way blamed herself for that. It was just the unfathomable nature of the universe that it interwove with such absurd complexity that all anyone could do was their best and then take the consequences as they came. Critias believed that he knew enough already to see where things were headed. He told Leon, point out the place where they are holding this copper guy. Leon indicated a fence-off square with a trailer home in the middle of it. They had him under house arrest right there. The prison of copper was well off away from any other occupied buildings. Hiram questioned Leon about it. How many guards are normally there watching him? Just two of those creatures, Leon said with an added gesture toward the infected that Critias had shot. The general kept them on long chains between the layers of fence. He would pull them back by their chains when he wanted to talk to him. Colonel Davis had his plan ready in mind. He told Carmen. You will sneak in with Verloc. The two of you will secure that anti-aircraft gun. I will hike in with the Grave Walkers and Leon. We will get this copper guy out of his prison. Once we have him, he can take charge over his people and we can bring this to an end without a fight. If at all possible, I would like to get this resolved without having to shoot anyone. Hiram told Critias, while we are away, just stay with the vehicles and be ready to move and when anything goes wrong. Pacifying them by force remains an option if they won't do this the easy way. As the sun continued to set toward darkness, the Predator drone's thermal spectrum cameras became progressively more useful. After the desert terrain shed its heat, there was much greater contrast for warm bodies. From the drone's eye view, Critias saw that Groom Lake itself was a vast salt flat that had served the old military as natural runway surface. On the near side of the salt flat was a typical airbase not appreciatively different from any of the others that Critias had seen before. He had no doubt that it was the free electricity from the dam and the conspicuous absence of wandering ghouls that gave the place its only appealing aspects. As darkness fell across the desert, Colonel Davis got their vehicles underway. Carmen and Verla continued to scout ahead on their motorcycles as a precaution against any anti-vehicle mines or possible ambush. No guards awaited them at the vehicle gate and the fence line. The fence itself was of the common chain-link variety, topped with barbed wire, and in good repair. A large and sustained attack by ghouls or even just one hunter would be able to bypass such soft security. It was the harshness of the desert and the remoteness of the location that was the real defense. A lone water impoverished ghoul that came upon the fence while wandering across the desert would find the barrier as reason enough to continue by some less troublesome way. Carmen and Verloc left their motorcycles parked beside an empty guardhouse at the gate. It was Verloc who removed the combination padlock that kept the gate chained shut. She used a strip of metal that she peeled from an old aluminum beverage can. After a bit of dexterous fiddling, she popped the lock open undamaged. Carmen used a low voice as she cautioned everyone, their community appears to be waking up. Most of the traffic is gathering at the same large building. Leon informed them, they will be heading to dinner at the mess hall. This could work to our advantage, having them all in one place. Manny walked up behind Leon to warn him, since you're coming with us, don't do anything unless we tell you. I will always assume the worst, and I'm not taking any chances. Carmen and Verloc pulled on desert camouflage balaclavas so their faces wouldn't shine in the starlight as they crept up on the Groom Lake community. After a go-ahead signal from Hiram, both women jogged off into the darkness to do their part. Critias gave Hiram a wave as the colonel headed off on foot with Manny, Frank, and Leon to go release that man copper. Once both teams were away, Major Feng calmly approached and then asked Critias, what happens next? Instead of his usual answer of not knowing, Critias gave it some thought before he made an educated guess. Carmen and Verloc will find something interesting and then go off mission for the fun and excitement. It will probably work out for the best anyway, because those two together are more than anyone could handle. The colonel will find that copper guy, only he will be more trouble than he is worth. If he had any sense in the first place, they would never have locked him up. About that time, everything will go unexpectedly crazy and they will call for us to clean up their mess. So I have time for a cup of tea then, Lee said as though she had heard good news. Like some? Yes please, Critias accepted. Having overheard, the Sand Tigers wanted some too. Chapter 6. Carnival of the Animals The Groom Lake watched our blended into the mountainside so perfectly that no one would notice it unless they knew exactly where to look, and then only in sunshine. As night fell, Lady Delacre awoke from her daylight-induced narcolepsy. When the sun rose, she had retreated into the dark interior of a closet and then spent the daytime hours in a sleep-like state. Much like Tal Butt's madness, her watcher insanity was genuinely beyond her willful control. Her lunacy aside, it was also true that she didn't keep an alarm clock. When the sun went down, 
she invariably knew it, even while inside a dark room. Professor Carnegie had never tried to figure that one out, since he believed her to genuinely be an Osferatu. Dosh was more of the practical sort. When a specific mission did not have him otherwise grossly invested, he had more interest in his daily affairs like the cleaning of his gear and cooking their dinner. It was Talbot who had a riveting concern to keep watch. He was never confident with the belief that the survivor community didn't care about their abandoned buildings outside their fences. Talbot imagined that the people would appear armed with guns and torches to then siege the tower. He watched from the uppermost level where there was a narrow slit in the concrete for observation from behind a drape of camouflage netting. When the sun went down, Talbot turned his spotting scope to watch the inhabitants of the community come out of their air-conditioned mobile homes and remodeled hangars. Nearly all of their living areas were together like a village behind another layer of security fence. The community had a fleet of electric golf carts that they used for motoring around the airbase. It was the huge military command office building that was their destination of choice. As the largest structure on the base that didn't house aircraft, it was the common area with storage for food and weapons. It contained the kitchens, dining hall, and their medical center. Once Talbot felt certain that an assault force of vehicles was not going to come to attack them, he swiveled the enormous spotting scope over the other way. From then on, he diligently scanned the desert around the road that approached from Indian Springs. Talbot's first reaction was fear because the pessimist in him believed that the general and his army were back. That worry vanished just as quickly because Talbot had seen those men dead or captured with his own eyes. The vehicles he saw coming across the desert had to be Colonel Hiram Davis and his soldiers making good on their promise to subjugate all that remained of their groom lake enemy. Two motorcycles were up front as they led the rally truck and their luxury sedan, which Talbot recognized from the damn community. He hoped that they hadn't accidentally encountered Gustav and Blacksburg. The soldiers would have likely killed them by mistake when they didn't recognize each other. Here comes King Louis, Talbot called out loud enough that Dosh would hear him downstairs. I can't tell how many men they have. Probably not more than a dozen. Let me see, De Locker whispered from behind Talbot's ear, scaring him with her sudden appearance. Don't do that, he complained about her spooky habit of creeping up on people. Talbot gave up the seat. She used the spotting scope to watch the vehicles approach and then stop at the security fence right there below their watchtower. When they got out and started confabbing, she gave up watching. De Locker told Talbot, It is time for you to go down and say hello. He was about to argue that she had volunteered him except that he was the only person in their group that Colonel Davis had met before. The soldiers from King Louis's army would not know Dosh or Lady de Locker from enemies, and besides, both of them were totally insane. Talbot still wasn't sure what he would tell Colonel Davis about them. Dosh had convinced himself that he was a pistol-packing dinosaur, and she believed that she was a mesmerizing blood-sucking seductress in the convention of Lily Munster, Vampira, and Morticia Adams. Even when the colonel did learn that they were friendly, he might not want their company. It was odd to Talbot that he was the only one among the three watchers with a genuine supernatural condition, and yet he could pass for human while the others were too bizarre for anyone to readily accept. His thoughts reminded Talbot to finish his small cup of Wolf Spain potion that suppressed his lycanthropy. According to Professor Carnegie, Talbot's disease would become less allergic to moonlight as time went on. Perhaps one day, only the full moon would be intense enough to trigger his episodes. For the time being, it was best if he took his medicine every evening to head off any potential attacks. Dosh called to Talbot, go see those friends of yours before they do something stupid and get us all killed. Down below the tower, Carmen and Verluck went off on their mission as did Colonel Davis with his team. The grave walkers angled away from the living areas of the community, their destination was the isolated prison of the former base leader, which was out in the middle of the crisscrossing airbase runways and taxiing lanes. Carmen and Verluck's path was up through the developed part of the airbase, just ahead of them was an enormous aircraft hangar capable of servicing one of the jumbo-sized cargo planes. The huge building stood out in that regard because the base had many smaller hangars appropriate for drone and fighter aircraft. It was rows of those smaller hangars refitted as living spaces that made up one side of the mobile home village that the survivors had assembled. The women had no interest in that hangar for the moment, so they continued on past it. As they reached the corner of the hangar's paved cement lot, Verloc saw a pair of golf carts parked at the far side of the hangar their electrical cords plugged in for recharging. Hey, Verloc said while she gestured that way. It took only a moment for Carmen to calculate the risks and benefits. If one of the Groom Lake survivors saw them sneaking about, they would assume the worst, that they were intruders or ghouls. Carmen reasoned aloud, we would fit right in. No one would think anyone was crazy enough to just drive around openly on their base as one of them. Shows what they know, Verloc replied cheerfully. They don't understand who they're dealing with. 
They dashed over to the hangar together, unplugged the better looking of the two carts, and then both hopped in, Verloc driving. Colonel Davis and his group had no cover at all as they crossed large patches of flat desert and then lanes of runway. There was nothing they could do other than rely on darkness and just hope that no guards watched carefully in their direction. It was Hiram that glanced back and noticed the golf cart with two occupants as it went along the roadway far off to their left. His first worry was that it was a guard patrol passing close to where Carmen and Verluck would be. After he recalled Carmen's plan for her and Verluck to ride under the Predator drone and then land at the base instead of driving, Hiram rightly guessed that it had to be them in the cart. His own group traveled totally exposed on foot, so he couldn't honestly believe that they were any worse off in that electric cart than he was himself without one. All the activity of the base survivors coming out of their homes did generate a goodly amount of noise. People talked to their neighbors and banged doors on their trailers. Because they knew their commanding general and nearly all of their men were gone, there was an atmosphere of fear about the place. They knew that the people who plundered Denver had already taken their dam, destroyed their manpower, and would soon do the same to them. Everyone still alive in the dying time world understood the same feeling of waiting for doom to arrive. The weak of the world were long since dead. For the strong, that fear manifested in a gregarious way. It made people louder, more boisterous, as a way to cope with their anxiety and show it their strength to endure. That emotion, determined camaraderie, and the sounds of life were acid on the brain of the man who had been with Lady de Lockerer the night before. For a long time they had a special arrangement. She had provided him with pills, liquor, or anything else he wanted from the outside world. In return, the man gave her uncontaminated human blood. Lady de Locker was obviously crazy, a goth culture weirdo that pretended she was a vampire or witch. But what did he care? He lived trapped on a high security military base where contraband luxuries had always been unattainable even before the world upended and died. There was no shortage of survivors willing to give a pint of blood in exchange for a share of the barter. After the official falling out with the Watchers, he still had a relationship with Lady de Locker. There was no life worth living without the party that she could provide. When the general declared the Watchers enemies, all that changed was that he had to meet with her in secret to do their trading. A dose of crushed methaquilone pills mixed into his whiskey was all that Lady de Locker needed to place him under her hypnotic vampire power. She had fed on him directly at her leisure, and in so doing, infected him as the bite of any ghoul would. The man had eventually staggered home to his trailer where he slept away the whole of the day, gradually losing his humanity and becoming one of the infected. Come sunset and the commotion of his community. The deranged and infected fool flung open his front door and then staggered drunkenly out into the cool night air. As if the Groom Lake airbase did not have enough intruders already for one night, Gustav and Blacksburg rounded the northern end of the mountains to approach the community from that other side. Because the noise of his motorcycle would have put him at risk of discovery, Gustav rode on the back of Blacksburg instead. While riding him side saddle, Gustav was no more of a burden to that behemoth swine than would have been a flea. A rope around Blacksburg's great neck allowed the hog to drag the ragged remains of an antelope he had eaten. The miserable bloody skin and head was a feast for famished ghouls fresh from their prison in the silver mine. As they scuffled for possession of it, fought and fussed, Blacksburg trotted along dragging it from their grasp. A fight for food was always cause for other ghouls to take interest. In this way, Gustav lured his whole army of hundreds onward to the airbase. Colonel Davis led his group up to the outermost layer of the security fences that surrounded the isolated mobile home which was the reputed residence of the man they knew as Copper. Leon's description had been entirely accurate. A second fence inside the first created a dog trot between them where a pair of emaciated desert ghouls could each roam about half a space. Long chains that bound them about their midsections limited the range of their movements. The anchors for those chains were at hand cranked twinches outside the barrier, placed in such a way that both ghouls could meet at the front of the trailer with its only door. The windows all had bars to keep the infected from forcing their way inside. A pair of ghouls and chains or otherwise on the loose were not enough to give trepidation to any grave walker. Leon was still unarmed and living precariously as both a prisoner to Colonel Davis and possibly a traitor to his former community. His thoughts stayed anything but ordered or sublimated such that both ghouls sensed his presence before he got close enough for them to see him. The guardian ghouls shambled to the near side of their containment and then moaned a bit with anticipation. That was the extent of their commotion because Frank Peterson gave them each a subsonic hollow point bullet to the forehead from his suppressed submachine gun. Both shots were accurately to the firmest portion of their skulls to make certain that his bullets fragmented and then stayed in their heads rather than passing through to end up somewhere unintended. Manny Giles came prepared with the bolt cutters that he had first intended for the front gates, before Verloc had jimmied them open with a slight trick. He snipped off the strong padlock that secured the first gate into the dog trot and then proceeded to repeating the process on the second inner barrier. 
Just as they unlocked the second gate, the door to the trailer home opened to reveal a mature man who stood in the back lead entryway. Copper was in his late fifties, reasonably fit, and wearing glasses. Proper eye wear was noticeable in that such things could become easily broken and were difficult to replace under present circumstances. Who are you now? Copper asked them not sounding worried, elated, or surprised. He wasn't even all that curious, more like he answered his door for a random knock that turned out to be salesman. My name is Colonel Davis, Hiram told him. We work for King Louis. I believe you know this man, Hiram referred to Leon. He told us that your community was under the impression that we raided the bunker under the Denver airport. King Louis did, but... Copper cut him off with a hand gesture that Hiram should pause, you would be the same Colonel Hiram Davis who was there in Denver and King Louis came to your rescue. The precedent had lapsed into some sort of madness, perhaps due to food poisoning or just stress. Manny snarled, stress. He wasn't mad and it wasn't no food poisoning. Bleibermann was drunk with power, declared himself a god, and then began eating people but only after he finished playing with them in his rape dungeon. The colonel silenced Manny with a hand gesture and then told Copper, if you know all of that, then you must have some idea why we are here. You want the dam of course, Copper replied. It is the best hope left in the world. There is enough electrical power there to rebuild civilization, if only someone has the wisdom and ambition to exploit it. Your King Louis knows all this, and so you are here. I am a prisoner and you want to rescue me so that I can speak to my people on King Louis's behalf. After a poignant pause that prepared them for disappointment, he warned, the men who imprisoned me are not going to be inclined to listen to reason, certainly not from me. We already took the dam, Hiram informed him on current events, and killed your general. Most of his men are dead. We have others like Leon in our custody. They decided that joining us was preferable to dying out in the deserts on their own. I agree, Copper said with a bit of cheer on his face. I would also prefer to join King Louis rather than die out in the desert. Where shall I begin? Carmen and Verluck took their golf cart past various hangars and workshops that had always been a part of an aeronautics research airbase. There were three large gates on different sides that opened into the inner fence that surrounded the community's housing area. Right outside that innermost gate that faced the runways was that tracked armored personnel carrier with its six-barreled turret-mounted Vulcan autocan. In the right hands, the machine was equally capable of destroying aircraft out of the sky, vehicles on the ground, or whole tribes of infected. While its ammunition lasted, it was the supreme power on the air base. Of the precious few men still alive in the community, two of them manned a defense cannon. One of them was up on top, ready to operate the turret. The other stood on the ground near the front of the vehicle where he waited impatiently. Verloc drove their cart right up to the standing man as though she and Carmen belonged there. The man up top didn't make anything of them as the women got out of the cart. With balaclavas covering their faces, no one would be able to tell who they were in the dark. The airbase didn't burn open lights that would antagonize infected from a great distance off into the wild desert. It's about time, the standing man snapped at them. You want us to miss dinner or what? Carmen just shrugged to say she didn't really care if they did. The man became suspicious because he didn't recognize either of them and he obviously knew everyone who lived in his own community, especially the shapely females worthy of watching. He asked, how did you get out here? The man realized that they had driven up from a peculiar direction when the gate they should have used was right behind him. Verloc thumbed over toward the south gate that was well out of sight because of all the mobile homes between them and there. The man considered that and it was possible. For people who lived on that side of the village, they could use the other gate if they wanted. Just as the man decided to press them to reveal who they were, Carmen raised her arm straight out in front of her, took a shuffling step forward, and then moaned comically like a zombie. It was a mocking performance that insinuated the man was a chicken heart that wanted to fearfully bemoan all his frightful worries. The joke of it all had to be, that two women right in front of him could possibly be anyone else other than who they were supposed to be, women of the community. Let's go already, said the other man as he climbed down off the machine. I'm starving. They can sit on this miserable turd for a while. Let's go eat. The first man gave the woman a shooing motion with his hand that showed he was brave and now tired of their tedious feminine antics. Both men walked off together, went through the gate, and then headed for the command building where the community gathered for the evening meal. Verloc chuckled as they departed and she added a raised armed zombie moan for good measure. They both laughed together at that and it made the man raise an offensive finger at them without turning around. Once the men were out of earshot, Verloc asked Carmen, what do we do with it? Disable the gun and then go back? It's so big, Carmen said longingly about the auto cannon. I've never gotten to play with anything big as this before. It would be a shame to break it before we got a chance to try it out. 
Verloc climbed up the front of the carrier and then looked down into the driver's compartment. Show me how to drive it then, she suggested to prolong their adventure. If they are going to be trouble, we can stick them all up at the same time with this Godzilla gat, just as a warning. We have a duty to keep all our options open, Carmen said in agreement as she climbed up too. Critias's helmet had a straw that he could use for drinking his tea and it even had a filter that would keep him safe from any contamination. His sense of shame urged him to take his helmet off anyway. It was not wise or professional to let his pride get the better of him, but Critias would not sip his tea through a straw while true heroes in the days of the king lived in the open and drank from their cups. Deprived of his helmet, Critias did not have the enhanced senses to notice Talbot as he cautiously crept down the rough mountain road from the watchtower in the rocky slope above the gate. While Critias's socializing robbed him of wiser caution, Ruby's somewhat novice paranoia kept her aggressively alert and wearing her night vision goggles. She only sipped at her tea when her patrol circuit brought her around past the back of the rally truck each time. Talbot managed to get close enough undetected that he could have made a rush upon them unawares as would a properly malevolent ghoul. He was not so near that the rush would have been successful because Ruby came around the truck in time that she would have been in a position to stop him. Even in the dark, Ruby saw that it was a man in proper clothes and thus not a feral infected. His rifle stayed slung over his shoulder. She felt confident that his intentions were not immediately hostile. Ruby called out in a low voice from behind him, Stay where you are and identify yourself. It's me, Talbot answered, from before. He slowly turned around so that she could recognize his face. When he saw her relax, Talbot said, I talk to my friends and they want to cooperate. The way he mentioned friends caused Ruby to glance up the dark slope of the mountain. She couldn't see anything up there, just the many shades of green that was all her goggles had to offer. Looking back to Talbot, she gestured with her submachine gun, The others will want to hear this. Critias had his helmet on by the time Talbot came around the truck. He had heard Ruby and guessed who she could have a pleasant conversation with. When he saw it was Talbot, Critias wasn't all that friendly as he asked, What the hell are you doing out here? It wasn't possible for Critias to overlook the possibility that Talbot had been meeting with the men of the airbase, making some sort of treacherous deal. I was looking for a friend, Talbot explained with blatant honesty. We thought he came here to get even with them for the bad way they treated us. We didn't find him and nothing has happened. So there is that. Critias pressed him, who is we exactly? Talbot loosened his collar as he thought about how to explain that. My friend Dosh is with me, he said guardedly. Dosh is real sensitive about his face and wears a mask. It would be nice if you could just not give him a hard time about it. I get it, Critias told him impatiently. You guys tend to have issues. It will be best for everyone if you just tell us what to watch out for. Dosh thinks he is a lizard, Talbot said sheepishly. An alien lizard bounty hunter is what he says. He just shrugged because that was the best explanation he had about that. I also have Lady Delacroix with me. She thinks she is a vampire, but in a good way. Critias wanted more, and you, what do you have? Talbot lost his color over that and didn't want to say. Finally he said, I am just a regular guy. There is a medicine that I take that keeps my condition under control. Professor Carnegie makes it for me. He isn't here and neither is Ophelia. She is harmless just keeps to herself. We came here to find Gustav. As that name came up, Talbot hesitated to find the right words. Gustav is not a bad guy really, just a little temperamental. Mostly he just likes to fix things, and explore. Once you get to know him, he is alright. You know that you can make us sick, Critias tested him. Right? Asymptomatic carriers, Talbot said with a nod. Cutter said that you had a doctor, a doctor kind who could cure us. We do. Critias confirmed it, but he is far away from here. It might be a long time before you ever see him. Until you do, you need to keep to yourselves and make sure you don't infect any of our people. That goes for your vampire lady in particular. Talbot offered, they are nearby if you would like to meet them. They need to stay where they are for now, Critias cautioned him. We have to get this place under control before we start having a meet and greet. If they are waiting someplace safe, go back and tell them to stay undercover until we are done. With that out of the way, Critias contacted Carmen by interlink to tell her, I assume you have been listening in. Talbot is with you, Carmen replied. He has two friends with him. One is a man named Dosh, who identifies as an anthropomorphic reptilian skip tracer, from outer space. The other is female and identifies as a vampire as in the Count Dracula variety. Critias said, yeah, with all the burdened annoyance he could put into it without saying swell. There is also this third guy, they are calling him Gustav. They believed he was on some kind of revenge kick and might be in the area. 
I want you to do a wider search with the drone outside the fence line, see what you can come up with. We can't afford to underestimate just how crazy these watchers are. Since she had her new orders, he needed to ask, where are you now? At that exact moment, Carmen didn't have time to talk. She just sent Gridius a live audio-visual feed from her own senses. Verloc was down in the hole at the front of the vehicle that was the driver's position. Carmen stood over her to explain what all of the controls did. That was when the nearby gate opened and a golf cart came out with two women dressed in military fatigues. They were the actual shift replacements for the men who had already gone off to dinner. What are you doing? One of the women asked sounding annoyed. Who told you to take this shift? The other woman got out of the cart too, but she didn't say anything. Her attention was on Carmen. At first she just didn't recognize who she was. Upon inspection, she noticed that Carmen was all wrong, her clothes, her pistol belt, and especially her sword. No one at Groom Lake ever wore a sword. The woman could not even think of anyone who owned one. As Critias watched, he saw the subtle change in the second woman, the way she deepened her posture, a moment away from going for her weapon and then opening fire on Carmen. At the same time, Carmen's artificial eyes analyzed everything they could about both women. Her scan finally settled on the woman about to attack her and then fixated on the beaded bracelet that adorned the woman's wrist. Please, Carmen spoke to the woman in her southern Paiute language. We only want to help you escape this place. Apart from Kevin, Carmen's android brother back home, they were the last two people alive on earth who knew her exotic tongue. Verloc had no clue what Carmen said, but she thrust up her hand from the driver's pit to give a thumbs up sign. The Paiute woman told her companion, we need to get back to the hall. This is under control here. Wait, the woman said in refusal. Now, the Paiute woman commanded, obviously pulling rank. The other woman relented and then returned to the golf cart. She only looked back once before they had driven away. Cameras on the Predator drone had kept watch inside the airbase. When Critias ordered Carmen to explore further out into the desert, she obeyed and redirected the aircraft. It wasn't long before her thermal imager discovered Blacksburg with Gustav on his back. A fanned out wake of hundreds of ghouls trailed behind them. They were only minutes away from the northern fence. What Gustav and his ghouls would do then was anyone's guess. Video quality was rather good for a primitive thermal camera. The cool night background temperature and Carmen's secondary enhancements helped a lot. Through the relay, Critias saw Blacksburg only he couldn't comprehend what it was that big, on all fours, and among the infected. He asked Carmen, what the hell is that thing? Is that some kind of hunter? It has to be, right? My analysis is clear, Carmen replied as a preparatory excuse. That appears in all respects to be a razorback, ineluctably, it must be a domesticated man pig chimera, undoubtedly a product of pre-downfall genetic medical research. It successfully contracted the infection and then transformed into a watcher hunter boar monster that has since returned to wild foraging habits to meet its significant dietary requirements. In total, I would cite that creature as a perfect example of a rogue wave in probability, unbelievable, especially because, there it is. I did ask, Critias said in light of her weighty and incredible answer. Do you have any thoughts on why he is riding it? I can only assume that he is that Gustav that Talbot was searching for. It probably beats walking, Carmen jested. Perhaps Gustav likes truffles or just wants to keep his ear to public opinion. That creature is a wondrous oddity to be sure, a unique curiosity of nature. I would rather not bear the mark of destroying another. Critias instructed her, if one of you has to be the bacon, you make it him. How is the rest of our mission going? She reported, now that we have the anti-aircraft gun under our control, everyone is moving into position. Colonel Davis has Mr. Copper with him and they are coming to me. Gustav and his porcine companion are nearing the perimeter fence. What do you want me to do? We didn't tell Gustav to become a murderous asshole, Critias said to Carmen. If we engage him first, the whole place is going to go completely nuts. They will think it is a King Louis invasion and then we will have a shooting war with their people too. You will just have to hold your position and wait for Colonel Davis. We are coming to you. His plan didn't sit too well with Carmen. Any ghoul attack was a bad thing of course. On the other hand, that airbase outdoors was just about the perfect place for it if you had to have one. Back home, the constant high humidity prolonged the survival of spilled ghoul blood. The arid sandy climate of the desert was ideal for killing infected blood cells once they had splattered the ground. Only a large mass of ghoul tissue could have any chance to endure as an infectious hazard. Anything small invariably dried out completely and then succumbed to a brace of disintegration. Carmen did see some major complications, like how defensive gunfire would damage their homes and other shelters. If the infected got inside the buildings, 
the mess would be far greater a decontamination chore to clean up. Nearly everyone was inside the command building by then. Carmen couldn't help but notice the infected soldier as he stumbled about. She had actual recorded memory of when she watched Adrian Finkler suffer from the same condition back in the future of Chicago IRC. They suffered from the last semi-functional stage of the transformation, a condition that marshals generally referred to as the brain fry. The man had not fully turned and it would be a long while before his new biology generated the chloroplasts that would make him detectable as a ghoul using ultraviolet excited chlorophyll fluorescence. The man did still possess some of his former intelligence, but he also suffered from the conflicted emotional urges of a ghoul. He both loved and hated the people of his old community. The disease already exploited his desire to seek them out for help. Later, when he found them, it would amplify his enraged resentment when they couldn't give him any aid. Since he was on his way toward the entrance into the command building where everyone was having their supper, the infected man was a real disaster in the making. Someone needed to stop him and no one else was in a position to help other than Carmen. She called to Verloc urgently, we need to get that guy over there. He is infected and about to go into their fun land. Verloc asked, what about this thing? Just remove the keys, Carmen advised, the turret is electric. Without keys, this rig is as useless as a wet paper sandwich. While Verloc climbed out of the somewhat inconvenient driver's well, Carmen hopped off the vehicle and then dashed over to open the gate. The infected man was nearly to the door inside by then and was quite a long way off. Her first and most expedient option was just to blow his brains out where he stood. The downside was that the man still wore his community uniform. When any of the villagers found him dead from her bullet, they would be calling it murder, not rescue from a naked old leathery ghoul. For lack of any better ideas, Carmen drew her pistol, mentally calculated the velocity setting, and then took a shot to hit him in the head. Her tungsten slug flew so slow that she could watch it travel. Tungsten was not magnetically responsive such that a Tesla flux pistol was incapable of accelerating that metal. Ferris rings strategically built into the bullet were more than enough to drive the whole thing as a projectile. The advantage was that tungsten being extremely heavy for its size, more so than even lead, made the bullets deliver the maximum possible kinetic energy at silent subsonic velocities. Carmen's bullet flew like a lumbering brick that walloped the infected man right upside his head. It didn't kill him or even a draw of blood but it did knock him right off his feet to sprawl out on the dusty ground. By that time, Verloc had jumped into their golf cart and then picked up Carmen on her way past into the housing compound. The two of them drove at humming speed to intercept the infected man who already staggered back up to his feet. The fledgling ghoul got up and then turned his head to search about for what had struck him. Carmen's blow to his skull hadn't made him any saner. She had perhaps made him worse. It was the most infected part of his brain that was best able to fend off a concussion. As the cart raced closer, the ghoul turned toward the oncoming vehicle that he could now see clearly. That was when the front doors into the command center building flew open wide to reveal a whole group of armed women on their way out. When the original anti-aircraft gun crew encountered their replacements at dinner, the suspicious members of both found the nerve to vocally express their confusion about what was going on at their compound. The officers in charge became aware that the people they had assigned to the vehicle were not at their post, and no one else could name who the women were that had taken it over. A mob of them had set off to get to the bottom of the matter. As the women appeared, the ghoul turned on them snarling a hateful hiss that sprayed saliva through clenched teeth. He would have leaped at them, only Verloc brutally ran him with the golf cart, which sent him tumbling across the pavement. The ghoul got a shattered pelvic bone from the impact. Being unable to stand, and an infected, the furious creature was well beyond any concerns for pain or the broken bones. The frustrating agony of trying to get up did make the creature even more violent. Better capable of expressing rage than taking effective action, the ghoul threw his head back and then made a howl of murder lust. All the women saw that he had turned. Not one of them was a stranger to the risks in their world. They had seen countless thousands of ghouls and had certainly killed more than a few to still be alive at all. The Paiute woman dashed up and then buried the pick end of a fire axe into his skull, which permanently shut him up. There was a tense moment where all of the heavily armed women who came out of the building were alarmed to see Verloc and Carmen who were strangers and thus interlopers of some kind. Those same intruders had just given up their control of the Vulcan super cannon to then thankfully rush over and help save everyone from an attack by an infected member of their community. All of them knew that the infection took quite some time to make a person fully grazed. It wasn't like people who had just arrived could have also infected the man. He had been sick for an entire day already to be at the advanced stage of predatory madness. Before the women could reconcile their surprise, confusion, and mixed feelings, an army of nearby ghouls answered the feeding call of the infected guard the Paiute woman had just disabled. 
Gustav's army had reached the outer fence line by then and when they heard that feeding shriek come from inside the airbase, the sound of it was all it took to drive them wild. Not even all of them answered that first scream, perhaps only dozens. Hundreds answered those dozens. A killing storm was on then, and nothing ever turned one off aside from the ghouls running out of things to attack. Because the ghoul army approached from behind the line of remodeled hangars, the people at the command center could not see anything. The infected crashed into the fence back there. After the first few tried to climb over and then entangled themselves in the razor wire mantle, the rest of the packs printed to the south along the fence to find an opening. The leader of the women out front of the command building stepped forward to confront Carmen and Verloc. She demanded with immediacy, Who are you? Where did you come from? What are you doing here? Verloc sprightly sprang from the golf cart and then whipped out her identification wallet with a flip that revealed her shining badge. That moment was her watch or dream being actually true in a real world emergency. I am Special Agent Shield, Verloc stated with heroic gravity. This is my partner, Special Agent Carmen. Sword, Carmen said with quiet regret. Now that she actually had to use it, her secret agent name did sound silly. Verloc continued, The Council of Governors sent us as your first contact rescue team. Welcome back to civilization. The woman leaned in close to stare at the official looking identity badge and then she asked, If you are the first contact team, who else is coming? Carmen had various means to keep track of everyone's location. She told their leader, Here they come now. Colonel Davis and his group caught a ride with Critias as team who picked them up with the Dakar rally race truck and the sedan. They drove in through the main gate together and then pulled up out front of the command building. The Groom Lake survivors were still plenty nervous, not only about the arrival of outsiders, but they still had all those screaming ghouls at their wire to deal with. Everyone in the airbase community was aware something was going on by then. Some of them took up positions in upper windows of the command center to shoot weapons from there if the situation called for it. All the rest were coming out front to see for themselves just what was going on. One of the women hastened to Leon the moment he got out of the truck. She called out to him with joy as she rushed to embrace him. The fact that Leon was not dead took her by surprise. Copper got out of the sedan and then went forward to reassure everyone. These are friends, he said loud enough for everyone to hear. This is Colonel Davis. He was a resident at the Denver base and now is here commanding an expeditionary force for King Louis. Many of the women gasped at the name because they knew King Louis as a pirate warlord, not a savior. They are not our enemies, Copper declared. All the survivors from Denver are now a part of their community as free citizens. All of you can be too if that is your wish. If you would rather just stay here, they will assist you in that. You will all keep your weapons. The running ghoul army got to a place where they saw into the village, in particular, where the light streaming out from the open doors of the command building illuminated the large crowd out front. With a renewed chorus of mad howling, the ghouls flung themselves upon the fence in force. Their combined weight quickly toppled the whole section inward and then hundreds of ghouls poured in through that breach. The second fence that enclosed the village area would not stop them any better. Within a minute, the whole army would swarm into the place and it would be bedlam. Verloc asked Carmen, should we get the cannon? With a sorry shake of her head, Carmen answered, no. It is loaded with high explosive incendiary ammunition. If we use it against the ghouls, the noise will call down hundreds more, and it will set fire to every mobile home or building that we hit we might burn down half the base. She sighed, it would have been so much fun though. The woman speaking for the Groom Lake community called to Hiram, what do we do, Colonel? That fence is not going to hold them. Get your people back, Colonel Davis instructed her. My men have this under control. Our only concern is that some of yours might get excited and then hit one of mine by mistake. All Hiram could do about that was trust that her community had discipline and she could command it in a combat situation. He summoned all his team with a hand gesture as he marched out away from the building to engage the ghouls when they arrived. Joining Colonel Davis in the advance was Frank and Manny for the Grave Walkers, Rosner and Reesheimer for the Sand Tigers, and also Ruby, Pallette, Critias, Carmen and Verloc. Major Fang stayed near the building and their vehicles along with Andy and Sully. As the fighting group approached the middle of the open square that was the center of the village, the airbase leader called to Hiram over the approaching screams of ghouls, Are you sure you can handle them? The colonel took out a road flare, scratched it to burn with light, and then he tossed it ahead of his team so that they all stood waiting in its red illumination. So prepared, Hiram ordered, make it loud. We want to bring them directly to us. All the women at the command building just watched in stunned silence. Colonel Davis's show was only a triviality compared to what they saw next. Lights, racing blinking colored lights appeared in the night sky right above their village where nothing had been only a moment before. 
The lights didn't move through space as they would if they were on a passing aircraft. They seemed to dance along a stationary surface that had to be enormous, far larger than any helicopter could ever be, even much bigger than one of their double-wide mobile homes. Most of them gasped at the incredible sight, and some of them said the impossible truth that they were looking at a spaceship, one of the fabled UFO craft that Area 51 was supposed to be famous for. It would have been unbelievable if they were not seeing it with their own eyes. A strong white light beamed down from the center of the colored blinks. The illumination shined right over the red flare as though the one had been a communication to summon the other. The inner fence fell under the weight of enraged infected and then a flood of them dashed directly for the lights and the people who waited there in the illumination. A half dozen thick ropes fell from the spotlight above to dangle down straight as though still anchored to some fixed position in the sky. Four newly arrived reinforcement sand tigers came whizzing down their individual ropes. While one of their hands controlled their line and speed of descent, their other hand had a submachine gun or an assault rifle that they fired into the onrushing ghoul horde. Two of the other ropes had Juan Villalobos Carlos and Terry Dunbar of the Grave Walkers. Both men performed the same combat repelling technique just as magnificently. Colonel Davis and his original group quickly spread out to the sides so that they formed a firing line that cleared the men as they rappelled down from the hovering black hole airship. All of them expertly made aimed shots on the incoming ghouls, not wasting ammunition or tearing up any of the mobile homes if they could avoid it. Once the first six men were on the ground, Roland and Amber came down next. Both grave walkers rappelled skillfully, but without any attempt to fire a weapon while doing it. Colonel Hiram Davis and a platoon of expert marksmen stood their ground against an army of infected that had only one point of entry and a single clear lane of attack. Their withering gunfire, sometimes automatic, dropped the oncoming ghouls in waves. The mounting bodies hampered the footing of those who came after, slowing them down and making them more vulnerable targets. When their first rush went down destroyed, all that followed were stretched thin, never able to muster numbers capable of gaining ground. Back east at Jim's city, where the infected could pull in hundreds of thousands in reinforcements, the ghouls could win by sheer numbers. The situation as it was, deep in the merciless desert in summer, Gustav's silver mine army had finite numbers that soon dwindled, trickled to a staggered few, and then stopped altogether. Colonel Hiram Davis had successfully captured the hydroelectric dam, repelled all attempts to retake it, and then made peace with the remaining survivors. He had even recruited new watchers who could be valuable in ways no mortal ever could. Hiram was certain that when the governors got his report that Area 51 was under their control, they would be more than pleased. Chapter 7. Cherries and Advice When the ghoul shooting at Groom Lake Air Base ended, Critias didn't stay around for the cleanup work. He told Carmen, you stay here and help Colonel Davis. I am going out to have a talk with our ghoul whisperer. Gustav has been a bad boy and this is not happening again. She somewhat frowned, are you going to hurt him? That's up to Gustav, Critias told her the truth. He is worth more to us alive because we want to work with his friends. If he is a mad dog, they will understand. They did chase him around the desert trying to muzzle his stupid ass. Critias was comfortable leaving Carmen to the task of arranging the cleanup. She was way smarter than he was and knew how to efficiently go about complicated problems like that. His primary concern was with that jerk-off Gustav who still creeped around out in the desert as an amateur jingle bells. Their Predator drone was so fuel-efficient that they had plenty of hours left on it. Since both missiles had already launched, their absence only made it lighter and more streamlined. When it did run out of juice, Carmen would be able to land it right there on the airbase. It had totally proved its worth. No doubt, they would use them again in the future. For the moment, the drone had its thermal camera keeping track of Gustav and his freak show monster pig. Critias knew exactly where to find them. Blacksburg didn't seem to care about anything other than his stomach. He had brundled off to the foothill of the mountain range to feast on all the lush prickly pears there. It was the first time he had found a chance to graze so close to the airbase. His rooting up the ground was just as destructive as reputation held. Pigs were great at eating, but hell on wheels when it came to preventing what they ate from ever growing back again. As Critias walked up out of the dark desert, he found Gustav shoving on the pig's flank in an effort to get him moving. Apparently, Gustav had thought to ride the pig out of there like a black hat bandit making his getaway. He may as well have been shoving on the mountain itself, because Blacksburg just ignored him. Critias called him out at a shout, Gustav, we've had enough of your bullshit. The watcher jumped in surprise and fright before taking cover behind the pig. Blacksburg had certainly heard Critias, but didn't care. He just continued to eat. Gustav shouted back while still hiding behind the pig, how did you hear the name? David Talbot told me, Critias answered him. I know all about Dosh, 
whatever her name is I can't remember, the vampire lady, Professor Carnacki, and Ophelia. The people at the airbase turned on you or something, now you are all sore about it. We killed all your monsters you brought and then made peace with those people. All your friends are going to join us. You are going to join us too or we are going to have a serious problem that you're not going to like. A desert ghoul, one of the stragglers from Gustav's army, it came running in to attack Critias. The cry it made was a Tibetan throat music howler monkey kind of sustained croaking that was surprisingly hideous. Critias cut it short by pistol shooting the rampaging infected through its widely stretched mouth. As the headshot infected skidded to a stop face down in the sand, Blacksburg actually turned his head, albeit still chewing, but he turned to give Critias a contemptuous glance. Seeing the pig's eye was all Critias needed to realize that Blacksburg was not a stupid beast. Pigs in general were smarter than dogs, more on the level with a chimpanzee. In the case of Blacksburg, whether it was the increased volume of his brain size, the human DNA in his genome, or what the infection did to upgrade him like it did with any other watcher, the super swine looked at him with real intelligence. If Critias had to guess, the message from Blacksburg was that Critias had better piss off or the pig was going to teach him some manners. It was true that a heart or lung shot would not kill a destroyer Razorback. The wounds would undoubtedly anger the beast, but not put him down. Nothing but a brain hit would stop Blacksburg. The pig's skin was as good as any leather, only thicker owing to his size. The gristle shield under that skin would almost certainly stop rounds from Critias's pistol. Boars like that saber fought with their tusks, which was probably why they had the gristle armor in the first place. If Critias wanted to kill Blacksburg with his blade, that would be well on the side of amazing. Short of getting the blade into his eye and tickling his brain, Critias would find himself hard pressed to even inflict a meaningful injury. Gustav saw how casually that Critias Wild West quick draw pistol shot that infected in the mouth. It was the motions of a real gunfighter, someone who had done it before and would do it again. Gustav had his hunting rifle slung on his back and he could probably get it ready while hiding behind Blacksburg. Past experience with Dosh had taught Gustav how dangerous a professional could be. Dosh and Critias had that same persistent calm aggression that chewed up anything that refused to lay down or get out of their way. So, Gustav finally said. What do you mean, you want me to join you? Critias told him, Talbot, Dosh, and that woman are hiding out somewhere near the main gate where we left our motorcycles. They came here to find you and stop you from making an ass of yourself. As you can see, they failed. You call off your war, bury the hatchet, and then haul your ass down there to find them. They will keep you company until we make arrangements for an official powwow about where we go from here. Um, Gustav said for a long moment and then agreed. Okay. I will go find my friends and wait to hear from you. He moved slowly at first, cautiously coming out from cover behind the pig, and when Critias didn't do anything, he walked south not wanting a fight. Critias just waited where he stood. He kind of wanted to think about what was going on, only no thinking came to him. It became just him calmly standing there listening to Blacksburg's snout root up a cactus. Once Gustav was gone and well out of sight, Critias was ready to leave. The pig continued to ignore him, but for some reason, Critias just had to say something to regain his self-respect. Blacksburg had insulted him first, with that piggy glance he gave. And fuck you too, he said to the huge swine. Blacksburg stopped chewing. His enormous pink ears raised up like a pair of scanning dishes. It seemed to be an invitation for Critias to run his mouth one more time. Critias squared off at the pig, put his hands on his hips and then asked, Are you feeling lucky, ham chop? I've got a smack for you too if you want it. The giant pig came about in one massive lurch with all the power of a rodeo bull. Sand and gravel flew from his hooves as Blacksburg launched at Critias. His tusk sabers flashed white and had edges like knives. The pig got a knife full of sand as Critias kicked a load of it into his face. It didn't stop the charge but it did ruin the aim of Blacksburg's first head swinging saber slash intended to rip open Critias's belly. Even though he didn't have time to think it in words, Critias thought that the pig fought like Carmen did when her anger unbalanced her. Pig-headed was an apt description for it. For those who suffered from the condition, even when they were capable of the slyest cunning, they never used it when riled up. After Blacksburg missed, the head swing that powered his tusk allowed Critias to grab a hold of the big pig ear on the other side of that gigantic head. Once Critias had his gauntlet clamped on for good, he thrust the fingers and thumb of his other hand up Blacksburg's great flaring nostrils. The outer edge of the snout was almost bony. All the rooting in the desert for food had hardened it into a proper shovel. The pink flesh on the inside of the snout was soft as his ears and just as sensitive. His mech suit made some audible pops as it gave everything it had. Blacksburg pushed so hard that Critias's boots plowed furrows in the sand as the swine drove him backward. 
Critias still didn't let go. Blacksburg was really angry then and he had the muscle power to throw Critias around with ease. The pig gave out the most dreadful high-pitched squeal of pain when his titanic swine strength made him discover what nose ringed bulls and oxen had known for thousands of years. The harder he fought, the more pain he would inflict on himself. Blacksburg would rip the meat out of his own precious snout long before Critias flew off into the desert. Critias's mech suit gauntlets had clamped onto him like vices. Trying to shake him off was never going to work. Perhaps worst of all was that Blacksburg's snout was essentially his only meaningful appendage. All he did was eat, and all his eating came from rooting with his snout. Even if he stopped right then, it would be hours before the pain subsided enough that he would be eating right. Well, Blacksburg would keep eating anyway, but it would come with a mindful remembrance of his achy nose. The pig had already decided that shaking Critias off hurt his snout and ear too much, so he stopped putting any enthusiasm into it. Critias threatened. I am not letting go until you've learned to behave yourself. The pig would kill him if he did let go, so not letting go had good sense behind it. He found a new understanding of the whole taking the bull by the horns thing, or it was a wolf by the tail, maybe a tiger. Anyway, you dare not let go because the animal is going to be really pissed off. Blacksburg sat down at his hind end like a dog. He seemed intent to just wait for Critias to make the next move. Their prolonged standoff ended almost immediately. Five stray ghouls came shuffling along in the distance. He couldn't be certain, but Critias was pretty sure that the damn pig snorted a laugh at him. How the arrogant swine even knew that Critias wore armor and wasn't an infected himself was a leap. The ghouls abruptly paused and then turned his way. Critias's whiny introspective thoughts had tipped them off and now they were going to jump him while he had both hands full of a snickering Simon's hog beast that was probably smarter than he was. That was when Carmen came skipping up out of the desert obviously enjoying herself. She appreciated the opportunity to be outdoors and explore a new terrain with its extreme climate. The arid badlands in summer would make a wonderful contrast when she finally got the chance to explore snow and winter. I heard you make him squeal, she said as she frolicked right past them to engage the approaching pack of ghouls. It seemed like a good idea to come out and make sure you were alright. She drew her sword from the sheath on her back and then held it underhanded. The blade rolled fluidly in her dexterous fingers as she swished off a ghoul's head with a proper upright grip. The other ghouls didn't even react, neither to protect themselves nor to show her any more aggression than they had for each other. With a backhand stroke, she decapitated a second. The momentum of that swing carried her completely around in a graceful twirl from which she lopped off her third head clean as a dandelion. Carmen sank down low to the ground in a cross-legged squad and then rose smoothly back up in a corkscrew motion that led her sword into another decapitation. For the last one, she made the execution with a two-handed chop that left the head still attached or at least seemingly so, but then the body fell away from underneath it. Critias told Blacksburg, What's up now, Mr. Smarty Pig? That's my woman. She would make a set of luggage out of your fat ass. With the ghouls out of the way, Carmen walked over and then paused to read the tattoo. He has Blacksburg written here and some numbers, only they are too faded for me to make out. This confirms my suspicion that he is a biotechnology specimen, a product of primitive gene editing techniques, quite different from our modern organics but still effective enough as you can see. He asked her, are you going to shoot him in the head, or do I let him go? Carmen patted Blacksburg on the head to test his tame reaction and then advised, let him go of course. He did let go and then promptly backed away in case there was any ill will. The pig slowly got up on his feet, wiggled his aching nose a bit, and then turned back to the cactus he had been eating. Before she could return to the airbase, Carmen took out her pistol and then walked over to put a bullet into each of their heads. It was unnecessary for her to leave them there snapping their jaws at nothing until dehydration finally finished her work days later. In the truer reality where she couldn't really control the outcomes of her best intentions, it was the thought that counted. She was about to depart, but then had another idea. Carmen took out her zip baggie of dehydrated banana chips and then approached Blacksburg. After giving them a last longing look of love, she sprinkled her favorite snacks out on the ground for him to eat. I'm sorry about your snout, she apologized. We don't want any hard feelings. Despite his incredible size and shoveling snout, Blacksburg had dexterous lips capable of delicately plucking up banana chips. He even took the time to chew them, or at least crush them once between huge molars. If pigs could smile, he made one in appreciation for the exotic flavor from a world away. Critias criticized her, there are no banana trees on this continent. You should not feed your rarest treats to a pig that eats anything from carrion to cactus. Carmen waved that off as nothing. Advice is not always wasted on the foolish or cherries on swine. I need only consider how many times you tried reason before you made any progress with me. 
when she tried to hold his hand for the walk home, he pulled it away. It has been up an infected pig's nose, he excused. You don't want that on your hands. She took his hand anyway, I would swim in it to be by your side. When the shooting ended, Colonel Davis had gone off to negotiate with the community survivors. They would have plenty to talk about, like the slave farm they had up north, and how they had been shooting at each other at various times. People were dead and each side had cause to begrudge the other's actions. Such was the nature of war and the peace afterwards. King Louis could pardon the crimes of bad people if they promised to reform and pledge themselves to the overall alliance that was the Council of Governors. Jim actually was a nice guy and he did have a good thing going. It would not be hard for Hiram to bring them on board. Critias and Carmen returned to the cleanup operation. After Sky Captain Gloria Robinson checked in with Hiram by radio for an all clear, she set about landing the Black Hole airship on the runway outside the village. She had her husband Henry aboard as her chief of security. Weren't her Hindemith acted as her co pilot? Fleet Admiral Rudo kept his son Hardock back at the city. A lot of preparation for transition was going on with his fleet and he wanted Hardock to take a more significant role in the mass migration of his people. Whether deliberately or by accident, it also ensured that Hardock would not be proving himself an independent man far away from his father by taking an active part in the battle for winning the Wild West. Gloria also had a couple of decontamination personnel and a mechanic to help keep the ship in shape. The airbase community was not without its useful talent. They had people who could operate a pair of front-loader earth movers and a large dump truck. Some gun-toting women were on hand to dispatch any wounded ghouls that started to revive or when more came in through the broken fence line. The heavy machines easily shoveled up the bodies in their scoops and then filled the truck for dumping them in the desert. The blood was not so bad either. The front loaders brought in tons of clean sand that they spread around to soak up the mess. They dumped that bloody sand back in the desert too. By the end, they would be using brooms to sand scrub the gore off the pavement. They would shovel it into the loader buckets. Summer heat and sandy winds would do the rest. Only two of the mobile homes suffered significant bullet damage in the battle. A few others took some easily patchable hits that amounted to nothing. Even the two bad ones had wounds they could easily fix. It was their furnishings inside that took significant damage. No one lost any priceless family heirlooms, so overall, Critias considered the damage to be effectively nothing. Both penetrated sections of fence had only collapsed. Their poles had bent over, but beyond that, it was more trouble to pick the meat out of the razor wire than it was to stand the fences back up using the lifting power of the front loaders. The same loaders used the massive weight of their machines to bucket press new reinforcement poles down into the sandy soil. When the cleanup operation ran smoothly and they had the fences mended, all the grave walkers and sand tigers gathered together to drink cold beers that had come aboard the black hole. It had been a memorable battle for Critias. He had to say, I loved it when you guys rap held down from the airship. The villagers will join up for that reason alone. It doesn't get any more ghoul buster than that right there. Critias raised his beer to them, that is how air cavalry should arrive. Dunbar drank to that and then laughed about it. While we were waiting for you guys to take out their anti-aircraft cannon, we had time to practice. Gloria let us rehearse that stunt a few times on the other side of the eastern range. It has been a while since any of us earned our air assault badge. We helped the army boys brush up on their rope work, one of the sand tires boasted. Helicopter insertion is our usual thing back with the fleet. As one of the villager women strolled by, Carmen called to her while holding out her cell phone, Would you mind taking a picture? The lady took the phone and then admired it for a moment before she said, It has been a while since I had one of these. We will have your cell tower working by morning, Carmen informed her cheerfully. Our friend Werner and your Mr. Copper are taking care of that. They will tie into our satellite network. That phone works right now if you had someone to call. The black hole acts as a mobile relay and has full uplink capabilities. The action heroes grouped up for a photo and then the woman returned the phone. Carmen advised her, You should go talk to Leon. Colonel Davis rescued as many of your men as possible from the reckless violence of your former general. We have communications to the dam. Your community could get in contact with any loved ones you have there. Our colonel has already talked to them about joining our alliance and they agreed. We will likely be returning all of them to you once we have made transportation arrangements. The woman did appreciate that idea. She went off to find Leon. A couple of village workers drove a golf cart that pulled a wagon. They worked as part of the cleanup detail removing isolated undead bodies that didn't require the use of a massive front loader excavator. As their final load, they were on their way to the command building to pick up the body that the Paiute woman had killed with a pickaxe. It was the only body that was a former member of the community, prompting some consideration for preferential treatment. Critias called over to them, 
please leave that man where he is. I will take care of it. We want to see if there is any evidence that can tell us how he got sick in the first place. The rest of you may still be at risk. They left the wagon there and then just went off to do other work. A glance from Critias communicated to Carmen that he needed her expert opinion for an impromptu post-mortem before the body went to the desert. She followed as he went over to take care of it. Carmen had a folding bill hook carpet knife she kept in one of her pockets. She used it to cut open the man's bloody clothes. It was the reasonable procedure to check the man's body for bite marks. The infected didn't develop their full regenerative powers in the early stages of the disease. If a ghoul had bitten him, the wound would still be visible in his flesh. Brutally mutilated bodies could ferment in their own juices for a week or more before they finally got up to start attacking people. Here it is, Critias said even though Carmen had already seen it. There were three sets of puncture marks on his forearm. He was no medical officer, but Critias did have a personal paranoid fascination with mastication images. Even the hangar doors on the Homer space station felt like ghoul bite to him. Critias felt sure that those were some kind of bite, only not ghoul bites. Ghouls did not make a pair of holes like some kind of poisonous snake. Carmen's unhappy sigh was clear enough. Swell, Critias grumbled as it came to him. There was only one set of teeth in the mouth of a meathead that Carmen would be disappointed to find. It had to be one of those new watchers, and of them, it had to be the Dracula lady. She had let her crazy run wild all over the guy and that had turned him. It sure made Critias wonder just how innocent that blood-drinking bitch had been when the general turned against the watchers and banned them from his airbase in the first place. The story that Critias had heard was that some soldier had forced himself upon her and then she had infected him by accident. The body he stood over at the moment didn't appear to be any kind of accident. The only thing that didn't make perfect sense was why the man had allowed her to do it. Carmen's artificial eyes were premium prototype technology even in her own time. She had senses that were at least as good as anything a mech suit offered. In the same way that Alice had used laser spectroscopic analysis, Carmen saw that his attacker had sedated him with meth aqua alone. She sent the information to Critias as a HUD application that would also switch on his analyzer to see for himself. Critias understood, the crazy slut zapped him out with too many orangey biscuits. Back in his own time, the recreational drug was available in controlled doses. It was popular in the sex clubs, and by all accounts did a good job of making people happy. The large dose the man took had zonked him so hard that the vampire chick gave him a proper fang raping without him offering any resistance. If she was also giving him a handy at the time, he may have even enjoyed it. Carmen asked, what now? She knew it could go in a lot of directions, including a mission to execute the Lady de Locker. There was room for argument that Gustav was little better than she was and perhaps even worse. He had only failed to kill everyone in the airbase, not for lack of trying. The Lady de Locker only fed on one or two people out of what she considered necessity. Go tell Colonel Davis, Critias instructed her. Don't let anyone else hear about this for now. Even if she is a murdering people, that is not entirely unexpected. Not all watchers are going to be friendly. We don't honestly know that any of these new ones are any good. Gustav is clearly a problem and Talbot has a secret bad enough that he won't tell us about it. So far, the only one I am starting to trust is the damn pig, and he is not likely to be all that helpful. Before she departed, Carmen reasoned, if the lady de la Cruer had Dr. Kine's treatment, she wouldn't have been infectious. She may have infected him, but that aside. Her crime was closer to a kidnapping and sexual assault than a murder. After the treatment, she would be considerably less of a threat. You can tell the colonel that too, Critias replied without commitment. In her defense, he argued, the other governors will want to have their own watchers to help them survive. Considering what lengths Jim was willing to go to for rewarding Verloc and Romeo, the others might not be that indisposed to feeding her whatever she wants. I agree that Verloc is worth every square meter of luxury apartment. She could have the whole damn building as far as I'm concerned and I wouldn't complain. Jim said the same thing, Carmen agreed about Verloc. While Carmen went into the command building to find Hiram who was at a conference with the leaders of the airbase, Critias returned to the special operations group drinking beer over at the nearby black hole. Henry had set up a nice propane cooker they had brought along on the airship. He grilled fresh steaks of beef along with pork chops and sausages that he slathered in Emperor Nick's barbecue sauce. It was a feast of such grandeur that it had to be a reward from Jim in recognition of his new acquisitions of the dam and airbase. The village had provided a water tank truck that the mechanic had used to set up a decontamination shower. It was a chance for everyone to scrub up and get clean before having a great meal. Colonel Davis and Carmen eventually returned from a villager conference inside the command building. Platt and Feng had been at the meeting too, presumably to represent the voice of Fleet Admiral Rudel. 
While Carmen and Major Feng went behind the water truck to take a shower together, Colonel Davis went to Critias. Carmen told me about the woman biting people, Hiram said to him. I am sending Verloc to talk with them and arrange a meeting for another day. Critias asked, are these people squared away? We killed a lot of their men, Hiram responded as a negative. We are imposing our terms on them by virtue of our superior force, which doesn't sit too well with them even if those terms are equitable. I let them know that we are trading with those watchers just as they once did. Some of them are not enthused about that either. What is the worst part? Critias sensed it was coming, you haven't mentioned the farm yet. Hiram nodded to that, the farm was where they put everyone that they didn't trust, want, or need. They didn't build it either, just took it over from the hard-working people who did. Now that we are here freeing all their slaves, these people are not looking forward to facing their former victims as armed equals. Even if they wanted to keep this base as their home, they have no means to feed themselves anymore. There will be blood between them before this is over. I will be surprised if there is not. Jim has mended fences before, Critias said unconcerned. He took in those pirates easily enough, and good men among them too. Jim is a nice kid, but he knows when to play it tough. People can think what they want, just so long as they don't forget that he is king and those that break his laws have to answer for it. Hiram said seriously, we're the ones here now, not Jim. We need to set some rules and be prepared to enforce them. That is what I told those women in there. Whatever differences these people had in the past, this is our show now. These people still have to eat and those farmers still have to farm. They have kids and there we have to do right for. That is why I am sending you to that farm, tonight. They have no weapons as I understand it, just good walls. Take whoever you need so long as you leave me with enough guns here to keep these people pacified. Critias asked the colonel, how do I get there? It's not far, Hiram had easy directions. They have a good road that they used regularly. The black hole stays here if that is what you mean. It is worth about as much as the dam is, so I want to keep the joy rides down to a minimum. I would take the rally truck. They built it for hard desert racing. A road trip won't stress it any. Critias chuckled as an amusing thought came to him, Rabbi wanted Andy and the Holy Rollers to do some good in this world. They will be perfect for this job. I will need Carmen too of course. My ears are burning, Carmen said sweetly as she returned from her shower dressed in clean desert comma fatigues. Get some food, Critias told her. We are going out hunting again. She pouted as she asked, what do I have to break around here to get a little punishment time? Haven't I been bad enough for one day? Food, he told her. You'll get yours when I have the time to make a proper go of it. As she headed off, Carmen showed her sassy walk so that he was sure about what he was missing. She went to the grill to get some overcooked bits of meat that others had left behind on the platters. There was also a single serving pop top can of pineapple chunks that appealed to her. About then, Gloria came out from the black hole where she had been working. Carmen greatly admired Gloria, the way she was a boldly capable leader, an adventurer, and a winning gambler, but at the same time Jim trusted her to command the most valuable piece of equipment they had. Gloria was what Carmen wanted to be, daring, but never foolhardy, whimsical, but never unprofessional, responsible, but never dismayed. She put her food down so that she could go over and give Gloria a salute from the brow like they did in the old world. The gesture was dying out and that putting a hand near the face was how people infected themselves. Sky Captain Gloria, Carmen said just to say it. It's so good to see you. You know, Gloria said conversationally though still pleased. You are the only person who calls me that. It will catch on, Carmen assured believing it. We have capo regime forager captains popping up like daisies. That isn't the same thing like in the Admiral's fleet. When Fleet Admiral Rudel calls you captain, he actually means it. In all seriousness, Gloria confided, I may be doing more harm here than good. We stole the ship from them because we recognized its worth. Right about now, more than a few of these slavers are thinking that same very thing. If they wanted to hightail out of here and survive on their own, taking the black hole would be a real good start. Do you think I should take her to the dam? It would not be such a temptation there. Carmen advised honestly, Colonel Davis wants to impress upon them the far-reaching strength of King Louis and the other governors. If we show them weakness, it would be wiser for us now, but also encourage their confidence that scheming might avail them later. I think you are right, that they may even try to take the ship. The best discouragement for now might be to keep the grave walkers and sand tigers right here. So long as you provide all the comforts and sleeping berths on board, they don't really have anywhere else to go. When she considered that, Gloria agreed, after that rope trip they did, none of these people would be crazy enough to try and fight them to get the airship. With that out of the way, 
Gloria asked, you're not going to be here too? More work, Carmen grumbled. Colonel Davis wants someone to make contact with that farm settlement you scanned for us. I'm sure it has to be that. I don't know when I will be back, but I don't imagine it will be before morning at the earliest. You never know what you will find in a situation like that, Gloria cautioned. There is no one better for safely straightening the place out. If you run into any trouble, just call. We will fly out and pick you up. Chapter 8 Marigold Cemetery Solly complained about his recurring issue yet again from the front passenger seat of the Dakar truck, if I drive, this would be a good training opportunity for me. Andy replied from behind the wheel, what would I do then? I thought you said you knew how to work on engines. I filled her up and checked the oil, Solly said so that it sounded like he was as elite as any 1950s filling station attendant. I even cleaned the bugs and bird poop off the windshield. Attention to detail, Andy complimented him. That is just what we need around here. If you want to practice, there is a whole graveyard of vehicles back at the air base. You could test drive them all to your heart's content. That is not practice, Solly disagreed somewhat bitterly. Driving when it matters is practice. After he settled back into the super expensive bucket seat, Sully watched the empty road that went through the desert that night. Just as it seemed over, he added, I could handle it. Watch out. Carmen shouted a warning from the back seat only it came too late to be of any help. Andy had already swerved to avoid a mighty buck of a mule deer that jumped right out into the road in front of them. The box great span of proud antlers still had their summer velvet. Their truck had only narrowly missed the collision. Andy had veered hard and then deftly recovered so precipitously that his passengers got a first-hand lesson on why the rally truck had such great seats. They all remained in place in them as the truck made its high maneuvers. The timing of Carmen's warning seemed late only because Andy had seen the deer coming. If Sully had been driving, they would have certainly crashed into the animal. Sully had not even known about the danger until it had already passed. When they were safely on course again, Sully grumbled, What is that stupid deer doing out at this time of night anyway? He should be sleeping by this hour. Not in the summertime desert, Carmen said it was anything but an oddity. They lose too much water moving about in the heat of the day. It also makes them more visible to ghouls that are hunting them. They get along much better in the dark of night. There is your practice, Andy told him. I keep my eyes off the road. Anyone can just drive. To be good, you need to drive without giving it your direct attention. Your mind has to be off the road where the trouble comes from. Carmen chuckled, Zen driving. Wise words from the Saifu of the White Line Nightmare. Critias privately spoke to Carmen in the back seat. I wanted to tell you that you were amazing out there when I had my hands full of pig. Major Fang would have been proud to see that. It was just like she said, when you are like the rain, they don't get mad, but they still get wet. She leaned her head over onto his shoulder, I wish we could go home. I miss the girls. I miss dinner at Funland. While we are away, others have to see to our business there. The last part made him suspicious. Is something going on back home? Only troubles I feel robbed of attending, she cryptically answered. It is my life, such as it is, and each day lost cannot be reclaimed. True enough, he agreed with her. This is the marshal's life. Find what satisfaction in it that you can. When we are home, you will appreciate it all the more. I will not let you go home while I need you here. It is not my way to be a wise man of words. These people at the farm will need talking to, and that requires you. Ruby was also in the back seat on the other side of Critias. She could not help but overhear their talk. At a pause in their conversation, Ruby asked him, Do you regret bringing me along for this? Just relax and keep us covered, Critias counseled her. We are not going to be doing anything you can't handle. What could be worse than the airport fight against their general? His answer didn't make Ruby feel any better about her worth to the mission. Carmen challenged her, Wasn't it your vigilance that warned everyone of Talbot's approach at the gates when no one else was wary? It isn't the ghouls that bother you. You dwell on your teammates' opinions. Let men give you advice. It gives them courage and makes you wiser. Ruby still wanted to hear it from Critias, so you trust me? I brought you along, didn't I? He no longer wanted to talk about it. Carmen complained, he never lets me play with rockets. You got to fire off a rocket. You are going to get the rocket, Critias promised her getting annoyed. I can't even tell when you are breaking my balls or just genuinely irritating. She snuggled closer liking the sound of that. The whole drive was only about a half hour because Andy drove at a highway speed. They knew when they were getting near the farm community because they started to see ruined cars and trucks along the side of the road. Those wrecks had bullet holes in their windshields and doors. 
It was the kind of damage inflicted by outbreak era fuel pirates when they ambushed people fleeing across country. There were no visible buildings nearby or even rough terrain for concealment. No outward clues explained why the attacks had happened there on the open desert road, but there were dozens of them scattered along the way. Like the airbase to the south, the farming village was in flat country with the usual mountainous ranges that surrounded it in the distance. After the ever-increasing number of ruined survival vehicles, the next most obvious indication that they were getting close was the landscape of desert marigold flowers. The blooms remained scattered at first. Their density steadily grew until they were a yellow blanket over the whole land. The uniformity of bright color highlighted all the rusting lifeless road war wrecks. Hundreds of them cluttered the whole valley. Eerily beautiful, Carmen said about the marigolds and tombstones, the latter being all the dead survivor vehicles. They could not be growing here like this and not this late in the summer without a lot of water. We are getting close. That's the place, Sully said as a wall came into view. The barrier was tall, smooth, and desert red in color owing to rust, which proved that it was all metal. It must be over a mile wide, Andy said impressed. He spoke of only one side and the wall formed an approximate square. Critias observed, that wall looks prefabricated. Border fence, Sully guessed. Do we know where the door is? It's around the east side, Carmen directed Andy. The black hole took some aerial photos for us when they arrived in the area. The interior is mostly crops, but they also raise sheep and pigs. Living areas are in the center. Critias asked, electricity? Yes, Carmen confirmed it. They have solar panels and wind generators. It allows them to have enough power to run some lights and pump water through the irrigation system. I don't imagine that they have much in the way of entertainment though. Even light bulbs become hard to come by without foreigners to do your shopping. Ruby asked, do we want them to know we're coming? We don't, Critias agreed with this sentiment. Let's creep up on them slow and quiet. If they are hard-working farmers, they might even be asleep. They won't have much need for guards, not with these walls. It's not like they have guns anyway. The golden flowers got only thicker as Andy drove them toward the gate and the security wall. A parking lot of vehicles was on that side. From the way that the flowers grew in around all the tires, there was no doubt that none of the cars or trucks had moved in at least a season. Sully advised, we can hide the truck in there with the others. Places like that are ghoul magnets, Andy declined the suggestion. It is a good place to get attacked by a lurker. Ruby asked, if they raise sheep, how come there are all these flowers? Marigolds are toxic to sheep, Carmen told her. The deer won't eat it either, not unless they are starving. Andy brought the truck to a stop and then called everyone's attention to the way ahead. There are tire tracks here that crushed the flowers. Someone drove here recently or left maybe. We get out here, Critias instructed. After they all disembarked, Carmen walked up to where there were tire tracks. She knelt down to examine the crushed flowers closely. They are laying down toward the gate, she reported. This is not too recent, but not more than a couple days either. Someone is here and they didn't leave. Colonel Davis asked them at the airbase and they said nothing about any of their people coming here. Critias reasoned. Hiram said they were not overly enthused about all this. It is not surprising that they would not rat out their friends to us just because we asked. As I understand it, they don't want to mingle with these people and the colonel felt there would be violence between them once we set them loose. When no one said anything, he asked Carmen, what do you think? She stood up holding a plucked flower so that she could smell its distinctive sweet scent. Carmen's technology enhanced nose detected a lot more than flowers. The air carried the pheromones of violent sex and death rattle fear. She also detected freshly spilled human blood and what was undoubtedly a simmering stew of human flesh. The enormous farm as a whole gave off the old methane of decay. People by the thousands had ended up in the sandy soil as its fertilizer. While the marigold farm may have been alluring to the eye, it was putrid to a nose that was thousands of times more discerning than that of a human. After an introspective moment contemplating flowers, murder, and what Critias would consider mission relevant, Carmen answered with a bit of Shakespeare's poetry. The purple violets and marigolds. This is looking good then, he assumed from her words. Carmen finished the line, shall as a carpet hang upon thy grave. Her literary outlook had turned grim quickly and it made him reconsider his own words. Hiram said those assholes really hated these people. If they are here now, and have been here for a day or two, I don't imagine it has been a friendly visit. Critias took the time of seven breaths to decide what to do and then he got started. He looked to Carmen, go examine their gate check for booby traps, cameras, sensors, whatever they might have, and find out how it opens. He told Ruby, check the trunk, get one of those rockets. 
they drive around in those armored gun trucks. We might need to knock one out in a hurry. When Ruby came back, she handed Critias his Tesla Flux combat rifle with its ammo clip satchel. He responded with a skeptical expression that was only apparent by the tilt of his helmet. She said, that pistol is not enough if we run into real trouble. You are taking this too. It was a good idea considering that they were going into combat against armed men rather than just infected. He took the rifle and then manually checked to see if it was loaded even though his HUD already indicated that it was. Satisfied, he told her, all the bitching you two do in the car was starting to make me wonder. Ruby didn't feel offended by his remark when she replied, Kavetchin is part of my cultural heritage. We do it on the donkey, not in the sand. That amused Critias, prompting him to say, Carmen is the reverse. She fights at home and then bitches at work. A small stone flew in to bounce off Critias's helmet. When he looked, he saw Carmen over by the gate giving him the rude finger. She had thrown the rock at him after overhearing his criticism of her at home and work. Rather than get angry, Critias said, she is ready for us to go in. Tell Sully to make sure he locked the truck up and we have the keys. I don't want anyone stealing it while we are away. I have the keys, Sully reported. Back at the dam, I installed a kill switch for the electric fuel pumps. It is under the dash on the passenger side. No one would find it quickly. Once everyone was together at the farm's wall, Carmen informed them, I did not find any external security. I believe that they don't even want to know when any ghouls or animals wander past this area. They have sheep dogs inside the wall that will probably start barking as soon as they become aware of us. It is a big place and I think they would be near the center at the living area this late at night. The main door has some kind of locks on the inside. There is a small access door with a pair of deadbolts that take keys. Picking them won't be a problem. Get to it, he told her. Check for some kind of alarm or a shotgun wired to the damn door. If there is one thing I know about assholes is that they are assholes all day long and twice on Sundays. Her amorphous key intelligently took the proper configuration in both deadbolt locks on the first turn. Carmen pushed open the metal door just enough to slip her hand inside. After a moment of fishing around, she came back holding a glass food jet. There was the end of a string glued to the bottom and a hand grenade slid inside. She pulled the string off and then offered the jet to Critias. Good call, Sully whispered. What is that contraption? Andy had seen the idea before, when we opened the door. That jar dumps off a shelf and then that grenade falls out the top. We get just enough time to step into the bang. While inside the jar, the glass walls of the container kept the grenade's arming spoon held in the safe down position. It was spring-loaded and flew open without a jar, or a safety pin to keep it shut. Sully reached into his pouch to take out a roll of bailing wire and some handy little snip pliers. He clipped off a piece of wire and then offered it to Critias, this will make a pin. Critias carefully pinned the grenade put it back into the jar, and then put it aside. While he worked, he told the others, I think this confirms what we can expect. This prick didn't care who came along next, King Louis or the airbase people. Andy wasn't so sure, or those people back at the base knew all about it and wanted us to take a hit. I don't think so, Carmen reasoned. Leaving something like that here was an invitation for one of the farmers to take it and then use it against them. Critias taught her, your logic doesn't always work on dickheads like these people. I think you would have missed that, seen it fall, and then had to throw it. Right now they would be going crazy and knew their door bomb had just gone off. With the door open, the stench of rot and murder were far stronger. The inescapable reminder made it impossible for Carmen to stop envisioning the myriad scenarios that might have generated it. All the accumulating villainy was rapidly eroding her better nature and making her hostile. You're right, Carmen admitted without revealing her malevolent attitude. You are right about me and about them. I'm supposed to be here for the governors and the people back home. Right now, all I want is to get back there and see my daughters. I'm sick of playing nice with mass murderers and sex maniacs. In an instant, Carmen paused back into alert action. She remained totally still and silent and then explosively turned to jump front kick the door she had just unlocked. The heavy door slammed into something on the other side. There was a muffled cry of alarm and pain that had come from a man. Carmen sprang in through the open door. There was another groan and then some guy flew horizontally out through the doorway. He landed to skid face down in the flowers and sandy dirt. Ruby rushed to follow Carmen in through the door to help her, but Carmen met her in the doorway coming back out. The man already scrambled clumsily trying to get up, only Critias pinned him down by planting a boot onto his back. He is the only one nearby, Carmen informed everyone, and he's drunk. She held out one of the national military assault rifles that were so common on the continent, this was his. 
My first guess is that it means he came from the airbase, but who knows. Logic falters in confrontation with dickheads, or so I have been told. Critias kicked the man over onto his back to see his face. There was nothing outstanding about him, Caucasian, military pants, and a dirty sleeveless shirt. I didn't do it, the man blubbered without a question to answer. Critias asked him, didn't do what? Whatever it is, we're not going to like it, and you don't even know who we are. The sad truth was, the man needed strong prescription eyeglasses and had lost his a couple years prior. He couldn't make any of them out by sight, especially not in the dark. His vision was plenty good enough to make out shapes and such, but at the moment, while drunk, the only way he would tell anyone apart was by recognizing their voices. I don't know who any of you are, the man whined. You were breaking in and then you attacked me. He preferred to drop the whole confession about whatever it was he hadn't done. Critias had law enforcement experience with drunks and bullshitters. He chose to profit by patience as he asked, who is in charge here? King Louis, the man gasped. King Louis is king of this place. He took it over and the farmers all serve him now. I just watched the door. Andy and his teammates all looked at each other when they heard the name of King Louis. Having seen that, the man got a little excited as though things were going in his favor. You have heard of King Louis, on the radio. He talks about his kingdom, real powerful, has a whole city with airplanes and armies. He won't take kindly to anyone that hurts me. I have heard of that show, Critias played along. King Louis has dance clubs and satellites. They even have a rooftop swimming pool where all these beautiful women sunbathe topless. Yeah, the man chuckled sickly, like they were now pals or something only he wasn't convincing. You don't want to mess with him. I don't want to mess with him at all, Critias agreed. We want to join him. The radio show says that he is always looking for new manpower. He doesn't even care what your story was before. Everyone has it tough these days, right? If you can follow his rules and make yourself useful, King Louis has a job for you. Three square meals a day and hot showers, the great King Louis has the answer to everyone's problems. The man mumbled without saying much of anything coherent. Critias threatened him, that is unless you are lying. If you're lying, we're going to take you out into the desert and then stake you to the ground, see what comes along to eat you first. In the name of playing along, Sully disguised his voice to sound tough as he said, this scurvy dog is lying through his teeth. Let's feed him to the sand devils now, I say. Ruby stared him down to make him stop because he sounded like a shiver me timbers pirate tried attendant from an amusement park. I swear it, the man begged. King Louis is here. I can take you to him. He was right to think that he was as good as dead otherwise. The man had no other angles to work at the moment. Critias let the door guard get up believing that his scheming had saved his life, at least for the time being. Take us to King Louis then, Critias insisted. The man led them back in through the door that Carmen closed behind them when she came in last. As lovely as the marigolds outside had been, the entire interior of the farm's walls was a paradise. There was a gravel road that connected to the main gate, but other than that, the whole of the interior had verdant cultivation. Beside the road right in front of them was an orchard of trees all heavy with apricots. The other side of the lane were trees bearing peaches. A camping tent was there under the trees. The campsite was in recent use. It was obviously the place where the guard had been staying when their talking outside alerted him to their presence. As they walked down the road, they saw plums, nectarines, and figs. While the trees were impressive, there was also acres of other crops. Everywhere was the pipes of an overhead irrigation system that sprayed so much water that they pumped up from wells that even the land beyond the walls got moisture enough to erupt in flowers. Amazing, was Carmen's first word about their discovery. I can see why King Louis wanted to acquire this place. This is truly a wonder of the world. As far as mankind nearing extinction went, the farm was the greatest agricultural feed left in human hands. It is about a half mile or so, the captive man said trying to sound confident and friendly. That is where the village is, at the center. The flowers, the ones outside, I hear that they drive away mosquitoes and other bugs. They are like a natural insect repellent. Critias didn't want to walk into an ambush. He asked, how many men did the king bring with him to take this place? He must have brought a whole army. He did, the man lied as though it had been exciting. They had helicopters and tiltroder planes. There must have been hundreds of them, all in uniforms. Once they had it under control, there was no reason for them all to stay here. I heard they were going to capture something else next, like some other places where people are surviving. Critias offered, like the dam maybe? They might have gone to the airbase at Groom Lake too. Maybe, the man replied noncommittally. That topic seemed to make him feel ill to his stomach. 
with all the drinking he had done, and the prospect of having Critias kill him, the man had plenty to make him queasy. If they are gone now, Critias continued. How many stayed behind to guard King Louis? He must have a pretty large force of bodyguards, as important as he is and all. A few, the man answered without thinking and then he regretted it. After Carmen threw him through the air like a sack of potatoes and then Critias stood on him, the man felt deep down that a few guards would not be enough to stop these strangers from doing anything they wanted. In an effort to correct his mistake, he added, here and there, you know, a few in various places. It is a huge farm after all. The man chuckled as though he had said something funny. As bad as the offensive odors were to Carmen's state of mind, the man was even worse because he had a stench of rape and murder all over his body. He actually had recently bathed in it. Her combat computer had been playing tens of thousands of scenarios as she explored the possible causes. All of that was now in the physical form of a despicable man that was within her vengeful reach. The final thought that Carmen latched onto was that no good person would be witness to so much evil and then make nice with it. She was not going to cuddle and play footsies with a monster. Carmen killed monsters. With all of that eroding her mind, Carmen gave no outward indications to telegraph her intentions before she pulled her pistol and then stuck it in the man's face. She took a deep zen breath to smell the fresh murder on him and know that he had it coming many times over. All the compostable evil in that place had her mind racing to account for it. The man gave her a shock and wounded expression. Carmen told him, I don't think it's nice, you laughing. See, my mule don't like people laughing. He gets the crazy idea you're laughing at him. She did squeeze the trigger to put a bullet right in the middle of his disgusting face. It was a general truism that no one else but Critias would think it wise to get in Carmen's way when she lost her composure. Not only did Critias get in her way, he was the only person who realized that Carmen intended to execute the creepy guard and do it in cold blood. He knocked her hand away the moment she fired. The Tesla Flux pistol cancelled its electronic trigger when the targeted enemy was no longer in front of the barrel. Carmen shot Critias a dirty look. In her mind, he gave comfort and mercy to monsters who were less than ghouls. Now is not the time for your bullshit, Critias told her. What is your major malfunction? She gave him as adversarial an expression as she was able, and then responded in Latin, not wanting anyone else to overhear. Eden is not big enough for two devils. Wicked things are on the air and in the ground. My vengeful spirit has laid down with my last villainous dog. Avarice's curse is on this place that was once a paradise. As surely as the Commodore's Camelot drank an ocean of blood, it is the countless victims of murder that fertilize these fields. Every fruit you see here is someone's pillaged soul. This is not a farm. It's a cemetery. Critias had suffered enough of her ill attitude and lost his temper. He snatched her up by the front of her military blouse and then raised her onto the tips of her boots. I gaze out over a putrid global laboratory, he fed her own words back to her in their original English. All of it is a cemetery watered in blood, all of it, round the globe. Bemoan whatever powers you will, white or black, but there is one law and where I roam there is no other will. You love your bed, your daughters, and your comfort. Out of greed for the more loyalty to me, you will serve in this now. He dropped her, where else do you have to go? She straightened her camouflage jacket as she said, if any other man had the nerve to put his hands on me like that. He dared her, you'd what? She finished, I'd know where to find your replacement when your precious law gets you killed. The prisoner opened his mouth to say, what law are you talking about? Shut up. Carmen warned him in no mood, if you don't come up with a King Louis in about five minutes, I'm going to hang you upside down from one of these trees and then beat you like a pinata with your own rifle. It wasn't clear what part of her threat had registered so deeply, but the man looked like he might faint for a moment. His knees actually got wobbly. Critias assumed the most obvious answer, that the man didn't have a King Louis to offer them. The truth was something considerably darker. The village at the center of the farm was a collection of buildings and barns, the water tower, and the largest wind turbine. Open doors on the barns revealed that they had a tractor, a combine and a variety of harvester machines for crops like potatoes and onions. What he saw got Critias thinking. He asked his prisoner, where did you get your liquor? The man made a dismissive gesture toward the large farmhouse, they steal food and then distill their own. A shameful waste of edibles it is, if you ask me, but that is a farmer for you, always sneaking and stealing. They don't share any of it either, always hoarding the best of everything for themselves. I want to see the livestock, Carmen insisted. Where is that? The man got all twitchy and nervous, what do you want to see the sheep for? The pigs, Carmen demanded. I can smell them. Show me to the pigs. We can have a look at the sheep later. He asked in disbelief, you can smell them from here? 
The farmers collect all the manure and then load it into their composting machine, more of a factory really. Nothing goes to waste around here. I should show you the barn where they do that operation. I said show me the pigs, Carmen threatened him losing her temper again. Critias asked her, why do we need to see that? Because nothing goes to waste around here, she answered in an imitation of the loathsome man. Their prisoner reluctantly led them around the edge of the farmstead to where the pigsty stood. It was all concrete and reasonably clean where the workers could broom the manure into collection trenches. Dozens of swine were in good health and fattening up nicely. It was precisely the food that they ate that interested Carmen and she knew where to look. Not far away was an iron cauldron that was nearly the size of a hog tub. It was so massive that it mounted in a concrete base with space underneath for the cooking fire. A ladle the size of a shovel hung there for tending to the contents. All manner of edible waste both animal and vegetable simmered in the iron tub. The final product with the consistency of a lumpy porridge would end up in the feeding troughs of the swine. It was essentially the identical process that Cutter had done when he was the cook for Jingle Bells and served the slot to domesticated ghouls instead of to pigs. Carmen checked in the fire chamber first. It didn't take her long before she used a stick to pull out a scrap of half-burned bloody shirt. As she held it out smoldering on her twig, she chanted, Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. In his usual obtuse way, Critias neither contemplated nor cared what Carmen was about. Sully caught on quickly enough. He took the great ladle and then stirred in the iron tub that nearly brimmed with slop. His action was akin to rowing a boat. Right away he struck on a significant mass that he pried to the surface. It was a whole man's body still in the process of rendering down into supper for pigs. A food thief, Critias said totally unmoved. All food thieves should be fed to pigs. A fitting punishment if there ever was one. Their prisoner quickly agreed, yes. He stole food from King Louis. The king has no mercy for thieves. He gestured over at a nearby shed and then said, the cauldron is full or his food-stealing wife would join him. Carmen grit her teeth not sure who angered her more. She was perfectly aware that Critias wanted his audience with the great imitation King Louis. Alienating their guide would not serve his main interest, which involved having the criminal escort them right into the very center of the enemy power. She walked over to the shed the man had indicated. When Carmen opened the doors, she revealed a woman that hung upside down from the ridge beam. It was too dark for anyone else to see anything in detail, but they saw enough to know what it was she had found. Carmen saw that the woman was still alive. Unfortunately, the savage wounds to her head included one that exposed a portion of her brain. It was a monstrous example of how durable humans could be, even when they were already dead only their body refused to know it. There was nothing Carmen could do for her but administer a mercy killing. She couldn't even do that because it would display the very compassion that Critias deliberately concealed for the sake of their actual mission. Enough fun and games, Critias said to get Carmen moving. I came here to see a king, not a petting zoo. Their guide found a renewed sense of confidence after witnessing his captors make light of the woman he had hung up alive in the shed until he had room in the slop cauldron. He led them back to the village center by a different route. Along the way, they discovered a military armored Humvee parked beside one of the barns. It was undoubtedly the one that the men had come in from the airbase. From it, they had a good idea of just how many people could be involved. Only five or six could have traveled in a vehicle that size. One of the buildings was a community center of sorts. It had a large screened-in porch with lawn furniture and a couple of light bulbs that provided some rare illumination. All of the other buildings were dark. The sound of music and some men's laughter came from inside the hall. Their guide said, I should go in first to tell them that you're coming. No need, Critias said as he put his hand on the man's shoulder. King Louis will be happy to know that you found him such excellent new recruits. Critias guided the man before him to act as a human shield. If there was any shooting, their hostage would take the first hit. Chapter 9 Hell is Empty To Critias as credit, his plan to get close to the pretender King Louis worked surprisingly well. One of the tyrant's own men was about to walk them right in through his front door. Expediency aside, his plan did have an excessively broad gap in foreknowledge as to what they might encounter. From Critias's point of view, it was the other man's base of operations. A surprise meeting face to face wasn't a quality when the bad guys lost the advantage of hiding inside their castle. Their leader had placed a guard at the front gate under the assumption that any confrontation would take place out there, or at least with forewarning. With that front gate guard neutralized, the farm's usurpers hadn't even considered the possibility that armed outsiders would just stroll in the front door of their new bunkhouse. As it was, the pretender King Louis sat in a large wooden chair at the center of a long dining table covered in delicious food. There were bowls of every fruit. 
he had platters with roasted pig, lamb, and chickens. His feast had gravy, mashed potatoes, and many vegetable dishes besides, all wonderfully prepared. He could fill his cup with wine made from the farm's own vineyard. The man himself was uncommonly handsome, in his mid-forties, clean-shaven, and stylish in dress. On his head he wore a late 18th-century Russian Empire military officer's helmet, gilded, with a silver two-headed eagle as its enormous crest. It was an outrageously ostentatious crown and as such not that bad a choice considering how difficult it must have been for him to locate a royal regalia of any sort. Three armed men made up what had to be their king's royal guard. The first of them sat at one of the many round cafe tables, his submachine gun in front of him among the many used dining dishes. He wrapped his hands on the table surface to be a musical drummer for the old-timey harmonic music played by an elderly male farmer across the room. The second guard had his assault rifle slung to his back. He had a handful of mismatched knives that he had repeatedly thrown and then retrieved from a splintered wooden target on a distant wall. A third guard's assault rifle must have been the one on the king's feasting table. He wore a pistol in a hip holster as he burishly forced a young woman in a dress to ballroom dance with him. She appeared haggard and ill-used by her captors that had clearly made sport of her for better than a day. Six other women were in the hall, each in their best dresses. Some had rips in their clothes or bruises from beatings that forced their compliance. They were likely the most attractive females in the farmstead, making them worthy of entertaining the false king and his thugs. The most attention-worthy observation about the room was the tan-colored steel barrel that poked out on its side from under the pretender king's dining table. The stenciled markings named it to be around a hundred liters of VX nerve gas. A block of plastic explosives with a radio detonator stuck onto the side of the barrel. The inescapable assumption about the weapon was that if the would-be king didn't have his way, the whole farm would die along with him and no one would have the prize. As Critias pushed in his prisoner, the harmonic music died. Everyone from king to hostages found the unexpected guests as reason to dampen their celebration. Critias as captive had the greatest motivation to keep things peaceful. If the false king's men panicked and opened fire, he would be the first to die. No problems, he stuttered with his hands raised to calm everyone down. These are just friends. They heard about King Louis and they want to join his army. Even if that man was a cowardly idiot, the other three soldiers understood that Critias as mech suit was a problem. At the very least, it was bullet retardant body armor that would weigh heavily in his favor when the gunfight started. None of the guards had their weapons at the ready and they realized that reaching for them would likely be the initiation of hostilities. On top of everything else, their bandit king's nerve toxin bomb he kept under his table was as much a threat to themselves as it was to any enemies. Taking their foes with them when they died was only the smallest of consolations. The whole concept of a doomsday consequence precluded them initiating the very violence that doomed them all. Even if everyone else was nervous about a confrontation, Carmen wasn't feeling shy. Her old west wandering badass gunfighter roleplay was as toxic as ever, like when she tried to shoot their guide in the face just to watch him die. She barged right in the moment the doorway cleared. It was almost as though she actually hoped to start a deadly conflict that none of them would survive. Without the least hesitation or hint of concern, she marched right up to his feast. Carmen loudishly praised the worthy banquet in a loud tone, at last, some real food. The great King Louis knows how to set a proper table. Absent any polite request on her part or an offered invitation from her host, Carmen abruptly snatched up a long butcher's knife from one of the platters, she promptly used it to stab a chunk of stewed mutton that she then carried to her gaping gob to scarf it down. Even while she chewed with her mouth open and the savory medium rare juices gushed down onto her chin, Carmen declared, delicious. Critias scolded his wife, mind your manners, insolent wench. This is a king and we want his patronage. She came about to gesture at Critias with the tip of her long knife. I've had just about enough of your sweet mouth for one day, mister. As a demonstration of her defiance, she spun to throw the knife at the guard's target board on the wall. It wasn't the barroom dart flip toss of some amateur. She hurled that spinless blade with force and buried it deep into the bull's eye with an audible thunk. The blade was even parallel to the ground, perfect. The stun with the knife got everyone's attention, the pretender king in particular. He was no fool and had more than a reasonable suspicion about who the strangers might be as an elite master assassins from the real King Louis' empire. He raised his wine cup in a friendly gesture as he said, I am interested in making new friends. My farm grows far more food than I need for myself. Without someone to trade with, it would just go to waste. Ruby did her best to seem at ease as she entered the building. She had the same slow-moving anticipation as all the false king's guards. They all knew that at any instant, the room would be the OK corral and people would die left and right. Even the winners were going to be walking wounded, assuming the gas bomb didn't consume them all. 
Sully stayed close to his wife where he put on a show of seeming tough and freewheeling as was any Badlands adventurer. His overacted performance made Ruby glad that he at least didn't break into finger-snapping song like Riff from the Jets in West Side Story. Andy had more faith in Critias's ability to handle the situation. He walked in genuinely without concern. Carmen turned back to the feasting table where she filled a crystal goblet with wine. In her piggish behavior, she slopped some of it onto the lovely white tablecloth, but didn't care. So armed with a drink, she next tore off a chicken drumstick from an otherwise pristine roasted poultry, jammed it down into the depths of the gravy boat, and then chomped off a sloppy mouthful of the flesh with her nymphet teeth, making slovenly slurping sounds all the while. It was Critias that had the false king's attention. Before the villain had seized power as a potentate, he had been a soldier. The man knew well enough the nature of weapons and technology. Critias carried only the best unidentifiable prototypes no less. The bomb had been of his devising and he still thought it was an unbeatable plan if he only had the courage to stick with it, even if that meant going to detonation. Critias pushed away the guard he had taken hostage and then approached the long table to confront the king of Marigold Farm. After neither of them spoke for a long serious moment where they sized each other up, Critias said, I assume you know why I'm here. Under the circumstances, it had to be obvious that it wasn't to join a fake King Louis. You're from him, the false king said meaning the real king. He sat back in his chair to show he had not lost confidence. The false king drank from his wine cup and then he brought his other hand to the arm of the chair so that Critias could see his detonator. It was a small black plastic device about the size of a cell phone with four large red buttons on the face, for four separate bombs if one were so inclined. The pull-out telescoping antennae remained collapsed since he wouldn't need it to reach from his chair to under his table. It wasn't a dead man's switch that would go off if Critias killed him just right. For anything to happen, the man would have to push the proper button. When he did, there was enough high-grade explosives to remove the whole building and kill everyone inside, regardless of what the VX poison did after that. Critias asked rhetorically, who else but him? You have not been here for that long, but my guess is that you know that he already owns the dam. Now I am here. The false king understood, so that means he now owns the airbase too. All that is left is this place, and it is a treasure to behold. You have to admit that. Far better than I ever imagined, Critias did admit it. I have to wonder how it is even possible. The walls alone are enough steel to make a battleship. Immigration control border wall, the false king revealed as the source of the security barrier. This one was meant for Arizona, but the funding fell through. It ended up on a lot not far from here waiting for a buyer, rather fortuitous as it turned out. The airbase had a much bigger population back in those days, had the machines and the manpower to enclose this farm, transplant some of the orchards. There have been a lot of wars since then, winners, losers, the changing of hands. Now it is all mine. He raised the detonator so that Critias could think about it, now it is mine and the big man will have to come to terms with me, if he won't, I will blast this VX shit over the whole farm and the rest of the valley besides. It will all be gone for good and your boss gets nothing. Critias got the picture. On the other hand, if you are king of this place, you will become part of the family, trading what you have for what you need. Everyone wins. Or everyone loses, the false king stated the alternative to his demands. Since it seemed that they had a complete understanding, he called out, Where is my music? We are having a party here. My guests deserve a little entertainment. As the old man began playing his harmonica again, Ruby, Sully, and Andy spread out around the long table to take turns sampling the appetizing food. They made a point to never all be unawares at the same time. Carmen emptied her wine goblet in a single draft, made an appreciative hum, and then reached for the decanter to refill another. She drained the whole like the first and then filled a third. When he saw her swilling the wine, Critias told her, Stop behaving like the whore you are. Better a sober cannibal, Carmen retorted, than a drunken Christian. Critias scoffed at that, You're the drunk, and the cannibal, you vicious harlot, so behave yourself. Inspired by the wine and the music, Carmen belted out in Gaelic drinking song, but if I get boozy, my whiskey's my own, and them that don't like me can leave me alone. You may boast of your wisdom and brag of your blood. We'll both be forgotten in the wake of the flood. She could carry a tune. If she was not getting drunk for real was for anyone to guess. Carmen twirled about the hall dancing alone as she sang more verses to the old song. Oh whiskey you villain, you've been my downfall. You've kicked me, you've cuffed me, but I love you for all. If the ocean were whiskey and I was a duck, I'd dive to the bottom and then drown to stay drunk. After Critias leaned his rifle against the edge, he took off his helmet and then put it down on the feasting table. So prepared, he pulled up a chair and then filled the bottom of a glass with the local whiskey the farmers distilled. 
Critias drank it as a shot. Pretty good, he complimented their creation. They use real barley sour mash for that, the false king said to explain the quality. Just like the old moonshiners, they distill it in secret. None of it ever made its way to Groom Lake of course. Years ago when this began, it was the farm that lorded all the power over the base. When the people didn't properly obey, risk themselves foraging for the people here, they didn't eat. That must have made them a lot of enemies, Critias replied as he refilled his glass. So they finally had enough and took the place away from them. This farm became a prison for the worst troublemakers, the man continued his story. When they no longer had any guns, they became suitably cooperative. Critias nodded in agreement, nothing like a little gun control to keep the farmers out of the courthouse and in the field where they belong. Now, you see this as being back to where it started? He showed Critias the detonator, your master will comply with my reasonable demands. I will provide him otherwise unattainable food by the truckload and he will provide me whatever I ask for in return. He can start by connecting the power lines to the dam to turn on proper electricity. I will need a construction crew to build my new palace. After that, I'm sure I will think of something else. Across the room, Carmen shouted, which one of you punks is going over there to refill my drink? Of the now four guards, the one wearing the pistol snapped off at her, you best shut your mouth, before it gets filled with something else. Carmen cackled with brutally mocking laughter as though the man's threat was less than pathetic. She pulled back her sleeve to check the time on her Jzazer La Coultra wrist watch. It was the finest mechanical timepiece, one even Carmen could desire as a fetishist of engineered mechanisms. She acquired it as a gift from Romeo, as a demonstration of eternal friendship and recognition of Carmen's Martial Service Future Technology wristwatch that she had gifted to Verloc. In all truth, the Martial Watch was nice and expensive, but not a priceless treasure in the future like her new one would be. With her eyes on the time, she told the man, you have exactly 60 seconds to get it up. If you can get your little pecker hard, I will give you the best polishing you've ever had. She laughed more, show me what you've got for me, you twinkling little fairy. The other guards cheered in full support of her body challenge. Carmen was damn sexy and she did have a big mouth they would like to see humbled by a man. Come on, Carmen taunted him. Show me the manpower, or maybe you would prefer a boy. The guard in question couldn't perform under that kind of pressure. Since he lacked the libido to meet her challenge or the brains to reply with anything clever, all the man could come up with was to say, you're not my type. Carmen dismissed him with a contemptuous wave of her empty glass, get me another drink, you little sissy, before I bend you over and peg you the way you like it, right in front of all your boyfriends. The man stepped up to smack her in the face, which was a mistake because Carmen knocked away his hand and then punched him right in the mouth, it was only a jab but she did have titanium knuckles so it landed on his face like a sack full of padlocks. He fell over backward to plop down onto his ass. Carmen laughed uproariously over his humiliation. So overcome with her unbridled amusement, she had to bend over with hands to knees as though trying to catch her breath. It took a moment for the man she dropped to get himself together. His lack of conviction concerning what he planned to do about it made him all the slower. It was actually true that Carmen did everything with the intention of starting a gunfight and then killing them all like the weak bandit scum they were. He was in no hurry to take her up on that challenge. The other guards laughed to see the man put in his place by a woman and didn't really care what happened to him next. Carmen took a screw-topped glass vial from one of her gun belt pouches and then held it up between thumb and forefinger. It had fine white powder that filled it to the top. She called out in an excited party voice, Oh yeah, look what I brought. Does anyone else like to party? I do cocaine. All the guards not on the floor cheered at the mention of doing rock star amounts of cocaine with her. Her sudden rise in popularity played on the fears of the man Carmen had just beaten. He had already dreaded the notion that Critias the hotshot in Wonder Armor would take over as the king's number one man. That seemed all the more likely from the way they chatted comfortably and a woman had just knocked him to the floor. Carmen tapped out a pile of cocaine onto the cafe table to start scraping it out into lines. While she worked, she told the humiliated guard. Have you gotten me that drink yet, Limpy? If you don't have it ready by the time I'm done here, I'll send Ruby out to get me my strap on. You don't come here and give orders, the man fumed as he got up to confront her. I'm not getting you anything, damn you. All the acting vanished as Carmen turned away from the cocaine to stare him down. The man witnessed that trick of light that came from her artificial eyes when malevolence overtook her and the enhanced laser range finding and spectrographic combat sensors came on. Intimidated by the soulless malice he glimpsed therein, he visibly receded from his boldness. Damned? She asked as though it was an insult that risked his life with the utterance. The devil will not have me damned, lest the oil that's in me should set hell on fire. 
There is no hell. The man stammered as though an atheist prayer would keep the evil in her away. Carmen took a step closer and mocked him with a whimpering tone as though she spoke for him. Some people tell us that there ain't no hell. She turned slowly to look back over her shoulder at the captive women farmers that huddled together in the far end of the room. Carmen spoke to them in a conspiratorial drawl, but they never farmed, so how can they tell? Solly laughed loudly, not because he found her rhyme amusing, but because he felt they were a moment away from a gunfight and he wanted to seem bold. It worked because no one went for their weapon and Carmen returned to being jovial. She told her new friends, help yourselves. There is plenty for all. Even the man who wanted to snort the cocaine the most still hesitated. He kept looking from the lines to her and then back again as he tried to decide if it was some kind of poison. Carmen took the man's rolled paper sniffing straw and then used it to take a line in each nostril. The bottle she shared was her watcher making overdose and respiratory tranquilizer kit. It contained a 70-30 mixture of uncut cocaine and white heroin, care of Charlie the dead bad guy. Carmen figured that if Critias caught the infection, she could inject him with the solution. Try her luck at turning him into a watcher that wasn't too crazy. The dose Carmen just snorted was about eight times more than any of them could withstand. After a passive moment, she grinned and said in a Bolivian trafficker cartel accent, that is some good coke. The men judged the potency of the drug by the size of Carmen. In their minds, they wouldn't need as much as she did. Anything she could take as a tolerant regular user gave them an indication of what they could handle as men. Carmen sauntered up to the false king's table and then refilled her wine goblet. So prepared, she asked Critias. Has he made his offer? Indeed he has, Critias informed her. I was just about to make my counter-proposal. Before that, Carmen interrupted their parley. I want to do a magic trick. She picked up a large formal dinner napkin to hang it over her hand. Carmen drained her wine glass and then balanced it empty with the circular base on her outstretched napkin draped palm. She moved closer to be against the table while turning the goblet over so that it disappeared from view beneath the falling folds of napkin. Its solid shape remained visible through the fabric as she turned to show it to everyone. The pretender king nodded at her that he followed thus far, but didn't get the point. Carmen slammed the glass into the tabletop only the chalice vanished. Nothing hit the table but the empty napkin. A fraction of a second later, they all heard the crystal wine glass shatter on the floor beneath his table. She had made the cup phase right through the tabletop. No one had much of a chance to react before Carmen took a long deep bow of theatrical victory. When she came up, she dropped the napkin in Critias's lap. Ruby clapped as she cheered, that was totally awesome. Andy put his plate down for long enough to clap. He wasn't being shy about enjoying the banquet. Critias told their host, here is my counter-proposal. Jerk-offs like you, all these antics just go to show how far you will go to not die. You are never going to push that button so long as you have one more weasel rad way to survive. If you surrender now and beg for mercy, I will hand you over to my commander alive. As proof that he was indeed serious, Critias drew his pistol as he stood up from his seat. He still had Carmen's napkin in his other hand. The three guards who inhaled Carmen's drug were no longer able to stand. They all crashed out into comfortable couches and reclining chairs to drool and overdose delirium. Ruby stepped up and then smashed the butt of her shotgun into the head of the fourth guard. He didn't go down until she gave him two more solid bashes. They were hateful ghoul killing blows. Once he was on the floor, she took away his pistol. The false king raised his detonator to kill them all. Not even the farm will remain, he threatened. Nothing will grow in this valley again for a thousand years. Carmen got a new crystal goblet to replace the one she smashed under the table while doing her sleight of hand magic trick. As she filled her cup with wine, she lectured. Your poison is a pesticide, moron, not an herbicide. Not one of these plants will care one bit about this stuff. It won't hurt the crops any more than it would kill ghouls, which undoubtedly explains where you got this test sample. Sure, the sheep and the pigs won't survive it, but the rest of the farm will still be intact. Someone in a hazmat suit will get the sprinklers on, that is if they don't run automated already. The poison will be washed away and broken down in a couple weeks at most. The false king could not surrender. As his last option, he gave them the one final warning, put down your weapons and submit to me, or I kill us all here and now. Critias tossed the napkin onto the feasting table. Inside was the radio detonator receiver that Carmen had removed from the poison bomb under the table. It was during her bowing after the magic trick. He had mounted it to the bomb to be obvious and visually intimidating. That also made it easy for her to just pull off the unit and thereby disarm the weapon. As the detonator receiver banged to a halt among the feasting platters, the false king recognized it, and then absorbed the true meaning of Carmen's magic trick. With sleight of hand and distraction, 
she had proven she could just as easily disarm a bomb under the table as smash the crystal goblet down there. You should have taken my offer, Critias told him to mean that opportunity was gone. The real King Lou is a whole long way away from here and I already know what he would say about you. One of the women hostages overheard that and then shouted from across the room, Real King Louis. This asshole is from the airbase, Critias told her without taking his eyes off the man. He told you that to make you think whatever. King Louis already has the dam in the airbase. We got here as soon as we could. Running from us got him here first. Carmen drank more wine even though the need for staying in character had passed. No one could be certain what if anything she had done was only acting her part just to drug the guards. On her way across the room, Carmen asked the hostages, which of these men killed the farmers we found at the slop rendering pot. They were all in it together, the old harmonica man informed her. He said he was the King Louis we heard about on our radio. They demanded to know where all the secret storerooms are, our hidden still, and the winery. First they banished Herb's son to the creatures outside the wall, said they wouldn't let him back in unless we surrendered. After that, they tortured Herb's wife Martha, hurt her so bad that he told them what they wanted to know. Once they had all the liquor and our radio, his men dragged them both away. I didn't know that Herb and Martha were dead until you just told us. Critias called to Carmen, go outside and track down this kid he is talking about. With a thousand wrecks out there to choose from, he could still be hiding in one of them. I would be. Carmen seemed on the verge of an argument as she eyed him overly long, but then she finally said peaceably, I would be happy to go look for him. You can trust me to find him quickly, alive, turned, or dead. While I am away, I can trust you not to do anything with my prisoners. Rather than address her, Critias called to the rest of his teammates, police up all their weapons and then tie them securely, don't leave those three douchebags on their backs or they might drown in their own vomit. Ruby asked, what about the farmers? Critias still watched the fallen king as he answered her, tell them to eat up and then go home. They can inform the rest of their people that the real King Louis has liberated this place. Tomorrow or the next day, they will get their chance to talk to Jim directly. What new lives they make for themselves is not up to us. Just reassure them that they won't be our prisoners or slaves. A small creaking of wood came from the chair of the pretender king as he shifted his weight slightly. It was reason enough for Critias to point his pistol at the man's chest. I'll have your weapon now, Critias insisted. Put your gun on the table where I can see it, and then get up and move away. The fall from king to prisoner had been quick, but not swift enough to suit the man. He had no wish to suffer in chains or worse. They already blamed him for the deaths of three farmers. Whatever future he had, it wasn't going to be pleasant. The idea he had was to go for his pistol and then try and shoot a bullet into the nerve poison canister. Once he made a hole in it, the poison would be the certain death of everyone in the room and then everyone else who came along to open the front door. Reach for it, Critias warned him, and you will live to see my bad side. You assholes can still be of use to me, so don't tempt me. Critias was right about the man in that his fundamental nature was to survive so long as there was some angle he could play, no matter how thin or desperate. The fallen king slowly stood from his chair and then carefully took his pistol from its holster to put it on the table. As she reached the door, Carmen told Critias, I will take care of that other thing on my way out. You leave her be, Critias commanded with harsh seriousness. If you want to do her a favor, find her son. As she went out, Carmen got in the last word, they deserve better than one of your garbage trucks. The dead deserve a lot, Critias called after her. The living deserve more. Ruby asked Critias, should I go with her? Carmen can take care of herself, Critias assured Ruby. You stay by Andy and don't turn your back on anybody, farmers included. I just want you to hold tight until sunrise. He turned his attention back to the false king and told him, they are going to tie you up now and you are going to let them. If you cross me, I will feed you balls first to the freaks. Critias waited around while all the hostages left the hall. They returned to their main house where they presumably would inform the other farmers. Andy and his crew got the bandits tied up where they wouldn't cause any trouble. Once that was out of the way, Critias left on his own to return to the pigsty in the slop cauldron. The woman in the shed was still alive, unconscious, and at death's door. She would never recover. Under closer examination, Critias saw that her skull had a deep brain penetrating wound like one of them men might have inflicted with a hammer or some metal gardening tool. He laid her out on some nearby grass and then went to pull the remains of her husband out of the cauldron. His mech suit protected him from the heat of the simmering slop. It was some small fortune that the body had not cooked enough to actually come apart into disjointed pieces. Critias would not feed pigs any human flesh from friends or foes. He didn't want to eat any animal that had dined on humans. 
That idea did inspire him to recall that Carmen's foul mood was in part the understanding that the soil in the farm contained hundreds if not thousands of bodies. Over the years, the sandy desert soil hadn't become so dark and rich without outside help. Finding the son of Herb and Martha was not that difficult for Carmen. A visual scan for broken marigolds set her in the direction of the nearby parking lot. They were all vehicles in outwardly good condition. Many of them were trucks of various sizes. There was heavy construction equipment there and some off-road vehicles. Carmen discovered an unexpected lack of infected. Her assumptions predicted that at least a few ghouls would use the shade of larger trucks as shelter from the sun. It seemed that the local environment was so inhospitable to anything but marigolds that not even ghouls wanted to live there. The intellectual puzzle of all the interwoven details did make Carmen thoughtful. Everything wrong with the place was also the exact thing that made it just right. Carmen was on the verge of transcending her emotional attachment to subjective values, but for the moment she still needed them. What would be the point of her wearing a super cool wristwatch when she intuitively knew what time it was anyway? So many of her favorite things only came from her silly love of the game called life. She was not ready to be a true pragmatist. It was a happy moment when she opened the driver's door of a flatbed truck to find an unconscious young man inside on the bench seat. More than a full day without water out in the summer desert heat had left him barely alive, but he was still breathing. He didn't regain consciousness when Carmen pulled him out and then hoisted him over her shoulder. Herb's son was not a child by any stretch of the imagination. He had to be Bobby Bean's age or thereabouts, old enough to be a man. Lucky for Carmen, her amorphous key worked equally well in vehicle doors and ignition systems. She only had to carry the man to the back of the nearby Dakar rally truck. She made him comfortable, gave him a few sips of water, and then drove back into the farm. It took her some effort to open the vehicle gate and then close it again, but it sure beat carrying him back on foot. Carmen pulled up at the farmhouses when Critias was outside using the garden hose to spray off. He didn't want to chance any lingering smell from digging around in the hog slop cauldron. His mech suit's hydrophobic properties had prevented any of the mess from overtly sticking to him even while he was elbow deep in it. Some of the overhead sprinklers were actively watering the farm crops. The abundant moisture gave the whole place a cool humidity and a smell that was pleasant in a farm country kind of way. Critias could tell that she had been successful. If she had failed to find the boy alive, Carmen would have been in a worse mood and not bothering with the truck. She opened the vehicle's rear hatch for him. Critias gently lifted the kid out and then carried him to the main house, where he handed him over to his people. Some of the men had walked out onto their porch ready to take him. Everyone in there was wide awake and keeping watch out their windows. They had every reason to be concerned about all the strangers in their community. The farmers that took the young man off Critias's hands seemed more than pleased to have him back alive. As Critias returned from their porch empty-handed, Carmen was about to say something only he cut her off with a request, come with me. He led her back into the community hall with the feast laid out. Critias took the decanter of moonshine whiskey, two glasses, and then told the forager crew, Carmen found him alive. He is real thirsty, but should pull through with a little rest. Andy, Ruby, and Sully gave Carmen a congratulating cheer as she went back outside with Critias. He took a seat on the porch and invited her to join him. When she didn't say anything, he poured them both a drink. As the silence continued, Critias removed his helmet, took out the cigar and then lit it. Finally, just to break the silence, he offered her one of the glasses, drink with me. She took the glass only to frown at it, you don't want me drinking. No, he disagreed. I want movie night to edit out you snorting all that shit up your nose. That bothered me, but it did work. Those three morons might even die from it. You seem to be tolerating everything remarkably well. I was angry with you, she confessed. I went out of my way just to aggravate you, and also complete the mission. To be perfectly honest, I don't really know how the drinking and drugs affect people like Romeo or Talbot. The left lobe of my liver is a mechanical upgrade that protects me from any contaminants in my blood. It would take a lot more than what I have had so far to impair my abilities. I might even need Kevin to write some software for it. I could then just turn it off to let me actually enjoy it. I don't want you using this stuff on me, he said just to let her know. Carmen shrugged, you will be dying anyway if it comes to that. I won't especially care what you want. As likely as not it would not work anyway. You'd end up terribly crazy, and then I would have to kill you all over again. While there is a chance of saving you, I will take it. My husband just died. Have a little sympathy as I try to resurrect him from the dead. At that, she drank the whiskey he poured for her. He drained his glass and then told her, It is not my place to kill a king. She grabbed the decanter to refill their glasses. Carmen did it aggressively as a demonstration that he was irritating her again. 
that moron is no more of a king than I am, she argued. I am sick of bad people having all the power and then getting away with it. The good pray for salvation that never comes while the bad shamelessly perform the blackest of deeds, with no fear that they might conjure up a true devil feeling affronted by their competition. Their thefts, rapes, and murders cannot remain unaccounted for. You act as though I must just endure it because there is no cure for man's madness. Here are the men. Here is the proof of what they have done. Here are their victims served up as supper for swine. Now you speak of feeding them and caring for them until you turn them over to Colonel Davis. By doing so, you make them comfortable and seeing them as an asset. Will he trade them to the airbase people for some concession? You don't know. You let them play kings, gods, and devils. I am the devil. Hell is empty because all the devils are here. What they have done, to have me be witness and then walk away is the very essence of blasphemy. They acted as though they could do anything because vengeance is just another religious myth, I am no myth. It is no idle boast. The collective will of mankind made me to be their instrument in places beyond the reach of their civilization. Vengeance is mine by virtue of my unholy birth. He corrected her, where I stand is by my virtue not beyond the reach of civilization. As king, he made himself responsible for the actions of his men. Inasmuch as that condemns him, it also saves him for the moment. He pretended to be Jim and it is to Jim that he must answer. As for the rest of his men, they are criminals of no particular import. Your appetite for torturing them is my concern. Carmen asked, is she still alive? She probably is, he confessed. That woman was determined not to die and I was in no hurry to force her into it. Now that you brought her son back to the world and we have captured their killers, it seems she had something worth waiting for. I'm not sure what to do with them anyway. I guess we could bury them out in the desert. If you're saving the king for later, she suggested, the rest of them would make useful grave diggers. He scoffed at that, Ruby near cracked the skull on the one. The other three are barely breathing after that overdose you gave them. I can wake them up, she assured him like she meant it literally. The other one can walk his broke ass or we drag him behind the truck for all I care. All right, Critias agreed. Wake them up. True to her word, Carmen revived the three overdosed brigands. She had a drug vial that contained some chemical that she injected them with. The first man she treated showed immediate signs of life. It was so impressive that Critias had to ask, what is that stuff? An antidote of sorts, she answered him. It works as an uptake inhibitor. If I am going to carry that stuff around, I needed the proper precautions. What if someone stole it from me and tried to use it? When Carmen used the same needle on the other unconscious guards, the false king commented, that isn't very sanitary. You can come along too, Critias told him. A comedian like you will come in handy out in the desert. That took away the man's verve. A trip out into the desert sounded like it would be a one-way excursion, which was nothing new for Vegas traditions anyway. Andy asked, is there anything we can do? Yeah, Critias readily accepted his offer. We need one of those farm wagons behind the truck. Get some shovels out of the barn for these assholes to dig some graves for those two farmers they murdered. We will swing by and get the bodies on our way out. The three doped guards had not been prisoners when they passed out. They awoke to find themselves in tightly bound ropes. Before long, Critias got the funeral procession moving. Solly finally got to drive as they took the truck out through the farm's front gate and then off to the side among the fields of marigolds. The five bandit prisoners dug the deep grave. Running off into the desert would not save them and no one got close enough to them to risk their attacking with shovels. Critias had them put the dead man down in the grave first. The body had an odor of the slop cooking cauldron that made the situation awkward. With that out of the way, Critias asked the false king, which of these bastards tortured and killed those innocent farmers? Panic set in then hard and fast. The grave was ready and everyone was in attendance. Right away, the false king and two of the men Carmen had drugged pointed out their two companions, the man from the front gate and the man that Carmen and Ruby had beaten on. Both of those men cursed their companions for being traitors who singled them out for worse punishment. Though they did not yet know it, they hadn't wasted their breath. The punishment would be worse. Critias commanded the condemned men, down on your knees or I'll cut off your feet with a shovel. When they complied trembling, Critias had Ruby bind their hands behind their backs again. Once the prisoners were ready, Critias turned to Carmen and then told her, There is glory in defeating your enemies. There is none to be had punishing them now while they're helpless. Carmen gestured to the dying woman lying in the flowers. Those farmers were helpless and still they failed defying enemies. What more of a noble sacrifice could a true king ask of anyone? I am not here to punish those men and glory is for the dead alone. 
she took out her hook-bladed pocket knife and then stepped up behind the man who had guarded the gate. Carmen had smelled the couple's fearful sweat and blood of murder on him when they first met. Of the woman, Carmen declared, she was a leader to the people of this farm and she gave her life trying to protect them. I will bury her as befits a queen of old. Carmen grabbed a fistful of the murderer's hair. He screamed horribly as Carmen ringed her sharp pocket knife around his skull, cutting him down to the bone. Carmen finished by ripping his bloody scalp clean off his head. The other prisoner flopped around on the ground desperate to escape, but it was to no avail. Carmen pinned him down and then scalped him too like one of the fallen at Little Bighorn. Thusly stripped to the bloody bone, Carmen took those grisly trophies over to the dying woman. She placed one of the scalps in each of her hands. Your son still lives and is safe inside the farm, Carmen spoke into the woman's ear. His rescue is your mercy. I put in your hands the reaped souls of the men who did this to you. In that, you have your justice and your vengeance. You will share this grave with your husband and together sleep draped in the marigolds of your home. We lay you to rest with honor. We will mourn and remember you. Be at peace now and leave all pains to those still in this world. Perhaps the woman heard everything Carmen said because she went into convulsions and finally died. Her hands stayed clenched like fists around the bloody scalps. Carmen told the surviving brigands, put her in and do it carefully. The moaning dormant of the scalped men summoned up the cries of ghouls out in the desert. Neither of the men was dying from their truly gruesome disfigurements. It was even possible for both of them to survive if they got considerable medical intervention. The three brigands with their scalps still on found plenty of motivation to work quickly without shirking an inequality. They placed the dead woman in the grave beside her husband and then shoveled back in all the loose soil. With the work done, Critias gathered up the shovels and then tossed them into their farm wagon. Ready to leave, he told the false king, you're coming with us. The two other guards expected an invitation into the wagon too, only such an offer wasn't forthcoming. One of them asked, what about us? Well, about that, Critias told them. That drug you morons inhaled doesn't mix all that well with the freak bites. There is a chance you might end up more of a problem than we would prefer having to deal with later. If not for the drugs you took, I would let the four of you stay here to mourn for these people you murdered. The ghouls will be along shortly and no doubt would love to make your acquaintance. In any case, you four have outlived your usefulness. The two condemned men knew they were dead no matter what. One of them charged at Critias only to take a shot to the head from his pistol. The other made a run for it, trying to get lost out in the dark of the desert. A blast from Ruby's shotgun blew him off his feet. A scalped guard, the one from the bunkhouse, felt suitably crazed over his hopeless situation. Slippery blood that dripped onto his wrists had allowed him to slip his ropes that Ruby could have tied better. He grabbed a stone off the ground and then leaped at Carmen to bash her with it. He got one step before Critias shot him in the head, which mercifully put him out of his misery. Having had his fill of the distasteful business, Critias executed the other still-bound scalped prisoner and then walked over to headshot the man Ruby had put down. The howling of desert ghouls was getting close by then. Those infected would be able to smell the blood well enough to find the bodies. Their feasting would clean up the mess of corpses, and then in the morning the buzzards would finish anything they left behind if it wasn't already too toxic from infection. Chapter 10 Custer's Revenge On the way back in after the funeral, Critias used his helmet to send a text message through the black hole to the cell phone of Colonel Hiram Davis at Groom Lake. His entire report was that he had the farm undamaged and awaited further instructions. With that out of the way, Critias planned to not give any guns to the farmers and he would keep the false king handcuffed to a chain. With those precautions in place, Critias could make a vacation out of his stay. Carmen transferred all her mission data back home to her brother Kevin via their longitudinal wave interlink. It was Kevin that digested down her full cognitive and sensory experience to produce a comparatively minuscule written report. His control room supplied that relevant information to Jim and the other governors. The Marigold Farm report was more good news for Jim. The dam had already been a momentous acquisition with its essentially limitless capacity to generate electrical power. It also came with the freshwater reservoir that had splendid fishing opportunities. Jim also had the Groom Lake Air Base under his control, which was no small prize. Even if it was true that the world had lots of air bases and airports, Groom Lake had access to the electricity and was in an inaccessible desert location ideally free of sustained heavy ghoul activity. The diverse productivity of the farm made Jim's gardens back home seem pathetic by comparison. As nice as it already was, Marigold Farm would become a whole lot better. Jim would reinvigorate the place with a connection to the dam's electrical grid. He would add additional manpower, skilled technical experts, and new farming equipment. In time, 
he could even expand the walls to take in more land for both crops and animal grazing. Jim valued all his new properties far too much for him to trust the crazy survivors and residents to not destroy them. For both the dam and the farm, the former slaves already in them had proven ability to safely operate their holdings. The airbase had a much larger population than the others combined, but they were far from hardworking or trustworthy by nature. Jim felt certain that if he mixed those former enemies together, they would degenerate into violence. On the other hand, even while he kept them apart, the recently brutalized occupants of the farm would not have any enthusiasm for continuing to feed their former masters at the airbase. The political machinery that was King Louis eventually became orders from Fajag to Colonel Hiram Davis at Groom Lake. Critias slept away his morning in a hammock under the fruit trees on Marigold Farm. He had never lived in the old world when people enjoyed nature freely without the threat of ghouls. For him, the outdoor life was a unique and thoroughly satisfying experience. Sleeping outdoors was doubly so. Automatic sprinklers on the farm's elevated irrigation pipes sprayed upward when they watered whole orchards at once. Critias sometimes slept to the sound of rain as it pattered upon a lawn umbrella that Carmen had placed there to keep the hammock dry. His wife remained in a fine mood after that dark business of a funeral in the desert. She had made peace with the harsh world and found satisfaction in her professional life as a special agent of the king. Censoring out the offensive odors from her enhanced olfactory sense spared Carmen an unpleasantly pervasive reminder of the farm's dark past. At the same time she enjoyed its more delightful aromas and their unmitigated grandeur. Despite its sordid and bloody history, Marigold Farm remained a wondrously beautiful place and an oasis sanctuary in the midst of an otherwise inhospitable land. Carmen checked on her husband frequently. When he was awake, they made love in the fragrant orchard or ate fruit fresh from the branches. When he slept, she explored the farm and made herself familiar with all its varied attributes. Colonel Davis left the Sand Tigers at Groom Lake. Other than being boots on the ground to keep the locals in line, they had a job to fill a fuel tanker truck that would go to the Greyhound Plane later. Lee Fane and Palat Sir Khan stayed there to negotiate with that community in the name of Fleet Admiral Rudil. The Admiral intended to gobble them up into his heavily militarized population. None of the governors believed that corrupt community of exploitive slavers needed to stay together at all, much less as a semi-autonomous entity under its own leadership. Gloria flew the Black Hole to Marigold Farm. She had Colonel Davis aboard along with all of his Grave Walker's platoon. After Gloria took some daytime aerial photos of the farm to send back home, she landed the airship in the wide-open grazing pasture at the northwestern corner. One of the farmers commanded a pair of dogs that flocked the sheep out of the way. Several dairy cows remained indifferent to the extraordinary arrival of a giant lighter-than-air vehicle. Earlier in the day while Carmen explored the farm, she had discovered their champion bloodline and illusion stallion that lived in the sheep pasture. The horse had no real value as a work animal and it certainly wasn't alive as potential food. For the farmers, keeping the horse was extravagant, but why was obvious to anyone who saw the magnificent beast. The stallion was a spectacular specimen of pure Spanish war horse, coquettish with his long mane. Carmen had gotten the horse bridled and saddled. The farmers still mounted the stallion on occasion. It was a convenient means of transportation when they surveyed the farm property away from the limited number of agriculture-wasting roadways. She had ridden the horse while she explored the fields and orchards. Later, Carmen taught Critias how to ride and then they had some fun together. Colonel Davis exited the black hole along with the grave walkers. They all marveled at the property from the ground just as they had done from the air. Marigold Farm was an emerald jewel encircled in gold, all in the midst of a vast desert wasteland. The grave walkers didn't mind strolling to the village at the center of the farm. It was their chance to admire the place and just enjoy the outdoors. Jim's community back home had a lot going for it, but it existed removed from nature. When out in the open at the East Airport, there was the ever-present danger of prowling infected. Marigold Farm had a power about it to astonish anyone, to either let them remember the world as it was or get some understanding about the way it had been. Critias met them on the road while he was on his way to return the horse to the stable. He was in the saddle with Carmen across his knees, her wrist bound as a captive. The eye mask band of red makeup across her face had a rather sinister aspect as all war paint should. Several feathers from a golden eagle festooned her hair. When the horse stopped, Colonel Davis had to ask, playing cowboys and Indians. More like Custer's revenge, Critias answered him and then gave Carmen's already red backside a smack. She remained limp and too sedated by happiness to do more than murmur that Guster had indeed gotten his full measure of justice upon a savage scalper of intrusive settlers. Amber chuckled over their inordinately colorful romance. It was no secret that Carmen had unconventional appetites that delved into masochism. Having seen enough of the farm's epicurean amusements, 
Colonel Davis told Critias about ongoing business. Jim and the other governors are on the fence about where they want to go from here. The Commodore thinks we can connect to Denver by rail. The Admiral seems to think an aircraft connection to Groom Lake would suffice. Jim suggested that an over-the-road truck route would be the most practical. We're the ones out here, so they won't make an official determination without our input. When you're done with your ride, I'd like to talk to you too about the possibilities. Critias gave him a from the brow salute to show that he understood and then they continued on for returning the horse to his pasture. In total, the farmers numbered around 30. The pretender King Louis and his goons had murdered their community leaders. For the moment, they were still doing their regular jobs to keep the farm running while they waited to see who would take them over next. Their situation was as simple as the value of food and who had the weaponry for declaring lordship over it. By the time Critias and Carmen returned to the village freshly showered and in clean clothes, Colonel Davis had the farmers talking to the governors over a video conference. The black hole conveniently provided all the requisite satellite uplink communications. Jim was on the laptop video screen explaining the situation with his usual excellence. A senior farmer hotly contested, how is this any different than before? What if we just want you to pack up and leave us in peace? You don't have the manpower to survive on your own, Jim replied with an obvious truth. The Council of Governors is uniting everything left in the world. Since you are not powerful enough to justify having a governor of your own, we can just admit that you're negotiating your surrender to us. The man challenged, how far are you willing to go to force our surrender? As far as it takes, Jim admitted freely. If it was simply a matter of force, we already have that. Clearly, I want something else. Your cheerful gratitude suits me much better than your submission to intimidation. Outright bribery is my preferred course of action. What do you want to make your dreams come true? That offer set the man aback for a moment. He never expected to be in a position to make wishes. Jim assisted him, for starters, we recognize that this farm is your home and you deserve every right to keep living here. We will restore full electrical service and provide you with goods and skilled professionals on an equal footing to ourselves. If all you want is safety, respect, and fair barter for your productivity, I promise you shall have it. If you have a capable person, select from among yourselves a mayor of Marigold Farm. Administrate this transition yourselves and we will be helpful in bringing about a harmonious adaptation. The only condition I must insist upon is that we unite in the common cause of humanity. Mumbling among the other farmers was all variations on their positive agreement. They wanted to be part of a larger free society where they were neither disarmed slaves nor isolationists living fearfully behind their high walls. Their long-term exposure to the King Louis radio program played no small part in their thinking. They believed in the dream and were willing to seize it now that the opportunity had come. Aware of the general mood of the farmers, the spokesman told Jim, we will elect a mayor as you suggest. Equal membership in your great alliance will ensure our willing and enthusiastic cooperation. The farmers showed their great sense of relief that their future situation would not be another tyranny. While they congratulated one another, the young man that Carmen had rescued struggled to stand from the law chair until one of the youthful women who had been a hostage helped him up. His brutal baking in the cab of that truck during his banishment had taxed his vigor, but he was well enough to leave his sick bed. After he approached Carmen, the young man indicated Andy with a gesture, Your friend told me what you did for me, and for my parents. He indicated the young woman that helped him stand, and what you did for Rose too. Thank you for coming here. I believe in King Louis now, the truth of the King Louis we heard about on the radio. It must all be real because of you. Thank you. You are very welcome, Carmen replied touched emotionally. In a more business-like manner, she warned, but you need to understand that this king's peace is for anyone willing to accept it. Many of the men from Groom Lake are already dead from their war against King Louis. Their remaining survivors have agreed to accept his peace. When you join the king, you must also accept the truce of peace. You don't have to be friends with those people, but your feud with them is over, and they still have to eat. Many of the farmers overheard Carmen and then grumbled over the idea of feeding the people who had enslaved them. They all understood the value of the farm and what they could gain in fair barter with the rest of the new alliance. The tempting benefits of that peace and living out their future days in safety and comfort, was only just enough for them to sublimate their old longing for revenge based on well-deserved hatred for Groom Lake. Carmen told the farmers, none of you have to stay here at all. Once we have the new transportation lanes open, you could go live in another of our cities. We have people who will be happy to work this farm either in your place or beside you. The Council of Governors has more advantages than you can yet understand. Critias felt that time really did he lull wounds when it came to absorbing new survivors into the kingdom. He wanted them to do more thinking and less talking, since it was the latter that could do the permanent damage immediately. As a change of topic, Critias asked Jim, 
the fake King Louis who did so much harm here is still alive. Without putting too much thought into it, Jim just asked, why? Tradition, I guess, was Critias's explanation. When Jim didn't comprehend his meaning, Carmen clarified. We respect the ancient prohibition against spilling noble blood. If everyone with a weapon thought it was within their purview to run around killing heads of state, communities might start changing governments as casually as they change their shoes. Critias and I agree that such things always deserve every measure of pomp and diplomacy. Jim readily approved after he understood the applied philosophy at work. I wholeheartedly agree that we should always respect the sanctity of the command structure. Herman Clark gave his life establishing the clarity of that. Consider it duly reviewed, I declare him a pet usurper unqualified for any special protections. One moment please, Commander Critias, Jessica said appearing on the screen behind Jim. I would prefer that you brought him back when my father returns. Jim revealed one of his rare telling expressions of his inner thoughts, this one being frustration with his wife's unwanted interference with business. He had to ask, why is that? He did not pretend to be you, Jessica reasoned. He pretended to be my husband. Your name is mine by marriage, is it not? Would you prefer I keep my name Davis? That pretender offended me and I wish to personally see him answer for it. More pleasantly she added, my father has accomplished great things for all, and upon his return, I want him to have one of those triumphs I have read about. I think it is only fitting. So that everyone would understand, Carmen explained for all. In the tradition of Rome, a triumph was a parade and general celebration to honor a successful military campaign leader upon his return to their capital city. It was customary to display a distinguished captive, some captured treasure, and also his glorious soldiers festooned in their parade regalia. Jim comprehended the sum of it and it did please him, so he decreed, well reasoned and soundly advised from a most worthy queen, let it be so. Deputy Grand Marshal Colonel Hiram Davis has accomplished much and there is more yet to come. The least we can do to show our appreciation is to host a triumph in his honor, a respect entirely deserved. With that business out of the way, the farm wives arranged an outdoor picnic so that everyone could have an afternoon supper. Living as they did, chores after dark were too difficult under the limited electrical lighting. There was all the leftovers from the Feast of the False King, plus more besides. When it came to advantages for living at Marigold Farm, one of them was having first pick of all the finest food. As they sat down together at one of the long picnic tables, Colonel Davis spoke of local business with his people he had gathered around him. We have to get home to have this triumph, Hiram said as the outstanding matter yet before them. The railway lines going back east are not open to us yet. Fleet Admiral Rudel could move between Denver and Groom Lake by air. Jim suggested that we could safely make the trip between here and Denver by relying on the highways and over-the-road trucking. Commodore Tinney is confident that we can open the rails between here and Denver as part of the overall train network. Critias asked, if the train was a good idea for continental travel before, why is it such a problem just getting to Denver now? Is there a bridge somewhere that collapsed? Hiram unfolded a map from his pocket and then laid it out on the table for everyone. Our problem is right here, he pointed out the location. Two trains got in each other's way back in the day and here they sit. Moving them would not be easy. The main issue is, this area here. To the east is the Wasatch Range of the Rocky Mountains. To the west is the Great Salt Lake Desert. In between is prime infected habitat from Spanish Fork Canyon in the south, to Willard Bay Reservoir in the north. Our track runs right down the middle of it. The trains we need to move are as deep in there as it gets. We can expect it to be worse than back home, solid packed like driving from here all the way back to Indian Springs, only wall-to-wall -wall urban screaming trouble. Andy whistled impressed, that is like 90 miles of downtown war zone and the trains are like 50 miles inside it. I can see why Rudel and Jim were willing to just forget about it. How many ghouls are in that hole? Let's call it the Wasatch Front, Hiram replied. We can expect a bider population in excess of 2 million. Even if things went our way, when the train engines fired up, they would come running. Sully reasoned. We don't really need a train for the dam. How close does a track get to us out here in farm country? Carmen reported, the Black Hole photographed a working rail line that stops just up the road from here. They were building it for the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Depository, but they never finished it. Using a train to ship cargo in and out of here could only be better if the track ran right up to this picnic table. With a little work on our part, that track could do exactly that. Normally, Critias said, I am the cautious type and would say just forget about it. When he had everyone's attention, he added, This time, I think we should go for it. We have Verloc, Cutter, Talbot and all his friends. They could work on those trains as is without a care in the world. 
that is just a weekend at home for them. As far as making the Wasatch Front safe, I say we just kill all those bastards. Think about it, we have the Groom Lake Air Base with all that war equipment. Most importantly we have Carmen. She is exactly the person you want around when it is finally time to seriously tear some shit up. If anyone could do it, I think she can. Everyone turned to stare at Carmen. By then, Kevin had long since downloaded all the computer data from Groom Lake and then analyzed it. That information allowed Carmen to consider what equipment was available for such an endeavor. Carmen told them, we have everything we need to destroy them. It will take some time and effort of course. Obviously, it is not really feasible for us to get all of them. The lurkers wait in place for something to attack. There is no getting them without burning down every building. Crawlers never travel far either. Even without an actual plan, it was what Colonel Davis wanted to hear. We don't need the lurkers, he said to be supportive. It is the really mobile and aggressive ones that are a problem for us using that corridor. Jim told me that it wasn't worth their time or materials to send in waves of bombers to set fire to the entire Wasatch Front. Whatever we do, we need to use the equipment and manpower we have without taking overly long about it. Well, Carmen suggested, I think it would be prudent to get our train engine operational. We will need that for transporting a lot of our materials there. Our train will need armored sleeper cars, some box cars and flatbeds, and the usual supplies. I need to get back to Groom Lake and prepare the equipment from there we will take. If we load all of that onto trucks, we can drive it up here and then load it onto the train when it arrives. Colonel Davis asked, what about those trains blocking the track into Spanish Fork Canyon? We will need tools of course, Carmen advised. Once we have our train loaded, I can fly ahead on the black hole with Ray and some of the others. After a quiet insertion, we could make all the preparations for getting the engine started. We would also need time to get all the brake lines holding pressure. With Ray's technical help, I'm sure we can handle it. Just one more thing before we eat, Hiram said to Carmen. When I run this idea by Jack, are there any serious risks to any of this, I mean, beyond the obvious daily hazards? Carmen gave that some proper consideration before she answered, no, nothing in particular. If the black hole crashes, a train catches fire, or some other possible accident happens, some people might die. So long as everyone uses the proper safety gear and follows their instructions, I expect everything to go smoothly. The Wasatch Front is a large area. Our preparations and time investment will necessarily be proportionately heavy. After the meal, Carmen helped the other women clean up while the men of the farm did their final tending to the animals for the night. She met up with Gridius at sunset and had him use his mech suit to carry the barrel of VX nerve toxin to the truck that the bandits had brought from Groom Lake. Carmen was careful to make sure that the barrel was safe and wouldn't bounce around while driving. Carmen had Critias drive as they left Marigold Farm to return to the airbase. He didn't have much experience with the contemporary vehicles and she thought it was a good time for him to learn. As they headed back across the desert, he asked her, What do you want to do with the barrel? We will use it ourselves, she confessed. There is a whole warehouse of this stuff at Groom Lake. They shipped it in from a chemical weapons testing and storage facility near where we are going at Wasatch Front, a place they called Dugway. That didn't make sense to him. You said that the poison would not have any effect on the ghouls. She shrugged at that, it affects them just fine, it just won't kill them. If shooting them through the lungs or in the heart is not going to stop them, paralyzing those organs wouldn't work any better. What it will do, is cause them horrible amounts of pain and make them unable to control their muscles to move around effectively. After a while, they will develop a resistance to it and then it won't do anything. That is fine for us, because I don't plan to use it on them more than once, to actually kill them or to keep them down for overly long? He asked, but it is dangerous to us? For your mech suit and myself, she said, it would hurt and cause uncontrollable muscle spasm. If it gets on your real skin, even a single drop, it will be the end for you. He followed along thus far, so why did they think it would work? They probably tested it on the newly infected, she speculated. It would have dropped them sure enough and seemed useful. At the time, it was the freshly infected everywhere anyway still had their makeup and knickers on. My guess is that by the time this shipment arrived at the base, their test subjects started getting back up and then biting people. They must have thought it was just a matter of them finding the right poison. Their whole world fell apart a lot sooner than they would have liked. By then, it was already too late. Critias realized that there had to be more, if this stuff is not your solution, what is? How are you planning on killing a million plus infected? First, she said, we have to get them all in one place. That is the tricky part. Anyone could kill them. Getting all your ducks in a row is what requires the planning. 
So you will use a bomb on them, he guessed. It would have to be pretty big to take out more than a million freaks. Oh yeah, she agreed with that. There will be some smaller bombs too, but the last one will have to be a big one. Carmen gave him a huge happy grin, I will finally get to play with the fun toys. Later that night at Groom Lake after an uneventful drive, Carmen and Gridius had all the sand tigers to back them up as they walked out toward the runway. A group of men waited out there, standing in the headlights of their vehicles. Leon was there talking to the surviving soldiers from the dead general's army. All those prisoners from the dam had driven back to their airbase aboard several trucks from storage in the canyon tunnels. None of the prisoners, Leon included, had any weapons. Once they were all face to face, Carmen addressed the audience, the Council of Governors invites all of you to join them. She indicated the Sand Tigers, these men are with Fleet Admiral Rudel. Governor Rudel has already negotiated with the people here, and they have agreed to join him. The Admiral extends that same opportunity to you, with the understanding that you agree to obey the officers he appoints over you. If any of you are unwilling to make peace and want to try your luck on your own out in the wilds, we will give you vehicles, small arms, and some supplies, you will be free to head west and luck be with you. Before you decide, I want you to consider that the Council of Governors has many more women than they do men. When you factor in your recent losses of manpower, you can see that there is a lot here with us worth staying for. None of the men wanted to live on the road when they still had safer and more comfortable options. Since none of them declined the offer, Carmen continued, the governors are going to open a railway train connection between the farm up north and their holdings back east. To do that, there is one main obstacle in our way, we have to clear two stalled trains off the track we need. The governors have a plan to accomplish that, but they need manpower, skilled soldiers capable of operating the vehicles and weapons we will use. Every volunteer we select to accompany us on this mission, should you survive, will have your choice of outposts as your next duty assignment. Those of you who prove yourselves will undoubtedly become officers of the governors too. The men talked quietly among themselves to see if they were all of like minds. It didn't take them long to come to a universal agreement. They had followed their last general without any hope of bettering their lives. What Carmen offered was a chance for them to risk themselves only they would get something out of it. Leon spoke for them all, we are with you. What do you need us to do? Carmen instructed, get all of the tractor trucks operational that you can. We need flatbeds and box trailers for cargo. We need drivers and crew for both of the Paladin artillery tanks, and two striker vehicles, a mobile gun system tank destroyer, and a 30mm cannon. We need all your forklifts. We are taking the airburst shells for the Paladins, kinetic penetrators and canister shot for the 105mm tank gun and enough 30 mm ammunition that the gun melts before we run dry. We also want all the smoke ammunition you can find for the two heavy guns. You will need to load up some heavy and medium machine guns, only belt fed, and plenty of ammo. I am not interested in fragmentation hand grenades. We don't want to rain infected meat on our own heads. No explosives will be used in close quarters. Everyone just stood around not sure where to begin. Leon shouted, All right, you heard the lady. Let's get to work. Several electric carts pulled up with women of the community. One of them was the Paiute woman that Carmen had first spoken to when she entered the base with Verloc. When the other women got out to join the men in their labor, the Paiute woman invited Critias and Carmen to join her. Carmen spoke to her and Paiute, This is my husband, Critias. The woman smiled at him and then said in English, I am Mosi, and will be your guide today. You can call me Kat. Carmen asked her, Isn't that Navajo? My father, Kat answered in that language. Carmen nodded in understanding and then used that language to say, A good man no doubt. Kat drove off with them in the cart. As they went, she returned to English, You are full of surprises. She is that, Critias agreed. As unconditional a friend as an enemy, either way, you'll get your full measure. Since they were talking face to face, Critias really wanted to know, Why did you take such a big chance trusting Carmen when you first met? That couldn't have been an easy decision. Not if you thought King Louis was a pirate lord. Cat had a ready answer, when she spoke to me in the true human language, I knew what I had to do. The spirits were working through her and I only needed to have faith. It was an unmistakable sign from the sacred ancestors. It could not have been anything else. Critias needed only nod to that. He too believed in sacred ancestors and the power of tradition. One should never abandon their beliefs during a crisis. That is when you needed them most. With that out of the way, Kat asked Carmen, what do you want to see first? Operation Hummingbird, Carmen told her. That was the name Carmen acquired from the computer records. When Kat had no idea what that was, Carmen clarified, the unmanned helicopters. 
Oh, Kat understood that. Those Japanese crop dusters and such. She turned to take them toward a large hangar building that was off by itself. We will need to do some unpacking, Kat warned. Copper never had any use for that stuff, but knew better than to let it spoil out in the weather. Critias pulled open the hangar door that had not moved in a year or more. The interior was dusty and dark. Carmen went inside and then found the switch to turn on the lights. Operation Hummingbird, she declared for them both. The hangar was huge and the community had loaded it with their storage. Even with all the crates and barrels, the miniature helicopters were plain to see. There was more than one kind. A few of them were unique prototypes with military markings. One of them had an autocan and another had rocket pods on pylons. Another dozen of the helicopters were about the size of motorcycles. Some of them were still in their shipping crates while others sat fully assembled. Instead of weapons, they had plastic reservoir tanks on their sides and spray nozzles for spritzing the liquid contents out into the air beneath them. Crop dusters, Kat said about the little helicopters with fluid spurts or tanks. At least, that is what they told me. Correct, Carmen confirmed it. Operation Hummingbird was not a bad plan. Not bad at all considering that I intend to use it in my own way. They planned to use these remote-controlled pilotless vehicles to spray ghoul tribes with deadly chemical weapons. It would not only have killed the large herds, but it would also have saturated their main traffic areas with the toxin, killing the ones that came along later. Unfortunately, they didn't have any poisons that were capable of killing them, for that matter, I don't either. Cat finally understood, so this is what all that nerve gas stuff is for. Copper had us lock it all up and then stay away from it. He said that we would be screwed if we ever punctured one of the barrels. It wouldn't be good, Carmen agreed to that much. In its current form it isn't a gas. It has a consistency closer to that of your engine oil. That is both good and bad. It will stay where you spill it, but it won't go away either. My husband and I will see to moving what we take. If there's a spill, none of your people will be at any particular risk. Critias commented about the miniature helicopters, these all seem to be new and most of them are still in their boxes. I would wager that they still work. Is this what you hoped for? We are that much closer, Carmen said with satisfaction. I need to get some men down here to pull them all out and then get them loaded into box trailers for the trip up to the railroad by the farm. On the way back out, Critias asked, what next? Carmen thought aloud, I can have them drive the striker vehicles there under their own power. The Paladin howitzers are already sitting on their transport trailers. Those just need semi-tractors to get them on the road. We will need to take one of the bulldozers up there too. Loading the heavy equipment onto flat cars is going to require an earth ramp. Once the people here have all this under control, we should go back to the dam. Ray will need our help getting our new locomotive operational. Before we can leave, I still need to get Verloc squared away for her helicopter trip. There are things for her to get ready in the target area before we arrive in force for the mission. Critias asked, another helicopter? We have plenty of them here to choose from, Carmen said like it was no big deal. She flew the Seahawk back home and the Eurocopter we have at the dam. This place has dozens of Pave Hawks and Black Hawks, which are pretty much the same thing. With some external fuel tanks, they will make the trip easily enough. Once they are in the city, finding fuel won't be any problem for them. When the time comes for us to get everything set up, we will need the helicopter for positioning materials around the operation zone. A helicopter will do that far better than the Black Hole can. He took a moment to consider her plans thus far. It was going to take them a while to get their own train ready. They would still have to load it and then drive it all the way to the Rocky Mountains. He couldn't imagine it taking less than several days. When problems came up as they usually did, they could need a couple weeks to get it all together. Critias asked her, why so soon? Verloc might have a couple weeks before we can get there with all this stuff. She gave him a skeptical glance, we can have our train ready sooner than that. Anyway. I want to get those new watchers out of the way to keep them from causing more trouble. They can explore and do some shopping. That was a wealthy part of the nation. I have no doubt that Romeo will find ample opportunities there to amuse himself. He sensed there might be more to it, you said there are thousands of watchers around the country. Any big city with drugs and a lake to drown in could have one of those crazy bastards creeping around. Do you think there are some in the Wasatch? Carmen frowned a little over the question and then told the truth, probably, yes. If there was one or more of them there, they might have moved on by now. They could also still be there. It is the one great uncertainty about all this. If they are unfriendly and have armed themselves, they could undo everything we are trying to accomplish, and even kill us. Well then, he agreed with her foresight. It would be a good idea for Verloc and Romeo to get there right away, take our new watchers along for the ride, have a look around, 
do a little shopping, and maybe see if there are some unfriendly watchers occupying the city. I'm not going to destroy the place anyway, Carmen reasoned. Even if they are there, so long as they don't do anything stupid, we will just clean up most of the naked dummies as Cutter likes to say, and then be on our way. After we are done, it will be a nicer place to live. They might even be grateful. Cat asked, where do you want to go next? Let's check out the chemical weapon storage, Critias instructed her. We have a barrel of that crap in the back and I would like to get rid of it. Chapter 11 Time and Tide Talbot and his watcher friends had met with Verloc while Critias and Carmen took over Marigold Farm. The new watchers proved to be amiable enough that they followed Special Agent Shield back to the dam to meet with Cutter and Romeo. Blacksburg the swine had traveled along with them, arriving somewhat later than the others. The pig had trotted there in the company of his usual traveling companion Gustav. After Carmen's preparations at Groom Lake got the personnel there capably underway, she and Critias returned to the dam to see about other business. It was after midnight and still plenty dark as they drove through the dam's adjacent city that had their airport. She had Critias stop at the fully enclosed train maintenance facility that they planned on taking over. As usual, picking the lock was no difficulty for Carmen. Once inside, cautiously using flashlights for illumination, they found that the place was perfect, not only just in the short term, but as a base of train operations for years to come. The enormous shed had twin heavy rail garage bays with overhead cranes, tools, and welding equipment. As fortune would have it, one of the bays sheltered an ideal locomotive from the elements. The train engine was an older model, having seen more than half a century in service. Tourist dollars, dutiful restoration mechanics, and regular use had kept it in perfect condition. The locomotive had been a real workhorse in its day, rugged, and with Herculean horsepower, having served in the creation of the dam itself. Just seeing it gave Critias confidence that it would not only meet their immediate low-speed unloaded needs, but it would also pull a whole train over the Rocky Mountains if called upon for that service. The other maintenance bay contained a boxcar, only it didn't seem the same as all the others Critias had seen before. It may have even been a cargo boxcar at one time, only a later refitting made it into something else. Whatever it was, it seemed to be in fully remodeled condition. Other than peeling off some masking tape newspaper left over from a refit paint job, the car looked immaculate. He asked, what is that one? That is also nice, Carmen informed him. It is our head-end power car. There is an electrical generator in there. It will provide the power for heating, air conditioning, and water pumps. It has everything we need for connected passenger cars to make them livable. The soldiers will appreciate that. I will need to install air conditioners on their armored vehicles. They don't have any and those machines do get miserably hot. Not only that, we can park it outside and then use its generator to power up this place while we work. They both explored the whole building, using their future tech camera systems to record an inventory of all the available tools and materials. Kevin could process such day tomorrow or less instantly to then compose a written report for the hard copy printers. After they finished, Carmen said, our new train will need armor and lots of it. That comment made Critias mention, those trains up in the Wasatch won't have any armor and there is no garage like this out there. How hard can it be to slap some sheet metal over the windows? Carmen bobbed her head at that as her mind raced with all the issues involved in her master plan. She finally said, this train, your train, will have to be a roar machine. For us to get all of the ghouls, well more than a million of them, this train will have to be able to withstand sustained attack by a lot of infected. You won't be able to run away just because a few hundred of them scream and scratch at the plating. You are right about those other trains. There is a good chance that we will keep one or both of those locomotives. Now that I have seen how nice this place is, we can drive them back here for maintenance and upgrades. Back to our actual starting point, she said, we need more equipment and materials for building the kind of armor we need. I have some ideas on where to get it. None of the flatbed cars we require are available here. The passenger cars out there on the shunting rails could work for us. If we push them in here, we could gut them, armor them, and then refit the interiors to our needs. He stated the obvious fact that she had to already know, all that noise is going to bury this place in the local freaks. We have to do something about that. There is that, Carmen agreed with him. I already heard from Kevin that Jim is not entirely thrilled with my plans. He specifically forbids us to make any more of a contamination mess near the dam than we already have. Jim is calling the dam a long-term paradise miracle situation that we need to preserve as a highest priority. The ghoul massacre at the airport was not our fault, Critias said annoyed. Their general attacked us. We are lucky no one got killed. We will have to clean up that mess at some point, 
Carmen informed him. At least in that matter, there is a confluence of factors working in our favor. The nearby septic-waste plant has pits to hold the bodies and front loaders to get them there. The desert climate works in our favor too. The blood spill on the tarmac won't endure the dry heat and sand erosion, once the meat piles are away. Critias said, it may be convenient for cleaning up and already a mess, but even so, if Jim says we are not to shoot up or blow apart the ghouls anywhere near areas we plan on keeping generationally, that would include slaughtering them here when they bury this garage chasing the tool work noise. He already assumed the answer was no, but he asked her to confirm it, is the Wasatch going to be a contamination zone? Your bombs will make one hell of a mess. I can kill a couple of million infected, Carmen told him, but only while making outrageously bloody carnage in the process, a gore avalanche that is never going to just go away. This won't be a sanitary extermination like Jim's Fort Blood plans back home. The whole Wasatch Front is going to be reduced down into an awful sticky mess when we're finished with it, the final killing zone especially. The upside is, people will only have to see it out their windows as our trains roll safely on through as speed heading for greener pastures. Critias did have complete confidence in Carmen's ability to plan the right solution to their problems. Unconcerned, he asked, what now? Carmen told him, as you pointed out, our next primary concern is cleaning up this local area so that we can safely use this building to work on our new train. To that end, Kevin processed the data we collected from past tests of your MechSuit's blackout mode software package. She had good news, he sent me your new upgrade that I will install for you. Ray and I will get this already excellent locomotive started without any trouble. When we take it out for a test drive, we can do a kernel flash pulling party to lure the local infected along with us. The only track we have connected to this train shelter takes us right through the middle of Vegas. We can just pull those out to, eventually leave them out in the deep desert. On our way through the city, we could drop you off with Cutter and some of the other watchers. There are some boxcars and flat cars in the city that we need to collect. While I am away pulling ghouls, your group can load some supplies onto those cars. On the way back, we will hook up your cars and then bring it all home. A HUD application for the new program appeared for Critias. When he switched it on, he lost all his mech suit functions other than his atmosphere and physical movement. The helmet muffled his natural voice a bit, but not enough to bother Carmen. He advised, you should come with us. Ray can drive the train around without a babysitter. He is a professional. She tentatively agreed, there are some ophthalmology supplies I would like to forge and there was a provider in that area. We can't really know what survived the fires without an inspection. See, he seconded her reason for joining him. I don't know what ophthalmology even is so you can't count on me to grab the right stuff. Jim wants to be able to make prescription eyeglasses for impaired vision, Carmen clarified. Hopefully, I will be able to take the grinding machines and other materials for making our own lenses. Crafting frames is not so important, but with any luck, I will just take whole cases of those ready made. On the other hand, Critias added to be positive about the mission, the steel we need for train armor is fireproof. Unless you were thinking about using plastic. Steel, she confirmed it. There is also other equipment we are interested in, welding supplies, plasma cutting technology, and machine bolts. Outfitting the interiors of the passenger cars will come later. I think the local hardware and home supply, stores will meet our needs in that arena. He suggested, you need to call Colonel Davis, have him truck in some builders from the airbase. A few dozen skilled workers would be helpful. I'll do that, she agreed while taking his hand. They were ready to go back to the dam for their other business. As soon as they were outside, the sound of howling ghouls came at them from off to the south at their airport. The battle there with the general had pulled in a lot of ghouls and it took them a while to eat the bodies, at least until what remained became so toxic with infection that not even they would eat it. With so many of them in one place, when one of them killed an animal, the rest would fight to take it away. Their squabbling could be quite boisterous. For those familiar with their hyena vocabulary behavior, their current sounds didn't relate to chasing human prey. There was something distinctive about that vocalization. It had an intensity that went far beyond mere food or frustration. As Critias was about to open the driver's door on the military light truck, he paused to check the soles of his boots for infected gore, a good habit he acquired for not spreading the mess around unnecessarily. At that moment, a female ghoul dashed up out of the dark straight for him. For Critias, a single infected was no threat in his mind anymore, it was more like having a fly that buzzed around his dinner plate harmless but irritating far beyond its actual power. Critias remained mindful that Jim gave orders to not slop up their city with infected tissue, so blowing its brains out was not an option. He settled for cocking back his hand to slap it upside the head. 
The ghoul ran right past the back of their vehicle and then continued south toward the airport, apparently tempted by the sounds of squabbling that came from there. Critias shrugged at that to say that his blackout program for his electronic pollution clearly worked. Let's hurry, Carmen said as she opened the passenger side door. I want to top off my charge before we get back to work. Her whimsically erotic thoughts with its accompanying surge of affection for Critias caused the female ghoul that passed to stop in its tracks. The creature spun about, locked onto Carmen even in the dark, and then charged straight at her back. With his enhanced senses powered down, Critias had no night vision or auditory enhancement to give him early warning. The starlight was strong enough for him to see the ghoul coming. Instead of his pistol, Critias pulled out that aluminum flashlight he had taken inside to explore the maintenance building. He threw it like a tomahawk that smacked the ghoul solid in the face. Carmen came to realize that something was amiss about the same time that Critias had. She already came about to deal with the problem when the flashlight knocked the ghoul into a spill. No longer sure of its target, the creature picked itself up and then ran off into the night with a broken nose. Once they were back on the road headed for the dam, Carmen commented, It looks like we are in the same boat now. Verloc says it happens to her sometimes. She meant ghouls attacking them even though they were not human. Everyone adapts to survive, he reasoned. When I think about it, giving each other a hard time when working makes for good camouflage. Like Jasper and Camelot, he was so good at grave walking because he really was a greedy sociopathic son of a bitch. They don't read a damn thing from him. I think you are right, dickhead. She agreed with added humor. Ghouls are not romantically seducing their victims. Like Lady de Locker, Critias added sourly. I have seen enough watchers to guess that she still might be more trouble than she is worth. This world is short on humans and she likes to drink them. When no one feeds her willingly, she will probably take it by force. Carmen reminded him, you and Cutter used to be at each other's throats. I will send her up to the city with Verloc. We can trust her and Romeo to determine just how unstable these new watchers really are. He had to wonder, do we know if any of them have been in that area before? If they toured around at all, that is one of the better places to visit. I only know what I have heard from Verloc, Carmen excused. We can look into it if you really want to know. I don't really want to know, he dismissed it. We have enough problems. That is why sending them away seemed like such a good idea in the first place. In the time that Critias had been away, the engineers at the dam had repaired the existing security camera system. There was now an operational camera at the great doors that sealed the tunnel at the base of the lower portal road. Dam electricians had also reconnected the remote-controlled drive chain that unbarred that barrier from the inside. No one had to come out to the end of the tunnel to open the locks. Carmen just had to send the command signal and then Critias had to dismount to manually push the tonnage-heavy doors. Watchers did not sleep in the conventional sense. All of them were up and about at that late hour. They were at the tail end of a cookout on the pier, not far from the inner end of the portal tunnel. Critias had to drive the truck around Blacksburg because the giant pig laid out in the middle of the deck. Once he had parked over by the generator building and they got out, Critias had his first chance to see all the new watchers. He was familiar with David Talbot of course. The man seemed in good cheer as though the world was on track for him. One or more of them had shot some rams and then dressed them for their roasting spit. With all their big eaters like Cutter and Blacksburg. A pair of large rams was little more than a meal for their picnic. Gustav was there freshly washed and in a change of clothes. He even gave Critias an acknowledging friendly wave. A little politeness could go a long way. It made Critias feel glad that he hadn't shot the crazy bastard out in the desert after he attacked Groom Lake with his silver mine ghoul army. Professor Karnaki smoked tobacco pipes and chatted with Professor Romeo. They shared that educated panache of upper society lifestyle that gave Critias a good feeling about the new professor. It had been his experience that sophisticated people considered petty villainy beneath their aristocratic station. On the other hand, they were the type of people to have mad scientist plans for epic destruction, in that regard, they would have to wait and see. The dinosaur mask on Dosh made him stand out like no other. That unavoidable display of madness aside, the man also had a practiced militancy about him from his dress to his weapons. Critias saw that Dosh was dangerous and it permeated him as it did with true professionals, Dosh's seat with his back to the water made it impossible for anyone to get behind him and he always had a clear view of everyone else. Critias had his full mech suit systems back up, which allowed him to see Dosh's eyes behind the concealed slits in his dinosaur mask. He was checking Critias and Carmen out, but even as he did it, his hands gracefully cut his meat with knife and fork, the plate perfectly balanced on his knee. Dosh gave the impression that he didn't have any concern with them at all. It remained uncertain exactly how he would get the food into his real mouth behind the mask. 
Critias assumed it wouldn't be a good idea to make an effort finding out. Getting between the man and his alter ego was unlikely to have a positive outcome. Delacroix wore a new high fashion dress. She had also done her hair and makeup. The lady wasn't a bad looking woman, especially in her eye catching bosom. There was also plenty that was off about her, like her complexion, which could have been her aversion to sunlight combined with her diet. The chloroplasts built up in her hungry ghoulish blood and that leached the pink color from her skin. Whatever it was, it made her paler than was normal. Like Dosh, she was curious while doing a good job of concealing it. Unlike Dosh, when Critias checked her out, her head turned as though she had psychically sensed him. She looked him right in the eyes and it did give Critias an uneasy feeling. The woman was a deep mystery. Whatever she thought, Critias had not a clue. The other woman had to be Ophelia. She was a lightly built brunette that sat in a dour defensive silence that left no doubt that she had no interest in meeting people or having any kind of conversation. Nothing about her seemed hostile or conspicuous, just closed off. When Critias removed his helmet to meet everyone, Cutter told him, Welcome back, Pee Wee. If you're hungry, I did all the cooking. You don't need to worry about catching anything. Maybe later, Critias declined. How are you making out with the new gang? Cutter answered, We talked about it. Everyone agrees that joining King Louis is the next best thing to getting their old lives back. To clarify, Critias checked, did they consider the other governors? No need, Cutter replied quickly. It's the king who appreciates our worth, respect our needs, and will guarantee that we are properly rewarded for our loyalty. Professor Carnegie introduced himself, but didn't offer to shake hands since he was already aware that protocols for contagion were in effect. The professor also introduced the others. Only Ophelia didn't outwardly respond other than to barely raise her hand to demonstrate that she was at least aware of events around her. When everyone knew who everyone else was, Critias addressed them, if things go as Carmen plans, we might be back in the King City before too long. There are supplies that we need to forage first, things to get our train ready for service. Your help in that would go far in making that happen. Dr. Kine back home has a process that can cure all of you of being infectious, Blacksburg too I should think. I don't want anything that happened at Groom Lake the other day to be a black mark between us. Just so you know, we are on the same side now. Blacksburg doesn't eat people, Gustav said thinking that was Critias's point. As for me, I harbor no grudges against anyone. He meant me, Lady de la Cure said in her self-assured but disarming voice. You have my word, I will not impose myself on anyone. However, if you do appreciate our willingness to work for your betterment, you might at least entertain the idea of volunteering a little taste now and again. The woman glanced over at Carmen and then winked, it was by the drink of his blood that we attained this eternal life. Carmen wasn't sure how to take what the woman implied even if she had already guessed, only it seemed impossible. She tested the woman by asking, what is it that you know? Lady de la Cruer raised a glass of red wine and then elegantly sipped it. After cleansing her palate, she said, the master will soon awaken. I hear his whisper as it washes over the world like a tide that his growing will commands. With each new wave, I feel it becoming clearer. Soon he will walk among us. Yeah, well, Critias didn't know what there was to say about that. Hopefully he will be in a good mood and decide to put an end to all this. You know what he really wants, the woman said as she gave Critias a cognizing look, just as I do. Until he gets it, he won't be putting an end to anything. He understood perhaps better than anyone. Having been so close to the creature, the man from the sarcophagus, Critias had experienced profound visions. Men had murdered the man's true love, a romance that measured in tens of thousands of years, and because of that crime, he had turned his back on the mortal world. Awake or not, without her, he would never care about humanity again. Critias knew what the master wanted because it was the same thing that Critias would desire in his place. The world was not worth saving if it didn't have his woman with him in it to share eternity. Carmen's cell phone started playing Ballad of the Green Berets. She took it out and then handed it to Critias, it's Colonel Davis. He had still never taken even a moment to figure out how the thing worked other than holding it to his face, so Carmen had to press the answer key for him. Hiram said, I watched the video you sent me about the drain shelter. It is everything Ray promised and more besides. Yes sir, Critias agreed with that. Carmen wants to get the engine started and then use it to pull the hostiles out into the desert to give us some breathing room. There are some sites in the big city that she wants to forage, armor for the train and some medical supplies. I read your proposal, Hiram told him. It had all come from Carmen, but she had told Colonel Davis that it was from Critias, in her usual diligence to make him seem on top of things. Hiram continued, we are going ahead with your plan, with a few alterations. For tonight, 
send Cutter and anyone else you need, have them bundle up the armor plating, position it where we can pick it up with a helicopter. There are plenty of chains and load straps around the dam that you can use. Once you have that ready, you can pack up some other things on your list, or just wait until after we do the depopulation. We will make the pull around noon when the light is good and the heat will be hardest on them. Ray will need to be at the train garage early enough to get it ready on time, with all the proper security of course. I will be out there with your new workers to help with the project and then I will ride along. Also in the morning, Hiram instructed, I want Verloc and Carmen to fly the Eurocopter out to me at Groom Lake. It has enough fuel for the trip. Have them wait until sunrise. There are too many power lines around there to fly at night. The mechanics here are getting some helicopters ready for flight. When we have the train to give cover, their pilots will fly in a Black Hawk to lift your cargo onto some flat cars. We will take the ghouls into the desert like you planned, only none of them are going to survive this to walk back home later. Carmen and Verloc will bring in a Zulu Cobra gunship and a couple of Predators loaded out with claw thermobaric by bye barbecue bombs. Critias Cautionary advised him, Carmen told me that Jim was pretty hot about not shitting where we eat. Jim is not here, Hiram dismissed it as genuinely not being a matter of any concern. His confidence was so high that it suggested Jim would agree. Critias pledged, everything will be ready on this end. Hiram advised, don't take any unnecessary risks with our assets. It is better to withdraw and then try again. Fleet Admiral Rudel can take over Denver and Winder if it comes to that. Yes sir, Critias acknowledged his instructions. As Critias gave the phone back to Carmen, he said, I assume you heard all that. We need to go back into the city to organize all that stuff you want. You will need to be back here in time to fly to Groom Lake. We have time for you to shower, Carmen told him, and then a nap. You have all morning to get ready. The helicopter won't come until midday. He wasn't so confident that they had time to relax. Are you sure we don't need to hurry this along so we can get home? If what she says is true, the master cometh. Carmen bowed to him oriental hand over fist and smiling, I already have a master, and he will cometh more than once before I'm finished with him. He picked her up to heft her over his shoulder. As he walked off for the shower, Critias promised her, I am going to use you so dirty, not even Ghoul Radar could find any affection in it. During the time that the Groom Lake survivors from the airport battle had stayed captive at the dam, Ray Brakeman, Cutter, and Romeo had the duty to guard them. The prisoners had since returned home without incident. To keep themselves busy, Ray and Cutter had chopped up a heavy-duty pickup truck inside the machine shop. They had used an acetylene torch to remove the whole body of the truck until it was just the chassis, power drain, and wheels. From there, Ray had welded on a crude replacement that was somewhere between a Willys Jeep and a giant-sized go-kart. The upshot of the whole project was that Cutter had a vehicle that he could not only ride in comfortably, but it even had modified controls for him to drive it. As Hiram had said, the dam had a large supply of chains and lifting straps available. All the moving at the dam had been in the heavy tonnage and it had an overhead crane system. After his time spent getting a little rest, Critias gathered up the cargo straps he thought they would need and then loaded them onto the towable ball hitch wagon they had first salvaged from the aircraft hangar in town. Cutter's jeep took Critias, Talbot and Gustav into the city. Professor Karnecki went in a different vehicle along with Romeo, Dosh, and Lady de Locker. Their mission was to escort Ray to the railway maintenance building. While Ray worked on the locomotive to get it started, Dosh and Romeo would provide his security. The professor and de Locker would continue on to do some foraging of their own in the local town. Critias was on the highway to Vegas when Carmen and Verluck flew over in the Eurocopter on their way to Groom Lake. Cutter didn't slow down until they got into the burned-out ruins of the city. The vehicle was a magnet for infected. It wasn't long before the ghouls started chasing in like so many barking dogs. As Cutter stopped his jeep, he said jokingly, All right guys, just let them pull out Critias and then eat him. Once he is dead, we will get to our real agenda. Without having tested his new blackout mode for his mech suit, Critias would have never joined them in the first place. There was no way for him to be any help if his presence made every ghoul in the city go bonkers. Cutter damn near knocked Critias out of the jeep just by nudging him with his elbow. Don't panic, Pee-wee, Cutter teased him. They can smell your peekaboo fear. Once they figure out what a fragile little rodent you are, they're going to drag you out and then take your ass virginity on the pavement. So that is what you fantasize about, Critias verbally burned him. I remember the time when everyone said, you could always tell a ghoul that was a member of Cutter's pig slop army. All of them walked funny and couldn't shit right, like he had been at them from both ends. The giant laughed over the deadly retort. Come on, he shouted to the ghouls. Let's get this over with. 
it took a minute for the dozen or so infected to discover that nothing in the jeep interested them. They even got some discouragement when Gustav used a wooden mop handle to smack on the few who tried to climb into the jeep to search for food snacks. For all the watchers, they had never known any different life. In their experience, humanity had become endless legions of Alzheimer's patients who could no longer remember how to speak, where they were, or what clothes were for. A lack of frenzied screaming communicated to other infected that there was nothing going on with a vehicle that made it worthy of interest. If they had recognized Critias as human, the sudden explosion of homicidal shrieking would have touched off the whole city into a killing frenzy. So long as Cutter didn't drive too fast, all the infected that they passed took notice that no other infected had taken interest. Their lack of hostility illustrated why human bait was so essential for traps that destroyed the ghouls. It wasn't in their nature to lemming themselves and mass into some death machine. Contraptions were generally effective at drawing their attention, but it was the presence of real people that got their goat. The first stop was deep in the burned-out ruins of Vegas. The denser suburban areas had suffered the worst from the outbreak days arson. Anything that still stood was little more than a blackened shell. Some of the smaller industrial areas had large sandy exclusion zones that had acted as firebreaks. That wasn't true for the larger factory properties, which had taken direct hits to encourage the conflagration of the city. Bombing attacks had completely destroyed places like a plastics factory, a natural gas supplier, and anything related to a petroleum industry. Cutter pulled into the outdoor storage yard of what had once been a one-stop shop for all industrial metal needs. The metal shed building had warped in the heat of the firestorm, but still stood isolated in a sandy lot. Inside they found more building materials than they would need. They pulled out diamond pattern plate in both rolled steel and aluminum. Critias also selected tons of square tube bars that Carmen wanted. She sent him messages to make sure that his loads never exceeded the weight allowance of the Black Hawk that would carry them. As the materials mounted out in the yard, Critias rigged up their lifting straps so that the helicopter would be able to pick up each package at midday. For their next haul, Cutter drove them further north across the city. They stopped at another industrial area that was in reasonably unburned condition. A rail spur was there that had a line of ideal flat cars that Carmen wanted for transporting heavy vehicles. Their original purpose had been for moving track backloads and other earth excavation machines, all of considerable tonnage. The flat cars were currently empty. In the lot adjacent to the track was the excavation company itself with its diverse selection of the heavy equipment if they had need of any. Cutter drove into the company lot and then parked at the huge warehouse building. Let's go shopping, he told Critias. Carmen said we can find the stuff we need in here. As Critias looked around, he didn't understand what she might want. They built and repaired them here, Cutter informed him, meaning the parking lot of heavy excavation machines, inside, we will find the tools they need for working with heavy steel. That made sense to Critias since a locomotive and a bulldozer were essentially the same thing when it came to dealing with heavy steel, welding, and such matters. The workshop inside was far larger and better equipped than the maintenance building for the locomotives. There was much more in the way of tools and equipment. Since they were indoors and out of sight from ghouls, Critias powered up his mech suit so that he could call Carmen. The blade for a bulldozer rested on blocks on the floor. He asked her, do you want this for the train? It could go on the front and knock the ghouls out of the way. I might consider it, she replied, if it was possible for us to move it. That weighs more than double what the helicopter could lift, and you have no way of even getting it outside. Something like that only lighter would be much better. Have a look around so that I can see what is there, then I will give you a list of what we should take. Carmen wasn't shy about her shopping list, but Critias had expected her to want several tons of tools and welding equipment. Everything could go out onto one of the nearby railway flatcars, so at least there would be no need for the helicopter to lift the stuff out. Her desires got ambitious when Carmen demanded the whole robotic plasma cutting table. It wasn't a small affair either. The rig was of the scale for manufacturing pieces from thick steel in broad dimensions. She did plan on armoring railroad cars and the diamond plates they collected were individually large enough to fill a long truck bed. Gustav rolled up a toolbox and then went right to work dismantling the plasma machine. The pieces would be big, but Cutter would have no problem carrying them to the flat cars. It was getting hot as the sun rose higher. In blackout mode, Critias's mech suit could still cool itself as part of their respiration using an epidermal gas condenser system. Cutter, Talbot, and Gustav were just ghouls or men in that regard and sweat profusely to beat the heat, which dehydrated them. With the air humidity close to zero, it evaporated too fast for them to be wet and sloppy. For the same reasons, the ghouls in the city found shady places to hide and get out of the sun. With Cutter to move the heaviest loads and Gustav being such a handyman with the tools. Critias occupied himself with the welding equipment and machined bolts. 
They had the work finished early enough that they drove to Carmen's nearby eye doctor factory to break in and take all the forage she wanted from there. Colonel Davis returned from Groom Lake aboard a small caravan of vehicles. Principal among them was an interstate bus. A pair of gun trucks were an escort, in front and behind. They didn't shoot up the infected or seek to make any kind of spectacle of themselves. By passing through the city at speed, they remained ahead of any danger. Those ghouls who witnessed their passing did what they could to intercept, but had no chance of running them down. As such, the infected never erupted into frenzy. Their passing did serve to wake them up and make them ready for when the real calling began. Not since the outbreak days had men declared open war on the infected. Colonel Davis came prepared to invite just such a battle, and it was only the first skirmish of a much larger campaign. Chapter 12. Reluctant Sinners When the time came to begin their diversion operation, both Humvee gun trucks abandoned Hiram's bus, driving off alone to plunge into the heavily infested Boulder City Airport. The commandos and those trucks fired off their thunderously loud weapons just to make the desired noise. After that, they let their visibility to the ghouls do the real work of starting a major battle. Soon enough, the furious screaming by legions of enraged infected grew into nightmare fuel. That planned commotion was Ray's signal to fire up his locomotive. True to his reputation, he brought the train to life after years of dormancy. That old iron was neither worn nor rusted. With all the world fallen around it, that retired gladiator returned to the arena as a former champion, ready to prove that men yet survived unhumbled. The maintenance garage was not a tomb. It was a slumbering dragon's lair. Finally awake, that long-rested and impenetrable beast roared forth once more. Its heavy industry glory shined undimmed by age or the untimely passing of man's once great civilization. Dosh and Romeo stood ready at the shunting switches and the brake hoses to help Ray lock onto the small train of four coach passenger cars. The head-end power car would stay behind in the second garage bay because there was no immediate need for it. Those grave walkers and sand tigers who were not already in the gun trucks, they helped the workers in the bus transfer over to the railway passenger cars. Nearly all of the two dozen laborers were women who had more skills in mechanics than with weapons. Their elite guardians shot down those few ghouls that tried to interfere. The gunmen gave no quarter in the name of cleanliness, because time was of the essence. The local desert had bodies enough that a dozen more would not break it. Before the day was done, the desert would have a whole lot more broken infected to bake for all time in its sunny oven. Colonel Davis and his soldiers were last to board the train and then the whole of it got underway. Ray started them off with a mighty blast from the locomotive's whistle. The gun trucks raced back from the airport pulling a flailing army of ghouls behind them. Those vehicles did not linger as an escort for the train, but rather they sped off ahead in the direction of Vegas. In the city, they would harass the ghouls along both flanks of the railway. By drawing in the infected, the hordes of creatures would be in ready position when the train finally arrived to collect their eager interest. Ray was not in any such hurry. He maintained a delicate balance of speed and timing. Crawler and lurker ghouls could not by their nature chase a train out into the desert. Their disabled means of movement made that impossible regardless of the intensity of their murderous desire to try. Runners were both able and willing to give chase, but they required prey that they could see to cement their interest. The men in the gun trucks had done a good job at giving the infected the bait of real humans. It would be the occupied open passenger coach cars that set the hook. While outwardly the passenger coaches were similar in appearance, mostly in their paint scheme, inwardly, they were quite different. Foremost and finest was an enclosed dining car. Behind that was an enclosed climate-controlled seating car. The last two coaches were crudely functional to the point of being primitive. Those latter cars had simple wooden bench seats that ran down their center lengths. Their sides had enormous open windows without any glass, opening so large that pipe guardrails protected side-seating passengers from accidentally tumbling out of them. Colonel Davis had the workers in the open cars where the infected would be able to clearly see them. Their only precautions were paper masks, plastic goggles, and the slung military rifles they wouldn't be using. While Ray kept the train moving, they were safe enough. If the locomotive did break down and the ghouls overtook the train, the infected would flood into the open windows of the coach cars and then kill everyone aboard without hope for anyone to escape. That sense of real danger impressed upon all the passengers, giving them that proper degree of fervent emotion Hiram's plan required to be successful. Genuine human passions of fear, hope, and that longing for life was the very thing that made ghouls totally mad with desperation. Emanations of humanity made the infected heedless on a level akin to the victims of a sinking cruise ship. In their disease-manufactured madness, Hiram had the last train leaving hell and all they required for eternal paradise was to catch it. 
It was poisoned hope and heroic determination that empowered an urgency as with trapped people in burning skyscrapers. It was easier for them to leap to their deaths than suffer the heat of their present conditions. Triggered ghouls would do anything to change their circumstances. When they saw a train full of people, the chase was on and would continue at any cost. Running themselves to collapse was as nothing compared to their need to grasp it and consume their lost humanity. The town around their train garage and airport was only a hundredth of the size of nearby Vegas, with a short stretch of canyon that divided the two. Every ghoul with feet to run on could cross the city in only minutes. Most of them had already been at the nearby airport fully antagonized by the gun trucks. Ray hardly got the train rolling and everyone already stared out the windows in astonishment. Thousands of ghouls rushed at them in a great naked and shrieking dust billowing mayhem. Ray was no amateur when it came to this special game of keep away tag between locomotives and infected. His people had years of practice playing it. Trial and error had become hard won experience. His cowcatcher that he welded onto the front of his locomotive was surprisingly light and uncomplicated. He added a simple triangular bumper of pipes that stuck out like two pedestrian handrails that came together at a blunt point. It had three tiers, at the knees, the waist, and at the chest level. When the train rolled at sufficient speed to pace the runners that pursued it, those infected ignorant enough to stand on the tracks ahead of it took an impact that deflected them away. Despite the train striking them, the bumper did them little serious injury, but had great efficacy at shoving them aside. It wasn't the way of ghouls to lie down on the tracks. When invariably standing or running, the bumper shield sent them tumbling out of the way. When the helicopter arrived, Critias and Cutter would need to be at the flat cars on the far end of the city furthest away from the approaching train. They had to be on hand when the Black Hawk brought in the loads of construction materials. Someone would need to muscle them into position on the flat cars and then unhook the lifting cable. It would be some time yet before that operation began. For the moment, they had used Cutter's jeep to drop off Gustav and Talbot at the materials warehouse pickup site. All those two would have to do was clip on the lifting hook and then let the helicopter do the rest. Before Critias and Cutter could go back, the giant had another mission. He drove further until they were just west of the main airport, the one the Canadian Air Force had firebombed like the Holocaust of Dresden. The whole place was just gone as was a 20-kilometer swath of dense suburbia to the northwest. Even the bones were ash in the sand. Hiram's two gun trucks entered the city by the main canyon pass highway and then split up. One of them took the west highway across the southern end of the city while the other went further north along the eastern half. The infected they encountered began to scream and chase after them. The ghoul rind spread in a chain reaction that lured infected out of hiding and into the fray. Since not every ghoul sprinted at the same speed, Ray couldn't outrun the best of them without putting too much distance between the train and the main body of their horde. For the ghouls who were fast enough to catch up with the moving train, it was no simple matter for them to transition from a hard run to actually climbing aboard. The only conceivably vulnerable point of access was at the tail end of the last passenger car. Ray had never been in a position to modify those railcars for increased security. He had just hooked up to them as they had sat in the yard. The ends of the coach cars had metal doors. Their common design lacked any extended rear deck so as to facilitate their close contact with each other and allow passenger travel between the linked coaches. If any ghouls did somehow manage to get onto the train, Hiram and his special forces soldiers were ready to repulse them. Enraged ghouls didn't have the intelligence to assault a train by means of cunning strategy. It was the open-air windows of the occupied coaches that most captured their attention. Dangerous or not, all the women couldn't resist holding on to the guardrail at the open windows so that they could watch the amazing spectacle as it unfolded around them. Few people ever witnessed a super tribe of infected on the march, and then survived to tell of the experience. The windows were thankfully too high off the ground for ghouls to reach them. Plenty tried and spilled down to be trampled by the others in the doing. The pursuers could try to grasp at the handrails that flanked the midpoint boarding entrances. Those positions all had strong metal doors. With the boarding stairs retracted as they were, no dangling ghoul would ever find the leverage to batter one of those doors open. It took Ray about 15 minutes to reach the edge of Vegas. The city was awake and on the move by the time the train arrived through the canyon. Thousands of ghouls already chased after the train. The combined volume of their mad howling was louder than the locomotive. Not even the train's horn was strong enough to dominate over the din of homicidal rapidity. Ray blasted the train's trumpet anyway just on proud principle. He had the pride of a freeman and a real true rail engineer besides. Thousands more infected advanced together ahead of the locomotive, those ghouls didn't have any comprehension of where the train would be in the future as it moved along its track. Only a small percentage of them by chance actually stood upon the rails. Even while the speed of the train was only that of a man on the run. Its energy owing to its great mass made it nigh unstoppable. 
the train's nose plow deflected the ghouls off to the sides as easily as leaves before a breeze. The two gun trucks drove fast enough to meander through the ruins of the city and stay about ten minutes ahead of the train. The men in those vehicles were cautious not to throw away their lives. As the city streets filled with so many energetic ghouls, there was a real risk of them driving the wrong way and then finding themselves caught between packs of ghouls that were too thick for them to crash through. To stay on mission, the trucks always pulled the infected westward so they would be in position for intercepting the train. It was about an hour for Ray to bring the train across the southern end of the city at a running pace. The whole city was a madhouse by then. Perhaps 200,000 infected dashed about at every turn. Tens of thousands of them already followed after the train. All the others had not yet realized the source of the commotion so they could know what to attack. Cutter stayed for long enough that he and Critias got a chance to hear the train coming. They were not crazy enough to be there when the avalanche of berserk infected washed through that area. Cutter's purpose being there was to manually pull the switch shunt to connect the incoming railway was onto the north-south railway that passed through the city. Critias didn't know much about trains, but the problem was obvious enough that he mentioned it. This way goes south. Don't we need them to go north? There is no north ramp, Cutter told him. This is the only way there is to go. After they go through, I will switch it back. They are going to turn around or something. Well, Critias suggested, maybe we ought to get the hell out of here before all of those freaks arrive. Just to mess with him, Cutter waved that off as nothing, I used to command armies of naked dummies like that. What do I care? Critias challenged him, when did you ever have that many? They may be sweet on you, but they sure as hell don't love me. Drive up there on the other side, that big patch of desert. We can watch from there. Cutter laughed at him, I'll keep you safe, you timid little squirrel. As he got into his seat, he said, I don't want the dummies crawling their stink all over me anyway. Earlier that morning, when Hiram took his group aboard the bus to the train garage, another team drove the fuel trucks out to the secluded sheep branch runway where Major Feng had parked the Greyhound plane. Pilat, Li Feng, and some soldiers led by Leon refueled the plane and then were on hand for refueling the mission helicopters when they arrived from Groom Lake. Cutter and Critias had a great view from a sandy rise in the middle of a large barren lot. Thousands of infected dashed through the area from the west, but they avoided the sand dunes because roadways were incomparably easier for the ghouls to run upon. The horde had grown ever larger to at least 70,000. Vegas was far from an ideal ghoul habitat, being short on water sources and food. Many of the local infected were crawlers, lurkers, and other dilapidated specimens who had suffered greatly in the firebombing of the city. Most of the citizens had fled during the outbreak and then many more refugees had flooded into the area from Mexico Way. Critias could not be certain about their numbers, but he guessed that about half of the functional ghouls in the city chased after Ray's train. Just the dust thrown up by the migration made the southern half of the city a brown muddy haze. The ghouls were equally brown, caked as they were in the dried mud that formed from their sweat and the dirt that clung to them because of it. The train arrived and then passed through the switch onto the southbound track. It was an uphill grade from then on, which was actually to Ray's advantage. Not only did it exhaust the hard running ghouls even further, at some point, Ray would need to come to a full stop and then put the train into reverse. Having the grade working in his favor in every regard would help reduce the time he spent vulnerably exposed. Ray not only throttled up to compensate for the uphill climb, he went further to put on some speed that would distance him from the pursuing infected. The train was at the southernmost edge of the city by then. From there the track entered barren desert and ascended the slopes of mountainous country. Colonel Davis got on his field radio to transmit, We are in position. His reply came from Verloc, this is Viper 1. We are on station. Predators are inbound with claws ready. We will engage on your command. Because Ray had outpaced the pursuing horde, Hiram opened the back door to reveal a better view behind them. The train passed through a choke point between two low peaks, their track curved out of sight on the far side. Hiram expected the steeper inner hillside to be protection for their train when he instructed Verloc, you are cleared to engage. The rail track made a long straight climb before it entered that cleft in the hillside. All the ghouls stretched out into a broad line as they approached it. The infected closest to the front came to a halt when an attack helicopter swooped down right in front of them. Downdraft from their rotors whipped up a lashing storm of dust and sand that blinded the ghouls. Carmen and Verloc flew the Viper Super Cobra helicopter as a team. In the main pilot seat, Verloc wore the mech suit like HUD interactive helmet that linked into the complicated aircraft. Carmen's artificial eyes and internal hardware allowed her to better than duplicate all the helmet's functions from her seat in the co-pilot gunner position. While Verloc kept them hovering, Carmen aimed the 20mm Gatling cannon down the slope at the approaching drive. 
they only had 750 rounds of ammunition for it, which did highlight the logistical enormity of the problem when it came to making war on the ghouls. It was a puny number of bullets for defeating 70,000 infected. Carmen's cannon fire and the dust from the rotors did serve to stop the horde's advance. Each 20 mm round penetrated deep into the approaching column, striking and then passing through dozens of them before depleting all its energy. Even as the ghouls in the front stopped in place and went down from cannon fire, the rest of the army pushed up from the rear so that the mass of them filled the valley. The railway track itself was a narrow space compared to the whole gap. Ghouls flooded up both sides like a cresting wave, pushed ever higher by the pressure from behind. Between bursts from the Gatling cannon, Carmen launched salvos of 70 mm rockets. They invariably exploded directly over densely packed mobs of infected. The airburst anti-personnel warheads sprayed them with thousands of bone-piercing metal darts over a large area. Coming down from above, the rockets assured a high percentage of head hits. Those headshot infected collapsed in giant opaque crop circles. Even more ghouls charged into the valley of death, with the greater mass of their army still surging up from the rear. As they reached maximum density, the helicopter abruptly swung away and then retreated. Verloc wanted them clear of the area for when Carmen piloted in a pair of Predator drones that came from the north on a bombing run. The first drone dropped a claw thermobaric weapon at the forward end of the ghouls' column, right where the valley trapped them in place. The blast of fire, fragmentation, and organ exploding pressure wave destruction covered the area of a football field. As the incendiary effects subsided, the second drone hit them again further back at their rear, destroying just as many. Their attack helicopter returned to hover over the remaining ghouls to torment them with blasting sand and give them something to focus their aggression on. It worked to get the infected to gather close enough together that the returning predator drones had a densely populated area to target with their claw munitions. Just as before, the helicopter withdrew moments before the drones came back in to bomb the valley. After the roaring sound of those second explosions faded, there was an unmistakable absence of ghoulish screaming. Ray Brickman took the train on ahead for another 10 minutes until he reached a Dolomite Mining Company. Their shunting rails had numerous hopper rail cars for transporting ore. Ray stopped and then backed in the train to lock one car on behind his passenger coaches. Hiram and his men connected the air hose to release the brakes and then disconnected the rest of the unwanted cars. So armed with that heavy shield of an ore car, Ray ran the train in reverse as he headed back to the city. Rank black smoke billowed off the charred and dismembered bodies of the ghoul army. Not even immortal human flesh was enough to withstand the devastation wrought by the claw bombs. The infected horde had already dehydrated and overheated from their marathon run in the brutal summer desert at midday. Thermobaric explosions had ruptured their organs and cooked them into hyperthermal unconsciousness. Thousands of them still twitched or crawled feebly. Even after all that they had suffered, the brutal sun beat down on them and would dry them out all the more. The train offered no mercy when Ray drove back through the pass where Carmen and Verluck had annihilated the ghoul horde. His ore hopper railcar was unforgiving steel and unstoppably heavy. As the car passed over them, the wheels effortlessly sliced through any infected flesh lying between them and the rails. Cutter and Critias heard the Gatling cannon shots. They saw the Predator drones streaking overhead and then heard their exploding thermobaric bombs. Their position gave them a clear view as lakes of flame engulfed the long column of infected. The rising smoke from their burned flesh marked where the ghoul army had been, nothing could have survived such a tremendous force of retaliation. They drove back down to the rail switch and then returned it to its normal neutral position. Rather than face any difficulty while driving back up north through the chaos, Critias and Cutter waited in the desert lot off to the side of the rails. They watched the locomotive return and then proceed further north, clearing the way for them as it progressed. Verloc and Carmen flew their attack helicopter back to the sheep farm where their ground crew would top off their tanks and replace any expended ammunition. Carmen's attack drones remained aloft. They still had half of their bomb loads and those magnificent munitions proved that they could effectively destroy all the infected in Vegas. Ray required a little over an hour to add his newer car, head back in reverse, and then drive the train all the way across to the northern edge of the city. Their success in the south left him confident in both their method and the reliability of the train. The trip north was different in that he led the way with his ore hopper and not his cow catcher. He invariably crushed more than a few of the ghouls as he forced his way over them. While the ore hopper ended up drenched in their contagious blood, it did spare the passenger coaches from suffering that same abuse. The train was still making its way through the city when the Black Hawk helicopter arrived to begin moving the cargo. The two pilots from Groom Lake Abley picked up the loads of armor construction materials and then delivered them to the flatbed cars where Cutter and Critias were on hand to square them into position. Hiram's two gun trucks rendezvoused with the train just outside the northern edge of the city. 
they came in together from the west while leading a considerable haul of ghouls down the highway. The trucks and the train converged to form a greater whore than the first. In fact it had come in from a larger area of the city. Time enough had passed for the bedlam to empty all the cesspits beneath every burned out hotel and other great building with a substantial basement. Tens of thousands of ghouls remained too spread out for the drones to effectively bomb them. Those runners in the lead were in sufficient numbers to overwhelm the train if Ray slowed down. There were no paved streets along the railroad track, but there were dirt roads worn into the desert by years of all-terrain vehicles. The gun trucks split up to follow a road on either side. The South Lane truck had three of the grave walkers. Manny Giles was at the wheel, Frank in the machine gun turret, and Roland riding shotgun as extra security. In the North Lane truck were three of the Sand Tigers who were equally anxious to prove themselves in risky action. Roland's solution for slowing down the vanguard of the Ghoul Army was to ready a quad-barreled flame assault rocket launcher. It was the Army's official replacement for the vintage flamethrower of the World War II era. The truck bounced around on the unfinished road as Roland climbed up onto the turret for some firing elevation. He had never used the weapon before and had to rely on the pictorial instructions off the side. His first rocket didn't work as planned because Roland failed to understand that the switch on the firing trigger allowed him to select between single fire or all four at once. He had assumed it would be the former when it was in fact set on the latter. All four rockets launched together with a frightening roar. Being unguided weapons plus the jostling of the truck, and his unstable perch, the rockets didn't all fly perfectly straight. When his target was thousands of ghouls and stampede, details of accuracy hardly mattered. Compared to the epically large area burned by the deadly claw munitions from the drones, the rockets were minuscule. Another limitation was that neither the ghouls nor the desert was particularly flammable, so there was nothing for Roland to set alight. What the rockets did have in their favor was a pyrofiric agent that burned at white-hot temperatures. Ghouls directly in the blasts went down roasted. Those nearby got severe burns just from the radiated heat. All those ghouls that ran up into the impact area got their feet fried by stepping in it barefoot. The ghoul advance didn't stop, but it did split to make its way around ground that was too hot for them to step on. That gave the infected who came up from behind a chance to close the gap. The attack helicopter was incredibly fast and so appeared on station as quickly as anyone even knew it was back in the area. Both gun trucks had to break off because the only rough roads they had to follow stopped running parallel to the railway. The track moved into hill country and that helped slow down the nearest infected. Better still was a short and narrow railway bridge that crossed over a sunken desert highway. The steep slopes made the roadway as good as a shallow canyon. It was the kind of natural barrier that bottled up the ghouls nicely. Ray took the train over the bridge and then as soon as he was clear, the attack helicopter dropped in behind to fire a burst from the Gatling cannon. High fencing closed in the sides of the bridge so there was no spilling over into the road canyon from there. While the bridge was wide enough to accommodate a locomotive, it was a narrow space for a hundred thousand crazed infected to rush through together. High explosive incendiary ammunition from the helicopter's 20mm Gatling cannon effectively shredded all the ghouls who attempted to cross the bridge. Tens of thousands more of the infected just poured around the sides of the bridge to slide down into the roadway ravine. They found the far bank too steep and and lion crumbly to readily climb up again. Their number soon swelled the valley to capacity. Carmen sent in her predator drones from both directions of the roadway valley. The first thermobaric bomb from the southbound drone filled the whole road canyon with flaming obliteration. The shape of the terrain helped focus and magnify the organ-crushing shockwave generated by that high-tech munition. Onrushing infected shoved those ahead of them off into the flaming trough. Even more of them diverted south to distance themselves from the fire. The northbound drone arrived just in time to bomb the newly concentrated ghouls, annihilating more than 30,000 of them with a single area eradicating weapon. Before either of the bombs had detonated, the attack helicopter had pulled back and then fired more salvos of air-bursting anti-personnel rockets that wiped out the center mass of ghouls beyond the bridge. Black smoke rising from the crispy bodies blocked all side of the train. The remaining ghouls didn't want to hurl themselves down into the flaming carnage of the bombed roadway. Another half-dozen rockets slaughtered them as they rushed the bridge. The trailing remnants of the rampage caught up and then formed a mob on the ridge overlooking the burning roadway. All of the infected clumped together just in time for the Predator drones as they came around again for another pass. The last two claw bombs incinerated the whole upper ridge on their side of the bridge. The ghoul defeat was so overwhelming that the two gun trucks had no more reason for caution. Both teams circled the smoking area and shot down the remaining stragglers that had somehow escaped the massacre. The rail track beyond the bridge ran parallel with the main motorcar interstate. They stayed together for the whole next valley and beyond. 
All of the Groon Lake women that watched out of the coach windows got a perfect view of a truck caravan as it drove down the highway into the newly liberated city. More than 40 Groom Lake trucks rolled in bumper to bumper like a sand-colored centipede. Their driving speed was a modest pace so that the gun trucks at their lead had the time for shooting down every remaining ghoul that they encountered. Ray continued on for another 10 minutes and then had some of the men disembark to switch the rail. His train went along a private rail ramp that went into an industrial-scale limestone quarry. It was easy for Ray to locate the machine he wanted because it was right in the open on one of the side tracks, he was after a heavy-duty front-loader excavation machine that had large diameter high rail track riding gear on front and rear. Even though the behemoth had languished out in the weather for years, it was desert climate and Ray had an army of mechanics to get it operational. Colonel Davis expected a long and miserable endeavor as he spread out the soldiers to stand guard. The only thing the women seemed to agree upon was putting on the new battery that Ray brought along. There was several minutes of heated discussion where the mechanics argued about how best to take the excavator apart and then put it back together. The winner of the debate sprayed ether into the air intake, cranked the starter for long enough to spread it around, and then the machine started up. Despite vehement warnings that such a procedure would cause the diesel engine to outright explode, there was only some black belt chain smoke and then the machine ran strong. In the short time that the women worked at starting the higher rail excavator, Ray had a couple of them use a cordless impact driver to remove all the bolts that held on his locomotive's cowcatcher. After that, it was a simple matter for one of the women to drive the excavator forward under its own power to get it on the rail ahead of the locomotive. Ray would be able to push the freewheeling front loader ahead of him. As they boarded the train again to depart, Colonel Davis disconnected the bloody or hopper car to leave that behind. Ray drove them back to Vegas with a new excavator leading their way. Its hydraulic bucket skimmed just over the rails and it shoved through the slaughtered ghouls that heaped the bridge that went over the Massacre Valley. The train finally arrived at the side rail where Critias and Cutterall waited them. The dwarf engineer backed in their train to hook up four boxcars that he wanted to take. Once those were in place behind the passenger coaches, Ray hooked on a string of loaded flat cars as well. With the train taken care of, Critias left with Cutter in the jeep to pick up Talbot and Gustav at the metal storage place. After Ray had the train on the move again, Headed into the center of Vegas, Colonel Davis addressed the Groom Lake mechanics who had helped him accomplish so much. He said, The Council of Governors has shown you how they deal with infected. Now they want you to see how they reward loyalty and hard work. To show their appreciation for your courageous assistance, we are now stopping at the downtown shopping mall. It stayed safe from the fire between the railway and the interstate highway. The caravan of trucks from Groom Lake stopped at that same shopping paradise destination. It was Colonel Davis's rallying point for the organized mass looting of the entire city. Wherever possible, Hiram planned on taking necessities, valuables, and precious artworks from whatever buildings had survived the outbreak era firebombing. Critias ended up at the dam's airport after he and Cutter picked up Talbot and Gustav from the metal materials supply warehouse. Romeo and Dosh were already there when Critias arrived. Colonel Davis and all his people would keep shooting and looting Vegas until sunset forced them out. Thousands of cripples, crawlers, and lurkers remained among the ruins of the burned-out city. Hiram didn't care about cleanliness. They gunned down any ghoul they encountered and then left them as they fell. To a much smaller degree, the same situation was true for Critias. In fact it still limped around the airport in need of a bullet. The important thing was that the train pull and bombing operations had so drastically reduced their numbers that the remaining ghouls were easy pickings. Gustav and Talbot walked over to the nearby wastewater evaporation plant. Talbot had parked the Special Forces off-road buggy in the large shed over there. That shed also contained the excavators that serviced the sewage pits. Gustav got a wheeled front loader operational and then they brought both machines back to the airport. The front loader proved to be a big help in clearing away all the infected bodies, destroyed vehicles, and any other mess that hampered making further use of the place. Once Critias had the airport fully under their control, Major Fang flew the Greyhound plane back and then parked it in the same hangar that they had used before. Carmen and Verluck brought in the attack helicopter. The two Groom Lake pilots flew in the Black Hawk they had used moving cargo. The rest of their ground crew workers drove into the airport on their ammunition and fuel trucks. After a lengthy safety inspection, the two Groom Lake pilots flew the Hercules cargo plane back to their Groom Lake airbase in the desert. The ammunition truck had the hydraulic ground handling wheels that fit onto the attack helicopter's skids. Once they had them in place, it was simple enough for them to tug the helicopter into a hangar to keep it out of the weather. Colonel Davis evacuated Vegas safely before sunset. Andy, Ruby, and Sully had come south with a vehicle caravan. Most of that fleet of trucks parked at the rail garage. A few of them carrying looted supplies continued on into the dam. 
all of the workers and drivers returned to the den for the night aboard their passenger buses. Ray brought the train back to the garage. Though he was small of stature, no man walked taller that afternoon. He had accomplished great deeds for the betterment of all. Carmen and Critias were on hand to guard Ray. The dwarf was as valuable as he was a friend. To commemorate the victory, Ray said, we need to christen this locomotive. She has made her bones and deserves a good name. I have a suggestion, Carmen offered. The name could be Heron's Tableau. Heron was the ferryman who transported the damned over to the other shore of the afterlife. It is this ship that will carry us as well. We will travel deep into the city of woe, and our cause being righteous, she will bring us safely out again, but unlike Orpheus before us, we shall not be foolish enough to look back. Ray understood that the name also meant a carnival float from his native Brazil. Heron's Tableau, Ray called out to his locomotive by its new name. The Shriekers will dance for us. They will parade all the way to the next world. After sunset, Colonel Hiram Davis hosted a grand feast at the dam. The Groom Lake people had followed short-sighted visionaries and blundering generals before, not always to their detriment, but never to truly astounding success either. Colonel Davis had showed them what real leadership could accomplish. Hiram had flown in with one small cargo plane and a car. From those humble beginnings, he had swiftly conquered the whole region using tools locally available. All that had been lacking was the visionary strength to pick up what was at hand and then make use of it. The woman who had speed started the front loader at the limestone quarry by using ether had become lead engineer by virtue of her ability to perform. She stood up to make a toast, to General Davis, Governor of the West. It was a clear message to everyone present, she offered a crown to Hiram and the room would back him if he put it on. That affirmation came immediately as all the women raised their wine glasses to him. They had looted a lot of premium wines that afternoon. The grave walkers remained neutrally silent. Sand tires went so far as to glance at each other, which meant that they didn't like the smell of that wind and they certainly wouldn't abandon Fleet Admiral Rudel to follow Colonel Davis instead. Hiram masterfully accepted the gesture of praise and then refused to drink to it. I know that all of you have heard about Denver, he told them. Your general lied that King Louis had raided the presidential bunker in an act of aggression. Nothing could be further from the truth. The president had me locked out on the surface, myself, my daughter, and the grave walkers you see here tonight. When he heard of our plight and how the mad president was eating his own people, King Louis himself flew all the way to Denver in that same Greyhound plane that we used to get here. With only a handful of his soldiers, good men like Commander Critias who is also here tonight, King Louis came to our aid. That is the kind of king he is, the kind of man he is. I stand before you now as that king's deputy grand marshal. I am a man of the governors and they have my unconditional loyalty. I appreciate your confidence in me and I am prepared to lead you to greater things still but we stand united under a higher power. Let us drink to the Council of Governors. They will not give you the keys to the West. They offer you this continent, and very soon the whole world. The Governors will not help you hide from the ghouls. They will help you destroy them. The Chief Engineer rebounded with a new toast, to the Council of Governors. Everyone cheered and then drank to that, grave walkers and sand tigers included. Critias glanced around to see that Carmen was gone. She had slipped away only recently. More scrutiny revealed that Platt had left too. Jealousy was enough for him to assume that they had departed together. When Critias got up to go look for her, Hiram had him wait, we need to talk. Critias stayed to hear him out. You leave tonight, Hiram informed him. Take the black hole and head up to Salt Lake. Get those locomotives as ready as you can without turning the engines over. I will keep Raya with me. Once we have this train armored up, I will get us on the way to join you. Critias asked. You don't think Carmen can handle it? She wanted me to stay with the train. She can do all the work, Hiram agreed without hesitation. Carmen is going to have to be the wrench up there. There is no one else who can do that job, not neck deep in two million biters. Carmen is first class at everything involved, everything but knowing when to break the rules, and when to cut her losses, pull up stakes, and just come home. You're in command of the mission. I need you to leave Cutter with me. He will be raised muscle while he does all this heavy engineering work. You can take whatever watchers you think will help you or won't be in your way. Another issue still hung out there for Critias. Carmen wanted a helicopter for moving her toys around. I think she said that the black hole was not the way to do it. I will bring you a helicopter, Hiram pledged. The Black Hawk has four rotor blades. I'll have the pilots land it on a flat car and then pull two of the blades off. The train can bring it along just fine. That won't be any problem. For now, it is better for you to take the black hole. 
Gloria can get thermal surveillance pictures of the whole Wasatch front and you can get on the ground quietly. That noisy helicopter would have them going ape shit. That comes later. That was all Critias needed to hear. He said to Hiram, with Gloria in the air and Carmen on the ground, I won't have any problems. It doesn't get any better than that. One thing though, Carmen doesn't know any sly tricks about starting trains. I would like for Ray to confirm that we have all the tools we're going to need. It's like those ladies jump starting that excavator, not everything is by the manual. Ray can make sure she has all her tools. She can call him for advice later if it comes to that. Hiram agreed, Andy will take you to the airport. Gloria can pick you up there, no power lines to worry about. Take Ray with you so that he can help you load the equipment you're taking. Andy can bring him home when you're done. Chapter 13 Madrina. The nine conspirators in the pill theft ring had all turned themselves into Fat Jack. They made full confessions, pled guilty without any need for a trial, and then willingly accepted their punishments. Each of them got 30 days of work release incarceration at the jailhouse. It wasn't long before Alice got the supporting evidence that justified making the oxycodone a contraband substance. All the prisoners went into withdrawal and some of them were so sick that the guards believed they had contracted infection and would soon turn. Dr. Clara didn't squirm away from teaching them all a lesson. They had stolen the pills from her medical center and even left her to be the first suspect in the crime. She had professional concerns for their well-being, but not much in the way of actual sympathy. The only way for most of the pill thieves to even perform their daily work shifts was by Dr. Clara putting them back onto the same drug. She would wean them off the high dosages that they addicted themselves to enjoying. By the time their imprisonment sentences were over, they would not have access to more so staying off the pills would not be a matter of willpower after that. Alice had one respect for herself as a marshal in the community. She had demonstrated that she could think for herself outside the bureaucratic chain of command and not end up looking like an overstepping idiot. I like the new bridge, a hologram of Carmen said with admiration as Alice walked through the tunnel for real. The land bridge from Radio City to the rear entrance of Forager's Castle was a complete success in both design and popularity. The builders had installed permanent lighting and professional fixtures and paneled the interior with a boxcar load of vinyl molded aluminum. It really was beautiful. The real hardwood had a new artificial floor over it that was much easier to clean and safe from splintering. When no one else was close enough to overhear, Alice told Carmen, Commodore Tinney has trains coming and going all over the place. Duke told me that their underground is so big that they just bring home everything and then sort out what they want later. They are filling up Camelot with all the stuff they're collecting. Carmen commented, inspecting railcars out in the wild is dangerous business. Just getting them rolling and off the tracks is helpful enough. I have seen some of their preliminary plans for laying our own track. The materials and machines are out there. It is just a matter of putting them all together where we need them. Alice imagined it as she said, there could be a new track into the East Airport or one that went up to the big black hole hangar. Or even just down the city streets, Carmen agreed with the limitless potential. We could lay a new track that went right into one of the buildings. That was a good idea that Alice liked. She suggested, or the train could go down into the baggage underground back in Denver. The Admiral's trains could have an indoor depot that would be a whole lot safer. Carmen smiled at that suggestion, you should pass that one along to Fleet Admiral Rudel. He is a very ambitious man when it comes to doing what is best for his people. Forager's castle had a full house for lunch. The Commodore's teams shuffled a lot of trains in and out of the garage tunnel. There were workers who unloaded cars, people who moved the cargo around for storage, and train crews as well. Builders worked on a dozen projects. Everyone needed the decontamination workers who did a long list of essential jobs. There was also all the GNP for keeping everyone safe. While Alice waited in line to get her lunch tray, she discreetly asked Carmen's hologram, Are you coming home soon? No, Carmen confessed sadly. This is where our work is. If we don't do it, the governors would just send in someone else and they would get hurt. It may have been a lark when I started, but I am a special agent of the king now, and this is a special skills operation. Alice wondered enough to ask, what are you doing right now? Carmen generated a live virtual reality simulation for Alice to see what she had going on out west. The temptations sang ball of confusion as the attack helicopter headed low across the desert. Alice got a view from Carmen's eyes as she sat in the forward gunner's cockpit. She turned her own head to see it all through her Delta helmet. To either side of the helicopter was a Predator drone flying in close combat formation. Carmen used the cameras on those drones to look back at the helicopter. Verloc wore a cool blacked out pilot's helmet in her upper rear seat. Both drones broke formation and then banked away to set up their bombing runs. 
from Carmen's telescopic vision. Alice watched Ray's train move south out of Vegas and drag a vast flood of tightly massed ghouls along with it. The dust that all the infected kicked up made a high drifting plume that was far larger still. Holy cow. Alice gasped totally impressed. You two are awesome. Other people in the lunch line overheard Alice, but couldn't understand what she was going on about. Carmen dismissed the virtual world so that Alice was back in her forager's castle environment. I should let you go, she told Alice. You can't eat with your helmet on anyway. Tell Critias I said hi, Alice replied and then took off her helmet after Carmen had vanished. Once she had her lunch tray, Alice went to sit with Miss Schoolhouse and her orphans. Those tables attracted other people. A few of the newlywed couples came around so that they could get to know everyone. Jim would give them preferential opportunity to get a family apartment in Radio City if they adopted one of the kids. Alice knew something about it from personal experience. It wasn't a bad thing if in part their reasons for getting involved with the orphans was a little selfish. It had been Jim that put Alice and Mandy back in the path of Carmen and Critias. In at least some small way, it was guilt and pity that motivated their decision to take them into their home. The real family wouldn't begin with the adoption. It had to grow later. Even Alice had ulterior motives for having lunch there. Rabbi had returned from a trip to Camelot. With her parents away, Alice needed someone to talk to that had good advice. Her problem hadn't really started that morning, but it had come to a head. Alice's deadline for everyone to turn in their oxycodone had come and gone. Various people had handed over their supply to Dr. Clara and that should have been the end of it. The addicts in the jailhouse continued to prove how dangerous the drug was, primarily because it was monstrously addictive. One of the addicts had threatened to kill himself if he didn't get some of the pills. Several others had such terrible bouts of vomiting and diarrhea that they couldn't even get out of their beds for work. Because her parents were out of the city rescuing Nevada and Bobby sleeping over in her room had caused Alice some publicly vaunted trouble, there was an apparent need for adult supervision at the apartment. Colonel Flash's southbound railroad mission to Texas got a short delay. Some of the equipment and personnel she would have taken ended up diverted into Duke's operation instead. Duke's westbound railroad mission had just gone off first. His operation had plenty of manpower and resources. With Colonel Davis trying to break out of Nevada and open the rails to Denver, the governors considered it a priority for them to send a train to link up with them wherever that might be. With Jam staying in the city, she decided to spend more time in the apartment at night, to be that adult supervision needed by Alice, Mandy, and Pipkin. It hadn't taken long for Tony Banjo to show up and join her there. He took Jam to the nightclub and then they came back to do even more drinking, always with the intention of spending the night together in the master bedroom. Pipkin had a special dislike for the relationship between her mother and Tony. She didn't have all the facts, but she was aware of the obvious. Jam had a drinking problem and Tony only exacerbated it. Pipkin and Jam had ended up in a shouting match that didn't end even after Tony left. They had continued to fight until Jam had left too. She went right back to Tony. For Alice, it was more complicated than how Pipkin saw their relationship. Colonel Flash was a hero to Carmen, the mother she would have wanted. Carmen insulated herself with denial, about both Jam and Tony. Even after her edict against oxycodone, Tony still dripped with it. Alice honestly wasn't all that sure what opiates Tony was on because there was more than one end in a heavy dosage. Undoubtedly, Tony was a functional addict, but he was one all the same and he had no intention of surrendering his drug stash, much less stopping altogether. It was a small gift to Alice that at least Jam wasn't on oxycodone too. Her liquor intake being so great wasn't a blessed alternative. Alice believed that Commodore Tini had postponed the Texas train mission precisely because Jam was in no condition to undertake something so important and dangerous. While Critias, Carmen, and Ray were on the other side of the country, Jam would be on her own while not at her best. Duke's mission out west would be into a vast emptiness with only a handful of dense urban areas for him to pass through. Jam's trip south into Texas was far more risky an endeavor. It had the warm humid climate that preserved slaughtered ghoul tissue as permanent sources of wet contagion. Infected populations would be much higher not only because it started that way, but because ghouls in general flourished in those lushly vegetated habitats. The mission would be 800 miles of track that culminated around the city of Houston. Two million or more infected would be there waiting to defend their territory. Jam needed to be on top of her game. At the moment, she seemed like she didn't even want her job anymore, not when she could just have a real life to enjoy. Alice even agreed with Carmen's unwillingness to interfere with their personal problems. Carmen wanted to be accepting and supportive without asserting herself into a dominant role, Alice wanting to do something didn't make the solution obvious. That is how Alice ended up having lunch with the orphans at Foranger's castle, so she could sit next to the rabbi and get some advice from the old man. 
The unexpected arrival of Alice for lunch did register as significant with the astute rabbi. He had been away helping the pardoned Maltese pirates acclimate themselves into life with the freemen. Much like the people from Groom Lake, the pirates found it easy to adjust to a better life than they had before. Elevating their stations was anything but a personal hardship. While he was away, Rabbi continued to keep abreast of current events through his regular phone conversations with Miss Schoolhouse. The pill robbery had been an entertaining scandal and not especially distasteful as social problems went. After Alice ate what she wanted and then pushed around her food, Rabbi told her, My advice probably can lighten your burden, but it might be able to broaden your shoulders. Tell me what troubles you. She glanced up at him before meekly asking, Do you mind? He smiled in a grandfatherly way, Mind? I am flattered. I know that your parents are still away doing heroic and wonderful things, along with Ray, Colonel Davis, and Captain Andy of course. That you would consider me as an adequate replacement, as clever and talented as you are, is even intriguing. It must be quite a pickle if it has you perplexed. Now that Alice had to speak her mind, she wasn't sure what to say. She didn't want to get too specific about anyone's private business, only there was no other way around it. Well, she began awkwardly. Someone close to me, a couple of them actually, they are doing something they shouldn't, and I know about it, but they are more important than I am. If I do nothing, they are going to end up ruining their careers or even dead. If I confront them, they are probably not going to listen to me anyway. If I tell on them, something will certainly happen, but they might get into a lot of trouble and then feel like I betrayed them. I don't know what to do. He had a ready answer, you must confront them of course. Be just as Moses when his moral duty demanded that he confront the all-powerful Pharaoh of Egypt. As you say, they probably won't listen to you and they will casually dismiss your accurate portents of their onrushing downfalls. That means there is a chance that they might. You won't be content to do nothing at all and your other option of going over their heads can still be a backup plan. Alice supposed, maybe if I had the right person to come along with me. I could confront them and go over their heads at the same time. If it was someone they respected, I mean. You could like just wait nearby in case I needed help. Rabbi asked rhetorically, me? There aren't many people here who would consider me over their head and as a spiritual advisor. The only person who comes immediately to mind would be Jam. The Commodore told me that she is finding it difficult adjusting to life not trapped aboard her train. He felt that she just needed time to get herself together. That time has come, Alice said resolutely. She can't go to Texas like this, and I'm afraid that she will try, and take Tony Banjo with her. Tony wants to race himself right off a cliff. Carmen says he thinks it would be totally metal, whatever that means. Together, they are a danger to every person in their command, including my Bobby. The rabbi considered her words and didn't disagree with her thinking. From his viewpoint, Alice had thought it out quite well, she just needed a little assistance to make it an official intervention. Of course I will help, rabbi agreed. Jam is like a daughter to me. Anyone who knows her can see that she is slipping. After a pause, he added, Captain Banjo is something else. I don't believe he would see me as the person he wants advice from. Perhaps you put it best, he wouldn't consider me to be very metal. You're right, Alice realized as it came to her, but I know who is metal enough. You could both come with me. I will try and reason with them, and if it doesn't work you can help me. He sipped his coffee and then smacked his lips in appreciation. Jim's community had taken some great coffee from the precedent in Denver. Rabbi asked, when would you like to do this? Alice already felt better about what she had to do and she had a positive attitude about the whole matter. She glanced over at the giant wall clock to see the time. I have to be at work after lunch, she explained. Sally wants me to go out to the East Airport with her. I have school after that. Could we do it after dinner? I'll be available, the rabbi promised her. Just call me when you are ready to begin. With renewed appetite, Alice hurriedly gobbled down the remainder of her lunch. She made some of the orphans laugh over her antics. Miss Schoolhouse was a stickler for manners and didn't let them behave piggishly. After some polite goodbyes and then putting her tray in the wash bin, Alice headed for the rail garage. She would walk around that way, through the pancake house, and then to the rook where she would catch the light rail on its trip to the east airport. Alice wasn't even sure where Sally Headshot would catch it, which could be anywhere from Smuggler's Passage on down. Alice was still in the back hall of the castle when Stig appeared and cut her off. His grim instruction was, follow me, we need to talk. I have a train to catch, Alice replied in a loud voice that she wanted everyone nearby to overhear. If this is about your GNP who were in the pill theft ring, I didn't tell you because it is not my job to include you in my confidential investigations, and yes, I thought you would kill them for betraying you. 
If I wanted them dead for what they did, I would have killed them myself. It would have also tipped off all the others, perhaps making them overreact because they believed everyone had a death sentence coming. Lastly, for all I knew, you might have been one of the people taking pills to cope, and like them, you are too important around here for us to just throw you away over a lifestyle error. Stay surprised her by taking her seriously. All right, he agreed. We need to work together in the future. My people are the eyes and the ears of the community, and they now trust you to have their backs in a pinch. I believe that I can trust you too. In the future, you can count on me to follow your lead in your investigations, even when my people are involved. We are in agreement then, Alice closed the deal. Sally really is waiting for me and if I'm late she will chew me like a hungry ghoul. Stig moved aside, be careful out there. As it turned out, Sally Hatchot had been in the railway garage keeping things moving smoothly. Sheriff Clyde Walker worked there with her. Alice met them at the rook moments before the light rail arrived. Captain Christopher, the rat catcher in King's Lion was the engineer on duty. He had been Alice's partner during the mission when they discovered all those pills at the ruined hotel and former outbreak emergency medical center. It had been a good day for them both, one that had won them trust and respect in the community. Ever polite, Christopher welcomed them all aboard. The light rail had boxes of supplies for the airport and Dr. Kine, both his laboratory and his underground hydroponic gardens, like returning empty produce crates. There was also a squad of guard and patrol for security duty. Some of Fleet Admiral Rudolph's engineers were on the way out to do whatever they did with the aircraft graveyard. Commander Carries used the helicopter to move out more of the bulky items that the Admiral wanted loaded on his barges to take to his fleet. Tons of smaller things ended up in crates that then came back aboard the light rail. Sally's mission at the airbase involved scouting the fence line for eventual repairs. Commodore Tini had trained cars with prefabricated metal pole barn garage buildings. Jim would put up something like that so the light rail had a destination a depot that would be indoors and out of the weather, especially in winter. To make the inspection that much easier, Master Chief Emily, Yeti, and Darla, had a GNP force at the East Airport. Captain Bors was also there with some of his Russian-speaking people. They were in charge of putting Kenny aboard his flying purple grinder. Bors used the blood sausage truck to tow Kenny around as bait. Their operation swept up stray infected and then ground them up into wretched smelling filth soup. It was only a couple of miles to the nearest heavy rail crossing. A parked string of tanker cars waited there to collect the vile final product for later disposal at the main storage tanks in Fort Blood. A toxic wash of nicotine pesticide inside the tankers had proven to be enough to prevent the liquefied ghouls from congealing into a solidified mass that the sludge pumps wouldn't be able to move. Jim and Queen Jessica showed up for school time with Miss Pepper. Alice made it back on time to clean herself up and make sure Mandy made it there too. Miss Pepper did do her best to make the lessons relevant and interesting. Being a school teacher wasn't enough to occupy Miss Pepper all day long. As an educated woman with leadership experience, Kevin's control room provided her with additional clerical duties. That afternoon, Miss Pepper had them working on mathematics. She taught them how to determine the volume of rail cars and how it applied to knowing how many items of a certain size they could hold. By knowing how many items were in a car, they could estimate how long it should take for a certain number of people to unload it. When the conversation turned to the Admiral's fleet and the plan to relocate them all by train, even the most childish math skills realized that the undertaking was truly enormous. It wasn't simply a count of how many railcars they would need, but rather how many fully loaded trains it required, shuttling back and forth for weeks. Alice left school with the Texas train mission on her mind. There were so many people trapped on those ships of the fleet, Commodore Tinney could easily take in hundreds of them and he needed the manpower. From what Alice knew about Nevada, the potential there was so great that some people called it the best place yet. The future of Fleet Admiral Rudolph's people demanded that Jam get herself cleaned up and back to work. That wasn't going to happen unless Alice made it so. She was going to do exactly that. Dinner in Funland was mostly uneventful. The daily gossip revealed that Colonel Davis's mission in Nevada continued to make steady progress. There wasn't much in the way of details. Alice knew about the ghoul calling operation because Carmen had shown her some of the train and helicopter action going on there. None of that news passed around the information-hungry community. Alice didn't know if Jim wanted it kept quiet or if it was Colonel Davis keeping it on the down low from Jim. Whatever the actual situation was, Alice kept what she knew private. The other news was that Duke's fledgling train mission had made only slow advancement. The rail cars that were in his way were necessarily in front of his locomotive. He hooked up to those cars, released their brakes, and then pulled them out but that left him with the burden of dragging them all the way back to Jim's city or even to Camelot for a place where he could get rid of them. 
to free up his locomotive for going back to get more, Juke needed a place to drop off the cars he had already pulled out. Other crews would have to deal with the stuff he hauled in, by either keeping it for being valuable or dumping it off somewhere that they wouldn't need to move it all over again later. The ready solution involved the Commodore sending in more locomotives. Juke could side rail the bird and some rail cars for collection by those other engines. Convenient storage space was limited and Juke rapidly filled it up. What he really needed for quickly clearing rail traffic was the use of railroad in transit storage yards. Those were places with many extra rail tracks all side by side specifically intended for what they were doing. In most ways, everything with the trains was a circular accumulating burden. Railroad storage yards were in cities and those cities had lots of infected. It took top professionals to do the brake work on the stagnant rail cars. It wasn't that the mechanical work was brain surgery, though it did take someone who could figure out the working end of the wrench. Prowling hungry ghouls infested those yard properties, with lots of nasty crawlers that were comfortable living underneath them. The work in rail storage yards was more dangerous than the actual track clearing which could happen away from city centers. In total, the current outlook on Juke's mission heading west was not so good. Whatever happened with the trains, it wouldn't be quick. The governors had far more work that they needed done than they had the skilled professionals to take care of it. As Alice ate her dinner in silence and listened to the captain's table news about the trains, it was just more fuel for her fire to get Jam back in the fight. She was the best train commander ever and for whatever reason, all she seemed to care about was partying with Tony Banjo. In addition to everything else, Alice's thoughts kept going back to Carmen. Her mother really admired Jam, but to do that, she had to lie to herself about what kind of woman Jam even was. Colonel Flash was really earning her nickname of Jam up Samantha Flash. She really had a talent for digging holes and then getting herself stuck in them. After dinner, Bobby Bean invited Alice to spend some time with him watching a movie with the community. They could snuggle on the couch together in public and no one would give them any grief over it. Alice knew what time Tony and Jam would go to the nightclub, so she wasn't in any hurry. When the time came, it was Jam's man Pike who approached Alice. He had that head-turning beauty Chandra with him. She had rebounded since her attempted suicide when she planned on killing Herman Clark to trigger someone else killing her in turn. Pike said to Alice, The old man told me what you have planned. Count me in too. I have to go do some work, Alice told Bean. I'll call you when I'm finished. Pike hugged Chandra and then explained, There is something important we have to take care of, it won't be long. Alice and Pike walked to King's Tower and then took the elevator up to Tony's floor. When they arrived, Alice told Pike, I want all of you to wait outside. Let me try talking to them first. If it doesn't work, I will call for you to help me. Tony and Jam had just finished getting ready for going to Jim's nightclub when Alice banged on the door to Tony's apartment. It was Wolf who opened the door. He guessed wrong about why Alice was there and said, Bean isn't here. I'm not looking for Bobby, Alice replied as she slyly ducked and twisted around Wolf to go inside through the doorway. I'm here to see Tony. The three Japanese ambassadors of Fleet Admiral Ruta were on the giant sectional couch playing Super Mario Kart using one of Tony's many video game consoles. They didn't care who came or went and so paid no attention to Alice. Jam walked in from another room wearing a sexy dress that did look great on her. She already had a drink in her hand and it wasn't her first of the evening. A moment later, Tony came in from the other side and asked Jam, Are you ready to go? Because Jam saw Alice standing there, she gestured that way for Tony to notice. Tony didn't suspect that anything was going on. He just assumed the same thing that Wolf had, that Alice came around looking for Bean. He's not here, Tony told Alice. I haven't seen him since dinner. I'm not here for Bobby, Alice replied. You missed the deadline. I'm here for the pills you're hoarding, and anything else like it. His pleasant demeanor vanished. Tony didn't appreciate her coming to his home as she had. I never touched any of those stolen pills, he told her coldly. I never knew anything about it. I never said you did, Alice countered. If you had, you would be in the jailhouse right now. You are getting your supply while out foraging. It doesn't matter where they come from. The law says that no one is supposed to have them without permission from Dr. Clara. They are illegal now. I'm not leaving without them. What's mine is mine, Tony said dismissively. I didn't help build this place to give up my freedom. I will do what I please with my life and the things I own. Who do you think you are? It wasn't so long ago that you were a slave in Denver. Now you think you order me around. In this I do, Alice assured him. You are high right now. If you don't give them to me, I'm just going to take them. Is that what you think? Tony scoffed. I'm the number one forager around here and you're just a charity case. Get out of my apartment. 
I don't want to hear another word about any of this shit ever again. Alice jeered at that arrogant boast. Maybe you used to be that great. Even a charity case nobody slave like me knows that you got lucky that night with the truck fire. You were high then and lucky that everyone else went out there to save you. My only luck was bad, Andy disagreed with her. That fire could have happened to anyone. High or not, I did my job. Now I will do my job, Alice pledged with total commitment. I won't look the other way while you burn yourself out like a junkie. All you care about is your partying. I already know the truth that you want to get yourself killed. You want to race ahead at full speed until it gets you killed in some way that everyone will think is metal. I don't even want to know what this metal nonsense even means. It is so stupid. You're not taking my Aunt Jan with you either. It is all coming to an end, the pills and the drinking. Both of you are going to do something with your lives besides making everyone else miserable. Since the situation had obviously spiraled into a killjoy place where Jan didn't want to be, she told Alice, please go home. I will talk to him and get this straightened out. You're just as bad as he is, Alice confronted her. Critias wanted us to be more like you, the great leader and hero of the people. Do you think he would want me to be more like you now? I don't know anything about trains, and even I know that Juke is in way over his head. The Commodore doesn't even trust you to go out there, not without Ray to look over your shoulder. Maybe you spent so much time on your train that you never want to go back to it, or maybe it is just the constant drinking. It doesn't matter anymore. The party is over and you are going back out there. Juke needs you. My parents need you, and I need you. Pipkin needs you too. The party is over. It's time to be Colonel Flash again. There was no way that Tony would give up his stash any more than he would give up his own head. He was using four times the dose than even the worst addict in the jailhouse and that guy had threatened to hang himself if he couldn't get more. Even if Tony wanted to just quit, it would probably kill him if he did, and he didn't want to stop anyway. All Tony could think of to do was order Wolf, throw her out. I've heard enough. When Wolf hesitated and just stayed in his seat, Tony shouted at him, You heard me. I won't be henpecked in my own place by this stupid little girl. It was a tough spot that Wolf didn't want to be in, but his one safe option had the added advantage of getting Alice out of the apartment before something serious happened. He got up from his chair by the door and then walked over to put his hand on Alice's shoulder. Alice wasn't prepared to shoot anyone and she wasn't big enough to muscle her way forward. Out of options, she let Wolf push her to the door so that he could throw her out. Wolf opened the door to find Sally Hedshoff standing there. Her expression made it clear that she had been eavesdropping and what she had heard hadn't left her amused. Behind Sally was the Commodore's rabbi and Pike, Jam's heavily tattooed enforcer. Sally waited for Wolf to make the first move. Her just standing there dared him to speak or even twitch. After a long uncomfortable pause, Wolf asked Sally, Can I leave now? Sally suggested, Why don't you have a seat while I still like you? Wolf carefully took his hand off Alice and then he went back to his chair. With him out of the way, Sally walked in to have a look around. The Japanese women continued playing their video game. They had the good sense to stay stupid like they didn't even know English. It was very Japanese to not notice the business of others coming through thin walls or none at all. A lot of the wind went out of Tony's sail when he saw that Sally was Alice's backup. It was bad enough that Sally had taken on Alice and her crew. That was a small thing compared to larger issues. I like your speech, Sally told Tony. You're the number one forager. You didn't build this place to give up your freedom. Is that what you tell yourself? If Jim was gone, you would be positioning your ignorant ass to be the new king around here? You have already risen about as high as you ever will and now you are fucking that up. It is official, you're cleaning yourself up or you're gone. If you think I'm joking, just let me know. I will have a hundred housekeepers up here in fifteen minutes. This apartment will be empty so fast that you'll think this is a bad dream. When Tony didn't say anything, Sally turned to Alice, use that helmet of yours and find what you came here for. Get it all. Alice went straight to the task. She started in the last room Tony exited when Alice first arrived. Sally turned to Colonel Flash and sounded more pleasant as she said, Carmen and her family are with us and will always be with us. If you gave a shit about her. Alice wouldn't have had to come here like this. I am giving you two choices, get yourself cleaned up and be the person they need in their lives, or pack your shit up and get out of my city. You go back to Camelot we gave you or back on the rails, wherever it is you feel most comfortable with your whiskey bottles. Either way, neither of you will show your face in our nightclub again. Hold on a second, Tony complained. Sally shut him up with a cold glance. Back in her old life as a gangster underboss. Sally had killed plenty of cocky smart-ass boys just like Tony, 
sometimes just for being short on their money and her not wanting to seem soft to the others. Here are your three options, she warned him with intimidating seriousness. 1. I take you out for work and leave you in a ditch somewhere. The city can hear a story about what a big hero you were, and that will be the end of it. Option 2, I call Stig and have his GNP drag you to the jailhouse. The whole city can find out what a raging dopehead you are while you do your cold turkey detox strapped to a bed. You can scream and shit yourself for two months while that poison eats its way out of you. Option 3, you do what I tell you while I try to salvage your stupid ass. Either way, all the governors are in agreement, our world is too hard for us to put our faith in drunks and heroin addicts. When neither of them said anything, Sally reminded them just how powerful she really was by her confidence alone. Her tone left no doubt when she prodded them. Decide quickly. Alice had to drag Tony's drug stash footlocker. It was too heavy for her to carry. Tony shouted in worse than frustration, fuck. That made Sally loosen up. She really liked Tony and it would be a shame to kill him. Sally praised his wisdom under pressure, I see that you choose to accept the wiser course. Sally turned to Wolf, load up all of the booze, all of it, every last beer and wine cooler. Get it out of here. Neither of them can drink without it taking them right back to this. With that out of the way, Sally assured them. Alice is right, Duke is in way over his head and he needs our help. Both of you are going out with the train missions we have planned for tomorrow morning. We are throwing together whatever we have on hand, which includes you too. Anything else you need will be there waiting for you. Next, she informed Tony, I'll have Clara put together a doping schedule for you. We will bring you down gradually enough that you are good for something other than clawing your own skin off. You can believe that I will have Alice checking up on you. If you ever hide any of that shit again, if you ever get your fix from anyone but Clara, I will have you in the Admiral's brig. He will make you his navy bitch mopping decks. I shit you not, so do not fuck with me on this. You didn't help build this place to give up your freedom? I'm the one who made you, and I damn sure it can unmake you just as easily. If you blow this chance to save your career as a captain, I will bounce you so hard that you will think Herman Clark got a good deal. After Alice opened the footlocker and saw the menagerie of drugs that would have made Hunter S. Thompson green with envy, she looked to Sally about what she should do. Sally walked over and then pulled out a giant clear plastic bag of hemp flowers, which she tossed onto the coffee table for Tony to keep. As for the rest of it, she told Alice, give all that to Clara. You can't tell her about what is going on. She needs to know that Tony is going out on a train in the morning and will need his medication. If she wants, she can instruct your sister on how to be in charge of his treatment. If Mandy wants to be a doctor, Tony can be her first patient. Believe it or not, Sally told Colonel Flash, we actually need you. When you are sober, you can command a train operation better than anyone. I will be staying at the castle to coordinate everything and be ready for any emergencies. Sally looked back to Alice. You're part of my personal crew now, so I want you there too. Clyde will be with me to watch my back. While you're working, whatever we find for you to do, you speak for me. With that in mind don't do anything stupid. I expect regular updates on your progress. As for Jam, she felt ashamed and humiliated. Even her own daughter voiced only disgust with her. Slinking back to Camelot in the Commodore would be her final walk of shame. Pike recognized her defeated expression and hoped to overturn it by calling to Jam from the doorway. Do we ready the train to go out and help Juke? Are we going back to it? That is for the Commodore to decide, Jam replied downtrodden. The rabbi moved past Pike to enter through the door. When Jam saw him, Rabbi said, Commodore Tinney did decide to invest all his faith in you. When Mickey died, you didn't quit and you won't quit now. No one called you Jam up because of the greatness of your mistakes, but because you always had the heart to overcome them. Now is no different. Give the word. Colonel Flash looked around the room, made her choice, and then commanded Pike. The word is given. We leave in the morning to help Duke. The governors want the rails open and the freemen are going to deliver. Pass the word around that Colonel Flash is asking for volunteers. I will catch up with you soon. We can talk about the arrangements. Chapter 14 Miss Katonic Madhouse After his mission meeting with Colonel Davis, Critias left the dam's dining hall to look for his wife. He found Carmen outside at the downstream power plant lagoon. Ray hung out nearby drinking from a gold-leaf bottle of imperial champagne and smoking a joint. Platt was there of course, consoling Critias as wife on who knows what. Carmen was obviously upset about something, which was nothing new as things with her went. She was close enough to Platt that they were able to hear each other over the thundering waters. She knew when Critias came out from the building. 
Carmen didn't need to see or hear him to do that. She had known when he was on his way. Just the computerized targeting scope on Critias's holstered Tesla Flux pistol was enough for her to keep track of him via the audio microphones. Critias was sure that she had another half dozen smart ways of doing it. It wasn't like he surprised them or caught her at anything that Carmen didn't want him to see. The opposite was closer to the truth. If she did resort to deceptions, that really would undermine their relationship. Carmen sniffled without wiping her tears. Being considerate, she didn't want to imprint on others that it was ever wise to touch their own face, especially when outdoors. Let's go, Critias told her with no special measure of compassion. We are on for your city of woe. Carmen had subconsciously eavesdropped on Critias's conversation with Colonel Davis. It could have been through the microphones in his weapon scope, or his nearby helmet, and likely a triangulation of both. She could have used the range-finding lasers in his mech suit helmet to collect the conversation by reading sonic vibrations in the table's crystal drinking glasses. Whatever her surveillance technique, she already knew as much about their orders as he did. Critias bringing it up would be reason enough for her to draw it all into active conscious memory. She had to raise her voice when she called over to Ray, We are leaving tonight. It would be nice if you could give our gear the once over, make sure we have all the tools we'll need for getting those locomotives operational. Ray just nodded to confirm that he would. Platt asked Critias, Do you need any help? It's a long flight in the black hole, Critias answered him. I'll have time to talk with her, but thanks anyway. That's not what I meant, Platt corrected him. I know what you meant, Critias dismissed his offer with bad attitude. This is a grave walking gig, out in the open on the down low. It wouldn't be your thing. I'm not sure it's my thing, but my armor helps. We're just friends. Platt said too much without making it obvious if he did it on purpose, which he did. The Turkish officer knew enough about the mission to retake Marigold Farm that he blamed Critias for leading so sordid an operation that he saw as unworthy of Carmen's dignity and loyalty, to both her husband and her commanding officer. Critias countered rhetorically, You think I don't know that? His tone made it clear that Palat and he would come to violence if it was anything else between their mother than just being friends. Because Carmen gave him a disapproving glance over him escalating the situation, Critias made an effort to be more diplomatic. She's a big girl and life is shit sometimes, he said to defuse the matter. I guess Carmen feels bad about popping the tops on those radar pieces of shit at the farm, or there is something going on back home we are neglecting. There is plenty in life for her to be sad about. She knows that I prefer her unhappy to coldly indifferent. After a moment to swallow his jealousy, Critias added, Whatever it is this time, Carmen doesn't need my permission to have friends. Platt seemed like he wasn't even listening to Critias. He just gave Carmen a supportive hug while also whispering something that made her nod, and then he went back to that party. Once Platt was gone, Ray walked up to tell Critias, I feel sorry for that guy. He thinks that Carmen would pick him over me once you're dead. I'd rather she did pick you, Critias confessed honestly. That guy rubs me the wrong way. It's not you he wants to rub the right way, Ray pointed out with a chuckle. Critias ignored the jibe and went to Carmen. He asked, are you going to tell me what is wrong? She took a deep breath and then came out with it. I'm not a good mother or a good daughter, and if this moment is any indication, I'm also not a good wife either. I put Tony and Jam together, which made their problems feed off each other until it became a crisis. He blew that off as nothing. Tony and Jam have always lived large. Are you telling me that someone is dead? Carmen shook her head no. Alice decided that their non-stop in sobriety had gone on for long enough, so she put a stop to it. She did it mostly on her own, but did ask the rabbi and Sally for some authoritative assistance. Critias just shrugged like he didn't hear anything that sounded like a problem worthy of his concern. His calm confidence that things would work out helped Carmen find a more hopeful perspective on the situation. She informed him, they will be going out on Jam's train in the morning. The consensus seems to be that some moderated sobriety and hard work should get them back to proper form. Neither Tony nor Jam are entirely willing participants in this remedy. It would be more accurate to say that they are victims of an offer that they can't refuse. Still good, Critias replied with satisfaction. Sometimes people need a little stern correction. Jam hits the bottle pretty hard and Tony hasn't been straight a single day since I've met him. He put his hands on Carmen's shoulders to let her know that everything would be alright, you do more good for more people than almost anyone else I know. From what you just said about Jam, I have total confidence that Alice would let you know if you were a bad mother, and Jam has never been shy about telling you what she thinks either. If I had a problem with you, I promise that you would know it. We will get this job done and be back home with him soon. Carmen sounded ashamed as she asked, Do you think less of me because of what I did to those pirates at the farm? 
He genuinely laughed at that and it was a strong merry laugh. Those bloodthirsty murdering bastards deserve to go to hell and you sent them there in the style they justly earned. I'm actually proud that you gave that couple a worthy funeral. Never forget, you are my woman, not Prince Gentleman Percy Palatz. Those villains reaped what they sowed. You say that Alice stood strong and tough in this situation with Jam. When enough was enough, she marched in there and straightened them out. Carmen nodded meekly that it was true. He enlightened her, I bet you're thinking that Alice thought about what I would do in her place. I can see that Alice thought about what you would do in her position. You're a great mother to them and it shows. After praising her, Critias did have a genuine complaint, those drugs you snorted up your nose still bothers me, probably more than it should. I don't want to see that on movie night. Your daughters should never see that, even if it was in the name of deception and accomplishing our mission. Having mentioned that, in all the rest, I am proud of you. Bad people open the door on worse things. Everything that happened to them is what they brought upon themselves. Marigold Farm was a job well done. We have nothing to apologize for, far from it. Platt is a good man, Carmen said because she felt she needed to explain him. He sees what he wants to see, and part of me wants to be that person he believes in. Critias was curious, part of you? What about the rest of you? She looked him in the eyes knowing he would understand. I never lived in their world before the ghouls, so I don't have a real nostalgia for an old life that I could want to get back. The only life I know is being with you and we don't work from home. Our lives are in the field, going wherever the work takes us, battling the bad guys to make a real difference. You and Palat are alike in so many ways. He is an amazing man, like when he jumped out of the Greyhound with that Manpad missile launcher. You both would love me and take care of me. The difference is, to feel like a man, he would have to make a home with me. That part of me would like to stay home, be a school teacher, a scientist, or an engineer, and I would be good at it. He could never accept me as a partner in his whole life, his life out here, not the way you do. Carmen was totally loyal to her marriage and she did adore Critias. It was important for her that he realize that. You let me share in everything you do. You see more in me than just your wife and a lover. We make a good team out here too. There is an inglorious, gun-packing, free-wheeling side of me with an appetite for destruction. You can take pride in my accomplishments as a marshal and not feel intimidated by all of my knowledge and abilities. For Palat, taking me with him would seem like his failure as a husband. For you, I was born to be by your side in the worst moments. From what she said, Critias disagreed with her assessment, Major Fang is Palat's partner and they do a lot of dangerous work together. I get the impression that he wants more of a relationship, only she pushes him away. Palat knows what you are capable of. And it does not scare him off. He would have no problem working with you like I do if he ever got the chance. Whatever his problem is, it is not working with or sleeping with women more talented than he is. Carmen did know a little about the relationship between Palat and Li Feng. Li did consider Palat to be her best friend and it showed, but it was Palat who had tried to take the relationship to the next level, only he got rebuffed into his permanent friend zone. Like his ambitions to now have Carmen, complications beyond his control made Palat's relationship dreams impossible. Ray declared to Carmen half-jokingly, I wouldn't mind you kicking ass. That is why you would pick me. I'm an amazing lover who knows how to let a woman breathe her fire. Critias needed to get his mech suit and other gear together for the mission, before he departed, he told Carmen, I'll leave you to get all your boyfriends in order. When Andy is ready to take us to the airport, call me. He laughed while walking away as though he just intuitively knew that she stuck her tongue out at him. Before Carmen and Ray got to the business of raiding the dam's engineering shops for tools, she told him in Portuguese, you would make sure that I was never bored. She held out her hand for the champagne bottle, and when he passed it over, Carmen took a drink. As she gave the bottle back, she added, We do share a love of machines. It was about midnight by the time that Critias got his mission airborne aboard the black hole and on its way. Gloria summoned Critias and Carmen to the bridge so that they could discuss what would happen next. She was at the illuminated map table. Overlay pen already marked out all the train routes of relevance. About six hours, Gloria told them. That is when we reach the lower end of the Wasatch Front. We will photo map the entire railway between the dam and there. Colonel Davis will need it when the time comes. To move beyond that, Gloria required more information. What is the plan for the final approach? Critias deferred to Carmen, you're up, General. Kevin has made better maps since we started this idea, Carmen explained the quality of their updated information. The abandoned trains we will move are here at the southern end. One of them blocks the southbound switch that we need for operating through Spanish Fork Canyon. From their map, 
Critias saw that there were two railways through the Rocky Mountains. Carmen's Spanish Fork Canyon was in the south. The other one was Weber Canyon at the northern end of the Wasatch Front. It was possible for them to go around by another longer route, bypassing those stalled trains entirely. Critias asked, what about using this pass up here? There is another way around available to us, Carmen admitted, but it won't do anything to address the ghoul population problem at that end either. My plan is for Colonel Davis to bring in his train from the south behind the blockage. We will have repaired those locomotives by then and drive them out through the north. The colonel's train will follow up from behind. Together, we will pull all the ghouls to the north right along with us. The greatest endurance runners have covered longer distances. I'm totally confident any functional ghoul would be able to keep up non-stop. Gloria informed them, the sun will be up by the time we reach the outskirts of the front. I will have to wait until tomorrow night to make a complete thermal map of the infected population. You could continue with the rail mapping, Carmen suggested. We can spend the day at the university foraging the equipment I need. Tomorrow night, we can start working on the trains while you get an accurate count of the ghouls. Knowing where they congregate will be essential for efficiently exterminating them when the time comes. Gloria turned to Critias, you better get some sleep. I will be putting you down at the university in about eight hours. When Carmen looked at him, Critias told her, you are welcome with me whenever you like, or you can stay here and work on your plans. I'm here for you in whatever way you need me. He did get some much needed sleep. Carmen eventually crept in late to cuddle. Critias didn't fully comprehend the inner workings of Carmen's mind, but he was aware that she found relief from the constant bombardment of her racing thoughts just by being in his arms. When finally flying over and able to see it for himself by daylight, Critias understood that the Wasatch Front truly deserved its bad reputation. It was nothing less than a perfect geographical fortress that naturally congregated and nurtured the infected. Once the freaks migrated in from the inhospitable mountains and deserts, they never found any reason to leave again. The whole length of the front had either epic mountains or lakes that walled it in. Urban development was exceptionally dense, which provided the ghouls with excellent shelter. There was plenty of water, which in turn generated lush vegetation and encouraged wildlife that kept the ghouls fed. Worst of all, was the narrowness of the whole thing. The natural barriers squeezed in all those infected into a long strip so that every single one of them was within sprinting distance of their railway line that went right down the center. Two million ghouls were within an hour of the tracks, and that was the ones furthest away. A million of those could reach the railway in only 20 minutes. At any point along the track, in the window of only a few minutes, tens of thousands of ghouls could siege one of their trains. Just seeing it from the air gave Critias flashbacks of Chicago. He knew what it meant to have that many ghouls in one place all agitated at the same time. The Wasatch Front was a death trap, pure and simple. Carmen read his thoughts from his expression and body language. She gave him a hopeful but uncertain look that recognized the possibility that he would call it off. He gave Carmen a thumbs up, let's get down there and make this happen. Carmen grinned over his shared confidence, they won't know what hit them. We will know what hits us, Critias cautioned her. If we so much as snap a twig down there, they might fall on our hands like a damn breaking. Don't get me eaten. Take your new 10mm pistol, Carmen advised seriously. I realize that we want to avoid engaging with them at all at this early stage. Even if you will never need to use it, the absence of your preferred weapon will serve as a constant reminder against the temptation to power up all your mech suit systems. Staying in blackout mode is essential, unless you just want to remain on the black hole. I'm going, Critias committed himself. I know your blackout program works. The only one in any real danger would be me. Professor Carnegie was in the main hold and had been there for the entire voyage. The new watchers were still infectious, which prompted Gloria to do what she could to minimize their contamination risk to her airship. Along with the professor, Critias also brought along Gustav, David Talbot, and Dinosaur Dosh. Verloc and Romeo had free run of the black hole, but they were already in the hold and ready for work when Critias arrived with Carmen. For getting down into the city, Gloria gradually settled down the black hole by compressing the helium and reducing the volume of the lighter-than-air buoyancy. It wasn't quick, but it was quiet, and would allow her to land completely with the minimal use of the drive fans. Their destination was the fourth-floor rooftop of a building that Carmen had marked as her target of primary interest. Disembarking eight groomen, their gear, and crates of their mission supplies was a considerable ballast change. By landing and then compensating for the expected loss, Gloria would not have to blast the fans simply to hold them down. Their descent was gradual enough that Critias had time to make some observations. Carmen wanted to forage in a university village. The property was at the very foot of the eastern mountains. Its other three sides were the thickest centermost mass of the Wasatch's dense suburbia. 
Their target building was on the western edge of that campus, which put them about a kilometer from the slopes of that nearby mountain range. Suburbs and park grounds came up around three sides of their target building. All that adjacent property was nearly a forest because it had grown up that much since the outbreak downfall. When they were securely settled down on the rooftop, Gloria and Henry came to the hatch to speak with Critias. Gloria said, if something goes wrong, you will need to get out of here lickety split. There are enough ghouls down there to pull this glass building apart. I walked in Vegas with Cutter, Critias told her with confidence in his grave walking skills. Just go ahead and do your mapping. I have a whole platoon of natives down here to protect me. She didn't share his self-confidence, I'll wait here for an hour, long enough for you to prove your mojo is working. When he didn't seem eager to agree, she added, this could be like Cleveland and Carmen picked the wrong damn building. Maybe looters already cleaned the whole place out. If what you want isn't even here, you won't need an hour to find out. He surrendered to that argument, an hour then, if we don't come a-running, you go on and take care of your business. It's nice to make new friends, Gloria added as a warning about all the strangers he had with him. Watch your back until you are certain who it is you're dealing with. I'll be careful, Critias promised. Verloc and Carmen scouted the rooftop for access into the building. The place they had landed on had no direct entrance, but there was a ladder down to the next lower roof. Critias instructed them, once you get inside, start at the bottom and confirm the integrity of the building. If this place is what you say it is, and it is clear, maybe Wernher will want to take a look through their stuff and take some things for the labs back home. After about ten minutes, Carmen returned with her report. This wing of the university closed down as part of an early outbreak quarantine measure. The medical research center on the east side of the campus remained open until the bitter end. Without the close inspection of those hospitals and labs, I cannot speak on their current condition. This building is intact and undamaged. The things I hope to find are here. It will take some time to modify them to our needs. With that out of the way, Carmen added, There is one thing, I found trash in one of the litter cans, a little trick I picked up from Sky Captain Gloria. I believe someone was here, not recently, perhaps two years ago, but after the fall of the city. They came here, explored whatever interests they had, ate a lunch, and then locked the doors on their way out. He had to ask, are you sure? Carmen nodded with complete confidence, the thickness of the dust accumulation is different than things around it. It gives a reliably accurate clock. Critias realized what Carmen surely did, this tourist used the trash can for his lunch wrappers. Carmen nodded again and then shrugged, she had nothing more to say about it that Critias didn't already understand. Aside from the mystery of who might have come around, it was a statement that they used the trash can rather than throwing their litter on the floor. They thought they might come back someday, Critias speculated. That or they felt a lingering respect for the place. It was a person familiar with the university, Carmen agreed. Why else would they have the keys? Two years was a long time ago, Critias reasoned. We keep our eyes open, and sweep for booby traps. Let's go get your stuff. The interior of the building was mostly anticlimactic. There was an empty auditorium, other irrelevant rooms and large common spaces. Carmen's piece de resistance was in the mechanical engineering lab, waiting safely behind the lock on a mesh storage cage. For Critias, it kind of amused him as he asked, a robot? It was a technology demonstration robot, quite large, a torso with a pair of articulated grasping limbs. He looked to Carmen, can we use this? Well, Carmen smiled at that. I plan to make some improvements. Kevin will write us new software. I will install a remote interface so that we can control and reprogram it as situations demand. She gestured around the lab to indicate all the tools, equipment, and other specimens of robotic hardware, I will combine bits of this and that to come up with something nice and self-mobile. Critias had to ask, what do you want this for? Carmen explained, the helicopter drones will need repeated engine refuelings and refills of their VX pesticide payloads. Our robotic friend here will be taking care of all our helicopter drone fleet servicing. I don't want to expose anyone to that VX toxin once we begin. The helicopters will be quite deadly with VX contamination as will the robot. She was comfortable with her plan, I see no need to destroy them when we are done. If the results are as good as I suspect, we may want to do it again. With the proper hazmat gear and cleaning equipment, I can salvage them all. Since their mission was going ahead, Critias asked her, who can help you build this thing? Gustav had real enthusiasm for taking things apart and rebuilding them. He volunteered, I can help. I can fetch tools and whatnot, Talbot offered. Romeo signed on, me too. Critias looked to Carnegie, what exactly are you a professor of? 
I hold doctorates in medicine, psychology, and parapsychology, Carnegie replied. I was a psychiatrist in my time, but I also dabbled in more esoteric phenomena, exorcism, poltergeist hauntings, and similarly unorthodox matters many would describe as spiritual. The medical degree sounded promising to Critias, that means you know what you are looking at if we go over to check out this hospital she mentioned. We may as well scrounge up some medical supplies while Carmen tinkers on her robot. Certainly, the professor readily agreed. Carmen warned Critias, while your mech suit is in blackout, I can't monitor your progress. It leaves me totally deaf and blind. I'd feel better if you waited until I could join you. Those feelings have no place here, Critias warned her back. Right now when I look at you, I am thinking of Platt putting his hands on you and you honking that shit up your nose. To hell with the goddamn ghouls. They are just a bunch of naked retards of no concern to me. I will do what I have to do. You do what you have to do. You brought us here. You have put lives at risk because you said you could make this happen. Fix the robot and stop worrying about me. She shrugged at him and then went back to her work. His cold attitude was the purest wisdom of their chosen profession. The ghouls could not see in the darkness of a man's heart. Softer natures were blood in their water. Before he walked out, Critias told the room, Carmen is in charge. Do what she says. Verloc led the way to show Critias how to get outside. She took them to an upper floor where some glass doors opened onto a roofless sky bridge. Midway across, Critias paused to take in the scenery. The four-lane roadway below them had heavy leaf and pine needle litter, but it was still one of the infrequent open spaces on the otherwise overgrown campus. He was glad it was daytime. In blackout mode, his mech suit wouldn't have any night vision and ghouls would react to light sources. Critias didn't even have the ability to see the time. He normally didn't even wear his future technology wristwatch under his gauntlet anyway. Critias started to count the infected that he saw walking the roadway. There were five or six of them within view at any moment. Some left and others arrived. That was enough for him to know what they could expect. A few thousand on campus, Dosh said after having done the same calculations. Critias had estimated that about 2,500 ghouls would be wandering the area they were going to cross. More would be on the walkways, less in the woods but some would always be in sight the entire time. If one of them did identify Critias as human, it was going to get exciting in a hurry, a lot more than a few thousand would answer the feeding calls. As they walked along, the group stayed on the litter-strewn sidewalks. They would encounter more infected by following the easy paths and they would pass them at elbow-rubbing distances, but that was all part of the dismissive attitude that kept them equally disinterested. Being a true watcher, Professor Carnegie genuinely had no fears about the infected. For him, he was the psychiatrist and the world was his muscadonic madhouse of harmless simpletons. His lack of worry was not the same as being devoid of professional curiosity. A ghoulish woman that approached them along the sidewalk caught Professor Carnegie's interest. Her movements were clumsy, which was odd since ghouls didn't normally suffer from neurological disorders. There were the rare few who had regenerated back from severe brain injuries. Ghouls were less susceptible to being headshot than a normal human. It just happened to be the only reliable way for someone to stop them at all. Normal humans could easily just bleed to death. It wasn't unheard of for an infected to recover from head injuries. Jingle Bell certainly had. Critias noticed that the ghoul was strange and he was no psychiatrist of the infected. For him, it was not the jerky mobility that stood out the most. Critias noticed that someone had cut the creature's hair. It wasn't bald as could happen when an incinerated scalp regenerated back. The female ghoul had short hair indicative of a couple months regrowth. Instinct told Critias to confront the ghoul in order to learn more. He grabbed it by the wrist and when it didn't react, he took it by the jawline and back of the head to stare into its eyes. When she recognized him as human, it became apparent that there was a woman in there, at least part of one anyway. Instead of homicidal rage, her eyes conveyed a desperate hopeful sadness, the kind of reaction that would come if she knew what she was, where she had been, and she longed for the release of death. Perhaps it was Critias's analytical reaction that set her off. The woman tried to speak, only she didn't have the ability, instead, she made a mournful howl of ultimate damnation. In most ways she was still a ghoul. She exhibited their need to pursue humans, to seek them as the supreme urgency of life. What she lacked was the conversion into murder mode when they found someone. The woman tried to cling to Critias, beseech him to release her from her filth-eating immortal misery. He was her only hope and she would never let that get away. Critias snapped her neck with a practice twist that didn't kill her brain. Her head was still alive and aware, but she stopped pawing at him as he laid her on the ground. Strange, Carnegie said about the creature. That is not the behavior of an asymptomatic carrier. It's clearly something else. Someone did this to her, 
Critias told the professor as he indicated her feet that had the horrible telltale long toenails that ghouls grew over the years. She is a real outbreak victim, been one for years, only somebody recently shaved her head and then turned her loose again, all messed up like this. There is just one reason I can think of that could explain that. Professor Karnecki nodded grimly, there is a dedicated neurosurgical center just ahead. In my expert opinion, someone shaved her head as preparation for brain surgery. Her healing factor removed all outward signs of the procedure. Depending on the method, it might not have been all that intrusive to begin with. Critias reasoned, she is out here because she is a species of surgical failure, not a success. We need to worry about what success looks like. There is something else, Verloc said calmly as cover for drawing her pistol and then pointing it behind Dosh's ear. She laid out her reason for the sudden change of heart. Professor Karnicki is the only person around here with the skills and morbid interest to perform a surgery like that. Perhaps these two know a whole lot more about what is going on around here than they are letting on. Your mistake was to think that I wouldn't see through your conspiracy and realize that this is your home base. Relax, Critias told her. I appreciate your sense of caution and I see your point about the expertise required for this kind of science. Gloria also warned me that we still don't know them all that well. I'm pretty sure that Professor Carnegie was down south dealing with Copper and the Mad General at Groom Lake when this woman lost her hair. Verloc challenged that, maybe his accomplices are still here. These Dr. Frankenstein types always have an Igor. The real Dr. Frankenstein didn't have an Igor, Carnegie corrected her, but I do understand your point pertaining to this genuinely extraordinary situation. I give you my word, I am not involved in the fate of this poor woman or anything else that may be going on at this research hospital. If you were thinking clearly, you would realize that it is actually fortunate that you brought me with you. Getting to the bottom of unorthodox mysteries such as this is one of my specialties. I believe you, Verloc said peaceably as she put away her pistol, no offense, but I am a special agent, he's an alien mercenary lizard, and you're an exorcist. We can never be too careful. Critias honestly didn't even know what Verloc thought was real around her. If in her watcher crazy she saw Dosh as an actual lizard man from space, he could honestly believe it. Real life was so messed up, her madness blended almost seamlessly. He told Dosh, no hard feelings, buddy. I'm sure you are used to a little distrust, being a bounty hunter and all. The watcher turned his masked head to give Verloc a look. He couldn't make expressions through his disguise and he didn't say anything. Dosh still got the message across that he would not be so forgiving if Verloc ever put a gun to his head again. As for the ghoulish woman, Critias did feel bad for her tragedy. That lasted for all of about three seconds. In that time, two new ghouls rushed in to kill him. As both of them sprinted in his direction along the convenient sidewalk, the fast hard slapping of their feet snapped him back to harsh reality. Critias would have shot them, except that Verloc did it for him first. Her quick draw suppressed pistol shots dropped them both with masterful center hits to the forehead. Verloc was so swift and precise that Dosh had to actively reconsider his thoughts about any future conflict with her. She had demonstrated that she was more than dangerous. Back in the proper grave walking mindset, Critias dragged the woman off the sidewalk. He permanently put her out of her misery using a suppressed shot to the brain from his 10mm pistol. Instead of pity, he felt a rush of malice. It must have been the same kind of vengeful hatred that had motivated Carmen when she scalped those marauders at the farm. He didn't overlook the absurdity of the offense. Abusing ghouls was not something people generally frowned upon. Critias rated making the woman semi-sentient enough to suffer as the crime of abomination, blasphemy against human dignity. He would just as quickly kill someone for sexually violating the creatures. It was one thing to slaughter ghouls, even by the millions. Defiling their human forms out of sicko perversion crossed the line. Dosh advised, we should hide these bodies. If I had found them, they would have told me plenty. No one disagreed with that reasoning. It was simple enough for them to move all three undead corpses deeper into the bushes and then cover them with leaf litter. Unsure of what stranger things awaited them, they continued ahead at a more cautious pace. Spread out before them was the interconnected university hospital complex and it showed signs of promising interest. The enormous multi-story buildings in that area displayed markings that designated them as medical centers, clinics, and hospitals. A couple of the monumental structures had dedicated services to the treatment of children. There was one for eye surgery, and a main university hospital with its teaching annex. Compared to Marshall's in his own time, Critias had become something of an expert on the old outbreak world and how it had collapsed. The end had been swift and savage. Nothing valuable had survived the looters much less the advancing super tribes if those buildings stood undefended. Barbed wire, sandbags, and similar impromptu fortifications had been essential when holding out for any period of time. During the outbreak, 
any kind of medical center or hospital became a focal point for everyone, be it the military, the local police, or the panicking refugees and newly infected seeking help. All that chaos invariably ended in violence. First with the armed security fighting off the civilians, and then the super tribes of the fully turned ghouls laying siege to any place occupied by humans. Critias had expected all of the hospital buildings to have the characteristic broken windows and other signs of outbreak conflict damage. They were more prone to being derelict fire-ravaged ruins than promising opportunities for forage. Instead of destruction, Critias saw intact defensive reinforcements that were notable from a distance, owing in no small part to their bright colors. All the lower windows and main entrances had excellent steel shutters, readily recognizable as the expertly welded hoods and trunk decklids from an endless supply of abandoned cars in the city. Closer at hand, Critias saw old piles of headshot ghouls. At first, like the carbonate barricades, the body dump appeared to be the handiwork of outbreak era defenders. Upon closer inspection, Critias realized that only at the bottom closest to the ground were the disabled ghouls that he expected. Back then, nearly all infected still had on their street clothes, with their shoes, and frequently noticeable jewelry. That was the kind of bodies he saw at the first layer, all laying randomly as if hurriedly thrown in a convenient heap. Later, a second body disposal operation had placed more headshot infected over the top. Those undead corpses were in a more orderly arrangement as though placed systematically. As strange as their orderly positions, indicative of leisurely workers, Critias noticed the ragged state of their clothing. The bodies still had their garments as would any infected that had fallen in the first days. The rags on those people had noticeably weathered, ripped, and rotted, but only on their exposed sides. That condition was common for bodies that had laid out individually on the streets for a year or even several of them. Someone had come along only later, years after the battle that dropped them, and then disposed of the bodies in an orderly time-consuming manner. The topmost layer of bodies was also orderly, but they were all nude ghouls with well-grown nails. They seemed like they might have joined the pile only recently. Those last corpses were outlandishly peculiar because of their missing heads. The heads were not anywhere nearby that Critias saw and the next stumps were clean straight cuts as though from a guillotine. Verloc warned them all with an urgent whisper, Get down! She showed them the way as she took cover behind the wall of stacked bodies. Some of them are coming. When he came to the city of Woe, Critias had more than a few expectations, and none of them had anticipated the reality. What he saw appeared to be a kind of slaver's roundup. Three of the figures wore clean military fatigues. Their colors were not in the desert hues of Groom Lake, but rather something greener that would serve them well in the local forest. They had boots on their feet and more importantly, they had military Kevlar helmets on their heads. While it was true that such helmets were unlikely to stop direct hits from combat ammunition, they would work quite well against slow large caliber subsonic rounds such as the ones from Critias's 10mm pistol. Effectively shooting through their headgear would require the kind of weapons that would trigger a ghoul riot. It was still possible to shoot them through their faces. Critias couldn't tell if the three soldiers were watchers even if they certainly weren't human. There was no way that the uninfected could lead a string of wild ghouls down the street as captives. The guards had neutral expressions, from what he could tell at a distance, and they didn't seem to be conversing with one another. Perhaps best of all, none of them appeared to have any weapons. The five naked specimens they escorted were strong ideal males that would make excellent recruits into a surgical soldier program. They slunk stupidly along in line, poles shackled to one another neck to neck. The docile creatures followed the leash of the soldier who tugged at them. As the group continued ahead toward the main hospital complex, two additional soldiers came out from cover along the building. They silently joined the rear of the column and then they all disappeared together out of sight. Critias informed his companions, the black hole and the others are in danger. There is no telling how many more of these guys they have wandering around the city. If one of them sees the black hole up on that rooftop, we could quickly have two wars on our hands, these guys and the stirred-up local freak show too. Just because Critias had to keep his mech suit in blackout mode, Verloc didn't have those same limitations. She brought her martial service wristwatch to her lips and then whispered, Special Agent Sword, go to alert status one. The hospital complex is occupied. At that moment, Critias knew what it felt like to be in over his head. The brain surgery scientist they had found in the city could be friendly or hostile. He could have just five of those soldiers or five hundred of them. There was some reasonable chance that the answer to infection that he came to the past for in the first place, was somehow in the possession of that surgeon experimenting on ghouls. It was also possible that at that moment an army of the soldiers could be advancing against Carmen and the Black Hole. It seemed more probable that no one had any clue they were around. Critias had to make a decision and all the real certainty he had was to do it quickly. He took his customary seven breaths while he considered his options, 
and then Critias acted decisively. He quietly told the others, I trust Carmen and Gloria to handle their end of things. They will safely evacuate the black hole if they decide that is best. We can't go forward with removing the wild ghouls from this city without knowing what is going on around here first. The only way we can find out, is by going to see for ourselves. We need to follow those soldier guys, find their main base of operations, and then get to the bottom of this. After his brief examination of the decapitated bodies, and then seeing the strange soldiers with captives, Professor Carnicky had some educated deductions. These heads have been surgically removed, he informed them with certainty. The surgeons operating here practice their techniques on the undamaged heads without burdening themselves with the rest of their unneeded bodies. It was the head and its brain that was of actual interest to them. As you can see, there are dozens of these test subjects here, all identical, heads carefully removed at the junction of the C7 and T1 vertebrae, I am confident that those soldiers are more victims of their surgical experimentation. There are more piles like this one, Dosh reported as he pointed off into the distance. If they had the time to experiment on a hundred of them, how many more could they have used it on after they figured out how to make it work? You can see how all the streets that way are clear of bodies. This place has been at it for a while and they have plenty of labor to clean up the mess. Critias tentatively agreed, if those soldiers we saw are from the successful surgeries, that would explain why those captured ghouls don't show any aggression toward them. It might also be the reason that they seemed so unemotional. Carnacki stated, the surgical process is why that woman was more than a crazed plague victim, but less than an asymptomatic carrier. The reticent personality of those soldiers may indicate that they are not fully cognizant, perhaps they are more like automatons. Verloc asked, if this surgery thing turns out to be true, what does that mean for us? Maybe they have developed some kind of cure. It is possible that they surgically restore these people back to some semblance of their former selves. Critias considered that and then added, it could be that they are getting a range of outcomes. Some of them end up like that woman while others come out as automaton drones like Carmen's robot back there. There could be others yet to come who actually are fully aware. Professor Carnacki speculated, their early experiments likely began with primitive lobotomy procedures. For the infected, they would regenerate the nerve connections in those prefrontal tissues. I don't believe that surgery would have had any noticeable effect on them even before it had healed. This could explain why the experiments have consumed so many test specimens. The behavioral issues of these beings, ghouls as you call them, come from what I believe to be the amygdala region, deeper in the brain. A surgical operation there might explain the necessity for their shaved heads. They could have performed a simple lobotomy by going through the orbital sockets. We can assume that the patients would just as quickly regenerate any damage to the amygdala regions of the brain. Perhaps newly regrown nuclei perform more naturally or the surgery involves modifying them rather than their outright removal. The human brain is complex, more so with factors brought on by the infection. It is all rather fascinating. I think we should take the time to consider if this is something we might want to encourage. What if there is a surgical cure? His cure as he put it was something Critias already had an answer to since it wasn't any more of a solution than was the watcher transformation. Humanity must have children to continue, Critias told the professor. Men such as yourself are valuable in ensuring that those few humans left continue to survive. Restoring their sanity is not restoring their humanity. These people are no longer truly human. Having said that, Critias realized that Dr. Kine would certainly be interested in all the scientific data that Critias could recover. Kind probably already did perform the same kind of surgical experiments down in his East Airport laboratory. Coming from the future as Critias did, he obviously saw that the soldiers were essentially primitive androids, precursors of the slaves so prevalent in his own time. It was the kind of surgical science and experimentation on the ghouls that had a long and glorious future. Ultimately, Kevin and Carmen would arise from such macabre meddling with the brains of ghouls. Critias's resolution to the dilemma was that Jim's position was already entirely clear. Jim didn't want the humans who remained alive to see making themselves into watchers as their best hope for the future. He also didn't want any watchers in the world who weren't working for him. Whatever it was that they had discovered going on at this madcap hospital, it wasn't a cure for humans and it didn't operate with permission from the Council of Governors. Critias's first obligation was to protect humanity. The closest thing he had seen before to what was going on here, was when Jingle Bells manufactured destroyers and elites to wage a war against men. I will scout left. Dosh volunteered and then went off to explore the way ahead. His weapon was a suppressed MP5 submachine gun that had come from the arms locker aboard the black hole. He still had his grenade launcher with a bandolier of assorted munitions. Setting one of those off would definitely be loud and call down a whole lot of attention. Verloc broke from cover next. She scouted the right side of their advance. 
Everyone was mindful of how two of the soldiers had appeared from cover to join the others. More of them could be waiting patiently behind every corner. Even while wild ghouls invariably disturbed the leaf litter that caked every street, the high traffic areas used by the booted soldiers still managed to wear down obvious paths, sometimes clean to the original pavement, the trails were clear enough that anyone who paid attention could follow them. The hospital soldiers had done a good job removing all the downed bodies from the streets around the medical campus community. Since Gridius didn't see any nearby abandoned vehicles, he assumed that the soldiers had removed those as well. If they could drive and tow old trucks away from their inhabited buildings, it demonstrated significant technical know-how. The Wasatch Front had a large air force base, as was common to any major metropolis. Critias realized that anyone smart enough to operate vehicles would be able to salvage military hardware. If the surgical soldiers lacked functional firearms, it was only by the choice of their mysterious masters. Perhaps the hospital community were as afraid of a city-wide infected uprising as Critias had caused to avoid it himself. The infected were disarmingly lethargic and stayed uniformly spread out while they performed their daily tedium, which was mostly foraging for food. If total ghoul war did break out, they would be swarming like army ants ten legions deep. Critias didn't even carry enough ammunition to make a difference if it came down to that. The hospital buildings did have good security with all the ground floor openings behind strong steel barriers. A network of upper floor sky bridges connected every medical building. Their original purpose had been to let the medical community function unimpeded in all weather conditions, the harsh local winters in particular. In the new death world environment, the sky bridges were luxury class school security. As to where the surgical soldiers went with their infected prisoners, their destination narrowed down into a singular certainty. The way they had gone took them past the mechanical support and services areas of the hospital and then around a blind corner. The dead end area back there was the incoming loading dock. As a major teaching hospital, it had five trailer docking gates, so it wasn't a small space. Even with the fire door and all the garage gates closed, the way they had gone remained readily apparent because there was a sturdy ramp of wheelchair access materials that led to the second garage gate. After they had peeked around the corner and felt confident that the loading dock was unoccupied, Verloc asked Critias, how do you want to handle this? He wasn't prepared to just kill everyone without first getting some kind of explanation. Critias imagined how Dr. Kine would have felt if they had just burst into his laboratory and then shot him in the ass because he was doing shock therapy experiments on ghouls. There was a reasonable chance that the research going on inside the hospital would be of value. On the other hand, he had stumbled onto the lair of some evil super scientist. He just didn't know for sure. Verloc had a recommendation, you've always had a talent for reasoning with immortals. I think we should ask questions first, and then shoot them later. He tended to agree with her but for other reasons. Critias surmised, it is likely that they have as much interest in avoiding a loud gun battle as we do. If we are going to have one anyway, we would be better off fighting them inside behind their barricades rather than having the city overrun us out here on the street. That said, he asked, you want to just walk up and knock? Perhaps I should, Carnegie told them both. As one scientist to another, I might be able to engage them in a reasonable discussion as to what is actually going on around here. We can't just leave. Critias said as his tentative agreement with the reckless plan. Even if these people are friendly, we have to warn them about our plans to depopulate the city. Otherwise they might get caught up in it, or even attack us while trying to stop it. Verloc's alert status one warning call had made Carmen panic. Just the experience of being detached from Critias while he was in danger had her feeling unsettled already. Grave walking in the city of woe was so fraught with potential failures that not even Carmen could calculate them all. The news from Verloc that some potentially hostile agency occupied the hospital complex only intensified her distress. Unsubstantiated calamitous fears were not reason enough for her to sure call professionalism and then rush off to find Gridius. However, it was enough for her to abandon her current duties. Carmen summoned Romeo, Gustav, and Talbot to join her. The four of them deserted the work on the robot while they headed back to the rooftop where the black hole still waited for them. Her primary concern was not for herself or her teammates. It was the black hole airship that was most vulnerable to harm. After that, it was Critias who was in the greatest danger. If at some point his grave walking disguise failed him, his chance of getting out of the city alive was slim in the extreme. Without a black hole for him to even retreat to, his survival chances reduced down to about nil. Sky Captain Gloria was out on the rooftop inspecting the airship when Carmen arrived, their urgency made it clear enough to her that something was amiss. Gloria asked, What is wrong? The hospital is occupied. Carmen reported with more than a little agitation. By whom? Gloria hoped for a more descriptive answer. Carmen shrugged that she didn't know. Gloria changed her question, 
Are they on their way back? One of the few pieces of information that Carmen had was the friendly fire avoidance position ping that came from Verloc's Marshal Service wristwatch even while in its quiet standby mode. That ping was getting further away, not closer. Carmen answered, They are continuing ahead. I'll have Henry keep a lookout, Gloria told Carmen. If the situation changes, let me know. Until then, finish your work. That is the reason we are here at all. Before they left, Gloria added, they will have bottles of helium around here somewhere. If possible, I want to take them. The black hole has room to hold more. The black hole is in danger here, Carmen asserted as a matter for immediate defensive action. The black hole is always in danger, Gloria replied. That is why Jim gave her to me. We complete the mission and we protect our people. If Critias does retreat, it will be back here to us. We stay on mission until the situation changes. Yes, ma'am. Carmen agreed and then hurried back to preparing the robot. Werner Hindemith joined Carmen from the parked black hole. He wanted to assist them with the robot's project and speed things along. Even though Critias had decided to follow Verloc's advice, he wasn't going to put the blame of the plan's outcome on her shoulders. If he threw caution to the wind, the responsibility had to be his own. Not only was he leading the mission, Critias had his grave walking mindset to consider. Nervous caution was a human motivation one that the ghouls were ever anxious to feed upon. With everything to lose, and no good sense to it, other than duty to principles, Critias banged on the garage door that was at the top of the pedestrian ramp. He wasn't sure what he expected to happen, perhaps the nothing that occurred. After a wait to listen, Critias hit the door again just to express contempt for it. He had put so much consternation into the plan only to have it prove to be so unamusing. Everyone got a surprise when the nearby exterior fire door opened out onto the secluded yard. In that doorway stood a man of obvious Samoan ancestry. His prime physical condition and clean clothing, all in variations of the color blue, made it apparent that the fellow was either a real wild born watcher or a masterful success in surgical restoration. The automatic pistol in his waistband demonstrated his functional mental acuity even before he proved he could speak. The Samoan had walked out expecting to find a feral ghoul banging on his garage door. Instead, he found four strangers. Three of them reflexively pointed weapons at him. Still being alive was all the reason he needed to know that they hadn't come to kill him. If they wanted that, they would have shot him down already. Unafraid, but wisely making no hasty movements that might set off the strangers to unnecessary violence, the Samoan sounded more annoyed than concerned as he asked, Who are you and why are you beating up on my shit? Verloc deftly holstered her pistol as a peace gesture before she explained more or less truthfully, We were passing through this area and noticed this place. Either someone was here or we could find some nice stuff while checking it out. If all this is yours, I can just pass along the warning to you and then we can move along our way. The Samoan sounded skeptical. Warning, huh? I'll take that warning now. A warning too late isn't worth anything. Verloc came straight out with it. The agency I work for will be depopulating this city to facilitate the regular usage of the local railway lines. We need you to evacuate for a couple weeks or so, for your own safety. After the cleanup, you will have your old free run of the place. We are not here to take anything, just to clear a safe path through. The Islander Watcher in Blue believed her since he knew the truth well enough when he heard it. He had a warning of his own. Before you do anything too crazy, you should check with Dr. Abrero. He is the dude that runs all of this. The doc isn't the kind of guy you want to disrespect. His crew are not the friendliest thugs I've ever banged around with either. Very well, Verloc agreed with that. Can you take me to him? Professor Carnegie spoke up. I would like to meet this Dr. Abrero. We seem to have much in common. I am also a doctor in the company of reputedly brutish henchmen. Sure thing, the watcher agreed with an easy shrug of why not. Nothing much ever happens around here anyway. I can tell you what he is likely to say. He won't want you killing off all the local specimens. Those are the ones he experiments on. The Samoan beckoned for them to follow him inside. I'll take you to see the boss. A spacious concrete floored warehouse area was beyond the door. That squad of calmly robotic soldiers were off on the other side of the room, using soapy water buckets, sponges, and a garden hose. They meticulously washed their ghoul captives clean. Both the soldiers and their captives shared the same silent detachment over the whole affair. Ghouls never had much malice for one another unless fighting over food. The wild infected passively submitting to their captivity was not especially unusual even if their predicament was out of the ordinary. Critias also took account of the warehouse's other features of interest. He saw a large number of plastic barrel drums in one area. Most of them had their lids off and those laying on their sides revealed that they were both clean and empty. 
Dr. Abrero's warehouse had what was surely a functional forklift. It implied that he used large trucks to deliver his supplies. Surgically corrected or not, all the doctor schools still had to eat much like any normal person would. To that end, his warehouse had an impressive stockpile of large cardboard boxes. The labels indicated the contents to be commercial-sized cans of food. Having some expeditionary experience as a forager, Critias saw that one organized pile of supplies was a diverse selection, in such quantity and proportions that it had to be the outgoing provisions for some kind of prolonged mission. After he took in the scenery, Critias asked their guide, Do you collect all this food yourself or do you send your soldiers out to get it? The watcher in blue wasn't forthcoming with operational details. His reserved response was only to say, a little bit of both. Critias didn't trust the watcher. The blue Samoan gave him a vague suspicion that the friendly introduction they were about to get with Dr. Abrero wasn't going to be all that hospitable after all. On the other hand, aggressive paranoia was always useful for staying alive, both tactically and in grave walking terms. Being hopeful and trusting was inefficient on both fronts. A sudden and unpleasant realization prevented Critias from considering the Samoan or the supplies any deeper. All the naked ghouls over at the washing area had lost their docile and cooperative natures. They displayed the sort of irritable twitchiness that was typical of infected just before they decided to attack suspected humans. More specifically, the soapy ghouls were not acting hostile toward the soldiers that held them captive. All of the ghouls stared in Critias's direction. Being an amateur grave walker at best, reliant on his mech suit as he was, Critias allowed himself to grumble under his breath, swell. That momentary lapse of mindset caused one of the naked ghouls to scream with malevolence and struggle against the leash of its bathtime soldier handler. There was something different about his grave walking disguise and Critias knew it. He wasn't much of a scientist or a trivia egghead in general, but as a professional ghoul fighter, it was obvious enough that environmental conditions had changed when nothing else really had. His best guess was that it had something to do with him being indoors that made him more detectable. It was possible that being inside the hospital isolated him from what was otherwise a camouflaging natural background of stellar radio interference that helped mask his bioelectric human signature. For all he really knew, it could have just been all the active air purifiers, fluorescent lights, and other hospital equipment turned on around the place. They collectively saturated the air with negative ions and that improved the notoriously poor conductivity of the general atmosphere. Under enhanced conditions, the ghoul's senses could be four times more sensitive. At the moment, the exact cause didn't really matter. That it was happening at all jeopardized everything. Critias's inability to grave walk effectively could touch off a major war. In that he was so close to revealing his humanity, Critias appreciated Carmen's wise advice that he leave his Tesla Flux pistol behind. The emanations from that technology might have been the end of him then and there. As the wild ghouls stared at him with mouth foaming hatred, Critias felt the familiar battle rush. In a moment, he would pull out his pistol and then kill them all the slaves, their handlers and the Samoan too. It was unlikely that the Watcher would casually go along with Critias shooting up the place, so he would invariably have to shoot the Watcher for no fault of his own. Their Samoan guide didn't pause over the ruckus. He cared nothing for screaming ghouls. The Watcher confidently walked them out of that dock area by taking a nearby doorway. That added distance put enough space between Critias and those wild ghouls that they lost the scent of him. While that turn of luck had solved his immediate problem, Critias remained cautious about getting too close to any more wild infected that might be in transition about the place. The interior of that hospital was conspicuously clean, attended enough to stand as proof that workers, probably zombie androids, regularly performed janitorial duties. It had electric lighting that seemed all functional, even though its full use was somewhat dispersed. Shadowy gaps gave the place a treacherously gothic ambience. The blue motif watcher led them down the main pedestrian corridor for the ground floor. The wide hall only made one turn, which was about midway through that huge multi-story building. Since they didn't get to explore any of the rooms they passed, that one hallway didn't give them much opportunity to learn anything about the mysterious Dr. Abrero. Critias did notice that there were old bullet scars on the floors and in some of the walls. That damage gave testament to the battle when the ghouls had finally penetrated the hospital's outer defenses during the outbreak. Dr. Abrero had cleaned up the mess of those dark times, repaired all the barricades and thus acquired for himself an impressive home. When they reached the far side of the hospital, the Samoan led them upstairs to the third floor and then onto a sky bridge that went out to the next building. According to the old signs on the wall, their destination was the Stroke Treatment and Neurology Center, which basically meant the brain surgery. There were windows along the bridge that gave a magnificent view of the nearby mountains. The foothills were so close that they actually suspended further urban construction in that steadily climbing direction. 
that enclosed elevated walkway made a smooth left curve near its middle. At that rounded corner was a crude replacement repair window, secure but ugly. It was also the only window that even had the ability to open, which it was, swung wide in that alfresco position. Standing there enjoying the fresh air and a cigarette was what appeared to be yet another male watcher. The smoking man's smirking expression was enough to reveal that he was fully sentient. He did have plenty to feel amused about, if nothing else, Critias and his companions were more than a little outlandish in appearance. Critias as Hunter imitation mech suit was as peculiar as Dosh who never took off his rubber dinosaur mask. Professor Carnacki wasn't that unusual in his antiquated and overly formal British bowtie brown suit. Verloc was gratuitously tactical with all her buckles, straps, and pouches. It was befitting a combative role for her adventure. She had come along without expectation for taking part in any subtly romantic espionage. In or out of a ballroom gown, Special Agent Shield was still ready for anything. You are early, the Watcher said to them in Spanish, and he wasn't speaking to the Samoan. The man didn't seem to have anything particularly Hispanic about him. He was more of a typical Caucasian American, and even had denims with a t-shirt. Verloc glanced at her Supertech Marshal Service wristwatch before she replied to him in that same language, according to my calendar. I'm right on time. Perhaps you read that? The watcher flirted back at her. He reached into his shirt pocket to take out the pack of cigarettes. With a practiced tap, he offered her the butt of one that had jumped out. Smoke? She declined, I never touch them. Don't you know those things will kill you? Yeah, he cocked his head in la vie as he put the pack away. I don't die as well as I used to. Verloc winked at him as she continued past, you might be surprised. Critias realized how fortunate it was that Romeo had taught Verloc to speak perfect Spanish. The watchers seemed friendly enough, but more than not that had to do with not stepping on their emotional toes. It dawned on Critias that the smoking watcher had assumed they spoke Spanish. He had apparently expected someone in the sense that they were early for a planned meeting, and he did not recognize them by sight. Taken on the whole, it meant that even more players in the game were out there somewhere. That others were around wasn't entirely surprising when he considered just how many more watchers were in their world. There would be many sophisticated groups and surely some would be less friendly than others. Jingle Bells had proved that watchers could be decisively hostile. It remained to be seen who the mysterious Dr. Abrero might be. There was always the possibility that he was still mortal and not another watcher at all. Thus far, it appeared that Dr. Abrero somehow surgically modified wild homicidal ghouls into primitive android slaves. He had them working as wranglers and janitors. It was possible that the smoking man and the Samoan were surgical successes, and not natural happenstance watchers at all. Critias recalled that Carmen had cautioned him that every major city would have some watchers therein. That was the talking thinking kind, and not the more numerous half-changed who were essentially just freakishly cunning ghouls. That kind of transformation resulted from insufficient levels of some cocaine type of drug in their systems or they stayed too oxygenated during their conversion. Globally. Thinking watchers had to number near 10,000, maybe more. By ability to survive in sheer numbers, it was their world now. Critias appreciated the importance of the task he had. It was that close to the extinction of the entire human race, since his own future past preordained his eventual success, there was nothing to bother him. Even as they did win, against thousands of hostile watchers that had to exist, that victory wouldn't come easy. Before they were out of earshot, the Samoan called back in English without looking, don't you ever work around here, Wilson. All I ever see out of you is drinking, smoking, and eating. Tongo Tongo, Tongo, Wilson pitied him. I do my work out on the road. I'm only here when I make the drop-offs. Tongo remained skeptical, I have never seen you hurry to do anything. Dropping off can take you a long time. The doctor pays me to get things done right, Wilson explained, not for me to get things done in a hurry. Nature never hurries and still gets everything done on time just like me. The Samoan quipped, you read that in a fortune cookie? Wilson corrected him, no, I read that on your mom's sweet ass. She has it tattooed back there. The walk continued and upon entering the next hospital building beyond the bridge, Critias finally saw the scope of their potential opposition. That hospital had a full staff of the surgically corrected ghoul androids. Critias didn't see that many of them together all at once, but they came and went so frequently that there had to be many such minions dispersed throughout the connected community of multi-story buildings. After Critias had seen a dozen examples of dutiful minion, he noted that none of them made any eye contact with him or anyone else. They didn't demonstrate any interest in the world around them aside from their particular task at hand. If they could even speak, Critias could not tell. They never did it with each other. The surgically corrected ghouls invariably lacked even a hint of genuine personality. 
they were complicated science experiments that served as automated slaves. All of them unhesitatingly carried out their programmed tasks, working skillfully and yet without demonstrating any form of interactive intelligence as with real watchers. At first, Critias thought that it was all to their good fortune that the surgically modified ghouls seemed to be mostly harmless domestic servants. It was possible they didn't even know how to use weapons or attack anyone. Dr. Abrero apart from being a surgical genius, also seemed to have a refined taste for the aesthetics. All his nurses had appropriate uniforms as did the soldiers and janitorial types. It was a cunning operation that the mad doctor had built for himself. As his work steadily progressed over the following years, it would be hard to say just how large and capable an empire of the damned he could assemble around himself. He would have thousands of immortal and obedient ghoul soldiers to do his bidding. The next interesting thing that Critias saw was his first assault rifle armed soldier ghoul on patrol about the place. The gun-toting ghouls also had helmets and soldierly uniforms. It remained unclear how much tactical thinking they were capable of or how it was they selected anyone as an enemy worth shooting. Critias and his companions were undoubtedly total strangers to the soldier ghouls. The patrols did not look them over or take notice of their weapons. Like all the other meat androids that milled about the place, the soldier ghouls just didn't seem to be there mentally. Even ordinary wild ghouls were curious and observant. The surgically modified minions were both improved in their capacity to perform complex tasks and yet tragically handicapped at the same time, having what amounted to a total inability to independently form a single want or desire. They had less personal initiative than was to be found in potted plants. Verloc asked, what is it that you do here for Dr. Abrero? I perform his routine daily training experiments, Tongo freely revealed. The Watcher had a friendly attitude about Verloc and wanted to impress her with his interactive tour. Their programming becomes permanent if everything happened just right. Since they were near to the training hall anyway, Tongo decided to just show them. He led them to a former therapy gymnasium where ten of the soldier minions had already gathered. The soldiers all appeared to be in good working order punctuated by a janitorial minion that was in there and had apparently lost its mind. It was having a malfunction of some type that left it standing inertly in rigid catatonia. The creature remained in a dusty-eyed stare, blissfully mindless while standing upright. Verloc was about to inquire about that pathetic thing, but Gridia speed her to it when he asked Tongo, what is wrong with that one? They are all a work in progress, Tongo explained away so routine a stumble in the overall project. The watcher pulled up the janitor's scrub blouse to expose a mechanical patch-like device that grafted into the ghoul's abdomen. In the old world, the machine would have delivered automated insulin injections. There was no telling what new ghoul potion alchemy was in its syringes at the moment. Tongo pressed the correct button to administer the injection of that mysterious chemical concoction. A lack of urgency indicated that they had some time before the drug would have full effect. As the medication worked its way towards the ghoul's surgically modified brain. Tongo removed headphones from the ghoul's front pocket and then fitted them in place on its head. Once so adorned, Tongo played the recording from a digital audio gadget that was also to be found in the ghoul's breast pocket. The earphones started to play music. Tongo explained with some considerable pride, Dr. Abrero was using visual triggers, these cards he held up for them to see. I came up with the idea of using music instead. When they hear their song, it gets kind of stuck in their head. After a bit, the music volume lowered and Tongo's voice began to speak as an additional audio track. He was telling the ghoul what he liked to do with his day. It began with his morning duties of getting a mop bucket of hot soapy water and then mopping that wing of the hospital. Based on the injector device, the audio player, and having witnessed a ghoul slave lose all motivation, Critias guessed that the drug made them manually awake enough to absorb a purpose by auditory suggestion. Without being told what to think, they no longer thought anything at all. Critias imagined that a more continuous dosing from that same drug might make the ghouls even more self-aware. He saw the possibility that Tongo and Wilson also had drug injectors concealed under their clothes, ones that gave them much higher doses, allowing them to be fully functional watchers. If Dr. Abrero turned off their medication supply, they might revert back to utterly oblivious paralytics. For the moment, Critias could only speculate. Tongo confidently diagnosed the janitor minion, this one just needs a few more minutes to get back into the game. He is a newer one. It can take them some time to fully rewire from the surgery. If you know what the person did in real life, it works even better. Dr. Abrero has a whole team of former doctors and nurses who assist him in his surgery. Critias asked about the small army of guards who just stood around like they awaited something. What about these guys? The doctor asked me to experiment with training this group all together as a unit. Tongo detailed his work. If they see others around them staying on track. It helps to reinforce the mission and prevent slippage. I have special music I use just for programming this group. Like I said, 
It helps when the Harakeshi beat that gets stuck in their head. Verloc noticed that the otherwise barren room did have a stereo music system set up on a portable folding table. The blatancy of it was proof that Tonga used the stereo for something. She asked, are we going to get a demonstration? Tongu got a lot of joy out of getting to show off his profession to some sympathetic guests. He produced a handheld remote control gadget that simultaneously activated all the injector implants for that whole platoon of soldier minions. As though awaking from collective daydreaming, the uniformed ghouls became aware of the environment. Another remote control allowed Tongu to start the music playing. His preferred sounds were mostly bass beats in the gangster rap tradition of his era. Some of the soldier ghouls readily recalled their past conditioning such that they began to do a kind of soft shoe footstep code dancing to the beat. The reminder of seeing others doing the dance inspired even more of the platoon to join in. Tongo thought he was the best of the foot talkers, and he did have a talent for it. Verloc gave Tongo sufficient opportunity to fairly represent his skills. That was when she showed him how it was really done. Mid-coast, she declared her home turf. We dropped it like this. Verloc's footwork had a greater pimp style. A perfect synthesis of East and West Coast urban flair with a dash of the Chicago Midwest gangsters. Verloc had a tango so enthralled with his watcher enthusiasm for urban music and dance, that Critias realized that their guide would never notice his absence. Dosh was first to recognize Critias as intentions. He discreetly recruited Professor Carnicky. They stood together as a visual screen. Critias quietly stepped back out into the main hallway. He would explore the university hospital on his own without anyone noticing he was gone. Despite his lack of scientific knowledge, Critias was curious about ghoul medicine. He grasped the idea of the surgeries. Carving them up was one thing, beyond that, ghouls were different than natural humans in significant ways. Ghouls were immune to bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. They could not bleed to death. Furthermore, the mitochondrial scale elaboration that was the infection populating their cells, regenerated, repaired, and otherwise upgraded their host. It begged the question as to what a ghoul could possibly need a hospital for at all. Once a surgery was over, a burrow could dump them in the nearest sewer and it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference as to their recovery. Tongo had shown them the training side of the project. Critias wanted to know what all the nurses were for and finding out was not a challenge. The nurses had their human memories and skills. What their corrective surgery had not restored was their ability to desire anything. They were incapable of wanting to look at Critias, take any interest in him, or care what he did. When a female nurse exited the room, Critias went to that doorway to explore inside. What he discovered had a profoundly unsettling impact on him. Once again, Critias lacked the scientific knowledge to really understand what he was looking at, but he could make sufficiently educated guesses. Dr. Abrero had captured a watcher child. Since that as yet unseen Abrero was into watchers, Critias didn't believe the child he looked at was of the feral common infected variety. The large medical tube down the girl's throat was presumably for force feeding her. Everything about the situation indicated it was a long-term care situation like for a comanose patient. The watcher girl was not interactive. Critias assumed that massively intrusive brain surgery Abrero had done on her had inflicted permanent brain death. A mechanical clamp held her head tightly in place, with anchor screws going down into the skull bones. Two stainless steel tubular probe shafts pierced into the girl's head, probably going deep into the core of the brain. From the layman's perspective, the doctor nourished her body waiting for the regeneration to restore brain tissue, and then he would return to extract it all over again by inserting a harvesting probe down inside the brain tubes. All of that wasn't the issue that disturbed Critias. His whole world came into focus in a way that he could only describe as enlightenment. It involved the ghouls and the watchers. It involved surgical zombie slaves, androids, and his wife Carmen. It involved Jim wanting to perpetuate humanity and not replace it with immortal watcher humans. It involved all the ghouls he had killed and their ongoing plans to slaughter millions in the near future, both in the city of Woe and back home. Was it wrong for Dr. Abrero to kidnap a sentient watcher child and then perform heinous medical atrocity on her in the name of saving the world? Was it wrong for Critias to go ahead with his plans to destroy massive numbers of ghouls while at the same time prosecute Abrero for crimes against one infected child? The hypocrisy of his own existence was entirely obvious. How far was Critias prepared to go in to accomplish what? Everything about his life was a farcical contravention that he held together by lying to himself. He had seen all that he needed. Critias left that room to seek out another. To no surprise, he found a male watcher child with metal tubes in his clamped head. Dr. Abrero clearly ran some kind of farm where he used children as the cattle. Critias had encountered watcher children before. He fully understood that they experienced joy and fear, trust and betrayal. 
they had suffered an atrocity nightmare of terror and agony getting where they ended up. Critias needed to reevaluate the meaning of life itself. He had reached his crossroads. For the moment, all Critias could do was swear an oath, I'll make Dr. Abrero pay for doing this to you. On his way out to return to the training room, Critias heard a creaking sound that seemed to come from the air conditioning vent on the wall. Without any of his enhanced senses because his mech suit was in blackout mode, he couldn't be sure if it was important. He was in no position to do anything about it anyway, so he kept going. Once he was back with the others, Critias saw the soldiers dancing in perfect synchronicity. It wasn't that the android ghouls were imitating Tongo. They remembered their lessons from previous sessions and could call upon that learning on command. The value of the work was obvious enough to Critias. The android ghouls could forage, clean up bodies, or operate the pumping equipment at Fort Blood. It was conceivable to keep making more android ghouls, give them claw hammers, and then just set them loose smashing in the skulls of every wild ghoul they encountered. It was only his future knowledge that helped Critias see the truth of it all. On some level, humanity would try and do exactly that. The end result would be for humanity to flee into orbital space. Humanity would hide there from unknown thousands of fully intelligent and ambitious watchers who ruled the Earth now, and would continue to rule it for centuries to come. Any uninfected human attempt to cleanse the planet was going to encounter their violent opposition. The truth was a secret back in the time of Critias because if the people knew, they would all want to become watchers themselves, escape death and disease, and then live forever. Dark watchers would blow up factories, collapse bridges, or perform whatever sabotage they required to preserve their own immortal existence. Android ghouls had a future, a great future, as Carmen and Kevin proved, but that future was not to restore the Earth, at least not yet. If anything, recent experience had opened Critias's eyes to the greater truth. He saw that the purpose of human life, its meaning, was simply the game itself. The journey not the destination was the true religion. If mankind did not continue on as an honorable, heroic, and unavoidably tragic morality tale, it had no reason to continue at all. The struggle was the meaning of life. Mankind would continue, but not as assholes who farmed little kids as meat byproduct factories. Mankind would not continue on as monsters. Humans would never embrace the horror as their means of escape. Men would aspire to be angels or they must fail and bravely go extinct with dignity intact. Critias was going to personally see that happen, one way or the other. Chapter 15 Eichmann Sanction Alice was in the pancake house garage the next morning. Her Delta mech suit helmet with its virtual reality HUD applications, telecommunications, and enhanced senses put her centuries ahead of the primitive smartphones everyone else had to assist them. The gear keeping her so informed and connected, in addition to her meager past accomplishments, had earned Alice the position of being Sally Headshot's personal assistant. Her status did not however earn her an invitation to join the planning session going on around a table nearby. Various command level officers hovered over a higher resolution satellite map of their city. They debated how they were going to clear out the crowded rail yard just south of the castle. It was over three dozen railway storage lanes packed side by side, a giant striped oval area right along the river. Fat Jack was committed to clearing out the entire rail yard of its old traffic. They needed the space so that Duke could drop off valuable cars, ones that would gradually make their way into the castle tunnel for unloading. Alice overheard enough of their conversation to realize that the eventual solution would be dangerous, brazen, and quite honestly not at all ingenious. Duke's overwhelming problems inherent in the clearing of railroad cars from the locomotive gauge tracks had not resolved themselves. The difficulty of doing that work in their city was generally worse owing to the high population of local infected. Alice had learned from her parents and her HUD games that she should solve monumental problems with innovative methods, not brutal determination. When Alice needed genius battlefield strategy, she knew just who to call first. Carmen answered Alice's call by projecting a hologram of herself into Alice's view. As soon as they were together, Carmen felt guilty about being away. That mess with Jam and Tony still weighed on her mind. Carmen had been the one who put them together in the first place. That Alice had to be the one to clean up the mess only made her feel worse. I'm sorry about leaving you behind to fix all the problems I made, Carmen apologized. You blame yourself too much, mother, Alice replied somewhat sternly. It isn't right for you to beat yourself up every time one of us does something stupid. And Jam needs to apologize to you, not you to her. I'm proud of the work you are doing. Since time was of the essence, Alice got to business. I called you because I need your help. It was my pushing that has forced Aunt Jam to go back out onto the rails. She has to clear the old rail cars out of that big rail yard just south of the castle. We need that yard, and others too. 
they are for storage as they clear the track going out to reach you. I am listening to them talking about it right now, and they don't have a good plan for doing it right. I'm worried that they will just wing it. You always have great plans. We really need your help. It's not safe, Carmen said as a kind of refusal, as though it would just cancel the risky operation. Nothing we do is safe, Alice countered in terms that were equally obvious. Alice's simple comment reminded Carmen of what Gloria had told her. Jim hadn't given the black hole to Gloria because he wanted her to keep it safe. The airship was a tool for foraging and it was always in danger. Gloria was the person Jim wanted in command when things were at their worst. The dangerous railyard mission was going to happen regardless. Carmen could feel guilty about her plan getting one of them hurt, or she could feel guilty when that happened anyway after she didn't help them at all. Carmen would help them and then hope for the best. She told Alice, putting aside my general trepidations for attempting it at all, I do have some ideas. In a nutshell, you need that rail yard clear of all infected so that you can have the freedom to unlock the brakes on all the old rail cars. If at all possible, you want to accomplish that in a way that keeps the mess down to a minimum. It sounded to Alice like there was hope, that is exactly what we need. How do we do it? First of all, Carmen began laying out a plan, you need to remind them that the weak eyed devil and the omniate grinders are both fully operational. At the moment, they are hesitant to start them up because it is uncertain if they will be able to stop once they do. Alice thought that too, once we start, the ghouls would never stop coming. Carmen disagreed, that is not actually true. The infected are interested in people, not machinery. If it was otherwise, they would not need Kenny at all. You can bring Kenny back down in the same way you would get him up onto Amiot in the first place. With a little common sense, it won't be a problem to orchestrate. Alice considered what she had heard so far. She realized that if she used the grinder, they would need the storage cars inside the tunnel to collect the soup. With that in mind, she got an inspiration. We have a second locomotive we can use now, Alice offered as a possible advantage. The Commodore sent us a switch engine for moving things around near the castle. It isn't very fast, but it is really strong for hauling things. You will need to use it, Carmen agreed with the notion. Explain to Jack that he needs to shuffle jam strain around. That will be the only way to get the new water cannon moved out of the pancake house and loaded onto a flat car. Once he has it loaded, Jamstrain can push it outside through the south rail gate. From there, you can use that switch engine the Commodore gave you to move the flat car with the sprayer over to the rail yard. Alice knew about the new water cannon. The mechanics had built it for use during the Texas operation. It didn't look like a water cannon. It was actually a huge shrouded turbine fan that seemed a lot more like a jet engine. By injecting water into that turbine, the water stream that came out could blast down ghouls from gunshot distances away. The machine's design had originally been for fighting oil field fires or something like that. If the idea worked in Texas, Jam's train would be able to wash tens of thousands of infected right off the pier and into the ocean. Those ghouls would be unable to do anything other than sink. The low body fat of ghouls made them poor floaters. Based on the information thus far, Alice asked, You want me to spray the ghouls with river water? That didn't seem all that useful to her. Carmen's hologram shook her head no, not river water, aqueous solution sodium hydroxide. Alice had no clue what that was, but she did understand well enough to know that she would need a lot of it. A jet engine water gun was a real thirsty machine. She reasoned, that water cannon needs a lot of liquid. In Texas they would feed it with an ocean. Where would I get swimming pools of that sodium hydroxide stuff you said? That was the good news that Carmen had for her. You can find all that you need just past the southern end of that rail yard. The old world routinely transported sodium hydroxide in water solution aboard tanker rail cars. There are dozens of them already there waiting for you. The mechanics have all the plumbing hoses and attachments that you will need. Everything we used in building the water cannon is neoprene and steel. It will work just fine for sodium hydroxide. Alice guessed, so that stuff is dangerous. Extremely dangerous, Carmen confirmed with marked seriousness. Your Delta armor is resistant to it. They have hazmat suits there for the people going with you. If you use the water cannon to mist that whole rail yard with the sodium hydroxide, I promise you that the ghouls will leave that area in a hurry. They won't come back until the rain washes it away and makes it safe for them again. When in contact with organic tissue, it is agonizingly corrosive. There was a part that Alice didn't get. How do I hook up the tanker to the water cannon when I need the water cannon to scare the ghouls out of the rail yard in the first place? It won't be easy, Carmen replied without a ready answer. I know that you will find it easier to work on one car with ghouls around it than you would working on the brakes of hundreds. When Alice just waited for more, Carmen made up something, 
I would use a smoke generator and some tear gas. Your Delta armor and helmet would allow you to see and breathe safely. The hazmat suits would protect the people with you. That would keep you safe for long enough to get the sprayer operational. It would be wise for you to practice attaching the plumbing fittings before doing it for real. I need a good plumber, Alice planned aloud. With gas and smoke all over the place, I could stand guard and keep them safe. That sounds like a good plan, Carmen agreed. A good railcar plumber is one who can wear a hazmat suit, all but blind in the smoke and tear gas, while hundreds of hungry ghouls rush all around in every direction. Alice knew what it meant to be afraid. She had lived through the things that happened in Denver, salt back the hunter, and riding on the ghoul grinder. She didn't think of herself as courageous just because she was willing to do something so dangerous. Alice had a hierarchy of fear that didn't rate hiding from ghouls in smoke as being the worst thing that could happen to her. I know someone who could do that job, Alice said about her action duty plumber. To get a better understanding of how it all worked, Alice tested her grasp of the plan thus far. After I spray the rail yard with that chemical, it will burn the ghouls and make them run away. Since it won't burn anyone wearing a protective suit, we would have the place to ourselves. Because Carmen didn't disagree with any of that, Alice suggested. Maybe I could spray that stuff even further out around the rail yard. That would keep the ghouls even further away. I would try and keep them out of visual range, Carmen suggested to encourage that idea. If you do a good job spraying, all the ghouls will evacuate the area. They won't want to be breathing the mist any more than they want to be rolling around in it. They will be stirred up though, Alice realized. That is what the grinders will be for. Once the ghouls are out of the rail yard, we would be free to sneak around in there and get all the brake work done quietly. The infected would never know we were around until it was time to pull the cars out. At that point, it wouldn't matter, and they would burn their feet if they even tried. It all came together for Alice how it could work. She said, this is like the poison sewer gas on the river. It scared them out of that whole town. They couldn't get away fast enough. It can just as easily get you a whole rail yard to yourself, Carmen approved of the plan. If you have the right outer suits on, you can safely work in it. When it succeeds this time. You can just do it again in these other places that Jack wants to clear. Alice loved the plan and knew that the others would need to hear it right away if they were to act on it properly. Thank you, Alice told her gratefully. Carmen offered, if you need any additional help, you can always call me back. Sally Hedshaw turned away from the commander's planning session to check her cell phone. Alice had sent her a text message as a way of covertly introducing her ideas. For her part. Sally had no interest in taking credit for the plan or for gradually introducing viable options. She just called over to Alice, if you have a better idea, let's hear it. Now is not the time to be shy. If what you think is stupid, we can always just tell you no. Alice stepped up since everyone was staring at her. She indicated the nearby jet sprayer, you should use that. If you put it on a flat car and get it out the south gate, you can push it with the new switch engine. Using the satellite map and guided by her HUD info frames, Alice pointed out the place, that rail yard has a bunch of these tankers that are carrying aqueous solution sodium hydroxide. The water cannon can use that as its fuel. We will all wear suits to keep us safe when that stuff burns the skin off all the ghouls. When the infected go crazy with the pain, we grind them up with omniot. After you take Kenny back down, the ghouls would lose interest because they don't want to eat machinery. Jam, Stig, and Derek glanced back and forth at each other, Fat Jack and Sally. Derek said. The sprayer and Amit are both ready to go. You could get Kenny up and down through the ladder tube we installed from the groundskeeper's shed. And we have the hoses we need to hook up to a tanker. Alice added, I was thinking a smoke generator and some tear gas would be enough to cover us while we hooked it up. Jack looked at her, We? You were thinking about going out there for this? My armor protects me from chemicals and gases, Alice reminded him. I would be one of the few people who could even see through the smoke to provide the cover for the plumber. I was thinking we have the lion do it. If we don't even tell him what this is about, and just show him how to hook up the hose, he would not have to think about anything else. He is really good at that, you know, doing one thing no matter what. Jam suggested, we could use Ray's caboose to pull in a flat car. Either way, I need to clear my train out of the tunnel for you to load up the water cannon. Moving my train is nothing compared to the problems we would have wrenching all those brakes out in the trail yard. By the way they all had a positive vibe about Alice's plan. It became clear that they were unanimous about running with it. Jack asked Derek, you said the Amiot feeder bridge is ready? All done, Derek confirmed it. I double checked all the welds myself. We are just waiting on the rail crane to come back for setting it up. Since I'm going out anyway, Jam told them. Bringing the crane back is no extra ordeal for me. 
Go ahead and grab it then, Jack told her. If we are going to test the Amiot grinder, I would like the bridge in place to make sure it all performs as anticipated. Sally asked Alice, are you certain you can guard Christopher while he attaches the plumbing for the jet washer? Absolutely, Alice confirmed it honestly. Go round up a crew then, Sally commanded her. I will give them final approval. Be sure to get someone who knows how to operate the sprayer. After you get it functional, someone will need to aim it. Colonel Flash took Pike, Tony Banjo, and his two crewmates along with her when she went out on her locomotive. They took the whole train with them to leave the old garage tunnel empty. Jam eventually returned without incident, delivering the rail crane and the flat car for the jet sprayer. Jack took Sheriff Clyde with him when he went out to operate the crane. The railway crane had an enclosed cab that could provide cramped living space accommodations for two, if needed during an emergency. It had enough supplies to keep them self-sufficient for up to five days if the operators ever found themselves trapped inside. After a forklift delivered the bridge to the north rail gate, Jack used the crane to expertly lift the finished feeding bridge for the Amiot grinder into place. One end of the new span anchored upon the uppermost roadway deck at the top of the Oak River buttress, from there it crossed over to the park grounds corner balcony that had the installed Amiot grinder that was ready to begin devouring ghouls. Victims could only enter the Amiot grinder's enormous tub by a pedestrian ramp that sloped up on its western side. Ghouls could reach the patio deck at the base of the ramp from two directions. One route came in from the north along the new bridge that Jack just positioned with the railway crane. The other route came up the balcony's existing concrete stairway that connected to the footpaths of the park grounds to the south. From the patio deck, ghouls could only reach the grinder's tub with its human bait perch above it, after they had passed through an arch gateway that was midway up the feeding ramp. The gateway had an old world security metal detection system as might come from an airport terminal or a courthouse. Incoming ghouls could set off its alarm system by possessing a forbidden quantity of metal. If a ghoul had something like an artificial metal joint or had one wrist wearing an old set of police handcuffs, the security detector would flag them as an intolerable risk to the grinder's hammer mill machinery. Those rejects would receive an immediate and forceful bludgeoning from an overhead windmill of paddles. The high speed and deliberately violent process would eject the offender out of the feeding queue. The direction of the rejected ghouls was onto a metal slide that would dump them off the balcony to land on the waterfront street far down below. Ideally, Jack would eventually park a dumpster on that roadway to catch those rejected ghouls, but barring that, a front loader could come along later to scrape them off the pavement. In any case, they didn't expect the total number of rejects to be all that great. While the crane work was underway, Derek and Bohr supervised crews that loaded the water cannon on the flat car with the muscle of two forklifts. There were finishing details that they had to contend with like bolting it all down and installing the fuel system for the engine. Lastly, they installed an artificial fog smoke generator. One of its reservoirs was for the non-toxic smoke. A second contained tear gas. If the operator desired, they could use both compounds at the same time to create a combination obscuration and area denial irritant in one. Alice got the plumbers to put together some spare parts that could simulate the fluid tanker they would be connecting into. They were the same type of rail cars that the grinder soup system filled, so the plumbers had no problem providing all the right couplings. Captain Christopher had unhesitatingly agreed to go with Alice on the mission. She had the outfitters dress him up in the full hazmat gear that he would need for the operation. Once properly attired, Christopher practiced in the railway tunnel. He had to negotiate the flat car's boarding ladder while moving the large flexible hose and then make the connection. After the hose was in place, he would use a wrench to open the flow valve. Yet he proved eager as always to take part in a volunteer hot zone action adventure. His job would be to help Christopher navigate the boarding ladder and dispense the heavy transfer hose. The turbine water cannon operated off a set of joysticks and buttons that attached to a long cable. Likewise, the controls for the smoke generator were remote enough from the actual machine that the operator could be safely inside the shunter locomotive that would be moving the flat car. Blue and Danny the ear from the Starlight Squad volunteered to join them. While Blue would be aboard the switch engine manning the controls for the water cannon and smoke generator, Danny would ride along aboard the flat car as armed security. The last position was perhaps the most difficult and dangerous. Alice needed someone willing to climb atop the tanker car to open the ventilation hatch. Vacuum pressure would prevent them from pumping out the tanker's liquid contents while it remained closed. Ambassador Darla from the Nelly Riverboat had already been interested in following Yeti outside. She volunteered to open the ventilation hatch. Sally Hatchot watched Alice and her team rehearse the operation in the garage tunnel to prove that they could pull it off. Once satisfied, she radioed to Commodore Tinney's engineer. Sally told him to drive his new switch engine locomotive to the castle so that he could connect to the water cannon flat car. Before setting out, 
Alice thought it best to give a pep talk to her team. You are all people I know I can trust, she told them. We have worked together before and know each other. Jack is letting me do this because it is not even dangerous. The only risk is making a mistake and we're not going to do that. We are all in radio contact and I will call out the steps as we go along. She checked with the Commodore's engineer who didn't wear a hazmat suit. Do you have everything you need to work in the gas fumes? The man nodded boldly as he said, I have a positive pressure air system. No exterior atmosphere will ever come inside. It will last a lot longer than your own oxygen bottles. I'm ready for this. Alice instructed, on the first pass, we will fill the rail yard with our tear smoke. We lure away as many of the infected as we can while we continue down south. Once we come back, we connect to the tanker and start spraying. We first get them away from where we are, and then we clean out the entire rail yard. Since I have the gear for seeing through the smoke, I will do all the track switches and connect the air pressure lines. Colonel Flash came over to tell them, I will let you know when I have my train back in the tunnel. We need to get the flow system connected before we can start up the grinder. We estimate that you can use the water cannon for about 10 minutes before we start up the omnit. Jack had some advice for Alice. One side of the rail yard is along the river. None of the ghouls will be coming at you from that direction, but they might go that way to escape. Think about where you are spraying that chemical. You don't want to box them in around you. The goal here is to drive them out, not trap them inside. To prove that she understood, Alice replied, when you let me know the grinder is ready. We will spray a barrier across the south end and then drive them out moving north. Stig cautioned everyone, in small numbers, the infected have been willing to crawl under the new land bridge. We have never tested pushing a whole tribe in that direction. They can't get through at the paddle boat dock, and the bridge is continuous from the castle to Radio City. At the very least, we need to shut down the bridge and close the gates, in case we lose a section. Fat Jack used his phone to call Kevin's control room. He had them send out a 20-minute warning that they would be locking down the bridge during the calling operation. Anyone who needed to use it, had to hurry along. Since all was in readiness, Alice ceremoniously asked Jack, Grand Marshal, do I have permission to begin the operation? Let's get this done, Jack told her. Because their smoke generator was at the rear end of the flat car, their engineer had a clear view going forward on the trip out to the rail yard. The first thing that Alice realized was that the overall scale of the spaces involved were much bigger than they had seemed in the satellite photo. While it was true that the smoke generator made an impressively thick white fog, it didn't obscure much of anything besides their little train. She estimated that it was about a half mile from the castle park grounds to the near end of the rail yard they wanted. The rail yard itself was about one mile long. Just over a half mile past the rail yard was the factory complex that had maybe 60 tankers of that aqueous solution sodium hydroxide. As best Alice could figure it, the rail yard was about 30 miles of rail all tightly packed together. At least a third of it had old cars sitting on it. If she didn't do everything just right on their first try, the plan was not going to work. They already had an open track that their trains used when going south. It passed along the riverside edge of the rail yard. They smoked it up real good as they made their way past, but none of that smoke went any further into the rail yard than the first wall of boxcars. Ghouls were already screaming of course. The switch engine was plenty loud and obviously a human contraption worthy of their ravenous interest. In the way that their smoke trail attracted ghouls to their location rather than disguising it, Alice got her next inspiration. She radioed to Blue, start adding in the tear gas to the smoke. Kevin had not provided them with gentle anti-hippy tear gas either. It was the inhumane variety that would take any normal human out of a riot with even a small exposure. For the ghouls, it couldn't kill them and they couldn't suffocate, not even while drowning in water but it did render them totally blind and burned their lungs like they had inhaled acid. Once they got a whiff of that, the infected were really howling, but it was the agony warning kind of screams, not the sort that summoned in more for a feast. The teardrop shaped constriction at the rail yards far southern and passed between large factory and warehouse buildings to either side. That choke point proved to be ideal for laying down a thick impassable wall of tear gas smoke that no pursuer could possibly bypass. As the moment approached for hooking onto their aqueous solution sodium hydroxide tanker, the engineer radioed, I will slow down and then stop. You have to jump off and then throw the turnout switch so that we can back in there to get your tanker. The man instructed her slowly and clearly so there would be no mistake, the point machine that controls the turnout doesn't have electric power anymore. You will have to use the hand throw lever. It won't move until you remove the locking pin. I left you a set of master keys and a little box on the end of your flat car. I advise you to hurry. If not for Carmen's help, 
Alice would have been terrified right about then, it was kind of strange in the way that fighting ghouls seemed easy compared to having to think clearly and deal with unfamiliar machines. That was why she had picked the king's lion for hooking up the transfer hose. It took a focused mind to work among ghouls, which was far more difficult than the instinct-driven necessity to just fight them. The switch engine slowed and then finally stopped. Being in one place let the smoke generator really pour it on. The whole vicinity just went to a tear gas infused whiteout. Her Delta helmet let Alice see through the smoke when nothing else could. Night vision goggles were just as useless as normal sight. Only infrared wavelength perception could penetrate the concealment fog. She found the little key box just as the engineer had promised, magnetically clamped onto the end of the flat car. There were a lot of keys for her to choose from. It wasn't a problem because a Carmen generated HUD info frame told her which key it was that she really wanted. The point machine that controlled the turnout switch had an armored plastic box that was low to the ground beside the rail. An info frame showed Alice where to find the lock and the key opened it just as it should. Once the locking pin rod popped out and a clear display of being open, Alice moved on to the hand throw lever. To her dismay, Alice found that it was not one lever but two. Thankfully, more info frame assistance from Carmen showed her that the shorter lever was a selector switch. Alice moved that one first to the position her info frame suggested. With that done, she hefted over the larger lever next. Alice really had to put her back into it, and she was glad she had her mech suit gauntlets to help her. She needed to crank on the lever to get the turnout into its new position. All her aggressive determination kept Alice inconspicuous in mind just as the smoke made her invisible in body. With her work complete, she glanced about to see maybe 30 infected were close enough for her to shoot at them if she desired. The ghouls were sightless, in pain, and totally furious. They had no clue that Alice was even there much less where she was at. Since the ghouls were at a total loss as to what to attack or where to go, they mostly just cringed and howled while they blindly swiped at the foggy air around them. It was an enlightening moment for Alice as she understood firsthand what grave walking was all about. Just because she could see a ghoul, did not mean she needed to shoot it. Like Cutter always said, they were just naked dummies. If a person understood their inner workings, a grave walker could often just ignore the infected. As Alice started up the flat car's boarding ladder, she radioed to the engineer, you are good to go. Smoke continued to spew from their generator, which made everyone but Alice blind as could be. The engineer hooped into the tanker car by feel alone. It was rather obvious when they banged into it and the couplers made it. Since she could see, Alice went down the ladder first. She kept a watch out while Yeti helped Christopher climb down and then start moving his transfer hose. Darla had an aluminum ladder that she used to bridge her way from the flat car to the top of the tanker. She would never go to ground at all. By climbing along the ladder, she would get up there to open the ventilation hatch. Just as Carmen had promised, the tear gas in the smoke was a combination problem that ghouls couldn't doubt to it. Alice didn't think actual normal people would have been able to do any better. Being blind twice over and in terrible pain was enough to throw anyone off of their game. Alice used her pistol to silently shoot two ghouls who were too close for comfort. Captain Christopher hauled the hose over to start hooking it up while she watched over him. The lion could only see to about the length of his own arms. That was just enough for him to do his assigned task, just not anything else. Once Alice was certain that no other ghouls were anywhere nearby, she followed info frame instructions to hook up the tanker's air brake hoses. The lion finished his job and then returned to the boarding ladder where Yeti waited to help him back up. All Alice had left to do then was to run down to the end of the tanker car. She shifted the long decoupling lever rod while the engineer rolled forward a bit. Their captured tanker car pulled freely without any mechanical problems. It came away from the string of them it had sat coupled onto. The air hoses to the disconnected car popped loose on their own with a hiss of escaping pressure. Alice dashed back to climb aboard the flat car. Once Yeti had a hold of her to make sure she didn't slip and fall, Alice radioed to the engineer to get them underway again. The engineer moved their little two-car train back out onto the main rail. Alice quickly repeated her procedure with the point machine that controlled the turnout. She moved the selector handle back into the main line position and then pulled the hand throw lever. In the little time she had while their train continued back toward the rail yard, Alice radioed to her whole team so everyone could listen. I want to stop at this near end, she instructed. We will spray down the narrow pass between those huge buildings. A little bit can go a long way, so there is no need to overdo it. After we get them running before us, I will throw the turnout switch to take us all the way up on the side furthest from the river. That is where they parked all those locomotive engines, but not a lot of other cars. We spray as far out as we can while we go all the way down. That way no new ghouls can get into the rail yard. After we get to the other end, we just turn around and roll back, 
spraying toward the river this time, to chase them out from the inside, pushing them toward the water. When we run out of juice, we get rid of this tanker and then go pick up another. Blue radioed, this turbofan is going to blow our smoke away. If you guys are not careful, it is going to blow you right off that flat car. Turn off the smoke, Alice commanded. We will stay low and away from the water gun. Just make sure you keep it pointed in the right direction. The cow turbine did not need any fluid to operate as a wind generator. Injecting fluid into its central nozzle was an independent feature. Their driver complained, we have too many of them chasing us for me to slow down. Test it out on them. Blue warned everyone, move to the end of the flat car. I will start spraying behind us to clear our backs and then saturate the choke point at this end of the rail yard. He rotated the turbine as a turret. Once Blue had it pointed in a safe direction, he started up its engine. All the commands came from his control box safely inside the switch locomotive. The turbine was not that loud compared to the train. Its size was not so great that the wind it generated was any danger unless someone stepped directly next to it. Blue switched on the fluid pump, pressurized the system, and then added some aqueous solution sodium hydroxide to the turbine fan by pressing a trigger. The cannon did an admirable job of keeping its projection in a narrow stream. It stayed together long enough to arch over the top of the switch engine and then go off into the distance. The liquid content of the jet became a mist before reaching the ground. In effect, it was not altogether different than spray from a giant pressure washer fed by a garden hose. Those ghouls chasing after their little train promptly got wet from the discharge. The first noticeable result was the oddly remarkable way it cleaned the dirt and grime off their filthy bodies. After a few seconds of exposure, the caustic chemical reaction started to dissolve their skin, and their eyes in particular. All those ghouls that took a direct hit from Blue's turbine blast of aqueous solution sodium hydroxide, went down shrieking in unbearable agony. Every other infected beyond the immediate range, either breathed in a damp mist, got lightly spritzed, or both. That was enough to stop them in their tracks and then make them flee for safety. Perhaps human bait like Kenny could lure infected into a swimming pool of the chemical, but nothing less would ever make them consider it. Everywhere Blue sprayed, it wetted the ground with a lasting deterrent. Any ghouls that tried to walk there, would have the flesh dissolve right off their feet. If Alice and her teammates hadn't been wearing protective hazardous environment suits, they certainly would not survive in that deadly environment. With that initial test a resounding success, their train moved on. Blue hosed down the whole choke point at the south end of the rail yard. Once that was sufficient, he turned his aim eastward at a high arc to begin airbrushing the landscape in that direction with caustic soda. Now experienced with the point machine turnout switches, Alice quickly dismounted and then opened the track she wanted for taking them around the western edge of the rail yard. Not one ghoul tried to stop her when she went out there to work. While Alice was so close to her train, the pernicious mist drifted well ahead of them in the light breeze. It was no longer possible for a ghoul to get anywhere near them without coming into contact with the corrosive chemical agent. Hug applications that Carmen provided kept Alice abreast of the rate at which they consumed their reservoir of sodium hydroxide. Once Alice realized how far one tanker of it would get them, she contacted their engineer in the shunter. We need to reverse and drive back when halfway across the rail yard, Alice updated everyone. Her message was mostly for their driver, but also for Blue who aimed the turbine blaster. On the return trip, fill in the upper west section. Do what you can to chase the ghouls down toward the river. We should have just enough left to give us some cover when we hook up another full tanker. The work progressed without any problems. A second tanker load of the chemical was enough for them to wet down the southern half of the rail yard. Their little train made for a perplexing adversary that the ghoul's simple collective intelligence was unable to overcome. At all times, some of the infected screamed for a mass attack, many more ghouls howled in pain as their skin melted off. Hundreds of them were totally blind because the chemical had burned their eyes. So much commotion couldn't help but summon up thousands of infected from around the nearby city. Since it was in their nature to avoid traps by not approaching ghouls in pain, they moved around the sprayed ground. It was also in their nature to move closer to feeder calls so they did keep congregating in the general area. Alice was attentive to their progress and eager to improve their methods whenever possible. She understood that blinding the ghouls was not nearly as helpful as driving them away. With that in mind, she had Blue concentrate on misting the ground rather than trying to shoot directly into mast infected. By their third tanker of chemical, Alice had them finish wetting down the whole western side opposite from the river. They had already sprayed the southern approach. Nothing remained for the ghouls but to retreat to the north toward the castle. It was that or suffer the agony of their skin melting off. Seeing that they finally had the upper hand, Alice radioed to Fajak that he should begin his grinder operation. On her next push, their train would drive out the whole swarming assembly of ghouls and they would have nowhere else to go. 
Kenny was already in his protective gear and waiting in the groundskeeper's shed just below the Amiot grinder. When the Amiot plumbers had connected the discharge pipe, the fresh water and fuel lines, and the electric power cable, they had installed a large diameter vertical steel tube in which to house it all. They had built a simple maintenance ladder going up inside the tube as well. By climbing the ladder, Kenny could get all the way up to his bait perch over Amiot's tub. He opened an oval hatch in the side of the tube and then stepped out onto a simple catwalk leading to his enticement platform. Kenny clipped his safety belt to the perch to make certain he would never fall in once everything was slippery in their blood. He didn't switch on any lights or loudspeakers. That first test would just be bait and the feeding cries of infected as they rushed in to devour him. A simple button push started up the powerful noisy engine. That was enough for nearby ghouls to glance his way, see Kenny exposed, and then rush at him. Things escalated fast as situations with ghouls often did. Kenny held off on engaging the clutch of the hammer mill until he got some good action going. His perch was high enough over the tub that he felt plenty safe while it remained empty and they could not stand atop one another. Kenny had a plastic and aluminum boat tore waiting for him up on the perch. He used it as his weapon when he actively tormented his attackers. They howled for his blood. That fury of homicidal screaming spread outward in a flash. Within seconds, hundreds answered. When eight or nine ghouls leaped and shrieked inside the spacious tub, Kenny engaged the clutch to let the hammer mill have at them. Amiant was far larger and more powerful than the flying purple. The machine ate them up effortlessly, sucking them in like so much slurped hair and strands of spaghetti complete with red tomato paste that was all their gushing blood. Kenny howled with gusto as he invited all comers to try and take him. If any ghoul killer imagined themselves a more fearsome predator than he, Kenny would teach them otherwise. Kenny would reap them by the thousands, the tens of thousands. Before he was done, everyone would know his name, and it would mean something. The tone of the ghoulish voices alone informed Alice when the Amiot grinder had started feeding. Using her telescopic vision, she saw that ghouls off in the distance had turned north to gaze back toward the castle. Many of them moved off that way to investigate. For Alice, that was all the more reason for her team to keep spraying and drive all the ghouls to the north out of the rail yard. A GNP lookout on Radio City reported, I can see a bunch of them now. They have spread out pretty good down there though. Most of them seem to be pushing through the woods over the castle. Over. Another GNP, one stationed on the garden building, he radioed, I can see them crawling under the land bridge here and there. It isn't holding them back any. I'd say we are good. At this rate, we will have that train filled up in no time. Over. That comment got Alice thinking. Her Miss Pepper school lessons in basic math had discussed the filling and unloading of trains. She put her education to the test. Alice used her HUD to contact the computers in Kevin's control room specifically the video security system for the city. She selected the live stream from any cameras that watched the Amiot grinder and Kenny. She saw that it was true. A constant flow of ghouls did go after Kenny and then became soup when they blundered into the grinder's tub. Ghouls on the attack screamed for more reinforcements. The ghouls in the soup didn't scream anything at all anymore. The voices of hundreds of attacking infected totally overwhelmed the small number of agonized cries from those ghouls actively feeling the hammer mill for a few seconds. As far as the city infected were concerned, a food chase was on and they had no reason for hesitation. The isolated approaches to the Amiot grinder did their part. It wasn't possible for enough ghouls to converge on the location simultaneously to overwhelm it. Alice started to count them as they attacked Kenny. A steady line of ghouls came over the bridge from the north. There was another diffused but regular chaos of ghouls that rushed through the wooded park grounds over the castle to get to that high corner patio. She estimated that at least one ghoul per second fell into the tub grinder. Sometimes it was more, but that wasn't really Alice's point as she carefully considered the number. One ghoul per second was 60 per minute, which was 3600 per hour. And Jam's drain could hold around 30,000 ghouls as soup. Alice realized that it might take 8 hours to load the train. Even if it went twice as fast that would still be four hours. Alice text messaged Fab Jack as soon as she realized her situation. Things are going well here. My estimated time for filling the train is four to eight hours. We don't have enough oxygen bottles, please advise. Jack called her directly, you are spraying sodium hydroxide not hydrogen sulfide. There is no poison gas in your situation. It is either a liquid or solid only. Your oxygen breathers are because their suits are closed up and they can't breathe in the mist or the tear gas. Chemistry is really important in ghoul fighting, Alice replied as a sort of confession that smart people deserved respect just like her father Critias repeatedly told her. Chemistry is important in this case, Jack agreed with her. You are right about it taking a while to load the train. The good news is, 
When you stop spraying, your team can just breathe the open air. Commodore Tinny is on his way to join you and he has three additional locomotives in his fleet. When he arrives, Tinny will take command. Your orders are to support him as he removes everything from that yard. Clearing out the ghouls was only the first step. We will keep grinding. Alice suggested, we are actually in the way on this flat car. Blue does not need us standing here while he operates the water gun. You can move off onto the roof of a boxcar while you wait for Tinny, Jack offered. Go ahead and let Blue do his work without you being in his way. Kenny got a bit of a fright when Amiot encountered its first metallic ghoul. The unfortunate creature had metal pins and braces grafted into its bones owing to some automobile accident in mortal life. It was enough to trigger the metal detector in the arch of the feeding ramp. The rotating ejection paddles promptly swung into play to knock the offending ghoul out of the queue. While it did technically work, it didn't happen in any way that the builders had intended. The paddle struck the ghoul, but instead of knocking it away, the tremendous force and speed of it scooped the creature up instead. The ghoul didn't slide off the paddle until it went all the way around in a full rotation. There wasn't room for its body to fit through the framework, so the motion broke most of its bones instead. Two more non-metallic ghouls tried to force their way through, only to have the malfunctioning machine club them too. The paddles worked fine on them, hurling them both out through the rejection gate to then fall multiple stories to hit the street below. The broken ghoul dislodged when it came around again, to fly out the gate and join the other two down on the pavement. When Kenny realized it was only bad news for the ghouls and not an actual breakdown of his operation, he just howled louder for the freaks to come and get him. He was aware that Tommy it could handle a lot more of them at a time than it already ate. The throttle was still in a low position. Down in the castle, Commander Derek heard something banging around in the feeder funnel of the weak hide devil grinder. Many of the infected had visual impairment from the chemical burns and tear gas. Some of them had tripped and fallen into the ant lion pit of the grinder. Unable to climb out on their own, they began to bang around. That was when Derek got the idea to bang back. He slapped on the side of the metal casing and yelled at the ghouls to get their attention. Since it was actually true, the ghouls realized that they had stumbled into some hidden entrance to a human bunker. As those infected started screaming for his blood, more came running to see what was happening. Within moments, more ghouls deliberately leaped into the pit to get at what they believed was cornered human meat. Once it seemed like he had a full load, Derek pressed the start button on the house grinder and then the hammer mill shredded them into wet mush. As passers-by in the castle heard the noise of what was going on, they went to see for themselves. Soon a dozen of them were slapping on the metal and shouting for ghouls to come down and get them. It worked too. All those ghouls in the park were actively looking for someone to bite. When they heard the many voices, it got them screaming, which called in more of their kind. Invariably, they couldn't resist the urge to jump into the funnel, believing it was some castle entrance they had discovered. By noon. The Commodore arrived with his Reclamation General Task Force of locomotives, engineers, and laborers. Expecting it to be a hot and dirty day, Commodore Tinny had brought along a modified flat car that was his outdoor decontamination showering station. Alice and her team especially were exhausted and dehydrated by then. Their hazmat suits were not even remotely as advanced as Alice's Delta armor. Those plastic outfits offered no heat evaporation qualities at all. Blue and his chemical sprayer had continued to pump out tanker cars of the caustic fluid that kept the ghouls away. He had effectively hosed a broad protective moat around the entire rail yard. A raining mist of the chemical across the interior had forced out even the most obstinate of crawlers and lurkers. Under such ideal conditions, the Commodore's engineers set to work and made rapid progress. Their locomotives connected up all the old rail cars, aired up their brakes, and then hauled them out. Freeman mechanics replaced the old point machines at the turnouts with simpler mechanical models for easy use in the active future of that trail yard. The Commodore's trains that removed strings of old cars returned with new box cars that contained valuable salvage destined for unloading inside the castle. They also delivered a new line of empty tanker cars that would eventually carry loads of ghoul soup out to Fort Blood. As a matter of pride, Kenny stayed on his grinder perch until Jam's train had a full load. He had depopulated the riverfront area having called in and then destroyed 30,000 infected. By the end, it was mostly crawlers and other cripples because the fleet-footed runners had already hurled themselves to their dooms. When Jam's train departed the tunnel for unloading at Fort Blood, Alice and her team caught a ride back into the castle aboard a string of loaded boxcars. It would take some time for the workers to pump out Jam's tankers into the Fort Blood storage vat. While they were away, the laborers in the garage tunnel would unload the boxcars. The unloading would progress swiftly with the aid of many forklifts. Much of the industrial supplies would go into the Pancake House garage. The fork trucks would rapidly move other goods through the land bridge into Radio City. 
Alice's brilliant success at the rail yard would not end there. Derek and Jack already planned the construction of more chemical sprayers. The world had a lot more tankers of aqueous solution sodium hydroxide out there, and a lot more rail yards to clear. It was a strategy that could help take their trains all the way to Denver, to Boulder Dam, and to that deep water port in Texas for Fleet Admiral Rudolph ships. Chapter 16. Hold Monsters. Professor Carnegie discreetly moved to stand beside Critias so that they could talk privately. The benevolent watcher asked, What did you find? Judging by your change of demeanor, it was not pleasant. The term that the professor was familiar with came to Critias's mind when he said, Dr. Abrero has been trapping and capturing asymptomatic carrier children. He immobilizes them, feeds them with tubes, and then harvests the interior of their brains. Maybe that is how he is making the potion he pumps into them. More likely where he gets his transplant tissue, the professor believed. He is removing the diseased nuclei from the mindless specimens and then transplanting asymptomatic tissue in its place. The result is these dancing automatons. He amended himself, or that unfortunate woman we found when we arrived. There might be complete recoveries as well. These two gentlemen we met thus far might be former patients. Critias needed to know where Professor Carnegie stood on their current ethical situation. He came right out and asked, Are you fine with this? Carnegie needed clarification. Do you mean the systematic medical exploitation of asymptomatic children? When Critias didn't help him with the reaction, the professor unreservedly shook his head no. I regret to inform you that this is definitely an irreconcilable difference between my group and your King Louis. Ophelia can't even know of this, much less participate in it. That said, I am not prepared to endanger the lives of everyone involved by forcing you to accept my position. It will be enough for us to part ways. My people don't trade in this kind of evil, Critias assured Carnegie. I can't let Dr. Abrero continue kidnapping children to fuel his unsavory methods. An interlude in the music was an opportunity for Professor Carnegie to ask Tongo, Will we be able to meet Dr. Abrero soon? The Samoan was having fun entertaining Verloc. Special Agent Shield had adapted to the urban gangland persona in such a way that Tongo got to live out his own watcher identity. If Carnegie had not reminded him, Tongo would have been content to forget about Abrero entirely. It's time, I guess, Tongo relented. He is this way. Dr. Abrero was not on that floor of the hospital. The operating labs where the surgeon did his questionable experiments was down on the basement level. Access was aboard a large elevator that was capable of transporting a rolling hospital bed along with a team of medical professionals. Instead of calling the elevator, Tongo went to a doorbell intercom box on the wall beside it. The doorbell got a prompt reply from a deep male voice that was not especially friendly. Yeah, what is it? Dr. Abrero has guests, Tongo said through the intercom. The voice asked, why are they here early? Are they stupid? The shipment is not ready. Tongo made an effort to conceal information when he explained, it is not those guests. Someone else is here and they need to speak to the doctor. Considering the state of the world, the voice had good cause to worry about strangers showing up at their base. The deliberation of many risky things was both ominously long and cunningly brief. In a slower and more cautious tone, the intercom voice asked, what do they want? In that. Tongo was honest, they want to talk to the doctor. Their agency plans on removing all the specimens from the city to make it safe for the passage of their trains. The voice said nothing for long enough that Critias could guess why. There were plenty of potent assumptions for the guy to make from that information he just got from Tongo. Depopulating the city was so huge and military intensive an undertaking that it was even more impressive than having functional locomotives. The voice would realize that his mysterious guests were only emissaries of a much larger force. A group with the firepower to clear the city could easily destroy their hospital base if it should come to that. That the guests were a deadly threat wouldn't be an inaccurate appraisal. Bring them down, the voice finally instructed. The doctor wants to meet them. As though as an afterthought, he added, tell them to leave their weapons. It was a good play, so Critias had to think fast. His classical education served him well enough in that moment. When Odysseus landed on the Isle of the Cyclops. It had been exceedingly bad manners for him to burglarize the home of Polyphemus. Rightfully, Polyphemus had felt entirely absolved from having to show any hospitality as a host when his guests were only thieving uninvited burglars that he had captured. Like with Odysseus, personal hardships were not justification for Critias to lead his band of heroes into villainy. If they were the first to break the ancient codes of hospitality, they would more than a little deserve whatever befell them at the hands of the vengeful Dr. Abrero. Critias and his friends were the heroes after all. King Louis was the good guy in the world. His kingdom had a fair dealing reputation to both project and protect. 
If Critias was not going to attack and kill Dr. Burrow immediately, then he was honor-bound to live within the obligations of a civilized guest. It was more than reasonable for the master of a home to ask that his unexpected invitees leave their weapons of war outside. For Critias and his companions to refuse such a request to disarm would certainly also be their declaration of being ill-mannered assassins. If they used Dr. Abrero's friendly offer to parley as a means of performing an armed infiltration, they would be doubly the villains. Perhaps that reputation for treachery would spread to the ears of others, making future encounters more difficult. Beyond good manners, there was logic for Critias to consider as well. If he and his companions were indeed fellow watchers, it begged the question as to who or what remained in the world for them to need weapons for shooting at. Watchers had nothing to fear from the ghouls, not even the hunters. The only reason for them to take weapons down to meet Dr. Abrero would be because they considered having a battle with him and his men. If that was the case, the doctor would be most unwise bringing such armed guests down into his home. Furthermore, if their agency with its trains and manpower was so great, they should have nothing to fear when traveling as emissaries. By ancient tradition, messengers inherently put themselves at risk doing their job. They just had to hope that the people they met with didn't turn out to be Mongols. The horse nomads executed all such unaligned messengers on general principle. Mongols didn't want anyone they met to ever get the idea that they were dealing with mere equals. As Critias saw it, he had two choices. He could give up his weapons and meet with Dr. Abrero, or he could shoot Tongo and then start killing his way through the base. As a marshal in service to King Louis, Critias sided with his professional obligation to explore peaceful cooperation if at all possible. Critias gave up his pistol. When he started, Verloc didn't hesitate to disarm herself too. She was incapable of experiencing doubt or fear, having self-confidence on the level of madness. Professor Carnegie did not carry a gun anyway, so he gave up nothing. Dosh hated the idea of relinquishing his weapons, but if the team was going forward unarmed, he wasn't going to stay behind. Everyone put their weapons on the floor beside the elevator. Critias left his panga bowie blade in its shin sheath. He would take the chance of getting away with it. They had given up their guns and that should have been peace gesture enough for Dr. Abrero. Tonga used a button to summon the elevator. While they waited for the car to arrive, Critias noticed that Tonga didn't have any change of equilibrium. He didn't seem worried about an upcoming fight and neither did he seem pleased to see that they had put aside their guns. That meant Tongo was either as cool a customer as Verloc, which was unlikely in the extreme, or he actually wasn't planning anything. The elevator ride took long enough to leave no doubt that they had gone down into a subterranean basement beneath the hospital. When the lift doors eventually opened, it was onto a frosty cold corridor with the distant sounds of fans that blew a freezer's vented air. It had nice finished floors, but the walls were concrete more typical of mechanical areas. If the basement was now a surgical theater, it hadn't been a sterile environment before the outbreak. Off in the distance they heard an assortment of odd mechanical pins and bumps that echoed about through the maze of passageways. Mostly the basement was just arctic cold. Their exhaled breath was clearly visible. Pipes and cables that ran along the walls had frost on them. Tongo put on a heavier blue jacket that he kept on a wall peg for his regular use. Even if the cold could not do him any harm because he was a watcher, it did not make the chill any more comfortable for him. Critias remarked, your Dr. Abrero went to a lot of trouble to freeze all this space. Are you guys hanging your fresh meat down here or what? That made Tongo snort at the irony. The doctor does hang his meat down here, but not the kind that you eat. He says that the extreme cold keeps the patients ready for surgery. Ah, uh, yes, Professor Karnaki comprehended the wisdom in it. The regenerative nature of their tissues is a major obstacle when operating on the plague victims. Taking their body temperatures down to freezing would impede their cellular functions. He would have the time a surgeon needs to operate without the organs prematurely regenerating their incisions. A rolling gurney with bloody sheets on it came out from a doorway ahead. The hunter ghoul that appeared pushing it was a true perversion of science, a real monstrosity. He wasn't near the biggest hunter ever, but his frame was still inhumanly bigger than any mortal man could ever possess. His torso filled the large hospital doorway to all corners. At first it seemed that the monster didn't even have a head. The flattened off shoulders squeezed square to the top of the door frame. That whole hulking torso had to turn at the hips to point their way. The normal sized face sort of just horrifically poked out, deeply embedded in the hunter's upper chest. The face's only field of vision was straight ahead. Other than those grotesque limitations, the face was otherwise fully voiced and functional. For any who witnessed the obscene thing with all of its thick surgical scars over bulging muscles, there was no doubt that the normal-sized head had originated on a different watcher ghoul of typical size and intelligence. The mad Dr. Abrero had entirely removed the hunter's original enormous head, discarding it outright, 
and then he surgically attached the more sentient and normal-sized replacement. The hunter's body was just quite too large to accommodate a human-scaled head, so it ended up with less than no neck, with a mouth lying just beneath the banana-sized collarbones. Even if it was an ugly abomination, the surgeon had done his other work successfully. The mind was alert and it had complete control of a superhuman hunter-kill machine body. Dr. Abrero is not ready to see you yet, the monster told Tongo in a perfectly understandable male voice. It was not the one from the intercom. You're supposed to give them a tour. Let them see how things work around here. The doctor will see them in the green room after he finishes his work in the surgical center. Tongo introduced the freakish orderly, this is baby face Fritz. He cleans up the mess around here for the doctor. His name is Fritz, but everyone just calls him baby face. If you can't guess why, it is because of his tiny fucked up face head mess he has going on there. Fritz rolled his eyes as though he was the normal person in the land of absurdity, and then he turned away to go about his business. As soon as the gurney was clear of the doorway, a second surgical freak came out into the hallway. The new one had begun as an impressively muscular but still humanly proportional male ghoul. Dr. Abrero had removed the human head and then surgically grafted on not only a new head, but also the enormous upper chest, shoulders, and arms from a hunter ghoul monstrosity. The extra set of giant arms were so broad and powerful that they overlapped the lower original human arms. His head was from the upper hunter body, so it was monstrously huge and ugly. It did have a reasoning mind however, and full control of the body, both legs and all four arms as well. The smaller lower set of arms currently carried a pair of buckets that contained cleaning supplies. His hunter's upper arms held a long stainless steel tray with a mound of bloody surgical instruments. Tongo informed everyone, that is Boris. It is a good thing that he's got four arms. That is how much crack he smokes, four fisting it like the chicken head he is. Fuck you, crabs, Boris threatened him seriously. It was the deep voice that matched the intercom. The four-armed goon didn't like Tongo and he made no secret about the animosity. I would be all over you like a prison riot, you topside son of a bitch. Just relax, Tongo told Boris without concern. Take a shower, why don't you? You stink up the whole basement. Once the two orderlies went off down the hallway, Professor Karnaki asked about the room they just exited from, what is in there? Tongo scoffed at the thought, those two morons are not doctors. Here, let me show you. The room was a butcher shop of sorts, of the food preparation variety. Servants of Dr. Abrero hunted elk, sheep, and deer. Fritz and Boris used medical equipment like autopsy knives and saws to dress the carcasses as food. That was the source of the bloody mess they were presently cleaning up. The deep cold of that basement level would keep the meat fresh. Stainless steel surgical pens held tall heaps of raw cut from various animals. The grim absurdity of it all aside, they were being properly clean about their butchery. Dr. Abrero did keep his working area sanitary. As their tour continued, Tongo took them to where a different elevator had brought down the washed ghouls from the warehouse dock above. The wet ghouls had come down into a freezer room that had flash cooled them into hypothermic paralysis. Critias and his group arrived to see Dr. Abrero's surgically restored medical assistants handling the incoming ghouls. Two of the android minions wearing hospital attire, lifted an inert specimen onto a gurney and then strapped him into place. They're just about done here, Tongo explained as they continued on. The others will be moving through the X-ray machine by now. Dr. Abrero takes pictures of their brains for calibrating his automated instruments. Critias wasn't sure what Tongo meant by automated until the watcher led them to the main operating theater. As visitors, they could observe the interior of the surgery from the hallway through a large glass window. Inside, the first of the captured wild male ghouls remained unconscious from the freezing cold. Even if it were awake and struggled, the body had strong straps to hold it down, a metal head brace used medieval steel skewers to drill down and immobilize the skull into place. There was a swarm of robot arms that held surgical instruments. Critias had seen a similar tool arm that was Jim's new computerized 5-axis milling machine. The arms installed stainless steel probe tubes into the ghoul's skull. The four-armed robot torso rotated 180 degrees to also operate on a second patient that was behind it. That donor body was an adult female which proved that most any watcher could end up as transplant fodder, adult or child. In this case, most of the head was already surgically absent. Dr. Abrero had removed everything above the intact lower jaw but the tongue, the brainstem, and the middle brain. In Critias's time, automated surgery machines were nothing unusual. For back in the days of King Louis, the machine was a prototype surgical robot of the finest computerized technology. While they watched, Tongo told his guests, Dr. Abrero has gotten better with practice. 
his surgery works just about every time. Now and then we still get one that doesn't take to it and they end up with something wrong with them. Verloc had only cunning in mind when she cozied up to Tongo with friendly banner. This is one amazing high-tech operation that your doc has going on here. What machine do you use on them next? Packaging is down this way, Tongo eagerly obliged Verloc. It was another opportunity to impress her with his privileged access to Dr. Abrero's kingdom. The Samoan watcher delivered them to a room that had more of those blue barrels like Gridius had seen in the warehouse above. The room also had 3D compression coffins, which were airtight iron boxes on gurneys. Professor Carnacki explained what he saw for the benefit of his companions, the word Abrero means worker in Spanish. Worker is an appropriate name for the specimens that the doctor manufactures here. He indicated some equipment that accompanied each of the metal coffins, this is essentially an embalming process. You could also think of it as a kind of dialysis blood transplanting system. These tubes remove the worker's natural blood supply. It appears that Dr. Abrero replaces it with the synthetic sperm whale motor oil from these drums here. The metal boxes are for vacuum desiccating the workers at the same time, like decompression chambers. Carnacki indicated one of the blue plastic barrels. Once the vacuum desiccation and oil change have dehydrated the worker down, they entomb it inside one of these containers. While rather macabre, it is an ideal solution for a long-term storage or easy transport. Critias asked, this synthetic whale oil stuff, what is that doing for them? Not very much, Carnacki speculated. I think it was a useful way for quickly extracting extra water out of their tissues. It would also keep the body in a state of hibernation. The workers would lack the energy to move about on their own. The customer would have to open their can first. They could fill the barrel's empty space with fresh water. That would rehydrate the body in a day or two. There is no reason to be clever about it. They could just toss the body into a nice sunny pond. The worker would soon be right as rain and do whatever anyone commanded, providing they had the hypnotic drug the doctor is injecting them with. Verloc told Tongo, This is some serious phantasm level craziness that your boss has going on here. What kind of smack does the doctor hit them up with? Tongo had a proud answer to that, he started out giving them straight amphetamine. A dose of that makes them responsive to instructions. I improved it by tweaking their medicine with a little scopalamine. It gives them that totally positive state of mind. They will do whatever you say with enthusiasm. Verloc pieced all the information together and then tested her assumptions with an informed bluff. How many barrels are the hombres coming to collect? The Colombians want 36, Tongo divulged. We have another four weeks. The shipment will be ready by then. This way, Tongo gestured the direction in which they should proceed before leading the way. The watcher eventually delivered them to an insulated aluminum door typical of walk-in freezers. Beyond that door was Dr. Abrero's green room. That spacious chamber was essentially a clean cafeteria with the usual tables and chairs. The cooking equipment was industrial stainless steel, both modern and spotless. Unlike the rest of the basement, that dining hall had something approaching a normal room temperature. A pair of automaton ghouls worked as the cooks and service staff. Their white uniforms left no doubt about their assigned careers. It was their obliviousness to anything but their labors that made it clear that they were not sentient watchers. At the moment, they were putting the finishing touches on setting out an elaborate meal. Neither of them even acknowledged the arrival of Critias as group. Fritz and Boris entered the cafeteria from doors on the other side. Both of them had changed into clean white butcher's aprons, even if they were still monstrously ugly, they were at least somewhat sanitary. Critias had no reason to believe that Dr. Abrero had any knowledge about using neutron radiation exposure to make his creations non-infectious. As such, Critias was not of a mind to sample any of the cuisine, or even remove his helmet for this matter. Boris spoke first, speaking to Tongo, the doctor wants you back upstairs doing your job. We will take care of his guests from here. Tongo wasn't anxious to depart since he enjoyed socializing with Verloc and wanted more. Even so, he was obedient to the wishes of his employer and obeyed. I'll catch up with you later, Tongo told Verloc as though he genuinely believed it. He even exchanged an elaborate secret street society handshake with her as proof of their new camaraderie. The blue Samoan watcher then departed, heading back the way they came. Please take your seats, babyface Fritz instructed them with a magnanimous gesture. Dr. Abrero will be joining you momentarily. Boris didn't turn away as he moved into the kitchen area to apparently help serve. The way he kept his unwavering and almost malicious eyes on them, was some indication that more was going on than just genuinely friendly hospitality. Professor Carnacki showed no sign of hesitation as he went forward to take a chair at the dining table. Verloc and Dosh followed his lead to do the same. Critias was at a loss for what else he could do but cooperate and wait to meet Dr. Abrero on his terms. 
As soon as they had seated themselves, the hunter enormous Fritz carried over a great silver serving platter with a breakfast buffet. They were having pancakes with from canned bacon, fruit cocktail, and scrambled eggs, presumably from the powdered variety. It was an appealing meal considering the can of creamery butter, a can of real maple syrup, and hot coffee. When everyone seemed to hesitate rather than eagerly partaking of a genuinely fine feast, Fritz felt a little offended or at the least disappointed. Come on then, Fritz urged them on. There is no standing on ceremony here. Take your masks off and dig in. What masks? Critias all but snarled the question. It was not just for Dasha's benefit, because it was in part, he also needed an excuse for keeping on his helmet. In all honesty, he didn't know how any of the hostile watchers might react if they learned he was a pure strain human, or if they could sense it intuitively without his mech suit shielding his bioelectric emanations. Suit yourselves then, Fritz said to dismiss the matter as he backed away. They were free to do as they pleased. Boris remained where he was at a distance, partly concealed behind a kitchen area steam table. His hulking ugly hunter's face was never much for making pleasant expressions under the best of conditions, but even so, he still appeared to be a little antipathetic about his unexpected guests. That diverse attitude came out further when Boris asked, Is something wrong with your faces then? Everyone is pretty around here. No need to be shy. Critias's pride got the better of him in that moment. Pridefulness was a useful camouflage when grave walking, since it wasn't anything like a compassionate impulse that ghouls sensed readily. In preparation of removing his helmet, he powered up all the sensors so that he could scan the table with both spectroscopic lasers and all factory qualitative analysis. If there was any infectious biomatter present in their food, he would be able to detect it. Critias could also determine if they were safe from any explosives or poisons. The food was hot cooked safe for human consumption, but that wasn't his interesting discovery. Boris across the room had been handling a gunpowder firearm that was currently concealed inside the steam table where he stood. The amount of gun oil, gunpowder, and lead stifnate his sensors detected likely came from something big, like on the order of a belt-fed machine gun. Before removing his mech suit helmet, Critias sent a text message to Verlox Marshal Service wristwatch. It warned her about Boris and the battlefield automatic rifle he lurked over. Once his helmet was off and on the table beside him, Critias used the tongs to serve some of the bacon onto his plate. As he nonchalantly played along with the absurd dinner party, Critias asked, Will Dr. Abrero be joining us? Quite soon, babyface Fritz promised them with a disarming ease to his tone. The ongoing operation in the surgical theater still occupies his immediate attention. The food was quite good. Even Dosh forked some deep into the fanged maw of his dinosaur mask. Professor Carnicky and Verluck were the least perturbed, certainly finding no cause to pass on a free meal. Dr. Abrero arrived peacefully if not promptly. From his first appearance, Critias took him for a watcher. Not unlike Dr. Kine, Dr. Abrero's face was a combination of being smoothly devoid of facial hair or conspicuous wrinkles, but also with a peculiar fullness that was almost cherubic, perhaps due to an overabundance of skin that resulted from middle age before contracting the infection. Abrero had curly hair of a light brown. Aside from being somewhat tall and thin-lipped in a serious way, their host was not especially distinguishable. The doctor did not pause as he approached the table to take his seat, though he did gaze over his guests to make some assessment of them. It was Critias that caused his attention to linger, or more accurately it was the mech suit that interested him on a professional level. The doctor also noticed the hint of facial hair stubble that proved Critias was still a natural human. Do you mind? Abrero asked rhetorically as he took his seat. I have not eaten today and I'm quite famished. It's your party, Doc, Critias replied with a gesture that he was welcome to his own chair. The doctor was precise about preparing his plate and he cut his pancakes with a knife rather than just the edge of his fork. After eating a perfectly buttered and syrupy double stack square of pancake, Abrero commented, Fritz told me that King Louis wants to expand his activities into this city. Here we are, Critias replied to mean that King Louis already had. We never expected to find you here at all. When we did, we wanted to let you know as a courtesy. In an observation, Dr. Abrero said, I had no idea he had come so far. Saving humanity is a global concern, Critias implied that King Louis's reach would extend everywhere in time. The doctor gestured with his fork toward Critias's mech suit helmet as he explained, I'm referring to that bio-booster armor that you wear. I never dreamed that his community had progressed so far scientifically. That he could approach equaling my works would be impressive enough, seeing that he has surpassed my accomplishments is inconceivable. Verloc offered a question out of curiosity, how did you know we were with King Louis? How familiar are you with our agency? Dr. Abrero gestured to Boris as he said, Some music please. 
The doctor's forearm monstrosity of a servant used one of his smaller human hands to take a remote control from his apron pocket and then use it. Concealed speakers around the cafeteria began to play sound and it was the radio show that broadcasted from Jim's city. A charming female voice was speaking, This is a request from our new friends aboard the riverboat Nellie. They are making swift progress and we expect them to be joining us soon. The music that followed was a uniquely atmospheric drumbeat that had been a major hit in its time. While the song was alien to Critias, even the stodgy Professor Carnicky had to confess, I do like this song. Motion at the distant doors Abrero had first entered through, drew attention in that direction. Critias and his companions were more than a little curious to see what new grotesque query Dr. Abrero had birthed with his amoral scientific experiments. Professor Carnicky was a paranormal investigator and consulting exorcist by trade. He alone came mentally prepared for gazing into the naked lunch Cthulhu event horizon. While his companions felt taken aback, Carnicky flowed with the flesh circus unperturbed. Come in, my pet, Dr. Abrero called when he saw a well-formed hand partly holding open one door. The grip was unusually low near to the floor for someone so fully grown. The hand was near the floor because it was also a foot, or at least did service as one, though not at the end of a leg. The hand attached to an athletic presumably male arm, hairless and undoubtedly attractive as arms went. The shoulder of that arm, one of a matching pair, both, along with the pectoral chest and collarbones, merged into the pelvic girdle of a beautiful young woman. Far more abominable than her having arms for legs, the remaining whole of a lower body, a clearly female form continued back from what normally should have been the buttocks region of her lower torso. In a word, Dr. Abrero had crafted the girl into a centaur or centaurette considering her clearly defined gender, the leg arms notwithstanding. Her hind legs were those of a shapely female as were the actual buttocks on that end. The upper female torso was painfully beautiful, as was her face, bare Aphrodite breasts, and overall proportions. Her dark African skin was free of surgical scars and temptingly sensual. She was an exquisitely lean and lightsome creature, delicately agile, even flawless, Aside from being a mind-racking abomination that caused the observer to feel lust, abhorrence, and shame in a kaleidoscope of convoluted kinesis. Don't be afraid, Odorka, Dr. Abrero summoned her. My guests want to meet you. Odorka must have hesitated over some consternation that words from the doctor put aside. She smiled adoringly as she pranced into the hall. At first, there was no explanation for why she pulled a rope using her feminine upper arms to hold it. Odorka was quite strong as a watcher and a quadruped. Once she was fully inside, her progress revealed that she dragged a watcher child, trussed up, and silenced with a piece of tape over his mouth. An oddity of the child was that he wore a black Halloween sort of costume that had to be of his own doing, since Dr. Abrero himself was anything but whimsical when dressing his servants. I caught the escaped specimen, Odeke told her master with pride while clearly seeking his approval. He was hiding inside the ventilation tunnels just as you said. The kid struggled and murmured defiantly through his gag, but otherwise could do nothing. Well done, Abrero praised her. You can leave him for now. I will have one of the others take care of him from there. The fate of the boy was undoubtedly to become surgical fodder. Dr. Abrero was in no hurry to do anything with him at the moment, perhaps not wanting to spare either Fritz or Boris who were his bodyguards to some large degree. Critias just came out with it, you have created the most amazing companions. Your skill as a surgeon is second to none. Odeka really enjoyed the music. As part of her appreciation, she stretched out in a pose and all of her many joints cooperated flawlessly. Even if her forelegs were arms, she operated them as sashaying legs without even a hint of handicap. The emotional tribal beating of the music's drums magnificently accentuated her genomic jungle ancestry. Accompanied by her slow gyrations and enviably agile centaurus steps, it left no doubt that she was a deliciously erotic being despite being starkly inhuman in her chimeric outward appearance. Dr. Abrero did watch Odaka dance and his reaction was a void comf test of his own psychology which never survives the watcher transformation without trauma. Abrero relished that he had the godlike power to craft a toy that others could envy but he would never desire to play with himself. He even felt the need to put it into words. What was she when I found her? Abrero challenged any of them to answer with their reasoning. He offered some obvious suggestions, was she a homicidal nuisance, a number on a spreadsheet, a logistical obstacle? His gaze shifted from Odaka directly onto Critias and that made it clear that Critias was no more worthy of human dignity than his pet dancing negress. To perfectly make his point, Dr. Abrero asked, How many of them does your King Louis want to destroy as a matter of convenience? There are a couple million in the Wasatch front corridor, Critias replied without any demonstration of feelings about the matter. The feral infected are so densely populated and in such great numbers that they could derail our loaded locomotives if given the opportunity. 
As you said, before her transformation, Otako was just one more in a sea of troubles, a city of woe as my wife calls it. Your presence here, Abrero argued, is proof that King Louis understands how important my work is to the future of this world. The infected specimens have no intrinsic value unless I choose to bestow it upon them. If you had come upon Otako before me, you would have destroyed her without a moment's hesitation. As a native of this city, you would have destroyed her regardless of her aggression towards you since as you said, that is your actual mission. Surely you agree, she is precious now. I agree, Critias confessed honestly. It reminds me of another of my wife's sayings, art is that thing which makes space or materials precious. Hearing logical proof that his mad surgical mutilations was high art did make Abrero smile. Otaka is the name I have given to baser materials that I have made precious. Like the other gods before me, I have crafted men from clan breathed true spiritual life into them. Abrero gestured over at the struggling watcher child on the floor behind him, finding them is not easy, and capturing them is even less so. Clearly, your King Louis travels far and wide. He has whole armies of capable agents. King Louis could supply me with the base materials I need so desperately to make my art. I have something of value to offer him in return. Slaves? Critias asked non-judgmentally. Of course that, Abrero pushed. I prefer the term androids, but they are nothing compared to my real power of benefaction. When you look at me, what do you see? An asymptomatic carrier, Critias answered readily. I assume you came about by happenstance, much the same way as did that boy over there. Critias was about to say unfortunate boy, but he had the gift of hiding his true emotions from the villains he had to clean up as his life's profession. I did this to heal myself, Abrero bragged. Insights I acquired during my early research prepared me for the eventuality when I inevitably became infected. When you look at me now, you see me perpetually healthy, energetic, and immune to the cruel ravages of time. I can bestow the priceless gift of immortality itself. Your King Louis could live for all time, the Emperor of the Earth in a reign destined to stretch on for even millions of years. After a pause that invited any comments of doubt, Abrero indicated the boy on the floor again the only price to fixing the world and then replacing it with a far better one free of disease and suffering, is the base materials that fuel my work. Critias argued, I'm not so sure that kid thinks of himself as a base material, any more than you do about yourself. Dr. Abrero frowned over that demonstration of Critias as moral weakness, the doctor took on a more cautionary tone as he told them, wandering around the ruins of this shattered world, there are many thousands of these asymptomatic carriers. While some of them can be useful to our goals, Many more are psychotically violent predators you plan on destroying anyway. Many others are retarded filthy children like the one you see here. You want to depopulate the city because your locomotive trains would crash into mobs of wild specimens. The tracks you need for getting east over the mountains brings you right past my doorstep. It was only your good fortune that you found me to be a valuable partner for future collaboration. Had I been a malevolent maniac living alongside so critical a railway juncture, your adventures might have ended here prematurely and most permanently. I have more than a passing understanding of how this world operates, Critias assured the doctor truthfully. You are correct in that you are an extreme case that perfectly makes your point about the potential hazards and benefits. Since you're the real expert, you could explain it to me in greater clarity so that we can be certain that I harbor no illusions. Your King Louis, Abrero did clarify bluntly with an added gesture to the music playing, he broadcasts his radio and television programs all over the globe through satellite telecommunications he obviously controls. For all of his great technical expertise, I have to wonder if he fully comprehends just what sort of malevolent and envious eyes are gazing back at him. While there are those who are anxious to join him, there will be others who covet their territories and fear his growing might. It is only a matter of time before some of them fight back. I will be a most useful ally to him when that time comes, and it surely will. As to the risks inherent in the King Louis shows, Critias answered it. Broadcasting our whereabouts rather than trying to hide will obviously draw the attention of many villains lurking out here. Honestly, it is the sort of predatory craziness that would come hunting for us eventually anyway. There is no hiding from it. Infection always gets in. We prefer this more proactive approach. Natural humans are in short supply and struggling to hold out. Finding them quickly is a top priority. The radio show facilitates that. Speaking to dangerously crazy asymptomatic carriers is just a regular part of my job, sometimes killing them is too. My work can save mankind from extinction. Abrero boasted energetically as though he was becoming impatient with them or not liking how their meeting progressed. I discovered the secret to fighting back against all of this. Even if you murdered me as you just hinted at, you would continue to use my android workers anyway. I know you see the boundless value in them. 
Professor Carnicky detected that Critias was becoming increasingly annoyed with Abrero's callously evil attitude. Boris across the room was similarly aware of it and ever ready to act in his master's defense. To calm things down, Carnicky asked, If you have the secret to restoring people to their mental normality, why are you making so many of these android workers? Yes, Dr. Abrero agreed with that observation conditionally. I create these limited androids when rejuvenating the minds that already became lost. When working with fresh specimens and the newly infected, when I can transform them from the beginning under controlled conditions, there is no loss of cognitive function on any level. Karnaki genuinely wanted to learn more. He simply asked, why? You must have noticed, the doctor educated them. Take Fritz and Boris for example. While most minor wounds heal on the specimens without any hint of scarring, major tissue grafting results in significant but otherwise harmless scarring. Both Fritz and Boris exhibit that phenomenon gratuitously. With obvious pride he indicated the dancing Odica, and yet as you can see, there are no unsightly scars on her, just all that perfect flesh. I accomplished that flawless appearance with techniques of plastic surgery. It was difficult and time-consuming, but nothing on the level of prevention. Carnegie sensed a connection, so the scarring is problematic in your restoration process. Abrero nodded regretfully, each time I remove sections from donor or recipient brains, the cavity develops some unavoidable scar tissue. For the recipient, this is of little concern, but for the donor, after repeated harvesting, this scar tissue eventually occupies the whole cavity and then the donor is no longer viable. Once that happens, I of course need another replacement donor. As to what donors he used, Abrero said, those filthy wild animal children are frankly of no consequence to anyone, not even themselves. They are no longer capable of growing up or developing into functional beings, but they are perfectly suitable donors. The adult specimens I have used were aggressive bandits. I saw no reason to let their useful raw material go to waste after my guards had dispatched them anyway. Personally, I prefer using the children. I get better results in cleaning them up as an act of mercy. They cannot care for themselves. Such children are not fit to be numbered among the immortals, not to endure in such a helpless state for endless time. Carnegie asked, how many controllable android workers do you get from each donor? The doctor told him, each donor can give five good harvests. Abrero was proud of his efficient conservation of donor material, I can create five android workers for every donor expended. That was where his pride faded, unfortunately, only in rare cases does the recipient undergo complete cognitive recovery. Both Fritz and Boris are my examples of that successful work. They each experienced a total rational restoration. Wilson and Tongo are successes of mine as well, as is Odeka of course. If not for my genius, all of them would be mindless detestations subsisting on the garbage of the old world. As much as Critias disliked Dr. Abrero, he hadn't forgotten that he was first a marshal of Virgil Lettuce. Duty came first and required some thought on his part. In his own time, the androids were more than prevalent, they were well on their way to transcendence as Kevin and Carmen clearly demonstrated. Androids would be a future fact, so turning them off in their age of conception was not his destiny. Furthermore, Dr. Abrero made a lot of good arguments. Jim did have a lot of dirty and dangerous jobs where android goals would be more than handy. There was a time not so long ago when Critias and Carmen had considered dispatching the Watcher children of Jingle Bells for being abominations. In that, sparing the children was a decision they made and never regretted it. Professor Carnicky had already told him that harvesting children was totally unacceptable. If nothing else, before he made any irrevocable rash decisions, Critias wanted to be certain that he understood what bargain Dr. Abrero wanted to make with King Louis. Critias said, if we capture asymptomatic children and psychopaths for you to use for biotech parts, in return, you will provide the king with android laborers. If he wants, you will use your procedure to make people live forever and never need to fear the ghouls outside ever again. Before Abrero could reply, Critias asked, What kind of arrangement do you have with these Colombians I've heard about? They provide you children in return for android workers too? Abrero passively didn't refute anything Critias had said describing their potential alliance. As to the latter issue, Abrero admitted, During the collapse, Colombia and the surrounding region was uniquely suited for the coincidental production of asymptomatic carriers. They have a high population of sentient adults and an even larger population of feral adolescents. What they are lacking is technical skills and the ambitious foresight to make anything of their new lives. Like your King Louis, I too have a vision for restoring this world. As to what the Colombians intend to do with the workers I will provide them, I frankly have no interest. Abrero unfeignedly dismissed all responsibility for his actions when he declared, 
as long as they come through on their end of our bargain and deliver to me all of the promised specimens, I will continue to supply them with as much additional manpower as they can afford. I have heard a great deal about your business practices, Critias replied, but nothing as to this vision for restoring the world. Thusly challenged, Dr. Abrero unflinchingly revealed the full extent of his mad ambitions. I have already freed myself from the rotting carcass of the old flesh, he raved. I have shed all pretenses of being a member of the former lower humanity. In the kingdoms of life, there is the animal, the vegetable, and the new organic, the immortal new flesh that is the destined evolution of the entire human species. You will be more than immortal. You can wear whatever new flesh you desire, be whatever gender or both, possessing whatever limbs or shape you identify yourself as. Living forever as gods, mankind will transform the earth into a paradise of gardens and science. Disease, decrepitude, and inequality will never exist again. If that description was not enough, Dr. Abrero sweetened the deal by adding, you can have your immortality right now. Once you are one of us, enjoying the security and benefits of the new flesh as your companions already do, I'm certain you will convince King Louis to join us as well. After just assuming that Critias could never resist the genuine offer, Abrero turned to Dosh, you two can have whatever body you desire. See what I did for them, I can transform you into any identity that you can imagine. Let me help you to be on the outside the person you truly are on the inside. Critias actually worried about Dosh. The Watcher wanted to be his alter ego so badly that he already wore that dinosaur mask. It was totally conceivable that Dosh would accept the offer of getting surgically transmogrified. Dosh paused for long enough to give Critias his concern and Dr. Abrero his satisfaction. The alien Saurian bounty hunter proved them both wrong with the unexpected phrase of, no women, no kids. Even as an extraterrestrial mercenary, Dosh had a code and he was not one to break it, not even to attain his most heartfelt ambition. Critias of course instantly understood what Dosh meant. Dr. Abrero voiced surprised vexation, what? It does not matter what useful science you accomplish here, Dosh explained in his same cold and even tone worthy of his true nature. Nothing is worth the dishonor that pays for it. It was the lack of contradiction forthcoming from Dosh's companions that sealed the negotiations. Verloc showed no hint of disagreeing with Dosh. Professor Carnicky and Critias approved of the sentiments judging by their resolute expressions. Not only were all of Dosh's companions supportive of him, they did so with a solid understanding about the negative ramifications such a stance could bring. Rather than wait for his situation to deteriorate any further, Dr. Abrero signaled Boris with an ineptly disguised touching of his ear. Even Professor Carnegie witnessed the signal for its true nature. Verloc and Dosh were genuine masters of espionage craft. Critias understood that it meant the real negotiation with Dr. Abrero had ended and the high-stakes hair rigor showdown had just begun. Boris did his best to seem sly as he took another remote control device from his apron pocket and then activated it. There was no doubt that he used a different device because Boris went back to his first remote for controlling the music. After turning off the radio broadcast, he activated an internal stereo system that played a compact disc over the same speakers. I'm not man or machine, the lyrics of the classic rock song began. I'm something in between. The malevolent grin that Boris focused directly on Critias made it clear that serious trouble was afoot. I'm all love, a dynamo. So push the button and let me go. Dr. Abrero dropped all pretense as he openly warned them, it's not too late for you to accept my terms. I'll never help you, Critias told the doctor with equal gravity. The transformation twisted your mind to evil. You're one of those monsters that we need to worry about, not a potential ally. You fool. Abrero cursed him. True enough, Critias agreed. I am far from the smartest person in this room. You're a pioneering scientist of impressive talent, sadly wasted because of your madness. Professor Carnegie is a man of many advanced educational degrees. When Verloc puts her mind to something, she can learn it so quickly that it puts you both to shame. Dosh has shown professional instincts at least on par with my own. I know my limitations and don't pretend to be smarter than I am. I trust in those things that fools often do, my religion. The only thing everyone agrees on is that the world is what it is. Smart people like you have these master plans to make the world into something else, something better, but even in that you admit that the world is what it is, for you to want to change it. What I believe in is the game itself. People are born, they struggle and then they pass on, leaving their lessons for the next generation. I don't want the game to end. It is all we really have. It is the very thing that makes humans worth having around at all. You, Dr. Brero, are a murderer of innocent travelers and orphan children and for no other reason than to feed your sick ambitions. As a duly designated officer of King Louis, I am going to put an end to your wicked ways and liberate your slaves so much as they will let me. 
liberate them? Abrero loudly scoffed at that ludicrous boast. My servants are loyal to me on a level that you cannot even comprehend. If not for me, they would still be garbage-eating idiots like the others outside. He called over to Otika, only turning his head enough for her to know that he spoke to her. Have I ever lied to you? I have always been honest with you about the ways of the world, so you know I speak truthfully now. These strangers in their King Louis do want to liberate you, but not in the way you are thinking. When they look at you, they see only ugliness. Even your undeniable beauty is repugnant to them. It reminds them of their own self-righteous deficiencies. They would liberate you, by killing you, and then burying you out of sight and mind. If they allowed you to live, it would be a constant reminder of their own flaws, and that their narrow-minded conceptions of the beau ideal tolerates no contradictions. If you have the slightest doubt about what I'm telling you, ask them yourself. They think your every breath shames their self-appointed dominance over what humanness even means. Odika looked to Critias with her confused and seemingly wounded expression. She wanted to know if it was all true, was she something that humanity could only be ashamed of, a constant reminder of their barbaric and callous inner natures, that very thing that liberalist idealism sought to hide more than vanquish. In the spirit of frank honesty that always came to Critias easily, he answered, I know more about the plight of androids than Dr. Abrero could possibly guess, what he did to you without your consent is no crime of yours. I don't know what place you will find for yourself with the king and his people, but I do know there would be one for you. At least, that would have been true if not for you hunting down that boy and dragging him in here to be murdered by this megalomaniacal butcher. It is not your body that concerns me, but rather the soul that drives it. So far, it seems like you are no better than he is. The boy on the floor heard everything and his tremendous heroism was truly as great as his cost him suggested. His bindings were only for show because he was secretly Otaka's accomplice. The two of them and other slaves of Dr. Abrero had conspired to free themselves if they ever came upon a reasonable opportunity. The arrival of agents from King Louis was that advantageous moment. The boy had been inside the air conditioning vent when Critias made his pledge to stop Dr. Abrero. A hero like Critias was the best chance they would ever get. The boy put his life on the line to seize the opportunity of fighting back. As he leaped to his feet unbound, the boy cried out, She did not drag me here. I asked her to bring me. Kid Panther is not dead. He lives and let evil beware. The Black Coston was his panther-themed superhero identity, which was obvious enough with him standing and also explaining himself. Just what he thought he was going to do aside from making bold speeches was yet to be seen. He was just a kid after all, and had no apparent weapons. Against powerhouses like Fritz and Boris, it was doubtful any weapon would avail him anyway. Still blinded by his delusions of superiority, Dr. Abrero rashly shouted in command, Seize the boy. Seize them all. With the moment of crisis at hand, everyone acted. Boris went directly for the belt-fed machine gun he had hidden before him in the kitchen unit. It was a bulky weapon and not conveniently located, but he did have four arms and a surplus of strength to make it happen. Babyface Fritz rushed to grab Kid Panther. Only he was by no means a trained fighter and his enormous hunter's body was more than a little clumsy. Kid Panther nimbly evaded Fritz's huge hands as he rushed between the monster's legs to get behind him. Fritz was uniquely limited in his ability to see, his head frozen into his chest as it was, without even a neck. As the lumbering Fritz turned this way and that to grab the boy, Kid Panther easily stayed in the blind spot behind him. Critias was as familiar with his mech suit helmet as he was with his Tesla Flux pistol. He deftly rolled his helmet off the table into his hand and then plopped it down upon his head with practiced grace worthy of a stage magician. Quick as he was, Odoko was every bit as fast as a lioness. In one springing motion, she closed the distance to Dr. Abrero. Odoko wrapped her forelimb leg arms around the doctor, trapping him into his seat with his arms pinned to his sides. Her slender upper arms were free for prying back the doctor's head and then holding a fork from the table aimed at his eye. If Odoko chose, she could mutilate the doctor and there would be nothing he could do to prevent it. Boris finally gripped his machine gun using both of his human-sized lower arms. He used his powerful hunter-sized upper arms to thrust aside the heavy steam table cabinet that was on caster wheels. Before Boris could level his deadly weapon at their table, Verloc was up from her seat and she sharply whistled to get the brutish bodyguard's attention. During that parting fist-bumping herb and handshake with Tongo, the Samoan watcher had discreetly passed her his automatic pistol. Verloc had kept the weapon concealed that whole time. She currently had it at the ready, pointed at Boris. If he so much as twitched another inch, she was going to blow him away. Such was the city champion pistol skill Verloc possessed, it was no idle threat, even against so durable and immortal as Boris. Hold your monsters. Karniki pleaded with Abrero, it doesn't have to end this way. 
an oddly metallic sounding footstep in the outer hallway alerted Dr. Abrero to what was coming. Hold! He laughed with maniacal enthusiasm. Now you will witness my ultimate creation. Abrero howled, I am here. The far doors swung open as Dr. Abrero's so called ultimate creation marched into the cafeteria. Its ghastly appearance was not unforgivable enough to eclipse the unfortunate circumstances of Wilson. Doubtlessly, that watcher had been a fellow conspirator against Dr. Abrero, a betrayal which had cost him dearly. His mission to stop or disable Abrero's monster had obviously been unsuccessful since he currently dangled limply from that nightmarish creature's extended pincer claw. Abrero's monster had started out as a powerfully built ghoul suitable as a platform for augmentation. Apparently, the doctor's envy about Critias's mech suit was not without foundation. Abrero had indeed attempted to create an armature. He had bolted a metallic exoskeleton permanently into the internal bone skeleton of the ghoul host. Instead of hydraulics or other means of mechanical strength enhancement, Abrero had attached actual muscle mass he had surgically removed from other ghouls, perhaps one or more hunters. The underlying occupant of the unsavory mess had a stainless steel artist smile and saber-toothed tiger skull permanently attached over his existing head. It not only did a superb job of giving him a fearsome appearance, it would also go a long way toward preventing any bullet injuries to his encased brain. Anywhere the body was visible beneath the muscle-enshrouded exoskeleton, there was obvious signs that Dr. Abrero had surgically inserted armor beneath the skin to toughen up his creation. The left arm that held Wilson was some kind of mechanical crustacean-inspired claw that appeared to be mostly retasked infected bone and implanted teeth. The hideous thing could have likely snipped Wilson's head clean off if it felt inspired to do so. As demented as Dr. Abrero's creation was, all of that was mild compared to its second face. At the right side pectoral mass was another face, mostly embedded there reminiscent of Fritz. That second face was flatter as though much of its bone was missing. It still had eyes and a functional mouth, and judging by its lolling tongue, it possessed sentience as well. In some repugnant way, that second face was the parallel brain that partially or wholly controlled the exoskeletal musculature. Perhaps like conjoined twins, both brains shared in the piloting of their hellish body. The exo ghoul had a brainwashing psyche program like Abrero's other androids. Its primary disposition was to protect the doctor from harm and judging by the condition of Wilson, the exo ghoul had no special reservations about killing Abrero's other minions if they got in its way. It was Otoka that threatened the person of Dr. Abrero at the moment. The exo ghoul dropped Wilson from both mind and claw as they focused on their new target. Critias obviously wasn't going to let that primitive abomination tear into Otoka. His mech suit had powered up to full systems readiness as soon as he locked on his helmet. On the instant that Critias's mech suit interlink communications went active, Carmen projected herself into the environment to learn what was happening. The mech suit had not recorded much in the way of useful data even if the live sensory feed revealed a whole menagerie of inexplicable details. Verloc's nearby Marshal Service wristwatch proved to be far more enlightening. It had passively recorded events thus far, and in particular, had monitored the local wireless computer network signals. The remote control Boris had used to awaken the exo ghoul had security that was so primitive as to be effectively non-existent. Within less than a second, Carmen hacked into the repurposed wireless insulin pump that Dr. Abrero had embedded inside the exo ghoul. Boris hoped the sudden rush to attack by the exo ghoul would be the distraction he needed when he brought his machine gun to purpose. He could not have been more mistaken. Verloc grouped two shots from her pistol into the soft avenue of his right eye, totally bypassing the thick bone of his juggernaut hunter's head. Her third shot severed his spinal cord through his neck, but that hardly mattered since her first two hollow point bullets had already reduced Boris' brains into hamburger. The end result was to drop Boris out of the game of life without even so much as a cry of his pain. Kid Panther's luck ran out when Verloc's epically loud indoor gunshots startled him so badly that it tripped him up. That moment of apprehension was all it took for Fritz's long-reaching massive hands to snatch him off his feet. The loud shots didn't help Oterka think clearly either. She had committed herself to restraining Dr. Abrero and didn't give up on that when everything snapped off. Critias went right over the top of their table, scattering breakfast service as he went. The exo ghoul had its toothy pincer thrust forth as it charged ahead. It had the obvious intention of clipping off Otoka's pretty head and thus free the mad doctor from her powerful embrace. Critias pulled his panga bowie blade from his shank scabbard and had it in hand as he dived onto the exo ghoul. Verloc was in no mood to hold back just to let Critias rack up some kill points of his own. She shifted the pistol over to stop the exo ghoul herself. While Verloc had no doubt that the steel smile and skull headgear would easily deflect one of her pistol rounds. The second chest face seemed relatively soft and thus highly vulnerable to her form of attack. 
That demonic little second face in the right side of the exo-ghoul's chest shifted its eyes onto Verloc. A crooked-toothed voiceless howl of alarm revealed that it was keenly aware of her deadly intentions. There must have been the will of two brains controlling all the muscles of the exo-ghoul because the abomination proved quite capable of reacting to two opponents simultaneously. The right hand moved to shield the little demon face from Verloc's gunshot just as it accurately went off from close range, Verloc's bullet impacted ineffectually against the steel armature brace that crossed the palm of that hand. As for Critias, his blade came down as a smashing chop that the exo-ghoul deliberately intercepted with the top of its armored head, which easily defeated the attack. At the same time, the redirected pincer claw sprang open wide enough to snap trap onto Critias's torso from the side just beneath his ribs. If it hadn't been for the armor of his mech suit, the teeth would have ripped his guts out. As it was, all that heavy bone and steel pincer could manage was get a solid purchase in the fleshy musculature and then keep him held tight. Josh was wise enough to worry that Dr. Abrero's android soldiers might come at them next. With Critias's slashing and Verloc's shooting, he was not going to get between them and the exo ghoul. Dosh went after the dropped machine gun that Boris had been holding. Once he had armed himself with that much firepower, it would hardly matter what Dr. Abrero tried to send against them. When Verloc fired again hoping to shoot the little demon face, her pistol jammed, no doubt due to Tongo's less than meticulous cleaning of his weapon. That was opportunity enough for both arms of the exo ghoul to deal with Critias. A vigorously flashing HUD application demanded Critias's attention so vehemently that he activated it without bothering to understand what it even did. He only knew it was some timely intervention by Carmen as she frequently delivered. Not only was he that desperate, but her assistance was generally first rate anyway, he could hardly go wrong. His mech suit transmitted a counterfeit signal to the pharmaceutical pump inside the exo ghoul. In its normal operation, the pump injected a small controlled dose of amphetamine directly into the dominant upper brain. Carmen's hack simply switched the pump into maximum continuous operation, delivering such a massive dose that just the raw volume of it ruptured an aneurysm in the creature's head. Critias forced open the claw and then dropped to his feet while the exo ghoul staggered from both an overdose and a traumatic brain injury. The little demon face suffered neither ailment, but still struggled to override the spasmodic impulses of its crippled counterpart. Even the slightest impairment would have been opportunity enough for Critias. Momentarily helpless as the exo ghoul was, Critias' power stabbed his panga bowie right between the eyes of the little demon face, burying the blade to the hilt. His weapon even punctured a thick underlayer of Kevlar armor that Dr. Abrero had added for extra protection. The exo ghoul still didn't collapse. It only staggered back from the multiple critical injuries. Critias had to abandon his short sword inside the demon face because getting it back out was going to take some serious pulling. Because its upper brain was incapable of dying due to the intrinsic nature of a mortal ghoul tissue, it went into a state of high-frequency seizures instead. The second parallel brain fared much better owing to the fact that it was not actually behind the little demon face at all. Dr. Abrero had shifted that brain over to the side during its implantation, ensuring it would be much safer behind a belt of sternum plate armor. While the secondary brain remained operational, psychologically, it had a sword blade buried through the middle of its face. Thusly distressed, and also battling with the upper brain's erratic commands, the second brain decided to use its pincer claw to amputate the useless upper head entirely. The plan proved to have a critical flaw in that both brains shared a braided hose of secondary spinal cord that effectively roped them together. As the lower brain claw snipped through the exposed neck and then viciously ripped off the mostly severed spastic head, that insanely violent action also pulled out its own brainstem, an act which permanently dispatched them both simultaneously. To the outside observer, the exo ghoul passed away in a tragic act of self loathing suicide. With Dr. Abrero still the helpless prisoner of Otica, Fritz found himself alone. Since he still held Kid Panther in his powerful hunter's hands, Fritz threatened, Let the doctor go or the boy dies. Critias, Verloc, and Dosh just waited in silence, seeing no need to take any action or respond. Fritz's extremely poor field of vision prevented him from noticing as Wilson struggled back up onto his feet. While ill used by the exo ghoul, Wilson had only feigned death, thereby tricking the idiotic creature into not decapitating him. When Fritz realized that everyone gazed in the same direction, he turned his whole massive body to see for himself. That was when his baby face came eye to eye with Wilson, who stuffed the barrel of a pistol into Fritz's shocked gaping mouth. Wilson pulled the trigger to blow Fritz's brains into a mush even as the hulking body contained the shot. Fritz collapsed without any visible wounds aside from blood and smoke that streamed out from his dead baby face. With a battle over and their liberation assured, Wilson groaned over his many aches and pains as he said, Man, I always hated that guy. Chapter 17 Behind the Cow 
With the hospital under their control, Critias planned to use it as their base of operations for the time being. Not only did it have a lot to offer in the way of security, supplies, and utilities, he still had to reorganize the new friendly watchers and figure out what to do with Dr. Abrero's primitive androids. For Dr. Abrero himself, Critias decided that he was too valuable a prize for him to just destroy and too dangerous a villain to risk him escaping custody. The convenient solution was to let Professor Carnegie put the mad doctor into his own vacuum desiccation synthetic spermicity oil embalming process. Critias would use some poetic justice and store him freeze-dried in a blue plastic barrel. Dr. Kine could rehydrate him back home if he ever wanted to safely make use of Abrero's scientific research knowledge. Critias hadn't forgotten about the dismembered girlfriend of the sarcophagus immortal back home. To the best of his knowledge, it was that elder immortal who had the power to restore the earth to humanity, but he would never do that until he got what he wanted first. There was a real possibility that Dr. Abrero could help put the woman back together, and if that was true, his mission to cure the world of infection was attainable. With Dr. Abrero out of the way, Critias went on a tour of the hospital complex to make certain he had not overlooked any potential problems or useful resources. He brought Kid Panther along, partly because he reminded Critias of growing up at the Virgil Lettuce. Life at Lettuce was all about brave kids who wanted to fight for justice and make a difference. Kid Panther was just like that, and he was immortal. The kid would never grow up, never become a full-grown man, and never mature beyond what he was already. Ideas of protecting Kid Panther, shielding him from a life of duty and danger, really didn't apply. Kid Panther had to live his life as a man because there was no other alternative for him. Their exploration of the hospital was uneventful until they reached the room with a male donor child that Dr. Abrero had filled with tubes. Abrero had destroyed the boy's brain enough to keep him comatose. There was no fixing him. When confronted by the scene, Kid Panther pulled off his leopard mask and started to cry, clearly deeply wounded by the sight of the mutilated boy. Not sure what to say, Critias asked, Are you going to be okay? I'm not the real Kid Panther, the boy confessed heartbroken. He is. I was just his sidekick. We tried to fight them off, but we both got captured. I managed to escape, but look what they did to him. While crawling around in the air ducts, I managed to save his uniform. I put it on. I don't know, maybe I thought it could scare them if they believed the real Kid Panther was still here. Critias removed his mech suit helmet and then showed it to the kid. You see this? I'm far from the first to wear one of these and I'm even further from the last. This is what it means to take up the cause. He was the real Kid Panther until he gave everything doing it, but he trained you, knowing this day was coming, when you would have to take up the mantle. You are the real Kid Panther now, and a damn good one. One day, it is going to chew you up too, and another will have to take your place. Look at him, and look at yourself. You already know what it means to be Kid Panther. There is no going back for either of you. The Watcher Boy looked down at the mask thoughtfully and then pulled it back onto his head. The fight goes on. He said gruffly as Kid Panther should. The villains who captured us, the ones who work for Dr. Abrero, they are still out there, hunting for new victims. Someone has to stop them. Dosh, Wilson, and Tongo came into the room just in time for Dosh to ask, someone has to stop whom? Critias looked to Wilson and Tongo for answers, how many more henchmen does Dr. Abrero have? Gator and Pogo, Wilson identified them by name. They are out on the road, hunting for donors. That's their job. Tongo ran the training center. My job was collecting food and electronic gadgets, home shopping club kind of stuff. They're both killer crazies, worse than Boris even. It could be weeks before they get back. Critias wasn't thinking of waiting around for them when he asked, Do you know which way they went? Dr. Abrero must have had some kind of system he used, checking different cities for lost boys. Wilson nodded, I have a pretty good idea where we could find them. I have traveled a lot in my time know my way around as well as those two shitbags anyway. King Louis has a job for you, Critias told Dosh. All I can promise you is that the king has more to give you than anybody, and from what he has to offer, you will get a generous reward. If you have any doubts, you can ask Verloc. She knows what it means to work for the man. You want me to track down Gator and Pogo, Dosh guessed correctly since he was actually quite clever. I want you to take Kid Panther with you, and Wilson. Critias added to confirm his intentions, they both know who you are looking for. Wilson can help you get ahead of them and the kid knows their methods, what you can expect from them when you do catch up. Dosh asked, dead or alive? Bring back their heads, Critias answered as a compromise on the two. Dr. Kine back home might be able to get something useful from them. If they have captured any victims, bring them back to join up with us. 
from some things I heard the professor say, maybe Ophelia wouldn't mind having some kids to look after. Someone is going to have to start. Dosh asked Kid Panther, are you up for this? I owe it to him to try, the boy said meaning the former Kid Panther who was currently in the nearby hospital bed full of tubes. Critias put his hand on Kid Panther's shoulder, we will burn him proper before you go. That is what you do with fallen heroes. There isn't much left of him now, not anymore, his heart and his mission have moved on into you. Tongo asked seriously, what about the Colombians? They will be coming, with kids, and expect their androids in exchange. Professional child traffickers? Critias asked rhetorically, as if little need be said. I'm not sure what my commanders want to do about this place. I expect we will be here waiting to greet them when they arrive, and then who knows, we might head south to clean up that mess. There is something down in that part of the world we already need anyway. It could be a chance to kill two birds with one stone. It had to be addressed, so Tongo came out and asked, King Louis is going to give us a chance? You gave Verloc your pistol, Critias answered him as though that explained everything. Nobody made you guys do the right thing. You showed us who you really are. King Louis needs you more than you need him. If you are willing to sign up, we want you, and we'll definitely take care of you from our end. Tongo questioned, and the androids? We don't see them that way, Critias replied somewhat non-committally. It is like the kids. There is only so much capacity they have for taking care of themselves. We will do for them as best we can, and let them be useful so they can have that much respect. Taking care of the unfortunate is what makes us different from the monsters we are fighting. It gives everyone meaning. For now, you are the expert in taking care of them. I think you should continue doing it for the time being. I actually know a little about androids. There is room for improvement in their drug injections and command instruction of devices. We have some professional scientists back home for getting into that. Satisfied that good things were on the horizon, Tongo said, I will round up some of the janitors. We will clean up the green room. It is a bit of a mess. That inspired Critias to ask, does this place have an incinerator? Tongo nodded readily that it did, there is a direct cremation furnace over in the generator building. Dr. Abrero had us use that for disposing of the medical waste, everything but the headless test specimens. We stacked all of those outside. It is large enough for anything you might have in mind. That is where Boris and Fritz are going, and Krabby Pat too. I want to burn these donor victims, Critias explained his reason for asking. They can never really die and I don't want any part of them lingering in this chopped up limbo. Only as ashes can they have any real peace. Once it was certain that Critias had the local situation completely under control, Gloria and her crew took the black hole back up into the sky. Her mission was to take detailed daytime and night thermal photographs of the entire Wasatch operational area. The nighttime study was especially important because it would provide them with accurate ghoul population figures, migratory paths, and areas of congregation. All of that would come in handy when the time came for luring the infected out into the open. Carmen would be their Pied Piper and she would get every rat in place for their eventual extermination. To make that happen, she needed to orchestrate the unfolding events from beginning to end with chronographic precision. She completed her robot rebuild in record time. Carmen could not only call upon the assistance of her brother Kevin, but they also had access to contemporary insight from technologists like Werner Hindemith, Tinker Bob, and Reginald Philby. Since they had the engineering equipment necessary, Carmen also built a simple but sturdy wagon that her robot could pull. They had mounted the robot torso onto caterpillar tracks that gave it autonomous mobility. Their final product was so excellent that it could not only pull a wagon behind it, but also a full load of heavy tools and materials that Carmen wanted to salvage from the university. With their work complete and the black hole already away doing the reconnaissance photography, Carmen walked her robot over to the nearby hospital complex. Romeo, Talbot, and Gustav were in her company. Carmen already knew a great deal about what to expect based on the information she collected from Critias's mech suit, she didn't have any overdeveloped feelings about Dr. Abrero or his androids. Yes, Carmen was a future evolution of that research and the androids were ancestors to her in some way, but it wasn't really all that different from her kinship with ghouls in general. Carmen did not see herself as a cyborg watcher, a gene-edited replicant, or any other form of artificial being. If anything, Carmen saw herself as a student, one more player in the game of life. Whatever form life took, it could be for humanity, against it, or a facet of the environment. Like her husband Critias, Carmen was one of the players in the game. As Li Feng had taught her, Carmen would do her best and the chips would fall as they may. It no longer served her interests to be dramatic about where she came from. That no longer really mattered in the greater scheme of things. Kid Panther, Tongo, and Verloc greeted them when they arrived at the loading dock. 
After some pleasant introductions, Kid Panther offered to show Carmen where she could find Critias. The boy escorted Carmen to where she could shower. Before departing, he instructed, when you are finished, go through there. He indicated another door further into the hospital. Carmen took a hot shower and then moved into the next room wearing only a clean towel. That part of the hospital had formerly been physical therapy related. The next room had large stainless steel therapeutic whirlpools like for sports medicine. Critias had cleaned up the largest of them, a huge rectangular hydrotherapy tub, got it filled, heated up, and ready. He had placed a dozen candles about the room as romantic lighting. There was a bottle of champagne with two fluted glasses, a platter of snacks he prepared from the abundant canned supplies, and soft music playing to complete the atmosphere. When Carmen just stood there speechless, Critias said, If I told you how much you mean to me, you wouldn't like it. She understood. Hearing that his love for her made him weak, vulnerable, soft and desperate, would be counterproductive to her preferred fantasy. Carmen enjoyed how he made her feel that way about herself. Her husband was stubborn and insensitive, a selfish brute that she was powerless to defend herself against. She was fragile and feminine, helpless without a man to protect her from the world. That was exactly the way she felt in that moment, paralyzed by perfect indecision. Mesmerized by the moment, she just stood there bedeviled. Even if Critias could not say it, he had gone through the trouble of showing it. He was going to worship her with his touch without denying her the pleasure of being his enthralled slave. Critias didn't even need to tell her not to move. His mere presence assured it. He walked close, pulled away her towel because she was his to admire in that way, and then kissed her. Not one worry intruded on Carmen's bliss. It was moments like this that she had traveled back in time for.